Author's Preface of The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Author's Preface. This story was begun within a few months after the publication of the completed Pickwick Papers. There were, then, a good many cheap Yorkshire schools in existence. There are very few now. Of the monstrous neglect of education in England, and the disregard of it by the State as a means of forming good or bad citizens, and miserable or happy men, private schools long afforded a notable example. Although any man who had proved his unfitness for any other occupation in life was free, without examination or qualification, to open a school anywhere, although preparation for the functions he undertook was required in the surgeon, who assisted to bring a boy into the world, or might one day assist, perhaps, to send him out of it, in the chemist, the attorney, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick-maker, the whole round of crafts and trades, the schoolmaster excepted. And although schoolmasters, as a race, were the blockheads and impostors who might naturally be expected to spring from such a state of things, and to flourish in it, these Yorkshire schoolmasters were the lowest and most rotten round in the whole ladder. Traders in the avarice, indifference, or imbecility of parents, and the helplessness of children, ignorant, sordid, brutal men, to whom few considerate persons would have entrusted the board and lodging of a horse or a dog. They formed the worthy cornerstone of a structure which, for absurdity, and a magnificent high-minded laissez-aller neglect has rarely been exceeded in the world. We hear sometimes of an action for damages against the unqualified medical practitioner, who has deformed and broken a limb in pretending to heal it, but what of the hundreds of thousands of minds that have been deformed for ever by the incapable pettifoggers who have pretended to form them? I make mention of the race as of the Yorkshire schoolmasters in the past tense. Though it has not yet finally disappeared, it is dwindling daily. A long day's work remains to be done about the way of education. Heaven knows, but a great improvement and facilities towards the attainment of a good one have been furnished of late years. I cannot call to mind now how I came to hear about Yorkshire schools when I was a not very robust child sitting in by-places near Rochester Castle with a head full of partridge, strap, tom-pipes and Sancho Panza, but I know that my first impressions of them were picked up at that time, and that they were somehow or other connected with a subturated abscess that some boy had come home with in consequence of his Yorkshire guide, philosopher and friend having ripped it open with an inky penknife. The impression made upon me, however made, never left me. I was always curious about Yorkshire schools, fell long afterwards and at sundry times into the way of hearing more about them, at last, having an audience, resolved to write about them. With that intent I went down into Yorkshire before I began this book, in very severe winter time, which is pretty faithfully described herein. As I wanted to see a schoolmaster or two, and was forewarned that those gentlemen might, in their modesty, be shy of receiving a visit from the author of the Pickwick Papers, I consulted with a professional friend who had a Yorkshire connection, and with whom I concerted a pious fraud. He gave me some letters of introduction in the name, I think, of my travelling companion. They bore reference to a suppositious little boy who had been left with a widowed mother who didn't know what to do with him. The poor lady had thought as a means of thawing the tardy compassion of her relations on his behalf, of sending him to a Yorkshire school. I was the poor lady's friend, travelling that way, and if the recipient of the letter could inform me of a school in his neighbourhood, the writer would be very much obliged. I went to several places in that part of the country, where I understood the schools to be the most plentifully sprinkled, and had no occasion to deliver a letter until I came to a certain town which shall be nameless. The person to whom it was addressed was not at home, but he came down at night through the snow to the inn where I was staying. It was after dinner, and he needed little persuasion to sit down by the fire in a warm corner, 
and take his share of the wine that was on the table. I'm afraid he's dead now. I recollect he was a jovial, ruddy, broad-faced man, that we got acquainted directly, and that we talked on all kinds of subjects, except the school, which he showed a great anxiety to avoid. Was there any large school near? I asked him, in reference to the letter. Oh, yes, he said. There was a pretty big un. Was it a good one? I asked. Ay, he said, it was as good as another. That was a, a matter of opinion, and fell to looking at the fire, staring round the room and whistling a little. On my reverting to some other topic that we had been discussing, he recovered immediately, but though I tried him again and again, I never approached the question of the school, even if he were in the middle of a laugh, without observing that his countenance fell, that he became uncomfortable. At last, when we had passed a couple of hours or so, very agreeably, he suddenly took up his hat, and leaning over the table, looking me full in the face, said in a low voice, well, mister, we've been very pleasant together, and I'll speak my mind to thee. Didn't let the widder send a little boy to any of our schoolmasters while there's a horse to hold in London, or a gutter to lie asleep in. I wouldn't make ill words among me neighbours, and I speak to thee quiet like, but I'm damned if I can gang to bed, and not tell thee for widder's sake, to keep the little boy from such scoundrels while there's a horse to hold in London, or a gutter to lie asleep in. Repeating these words with great heartiness, and with a solemnity on his jolly face that made it look twice as large as before, he shook hands and went away. I never saw him afterwards, but I sometimes imagine that I descry a faint reflection of him in John Browdie. In reference to these gentry, I may here quote a few words from the original preface to this book. It has afforded the author great amusement and satisfaction during the progress of this work to learn from country friends and from a variety of ludicrous statements concerning himself in provincial newspapers that more than one yorkshire schoolmaster lays claim to be the original of mr squeers one worthy he has reason to believe has actually consulted the authorities learned in the law as to his having good grounds on which to rest an action for libel Another has meditated a journey to London for the express purpose of committing an assault and battery on his traducer. A third perfectly remembers being waited on, last January twelve month, by two gentlemen, one of whom held him in conversation, while the other took his likeness. And although Mr. Squeers has but one eye, and he has two, and the published sketch does not resemble him, whoever he may be, in any other respect, Still, he and all his friends and neighbours know at once for whom it is meant, because the character is so like him. While the author cannot but feel the full force of the compliment thus conveyed to him, he ventures to suggest that these contentions may arise from the fact that Mr. Squeers is the representative of a class and not of an individual, where imposture, ignorance and brutal cupidity are the stock in trade of a small body of men and one is described by these characteristics, all his fellows will recognise something belonging to themselves, and each will have a misgiving that the portrait is his own. The author's object in calling public attention to the system would be very imperfectly fulfilled if he did not state now, in his own person, emphatically and earnestly, that Mr. Squeers and his school are faint and feeble pictures of an existing reality, purposely subdued and kept down lest they should be deemed impossible that there are upon record trials in law in which damages have been sought as poor recompense for lasting agonies and disfigurements inflicted upon children by the treatment of the master in these places involving such offensive and foul details of neglect cruelty and disease as no writer of fiction would have the boldness to imagine and that, since he has been engaged upon these adventures, he has received from private quarters, far beyond the reach of suspicion or distrust, accounts of atrocities in the perpetration of which, upon neglected or repudiated children, these schools have been the main instruments, very far exceeding any that appear in these pages. This comprises all I need to say on the subject, except that if I had seen occasion I had resolved to reprint a few of these details of legal proceedings from certain old newspapers. One other quotation from the same preface may serve to introduce a fact that my readers may think curious. 
to turn to a more pleasant subject it may be right to say that there are two characters in this book which are drawn from life it is remarkable that what we call the world which is so very credulous in what professes to be true is most incredulous in what professes to be imaginary and that while every day in real life it will allow in one man no blemishes and in another no virtues it will seldom admit to a very strongly marked character either good or bad in a fictitious narrative to be within the limits of probability but those who take an interest in this tale will be glad to learn that the brothers cherryble live that their liberal charity their singleness of heart their noble nature and their unbounded benevolence are no creation of the author's brain but are prompting every day and oftenest by stealth some munificent and generous deed in that town of which they are the pride and honour if i were to attempt to sum up the thousands of letters from all sorts of people in all sorts of latitudes and climates which this unlucky paragraph brought down upon me i should get into an arithmetical difficulty from which i could not easily extricate myself suffice it to say that i believe the applications for loans gifts and offices of profit that i have been requested to forward to the originals of the brothers cherryable with whom i never interchanged any communication in my life would have exhausted the combined patronage of all the lord chancellors since the accession of the house of brunswick and would have broken the rest of the bank of england the brothers are now dead there is only one other point on which i would desire to offer a remark if nicholas be not always found to be blameless or agreeable he is not always intended to appear so he is a young man of an impetuous temper and of little or no experience and i saw no reason why such a hero should be lifted out of nature end of author's preface chapter one of the life and adventures of nicholas nickleby by charles dickens this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one introduces all the rest there once lived in a sequestered part of the county of devonshire one mr godfrey nickleby a worthy gentleman who taking it into his head rather late in life that he must get married and not being young enough or rich enough to aspire to the hand of a lady of fortune he had wedded an old flame out of mere attachment who in her turn had taken him for the same reason thus two people who cannot afford to play cards for money sometimes sit down to a quiet game for love some ill-conditioned persons who sneer at the life matrimonial may perhaps suggest in this place that the good couple would be better likened to two principals in a sparring match who when fortune is low and backers scarce will chivalrously set to for the mere pleasure of the buffeting and in one respect indeed this comparison would hold good for as the adventurous pair of the fives court will afterwards send round a hat and trust to the bounty of the lookers-on for the means of regaling themselves so mr godfrey nickleby and his partner the honeymoon being over looked out wistfully into the world relying in no inconsiderable degree upon chance for the improvement of their means mr nickleby's income at the period of his marriage fluctuated between sixty and eighty pounds per annum there are people enough in the world heaven knows and even in london where mr nickleby dwelt in those days but few complaints prevail of the population being scanty it is extraordinary how long a man may look among the crowd without discovering the face of a friend but it is no less true mr nickleby looked and looked till his eyes became sore as his heart but no friend appeared and when growing tired of the search he turned his eyes homeward he saw very little there to relieve his weary vision a painter who has gazed too long upon some glaring colour refreshes his dazzled sight by looking upon a darker and more sombre tint but everything that met mr nickleby's gaze wore so black and gloomy a hue that he would have been beyond description refreshed by the very reverse of the contrast at length after five years when mrs nickleby had presented her husband with a couple of sons and that embarrassed gentleman impressed with the necessity of making some provision for his family was seriously revolving in his mind a little commercial speculation of insuring his life next quarter day and then falling from the top of the monument by accident 
there came one morning by the general post a black-bordered letter to inform him how his uncle mr ralph nickleby was dead and had left him the bulk of his little property amounting in all to five thousand pounds sterling as the deceased had taken no further notice of his nephew in his lifetime than sending to his eldest boy who had been christened after him on desperate speculation a silver spoon in a morocco case which as he had not too much to eat with it seemed a kind of satire upon his having been born without that useful article of plate in his mouth mr godfrey nickleby could at first scarcely believe the tidings thus conveyed to him on examination however they turned out to be strictly correct the amiable old gentleman it seemed had intended to leave the whole to the royal humane society and had indeed executed a will to that effect but the institution having been unfortunate enough a few months before to save the life of a poor relation to whom he paid a weekly allowance of three shillings and sixpence he had in a fit of very natural exasperation revoked the bequest in a codicil and left it all to mr godfrey nickleby with a special mention of his indignation not only against the society for saving the poor relation's life but against the poor relation also for allowing himself to be saved with a portion of this property mr godfrey nickleby purchased a small farm near dawlish in devonshire whither he retired with his wife and two children to live upon the best interest he could get for the rest of his money and the little produce he could raise from his land the two prospered so well together that when he died some fifteen years after this period and some five after his wife he was enabled to leave to his eldest son ralph three thousand pounds in cash and to his youngest son nicholas one thousand and the farm which was as small a landed estate as one would desire to see these two brothers had been brought up together in a school at exeter and being accustomed to go home once a week had often heard from their mother's lips long accounts of their father's sufferings in his days of poverty and of their deceased uncle's importance in his days of affluence which recitals produced a very different impression on the two for while the younger who was of a timid and retiring disposition gleaned from thence nothing but forewarnings to shun the great world and attach himself to the quiet routine of a country life ralph the elder deduced from the often repeated tale the two great morals that riches are only the true source of happiness and power and that it is lawful and just to compass their acquisition by all means short of felony and reason ralph within himself if no good comes of my uncle's money when he was alive a great deal of good came of it after he was dead inasmuch as my father has got it now and is saving it up for me which is a highly virtuous purpose and going back to the old gentleman good did come of it to him too for he had the pleasure of thinking of it all his life long and of being envied and courted by all his family besides and ralph always wound up these mental soliloquies by arriving at the conclusion that there was nothing like money not confining himself to theory or permitting his faculties to rust even at that early age in mere abstract speculations this promising lad commenced ursura on a limited scale at school putting out at good interest a small capital of slate pencil and marbles and gradually extending his operations until they aspired to the copper coinage of this realm in which he speculated to considerable advantage nor did he trouble his borrowers with abstract calculations of figures or reference to ready reckoners his simple rule of interest being all comprised in the one golden sentence two pence for every halfpenny, which greatly simplified the accounts and which as a familiar precept more easily acquired and retained in the memory than any known rule of arithmetic cannot be too strongly recommended to the notice of capitalists both large and small and more especially of money brokers and bill discounters indeed to do these gentlemen justice many of them are to this day in the frequent habit of adopting it with eminent success in like manner did young ralph nickleby avoid all those minute and intricate calculations of odd days which nobody who has worked sums in simple interest can fail to have found most embarrassing by establishing the one general rule that all sums of principal and interest should be paid on pocket-money day that is to say on saturday and that whether a loan were contracted on the monday or on the friday 
the amount of interest should be in both cases the same indeed he argued and with great show of reason that it ought to be rather more for one day than for five inasmuch as the borrower might in the former case be very fairly presumed to be in great extremity otherwise he would not borrow at all with such odds against him this fact is interesting as illustrating the secret connection and sympathy which always exists between great minds though master ralph nickleby was not at that time aware of it the class of gentlemen before alluded to proceed on just the same principle in all their transactions from what we have said of this young gentleman and the natural admiration the reader will immediately conceive of his character it may perhaps be inferred that he is to be the hero of the work which we shall presently begin to set this point at rest for once and for ever we hasten to undeceive them and stride to its commencement on the death of his father ralph nickleby who had been some time before placed in a mercantile house in london applied himself passionately to his old pursuit of money-getting in which he speedily became so buried and absorbed that he quite forgot his brother for many years and if at times a recollection of his old playfellow broke upon him through the haze in which he lived for gold conjures up a mist about a man more destructive of all his old senses and lulling to his feelings than the fumes of charcoal it brought along with it a companion thought that if they were intimate he would want to borrow money off him so mr ralph nickleby shrugged his shoulders and said things were better as they were as for nicholas he lived a single man on the patrimonial estate until he grew tired of living alone and then he took to wife the daughter of a neighbouring gentleman with a dower of one thousand pounds this good lady bore him two children a son and a daughter and when the son was about nineteen and the daughter fourteen as near as we can guess impartial records of young ladies ages being before the passing of the new act nowhere preserved in the registries of this country mr nickleby looked about him for the means of repairing his capital now sadly reduced by this increase in his family and the expenses of their education speculate with it said mrs nickleby speculate my dear said mr nickleby as though in doubt why not asked mrs nickleby because my dear if we should lose it rejoined mr nickleby who was a slow time-taking speaker if we should lose it we shall no longer be able to live my dear fiddle said mrs nickleby i am not altogether sure of that my dear said mr nickleby there's nicholas pursued the lady quite a young man it's time he was in the way of doing something for himself and kate too poor girl without a penny in the world think of your brother would he be what he is if he hadn't speculated that's true replied mr nickleby very good my dear yes i will speculate my dear speculation is a round game the players see little or nothing of their cards at first starting gains may be great and so may losses the run of luck went against mr nickleby a mania prevailed a bubble burst four stockbrokers took villa residences at florence four hundred nobodies were ruined and among them mr nickleby the very house i live in sighed the poor gentleman may be taken from me to-morrow not an article of my old furniture but will be sold to strangers the last reflection hurt him so much that he took at once to his bed apparently resolved to keep that at all events cheer up sir said the apothecary you mustn't let yourself be cast down sir said the nurse such things happen every day remarked the lawyer and it's sinful to rebel against them whispered the clergyman and what no man with a family ought to do added the neighbours mr nickleby shook his head and motioning them all out of the room embraced his wife and children and having pressed them by turns to his languidly beating heart sunk exhausted on his pillow they were concerned to find that his reason went astray after this for he babbled for a long time about the generosity and goodness of his brother and the merry old times when they were at school together this fit of wandering past he solemnly commanded them to one who never deserted the widow of her fatherless children and smiling gently on them turned upon his face and observed that he thought he could fall asleep. End of chapter one.
Chapter Two of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two of Mr. Ralph Nickleby and his establishments and his undertakings and of a great joint stock company of vast national importance. Mr. Ralph Nickleby was not, strictly speaking, what you would call a merchant. Neither was he a banker nor an attorney nor a special pleader, nor a notary. He was certainly not a tradesman, and still less could he lay claim to the title of a professional gentleman, for it would have been impossible to mention any recognised profession to which he belonged. Nevertheless, as he lived in a spacious house in Golden Square, which in addition to a brass plate upon the street door, had another brass plate two sizes and a half smaller upon the left-hand doorpost, surrounding a brass model of an infant's fist grasping a fragment of a skewer and displaying the word office it was clear that mr ralph nickleby did or pretend to do business of some kind and the fact if it required any further circumstantial evidence was abundantly demonstrated by the diurnal attendance between the hours of half-past nine and five of a sallow-faced man in rusty brown who sat upon an uncommonly hard stool in a species of butler's pantry at the end of the passage, and always had a pen behind his ear when he answered the bell. Although a few members of the graver professions live about Golden Square, it is not exactly in anybody's way to or from anywhere. It is one of the squares that have been a quarter of the town that has gone down in the world and taken to letting lodgings. Many of its first and second floors are let furnished to single gentlemen, and it takes boarders besides. It is a great resort for foreigners. The dark-complexioned men who wear large rings and heavy watch-guards and bushy whiskers, and who congregate under the opera colonnade and about the box-office in the season, between four and five in the afternoon, when they give away the orders, all live in Golden Square, or within a street of it. Two or three violins, and a wind instrument from the opera band reside within its precincts. Its boarding-houses are musical, and the notes of pianos and harps float in the evening time around the head of the mournful statue, the guardian genius of a little wilderness of shrubs in the centre of the square. On a summer's night windows are thrown open, and groups of swarthy moustached men are seen by the passer-by, lounging at the casements, and smoking fearfully. Sounds of gruff voices practising vocal music invade the evening silence, and the fumes of choice tobacco scent the air. There, snuff and cigars, and German pipes and flutes, and violins and violin cellos divide the supremacy between them. It is the region of song and smoke. Street bands are on their metal in Golden Square, and itinerant glee singers quaver involuntary as they raise their voices within its boundaries. This would not seem a spot very well adapted to the transaction of business, but Mr. Ralph Nickleby had lived there notwithstanding for many years, and uttered no complaint on that score. He knew nobody round about, and nobody knew him, although he enjoyed the reputation of being immensely rich. The tradesman held that he was a sort of lawyer, and the other neighbours opined that he was a kind of general agent, both of which guesses were as correct and definite as guesses about other people's affairs usually are or need to be. Mr. Ralph Nickleby sat in his private office one morning, ready dressed to walk abroad. He wore a bottle green spencer over a blue coat, a white waistcoat, grey mixture pantaloons, and Wellington boots drawn over them. The corner of a small plated shirt frill struggled out as if insisting to show itself from between his chin and the top button of his spencer and the latter garment was not made low enough to conceal a long gold watch-chain composed of a series of plain rings, which had its beginning at the handle of a gold repeater in Mr. Nickleby's pocket, and its termination in two little keys, one belonging to the watch itself and the other to some patent padlock. He wore a sprinkling of powder upon his head, as if to make himself look benevolent, but if that were his purpose, he would have perhaps done better to powder his countenance also, for there was something in its very wrinkles and in his cold, restless eye which seemed to tell of cunning 
that would announce itself in spite of him however this might be there he was and as he was all alone neither the powder nor the wrinkles nor the eyes had the smallest effect good or bad upon anybody just then and are consequently no business of ours just now mr nickleby closed an account book which lay on his desk and throwing himself back on his chair gazed with an air of abstraction through the dirty window some london houses have a melancholy little plot of ground behind them usually fenced in by four high whitewashed walls and frowned upon by stacks of chimneys in which there withers on from year to year a crippled tree that makes a show of putting forth a few leaves late in autumn when other trees shed theirs and drooping in the effort lingers on all crackled and smoke dried till the following season when it repeats the same process and perhaps if the weather be particularly genial even tempt some rheumatic sparrow to chirrup in its branches people sometimes call these dark yards gardens it is not supposed that they were ever planted but rather that they are pieces of unreclaimed land with the withered vegetation of the original brick field no man thinks of walking in this desolate place or of turning it into any account a few hampers half a dozen broken bottles and such like rubbish may be thrown there when the tenant first moves in but nothing more and there they remain until he goes away again the damp straw taking just as long to moulder as it thinks proper and mingling with the scanty box and stunted overbrowns and broken flower props that are scattered mournfully about a prey to blacks and dirt it was into a place of this kind that mr ralph nickleby gazed as he sat with his hands in his pockets looking out of the window he had fixed his eyes upon a distorted fir tree planted by some former tenant in a tub that had once been green and left there years before to rot away piecemeal there was nothing very inviting in the object but mr nickleby was wrapped in a brown study and sat contemplating it with far greater attention than in a more conscious mood he would have deigned to bestow upon the rarest exotic at length his eyes wandered to a dirty little window on the left through which the face of the clerk was dimly visible that worthy chancing to look up he beckoned him to attend in obedience to this summons the clerk got off the high stool to which he had communicated a high polish by countless gettings off and on and presented himself in mr nickleby's room he was a tall man of middle age with two goggle eyes whereof one was a fixture a rubicund nose a cadaverous face and a suit of clothes if the term be allowable when they suited him not at all much the worse for wear very much too small and placed upon such a short allowance of buttons that it was marvellous how he contrived to keep them on was that half past twelve noggs said mr nickleby in a sharp and grating voice not more than five and twenty minutes by the noggs was going to add public-house clock but recollecting himself substituted regular time my watch has stopped said mr nickleby i don't know from what cause not wound up said noggs yes it is said mr nickleby overwound then rejoined noggs that can't very well be observed mr nickleby must be said noggs well said mr nickleby putting the repeater back in his pocket perhaps it is noggs gave a peculiar grunt as was his custom at the end of all disputes with his master to imply that he noggs triumphed and as he rarely spoke to anybody unless somebody spoke to him fell into a grim silence and rubbed his hands slowly over each other cracking the joints of his fingers and squeezing them into all possible distortions the incessant performance of this routine on every occasion and the communication of a fixed and rigid look to his unaffected eye so as to make it uniform with the other and to render it impossible for anybody to determine where or at what he was looking were two among the numerous peculiarities of mr noggs which struck an inexperienced observer at first sight i'm going to the london tavern this morning said mr nickleby public meeting inquired noggs mr nickleby nodded i expect a letter from the solicitor respecting that mortgage of ruddles if it comes at all it will be here by two o'clock delivery i shall leave the city at about that time and walk to charing cross on the left-hand side of the way if there are any letters come and meet me and bring them with you noggs nodded and as he nodded there came a ring at the office bell 
The master looked up from his papers, and the clerk calmly remained in a stationary position. The bell, said Noggs, as though in explanation. At home? Yes. To anybody? Yes. To the tax-gatherer? No, let him call again. Noggs gave vent to his usual grunt, as much as to say, I thought so. And the ring being repeated, he went to the door, whence he presently returned, ushering in, by the name of Mr. Bonney, a pale gentleman in a violent hurry, who, with his hair standing up in great disorder all over his head, and a very narrow white cravat tied loosely round his throat, looked as if he had been knocked up in the night and had not dressed himself since. "'My dear Nickleby,' said the gentleman, taking off a white hat which was so full of papers that it would scarcely stick upon his head, there's not a moment to lose. I have a cab at the door, so Matthew Pupka takes the chair, and three members of Parliament are positively coming. I have seen two of them safely out of bed. The third, who was at Cropford's all night, has just gone home to put a clean shirt on, and take a bottle or two of soda water, and will certainly be with us in time to address the meeting. He is a little excited by last night, but never mind that. He always speaks the stronger for it. "'It seems to promise well,' said Mr. Ralph Nickleby, whose deliberate manner was strongly opposed to the vivacity of the other man of business. "'Pretty well,' echoed Mr. Bonney. "'It's the finest idea that was ever started. United, Metropolitan, Improved Hot Muffing and Crumpet Baking and Punctual Delivery Company. Capital five millions in five hundred thousand shares of ten pounds each. Why, the very name will get the shares up to a premium in ten days.' "'And when they are at a premium,' said Mr. Ralph Nickleby, smiling, "'when they are, you know what to do with them as well as any man alive, "'and how to back quietly out at the right time,' said Mr. Bonney, "'slapping the capitalist familiarly on the shoulder. "'By the by, what a very remarkable man that clerk of yours is.' "'Yes, poor devil,' replied Ralph, drawing on his gloves. "'Though Newman Noggs kept his horses and hounds once.' "'Aye, aye,' said the other carelessly. Yes, continued Ralph, and not many years ago either, but he squandered his money, invested it anyhow, borrowed at interest, and in short made first a thorough fool of himself, then a beggar. He took to drinking, had a touch of paralysis, and then came here to borrow a pound. As in his better days I had done business with him, said Mr. Bonney, with a meaning look. Just so, replied Ralph. I couldn't lend it, you know. Oh, of course not. But as I wanted a clerk just then, to open the door and so forth, I took him out of charity, and he has remained with me ever since. He's a little mad, I think, said Mr. Nickleby, calling up a charitable look. But he's useful enough, poor creature, useful enough. The kind-hearted gentleman omitted to add that Newman Noggs, being utterly destitute, served him for rather less than the usual wages of a boy of thirteen and likewise failed to mention in his hasty chronicle that his eccentric taciturnity rendered him an especially valuable person in a place where much business was done of which it was desirable no mention should be made of outdoors the other gentleman was plainly impatient to be gone however and as they hurried into the hackney cabriolet immediately afterwards perhaps mr nickleby forgot to mention circumstances so unimportant there was a great bustle in Bishopgate Street within, as they drew up, and it being a windy day, half a dozen men were tacking across the road under a press of paper, bearing gigantic announcements that a public meeting would be holden at one o'clock precisely, to take into consideration the propriety of petitioning Parliament in favour of the United Metropolitan Improved Hot Muffin and Crumpet Baking and Punctual Delivery Company capital five millions in five hundred thousand shares of ten pounds each which sums were duly set forth in fat black figures of considerable size mr bonney elbowed his way briskly upstairs receiving in his progress many low bows from the waiters who stood on the landings to show the way and followed by mr nickleby dived into a suite of apartments behind the great public room in the second of which was a business-looking table and several business-looking people here cried a gentleman with a double chin as mr bonney presented himself chair gentlemen chair the newcomers were received with universal approbation and mr bonney bustled up to the top of the table took off his hat ran his fingers through his hair and knocked a hackney coachman's knock on the table with a little hammer 
whereat several gentlemen cried here and nodded slightly to each other as much as to say what spirited conduct that was just at this moment a waiter feverish with agitation tore into the room and throwing the door open with a crash shouted sir matthew pupka the committee stood up and clapped their hands for joy and while they were clapping them in came sir matthew pupka attended by two live members of parliament one irish and one scotch all smiling and bowing and looking so pleasant that it seemed a perfect marvel how any man could have the heart to vote against them sir matthew pupka especially who had a little round head with a flaxen wig on top of it fell into such a paroxysm of bows that the wig threatened to be jerked off every instant when these symptoms had in some degree subsided the gentlemen who were on speaking terms with sir matthew pupka or the two other members crowded round them in three little groups near one or other of which the gentlemen who were not on speaking terms with sir matthew pupka or the other two members stood lingering and smiling and rubbing their hands in the desperate hope of something turning up which might bring them into notice all this time sir matthew pupka and the two other members were relating to their separate circles what the intentions of government were about taking up the bill with a full account of what the government had said in a whisper the last time they dined with it and how the government had been observed to wink when it said so from which premises they were at no loss to draw the conclusion that if the government had one object more at heart than another that one object was the welfare and advantage of the united metropolitan improved hot muffing and crumpet baking and punctual delivery company meanwhile and pending the arrangement of the proceedings and a fair division of the speechifying the public in the large room were eyeing by turns the empty platform and the ladies in the music gallery in these amusements the greater portion of them had been occupied for a couple of hours before and as the most agreeable diversions pall upon the taste on a too protracted enjoyment of them the sterner spirits now began to hammer the floor with their boot heels and to express their dissatisfaction by various hoots and cries these vocal exertions emanating from the people who had been there longest naturally proceeded from those who were nearest to the platform and furthest from the policemen in attendance who having no great mind to fight their way through the crowd but entertaining nevertheless a praiseworthy desire to do something to quell the disturbance immediately began to drag forth by the coat-tails and collars all the quiet people near the door at the same time dealing out various smart and tingling blows with their truncheons after the manner of that ingenious actor mr punch whose brilliant example both in the fashion of his weapons and their use this branch of the executive occasionally follows several very exciting skirmishes were in progress when a loud shout attracted the attention of even the belligerents and then there poured forth onto the platform from a door at the side a long line of gentlemen with their hats off all looking behind them and uttering vociferous cheers the cause whereof was sufficiently explained when sir matthew pupka and the two other real members of parliament came to the front amidst deafening shouts and testified to each other in dumb motions that they had never seen such a glorious sight as that in the whole course of their public career at length and at last the assembly left off shouting but sir matthew pupka being voted into the chair they underwent a relapse which lasted five minutes this over sir matthew pupka went on to say what must be his feelings on that great occasion and what must be that occasion in the eyes of the world and what must be the intelligence of his fellow countrymen before him and what must be the wealth and respectability of his honourable friends behind him and lastly what must be the importance to the wealth the happiness the comfort the liberty the very existence of a free and great people of such an institution as a united metropolitan improved hot muffin and crumpet baking and punctual delivery company mr bonney then presented himself to move the first resolution and having run his right hand through his hair and planted his left in an easy manner in his ribs he consigned his hat to the care of the gentleman with the double chin who acted as a species of bottle holder to the orators generally and said he would read to them the first resolution that this meeting views with alarm and apprehension the existing state of the muffin trade in this metropolis and its neighbourhood that it considers the muffin boys as at present constituted 
wholly undeserving the confidence of the public, and that it deems the whole Muffin system alike prejudicial to the health and morals of the people, and subversive of the best interests of a great commercial and mercantile community. The honourable gentleman made a speech which drew tears from the eyes of the ladies, and awakened the liveliest emotions in every individual present. He had visited the houses of the poor in the various districts of London, and had found them destitute of the slightest vestige of a muffin, which there appeared too much reason to believe. Some of these indigent persons did not taste from year's end to year's end. He had found that among the muffin sellers there existed drunkenness, debauchery, and profligacy, which he attributed to the debasing nature of their employment as at present exercised. He had found the same vices amongst the poorer class of people who ought to be muffin consumers, and this he attributed to the despair engendered by their being placed beyond the reach of that nutritious article, which drove them to seek a false stimulant in intoxicating liquors. He would undertake to prove before a committee of the House of Commons that there existed a combination to keep up the price of muffins and to give the bellman a monopoly. He would prove it by bellman at the bar of that house, and he would also prove that these men corresponded with each other by secret words and signs as Snooks, Walker, Ferguson, Is Murphy Wright, and many others. It was this melancholy state of things that the company proposed to correct. Firstly, by prohibiting, under heavy penalties, all private muffin trading of every description. Secondly, by themselves supplying the public generally, and the poor at their own homes, with muffins of a first quality at reduced prices. It was with this object that a bill had been introduced into Parliament by their patriotic chairman, Sir Matthew Pupka. It was this bill that they had met to support. It was the supporters of this bill who would confer undying brightness and splendour upon England. Under the name of the United Metropolitan Improved Hot Muffin and Crumpet Baking and Punctual Delivery Company. He would add, with a capital of five millions, in 500,000 shares of £10 each. Mr. Ralph Nickleby seconded the resolution, and another gentleman, having moved that it be amended by the insertion of the words, and crump it after the word muffin whenever it occurred. It was carried triumphantly. Only one man in the crowd cried no, and he was promptly taken into custody and straight away borne off. The second resolution, which recognised the expediency of immediately abolishing all muffin or crumpet sellers, all traders in muffins or crumpets, of whatsoever description, whether male or female, boys or men, ringing handbells or otherwise, was moved by a grievous gentleman of a semi-clerical appearance, who went at once into such deep pathetics that he knocked the first speaker clean off the course in no time. You might have heard a pin fall, a pin, a feather, as he described the cruelties inflicted on muffin boys by their masters, which he very wisely urged were in themselves a sufficient reason for the establishment of that inestimable company. It seemed that the unhappy youths were nightly turned out into the wet streets at the most inclement periods of the year, to wander about in darkness and rain, or it might be hail or snow, for hours together without shelter, food or warmth, and let the public never forget upon the latter point that while the muffins were provided with warm clothing and blankets, the boys were wholly unprovided for, and left to their own miserable resources. Shame! The honourable gentleman related one case of a muffin boy, who having been exposed to this inhuman and barbarous system for no less than five years, at length fell victim to a cold in the head, beneath which he gradually sunk until he fell into a perspiration and recovered. This he could vouch for, on his own authority, but he had heard, and he had no reason to doubt the fact, of a still more heart-rending and appalling circumstance. He had heard the case of an orphan muffin boy, who, having been run over by a hackney carriage, had been removed to the hospital, had undergone the amputation of his leg below the knee, and was now actually pursuing his occupation on crutches. Fountain of justice were these things to last. This was the department of the subject that took the meeting, and this was the style of speaking to enlist their sympathies. The men shouted, the ladies wept into their pocket handkerchiefs till they were moist, and waved them till they were dry. 
the excitement was tremendous and mr nickleby whispered his friend that the shares were thenceforth at a premium of five and twenty per cent the resolution was of course carried with loud acclamations every man holding up both hands in favour of it as he would in his enthusiasm have held up both legs also if he could have conveniently accomplished it this done the draft of the proposed petition was read at length and the petition said as all petitions do say that the petitioners were very humble and the petition very honourable and the object very virtuous therefore said the petition the bill ought to be passed into a law at once to the everlasting honour and glory of that most honourable and glorious commons of england in parliament assembled then the gentleman who had been at cropford's all night and who looked something the worse about the eyes in consequence came forward to tell his fellow countrymen what a speech he meant to make in favour of that petition whenever it should be presented and how desperately he meant to taunt the parliament if they rejected the bill and to inform them also that he regretted his honourable friends had not inserted a clause rendering the purchase of muffins and crumpets compulsory upon all classes of the community which he opposing all half measures and preferring to go to the extreme animal pledged himself to propose and divide upon in committee after announcing this determination the honourable gentleman grew jocular and as patent boots lemon-coloured kid gloves and a fur coat collar assist jokes materially there was immense laughter and much cheering and moreover such a brilliant display of ladies pocket handkerchiefs as threw the grievous gentleman quite into the shade and when the petition had been read and was about to be adopted there came forward the irish member who was a young gentleman of ardent temperament with such a speech as only an irish member can make breathing the true soul and spirit of poetry and poured forth with such fervour that it made one warm to look at him in the course whereof he told them how he would demand the extension of that great boon to his native country how he would claim for her equal rights in the muffin laws as in all other laws and how he yet hoped to see the day when crumpets should be toasted in her lowly cabins and muffin bells should ring in her rich green valleys and after him came the scotch member with various pleasant allusions to the probable amount of profits which increased the good humour that the poetry had awakened and all the speeches put together did exactly what they were intended to do and established in the hearers minds that there was no speculation so promising or at the same time so praiseworthy as the united metropolitan improved hot muffin and crumpet baking and punctual delivery company so the petition in favour of the bill was agreed upon and the meeting adjourned with acclamations and mr nickleby and the other directors went to the office to lunch as they did every day at half past one o'clock and to remunerate themselves for which trouble as the company was yet in its infancy they only charged three guineas each man for every such attendance. End of chapter two. Chapter three of the life and adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three. Mr. Ralph Nickleby receives sad tidings of his brother, but bears up nobly against the intelligence communicated to him. The reader is informed how he liked Nicholas, who is herein introduced, and how kindly he proposed to make his fortune at once. Having rendered his zealous assistance towards dispatching the lunch, with all that promptitude and energy which are among the most important qualities that men of business can possess, Mr. Ralph Nickleby took a cordial farewell of his fellow speculators and bent his steps westward in an unwonted good humour. As he passed St. Paul's, he stepped aside into a doorway to set his watch, and with his hand on the key and his eye on the cathedral dial, was intent upon so doing when a man suddenly stopped before him. It was Newman Noggs. Ah, Newman, said Mr. Nickleby, looking up as he pursued his occupation. The letter about the mortgage has come, has it? I thought it would. Wrong, replied Newman. What? Nobody called respecting it? inquired Mr. Nickleby, pausing. Noggs shook his head. What has come, then? inquired Mr. Nickleby. 
i have said newman what else demanded the master sternly this said newman drawing a sealed letter slowly from his pocket postmark strand black wax border woman's hand c n in the corner black wax said mr nickleby glancing at the letter i know something of that hand too newman i shouldn't be surprised if my brother were dead i don't think you would said newman quietly why not sir demanded mr nickleby you are never surprised replied newman that's all mr nickleby snatched the letter from his assistant and fixing a cold look upon him opened read it put it in his pocket and having now hit the time to a second began winding up his watch it is as i expected newman said mr nickleby while he was thus engaged he is dead dear me well that's a sudden thing i shouldn't have thought it really with these touching expressions of sorrow mr nickleby replaced his watch in his fob and fitting on his gloves to a nicety turned upon his way and walked slowly westward with his hands behind him children alive inquired noggs stepping up to him why that's the very thing replied mr nickleby as though his thoughts were about them at that moment they are both alive both repeated newman noggs in a low voice and the widow too added mr nickleby and all three in london confound them all three here newman newman fell a little behind his master and his face was curiously twisted as by a spasm but whether of paralysis or grief or inward laughter nobody but himself could possibly explain the expression of a man's face is commonly a help to his thoughts or glossary on his speech but the countenance of newman noggs in his ordinary moods was a problem which no stretch of ingenuity could solve go home said mr nickleby after they had walked a few paces looking round at the clerk as if he were his dog the words were scarcely uttered when newman darted across the road slunk among the crowd and disappeared in an instant reasonable certainly muttered mr nickleby to himself as he walked on very reasonable my brother never did anything for me and i never expected it the breath is no sooner out of his body than i am to be looked to as the support of a great hearty woman and a grown boy and a girl what are they to me i never saw them full of these and many other reflections of a similar kind mr nickleby made the best of his way to the strand and referring to his letter as if to ascertain the number of the house he wanted stopped at a private door about halfway down that crowded thoroughfare a miniature painter lived there for there was a large gilt frame screwed upon the street door in which were displayed upon a black velvet ground two portraits of naval dress coats with faces looking out of them and telescopes attached one of a young gentleman in a very vermilion uniform flourishing a sabre and one of a literary character with a high forehead a pen and ink six books and a curtain there was moreover a touching representation of a young lady reading a manuscript in an unfathomable forest and a charming whole length of a large-headed little boy sitting on a stool with his legs foreshortened to the size of salt spoons besides these works of art there were a great many heads of old ladies and gentlemen smirking at each other out of blue and brown skies and an elegantly written card of terms with an embossed border mr nickleby glanced at these frivolities with great contempt and gave a double knock which having been thrice repeated was answered by a servant girl with an uncommonly dirty face is mrs nickleby at home girl demanded ralph sharply her name ain't nickleby said the girl la creevy you mean mr nickleby looked very indignant at the handmaid on being thus corrected and demanded with much asperity what she meant which she was about to state when a female voice proceeding from a perpendicular staircase at the end of the passage inquired who was wanted mrs nickleby said ralph it's the second floor hannah said the same voice what a stupid thing you are is the second floor at home somebody went out just now but i think it was the attic which had been cleaning of himself replied the girl you had better see said the invisible female show the gentleman where the bell is and tell him he mustn't knock double knocks for the second floor i can't allow a knock except when the bell's broke and then it must be two single ones here said ralph walking in with more parley i beg your pardon is that mrs la what's her name creevy la creevy replied the voice as a yellow headdress bobbed over the banisters i'll speak to you a moment ma'am with your leave said ralph 
the voice replied that the gentleman was to walk up but he had walked up before it spoke and stepping on to the first floor was received by the wearer of the yellow headdress who had a gown to correspond and was of much the same colour herself miss la creeby was a mincing young lady of fifty and miss la creeby's apartment was the gilt frame downstairs on a larger scale and something dirtier mm, said miss la creeby coughing delicately behind her black silk mitten a miniature i presume a very strongly marked countenance for the purpose sir have you ever sat before you mistake my purpose i see ma'am replied mr nickleby in his usual blunt fashion i have no money to throw away on miniatures ma'am and nobody to give one to thank god if i had seeing you on the stairs i wanted to ask a question of you about some lodgers here miss la creevy coughed once more this cough was to conceal her disappointment and said oh indeed i infer from what you said to your servant that the floor above belongs to you ma'am said mr nickleby yes it did miss la creevy replied the upper part of the house belonged to her and as she had no necessity for the second floor rooms just then she was in the habit of letting them indeed there was a lady from the country and her two children in them at that present speaking a widow ma'am said ralph yes she is a widow replied the lady a poor widow ma'am said ralph with a powerful emphasis on that little adjective which conveys so much well i'm afraid she is poor rejoined miss la creeby i happen to know that she is ma'am said ralph now what business has a poor widow in such a house as this ma'am very true replied miss la creeby not at all displeased with this implied compliment to the apartments exceedingly true i know her circumstances intimately ma'am said ralph in fact i am a relation of the family and i should recommend you do not keep them here ma'am i should hope if there was any incompatibility to meet pecuniary obligations said miss la creevy with another cough that the lady's family would no they wouldn't ma'am interrupted ralph hastily don't think of it if i am to understand that said miss la creevy the case wears a very different appearance you may understand it then ma'am said ralph and make your arrangements accordingly i am the family ma'am at least i believe i am the only relation they have and i think it right that you should know i can't support them in their extravagances how long have they taken these lodgings for only from week to week replied miss la creevy mrs nickleby paid the first week in advance then you had better get them out at the end of it said ralph they can't do better than go back to the country ma'am they're in everybody's way here certainly said miss la creevy rubbing her hands if mrs nickleby took the apartments without the means of paying for them it was very unbecoming a lady of course it was ma'am said ralph and naturally continued miss la creevy i who am at present an unprotected female cannot afford to lose by the apartments of course you can't ma'am replied ralph though at the same time added miss la creevy who was plainly wavering between her good nature and her interest i have nothing whatever to say against the lady who is extremely pleasant and affable though poor thing she seems terribly low in her spirits nor against the young people either for nicer or better behaved young people cannot be very well ma'am said ralph turning to the door for these echominiums on poverty irritated him i've done my duty and perhaps more than i ought of course nobody will thank me for saying what i have i am sure i am very much obliged to you at least sir said miss la creevy in a gracious manner would you do me the favour to look at a few specimens of my portrait painting you're very good ma'am said mr nickleby making off with great speed but as i have a visit to pay upstairs and my time is precious i really can't at any other time when you are passing i shall be most happy said miss la creevy perhaps you will have the kindness to take a card of terms with you thank you good morning good morning ma'am said ralph shutting the door abruptly after him to prevent any further conversation now for my sister-in-law <laughs> climbing up another perpendicular flight composed with great mechanical ingenuity of nothing but corner stairs mr ralph nickleby stopped to take a breath on the landing when he was overtaken by the handmaid whom the politeness of miss la creevy had dispatched to announce him and who had apparently been making a variety of unsuccessful attempts since their last interview to wipe her dirty face clean upon an apron much dirtier what name said the girl 
Nickleby, replied Ralph. Oh, Mrs. Nickleby, said the girl, throwing open the door. Here's Mr. Nickleby. A lady in deep mourning rose as Mr. Ralph Nickleby entered, but appeared incapable of advancing to meet him, and leant upon the arm of a slight but very beautiful girl of about seventeen, who had been sitting by her. A youth, who appeared a year or two older, stepped forward and saluted Ralph as his uncle. Ah, growled Ralph with an ill-favoured frown. You are Nicholas, I suppose. That is my name, sir, replied the youth. Put my hat down, said Ralph imperiously. Well, ma'am, how do you do? You must bear up against sorrow, ma'am. I always do. Mine was no common loss, said Mrs. Nickleby, applying her handkerchief to her eyes. It was no uncommon loss, ma'am, returned Ralph, as he coolly unbuttoned his spencer. Husbands die every day, ma'am, and wives too. And brothers also, sir, said Nicholas, with a glance of indignation. Yes, sir, and puppies and pug-dogs likewise, replied his uncle, taking a chair. You didn't mention in your letter what my brother's complaint was, ma'am. The doctors could attribute it to no particular disease, said Mrs. Nickleby, shedding tears. We have too much reason to fear that he died of a broken heart. Pfft, said Ralph, there's no such thing. I can understand a man's dying of a broken neck, or suffering from a broken arm, or a broken head, or a broken leg, or a broken nose. But a broken heart? Nonsense. It's the cant of the day. If a man can't pay his debts, he dies of a broken heart, and his widow's a martyr. Some people, I believe, have no hearts to break, observed Nicholas quietly. How old is this boy, for God's sake, inquired Ralph, wheeling back his chair and surveying his nephew from head to foot with intense scorn. Nicholas is very nearly nineteen, replied the widow. Nineteen, eh? said Ralph. And what do you mean to do for your bread, sir? Not to live upon my mother, replied Nicholas, his heart swelling as he spoke. You'd have little enough to live upon if you did, retorted the uncle, eyeing him contemptuously. Whatever it be, said Nicholas, flush with anger, I shall not look to you to make it more. Nicholas, my dear, recollect yourself, remonstrated Mrs. Nickleby. Dear Nicholas, pray, urged the young lady. Hold your tongue, sir, said Ralph. Upon my word, fine beginnings, Mrs. Nickleby, fine beginnings. Mrs. Nickleby made no other reply than entreating Nicholas by a gesture to keep silent, and the uncle and nephew looked at each other for some seconds without speaking. The face of the old man was stern, hard-featured, and forbidding. That of the young one, open, handsome, and ingenuous. The old man's eye was keen with the twinkling of avarice and cunning. The young man's bright with the light of intelligence and spirit. His figure was somewhat slight, but manly and well-formed, and apart from all the grace of youth and comeliness, there was an emanation from the warm young heart in his look and bearing which kept the old man down. However striking such a contrast as this may be to lookers-on, none ever feel it with half the keenness or acuteness of perfection with which it strikes to the very soul of him whose inferiority it marks. It gulled Ralph to the heart's core, and he hated Nicholas from that hour. The mutual inspection was at length brought to a close by Ralph withdrawing his eyes with a great show of disdain, and calling Nicholas a boy. This word is much used as a term of reproach by elderly gentlemen towards their juniors, probably with the view of deluding society into the belief that if they could be young again, they wouldn't on any account. Well, ma'am, said Ralph impatiently, the creditors have administered, you tell me, and there's nothing left for you. Nothing, replied Mrs. Nickleby. And you spent what little money you had in coming all the way to London to see what I could do for you, pursued Ralph. I hoped, faltered Mrs. Nickleby, that you might have an opportunity of doing something for your brother's children. It was his dying wish that I should appeal to you in their behalf. I don't know how it is, muttered Ralph, walking up and down the room, but whenever a man dies without any property of his own, he always seems to think that he has a right to dispose of other people's. What is your daughter fit for, ma'am? Kate has been well educated, sobbed Mrs. Nickleby. Tell your uncle, my dear, how far you went in French and extras. The poor girl was about to murmur something when her uncle stopped her very unceremoniously. We must try and get you apprenticed at some boarding school, said Ralph. You have not been brought up too delicately for that, I hope. No, indeed, uncle, replied the weeping girl. I will try to do anything that will gain me a home and bread. Well, well, said Ralph, a little softened. 
either by his niece's beauty or her distress stretch a point and say the latter you must try it and if the life is too hard perhaps dressmaking or tambour work will come lighter have you ever done anything sir turning to his nephew no replied nicholas bluntly no i thought not said ralph this is the way my brother brought up his children ma'am nicholas has not long completed such education as his poor father could give him rejoined mrs nickleby and he was thinking of of making something of him some day said ralph the old story always thinking and never doing if my brother had been a man of activity and prudence he might have left you a rich woman ma'am if he had turned his son into the world as my father turned me when i was as old as that boy by a year and a half he would have been in a situation to help you instead of being a burden upon you and increasing your distress my brother was a thoughtless inconsiderate man mrs nickleby and nobody i am sure could have a better reason to feel that than you this appeal set the widow upon thinking that perhaps she might have made a more successful venture with her one thousand pounds and then she began to reflect what a comfortable sum it would have been just then which dismal thoughts made her tears flow faster and in the excess of these griefs she being a well-meaning woman enough but weak withal fell first to deploring her hard fate and then to remarking with many sobs that to be sure she had been a slave to poor nicholas and had often told him that she might have married better as indeed she had very often and that she never knew in his lifetime how the money went but that if he had confided in her they might have all been better off that day with other bitter recollections common to most married ladies either during their coverture or afterwards or at both periods mrs nickleby concluded by lamenting that the dear departed had never deigned to profit by her advice save on one occasion which was a strictly veracious statement inasmuch as he had only acted upon it once and had ruined himself in consequence mr ralph nickleby heard all of this with a half smile and when the widow had finished quietly took up the subject where it had been left before the above outbreak are you willing to work sir he inquired frowning on his nephew of course i am said nicholas haughtily then see here sir said his uncle this caught my eye this morning and you may thank your stars for it with this exordium mr ralph nickleby took a newspaper from his pocket and after unfolding it and looking for a short time among the advertisements read as follows education at mr wackford squeers academy dotheboys hall at the delightful village of dotheboys near greta bridge in yorkshire youth are boarded clothed booked furnished with pocket money provided with all necessaries instructed in all languages living and dead mathematics orthography geometry astronomy trigonometry the use of globes algebra single stick if required writing arithmetic fortification and every other branch of classical literature terms twenty guineas per annum no extras no vacations and diet unparalleled mr squeers is in town and attends daily from one till four at the saracen's head snow hill n b an able assistant wanted annual salary five pounds a master of arts would be preferred there said ralph folding the paper again let him get that situation and his fortune is made but he's not a master of arts said mrs nickleby that replied ralph that i think can be got over but the salary is so small and it's such a long way off uncle faltered kate hush kate my dear interposed mrs nickleby your uncle must know best i say repeated ralph tartly let him get that situation and his fortune is made if he don't like that let him get one for himself without friends money recommendation or knowledge of business of any kind let him find honest employment in london which will keep him in shoe leather and i'll give him a thousand pounds at least said mr ralph nickleby checking himself but i would if i had it poor fellow said the young lady oh uncle must we be separated so soon don't tease your uncle with questions when he's thinking only of our good my love said mrs nickleby nicholas my dear i wish you would say something yes mother yes said nicholas who had hitherto remained silent and absorbed in thought if i am fortunate enough to be appointed to this post sir for which i am so imperfectly qualified what will become of those i leave behind 
your mother and sister sir replied ralph will be provided for in that case not otherwise by me and placed in some sphere of life in which they will be able to be independent that will be my immediate care they will not remain as they are one week after your departure i will undertake then said nicholas starting gaily up and wringing his uncle's hand i am ready to do anything you wish me let us try our fortune with mr squeers at once he can but refuse he won't do that said ralph he will be glad to have you on my recommendation make yourself of use to him and you'll rise to be a partner in the establishment in no time bless me only think if he were to die why well, your fortune's made at once to be sure i see it all said poor nicholas delighted with a thousand visionary ideas that his good spirits and his inexperience were conjuring up before him or suppose some young nobleman who has been educated at the hall were to take a fancy to me and to get his father to appoint me as his travelling tutor when he left and when we come back from the continent procured me some handsome appointment eh uncle ah to be sure sneered ralph and who knows but when he came to see me when i was settled as he would of course he might fall in love with kate who would be keeping my house and marry her eh uncle who knows who indeed snarled ralph how happy we should be cried nicholas with enthusiasm the pain of parting is nothing to the joy of meeting again kate will be a beautiful woman and i so proud to hear them say so and mother so happy to be with us once again and all these sad times forgotten and the picture was too bright a one to bear and nicholas fairly overpowered by it smiled faintly and burst into tears this simple family born and bred in retirement and wholly unacquainted with what is called the world a conventional phrase which being interpreted often signifieth all the rascals in it mingled their tears together at the thought of their first separation and this first gush of feeling over were proceeding to dilate with all the buoyancy of untried hope on the bright prospects before them when mr ralph nickleby suggested that if they lost time some more fortunate candidate might deprive nicholas of the stepping-stone to fortune which the advertisement pointed out and so undermined all their air-built castles this timely reminder effectually stopped the conversation nicholas having carefully copied the address of mr squeers the uncle and the nephew issued forth together in quest of that accomplished gentleman nicholas firmly persuading himself that he had done his relatives great injustice in disliking him at first sight and mrs nickleby being at some pains to inform her daughter that she was sure he was a much more kindly disposed person than he seemed which miss nickleby dutifully remarked that he might very easily be to tell the truth the good lady's opinion had not been a little influenced by her brother-in-law's appeal to her better understanding and his implied compliment to her high deserts and although she had dearly loved her husband and still doted on her children he had struck so successfully on one of those little jarring chords in the human heart ralph was well acquainted with its worst weaknesses though he knew nothing of its best that she had already begun to seriously consider herself the amiable and suffering victim of her late husband's imprudence End of chapter three Chapter Four of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four Nicholas and his uncle, to secure the fortune without loss of time, wait upon Mr. Wackford Squeers, the Yorkshire schoolmaster. Snow Hill what kind of place can the quiet townspeople who see the words emblazoned in all the legibility of gilt letters and dark shading on the north country coaches take snow hill to be all people have some undefined and shadowy notion of a place whose name is frequently before their eyes or often in their ears what a vast number of random ideas there must be perpetually floating about regarding this same snow hill the name is such a good one snow hill snow hill too coupled with the saracen's head picturing to us by a double association of ideas something stern and rugged a bleak desolate tract of country open to piercing blasts and fierce wintry storms 
a dark cold gloomy heath lonely by day and scarcely to be thought of by honest folks at night a place which solitary wayfarers shun and where desperate robbers congregate this or something like this should be the prevalent notion of snow hill in those remote and rustic parts through which the saracen's head like some grim apparition rushes each day and night with mysterious and ghost-like punctuality holding its swift and headlong course in all weathers and seeming to bid defiance to the very elements themselves the reality is rather different but by no means to be despised notwithstanding there at the very core of london in the heart of its business and animation in the midst of a whirl of noise and motion stemming as it were the giant currents of life that flow ceaselessly on from different quarters and meet beneath its walls stands newgate and in that crowded street on which it frowns so darkly within a few feet of the squalid tottering houses upon the very spot on which the vendors of soup and fish and damaged fruit are now plying their trades scores of human beings amidst a roar of sounds to which even the tumult of a great city is as nothing four six or eight strong men at a time have been hurried violently and swiftly from the world when the scene has been rendered frightful with excess of human life when curious eyes have glared from casement and housetop and wall and pillar and when in the mass of white and upturned faces the dying wretch in his all comprehensive look of agony has met not one not one that bore the impress of pity or compassion near to the jail and by consequence near to smithfield also and the compter and the bustle and noise of the city and just on that particular part of snow hill where omnibus horses going eastward seriously think of falling down on purpose and where horses in hackney cabriolets going westward not unfrequently fall by accident is the coachyard of the saracen's head inn its portal guarded by two saracen's heads and shoulders which it was once the pride and glory of the choice spirits of this metropolis to pull down at night but which have for some time remained in an undisturbed tranquillity possibly because this species of humour is now confined to st james parish where door knockers are preferred as being more portable and bell wires esteemed as convenient toothpicks whether this be the reason or not there they are frowning upon you from each side of the gateway the inn itself garnished with another saracen's head frowns upon you from the top of the yard while from the door of the hind boot of all the red coaches that are standing therein there glares a small saracen's head with a twin expression to the large saracen's heads below so that the general appearance of the pile is decidedly of the saracenic order when you walk up this yard you will see the booking office on your left and the tower of st sepulchre's church darting abruptly up into the sky on your right and a gallery of bedrooms on both sides just before you you will observe a long window with the words coffee room legibly painted above it and looking out of that window you would have seen in addition if you had gone at the right time mr wackford squeers with his hands in his pockets mr squeers appearance was not prepossessing he had but one eye and the popular prejudice runs in favour of two the eye he had was unquestionably useful but decidedly not ornamental being of a greenish grey and in shape resembling the fanlight of a street door the blank side of his face was much wrinkled and puckered up which gave him a very sinister appearance especially when he smiled at which times his expression bordered closely on the villainous his hair was very flat and shiny save at the ends where it was brushed stiffly up from a low protruding forehead which assorted well with his harsh voice and coarse manner he was about two or three and fifty and a trifle below the middle size he wore a white neckerchief with long ends and a suit of scholastic black but his coat sleeves being a great deal too long and his trousers a great deal too short he appeared ill at ease in his clothes as if he were in a perpetual state of astonishment at finding himself so respectable mr squeers was standing in a box by one of the coffee-room fireplaces fitted with one such table as is usually seen in coffee-rooms and two of extraordinary shapes and dimensions made to suit the angles of the partition in a corner of the seat was a very small deal trunk tied round with a scanty piece of cord 
and on the trunk was perched his lace-up half-boots and corduroy trousers dangling in the air a diminutive boy with his shoulders drawn up to his ears and his hands planted on his knees who glanced timidly at the schoolmaster from time to time with evident dread and apprehension half past three muttered mr squeers turning from the window and looking sulkily at the coffee-room clock there'll be nobody here to-day much vexed by this reflection mr squeers looked at the little boy to see whether he was doing anything he could beat him for as he happened not to be doing anything at all he merely boxed his ears and told him not to do it again at midsummer muttered mr squeers resuming his complaint i took down ten boys ten twenties is two hundred pound i'll go back at eight o'clock to-morrow morning and have got only three three orts is an ought three twos is six sixty pound what's come of all the boys what's parents got in their heads what does it all mean here the little boy on the top of the trunk gave a violent sneeze halloa sir growled the schoolmaster turning round what is that sir nothing please sir replied the little boy nothing sir exclaimed mr squeers please sir i sneeze rejoined the little boy trembling till the little trunk shook under him oh sneeze did you retorted mr squeers then what did you say nothing for sir in default of a better answer to this question the little boy screwed a couple of knuckles into each of his eyes and began to cry wherefore mr squeers knocked him off the trunk with a blow on one side of the face and knocked him on again with a blow on the other wait till i get you down into yorkshire my young gentleman said mr squeers and then i'll give you the rest will you hold that noise sir yes sobbed the little boy rubbing his face very hard with a beggar's petition in printed calico then do so at once sir said squeers do you hear as this admonition was accompanied with a threatening gesture and uttered with a savage aspect the little boy rubbed his face harder as if to keep the tears back and beyond alternately sniffing and choking gave no further vent to his emotions mr squeers said the waiter looking in at this juncture is a gentleman asking for you at the bar show the gentleman in richard replied mr squeers in a soft voice put your handkerchief in your pocket you little scoundrel or i'll murder you when the gentleman goes the schoolmaster had scarcely uttered these words in a fierce whisper when the stranger entered affecting not to see him mr squeers feigned to be intent upon mending a pen and offering benevolent advice to his youthful pupil my dear child said mr squeers all people have their trials this early trial of yours that is fit to make your little heart burst and your very eyes come out of your head with crying what is it nothing less than nothing you're leaving your friends but you will have a father in me my dear and a mother in mrs squeers at the delightful village of Dotheboys, near Greta Bridge in Yorkshire, where youth are boarded, clothed, booked, washed, furnished with pocket money, provided with all necessaries. It is the gentleman, observed the stranger, stopping the schoolmaster in the rehearsal of his advertisement. Mr. Squeers, I believe, sir. The same, sir, said Mr. Squeers with an assumption of extreme surprise. The gentleman, said the stranger, that advertised in the Times newspaper, morning post chronicle herald and advertiser regarding the academy called dotheboys hall at the delightful village of dotheboys near greta bridge in yorkshire added mr squeers you come on business sir i see by my young friends how do you do my little gentleman and how do you do sir with this salutation mr squeers patted the heads of two hollow-eyed small-boned little boys whom the applicant had brought with him and waited for further communications i am in the oil and colour way my name is snawley sir said the stranger squeers inclined his head as much as to say in a remarkably pretty name too the stranger continued i have been thinking mr squeers of placing my two boys at your school it's not for me to say so sir replied mr squeers but i don't think you could possibly do a better thing hmm said the other twenty pounds per annum i believe mr squeers guineas rejoined the schoolmaster with a persuasive smile pounds for two i think mr squeers said snawley solemnly oh, i don't think it could be done sir replied squeers as if he had never considered the proposition before let me see four fives is twenty double that and deduct the well a pound either way we shall not stand betwixt us 
you must recommend me to your connection sir and make it up that way they are not great eaters said mr snawley oh that doesn't matter at all replied squeers we don't consider the boys appetites at our establishment this was strictly true they did not every wholesome luxury sir that yorkshire can afford continued squeers every beautiful moral that mrs squeers can instil in short every comfort of a home that a boy could wish for will be theirs mr snawley i should wish their morals to be particularly attended to said mr snawley i'm glad of that sir replied the schoolmaster drawing himself up they have come to the right shop for morals sir you are a moral man yourself said mr snawley i rather believe i am sir replied squeers i have the satisfaction to know you are sir said mr snawley i asked one of your references and he said you were pious well sir i hope i am a little in that line replied squeers i hope i am also rejoined the other could i say a few words with you in the next box by all means rejoined squeers with a grin my dears will you speak to your new player fellow a minute or two that is one of my boys sir belling is his name a taunton boy that sir is he indeed rejoined mr snawley looking at the poor little urchin as if he were some extraordinary natural curiosity he goes down with me to-morrow sir said squeers that's his luggage he's a-sitting upon now each boy is required to bring sir two suits of clothes six shirts six pair of stockings two nightcaps two pocket handkerchiefs two pair of shoes two hats and a razor a razor exclaimed mr snawley as they walked into the next box what for to shave with replied squeers in a slow and measured tone there was not much in these three words but there must have been something in the manner in which they were said to attract the attention for the schoolmaster and his companion looked steadily at each other for a few seconds and then exchanged a very meaning smile snawley was a sleek flat-nosed man clad in sombre garments and long black gaiters bearing in his countenance an expression of much mortification and sanctity so his smiling without any obvious reason was the more remarkable up to what age do you keep boys at your school then he asked at length just as long as their friends make the quarterly payment to my agent in town or till such times as they run away replied squeers let us understand each other i see we may safely do so what are these boys natural children no rejoined snawley meeting the gaze of the schoolmaster's one eye they ain't i thought there might be said squeers coolly we have a good many of them that boy's one him in the next box said snawley squeers nodded in the affirmative his companion took another peep at the little boy on the trunk but turning round again looked as if he were quite disappointed to see him so much like other boys and said he should have hardly have thought it he is cried squeers but about those boys of yours you wanted to speak to me yes replied snawley the fact is i am not their father mr squeers i am only their father-in-law oh that's it is it said the schoolmaster that explains it at once i was wondering what the devil you were doing to send them to yorkshire for ah oh i understand now you see i have married the mother pursued snawley it's expensive keeping boys at home and as she has a little money in her own right i am afraid women are so very foolish mr squeers that she might be led to squander it on them which would be their ruin you know ah see returned squeers throwing himself back in his chair and waving his hand and this resumed snawley has made me anxious to put them to some school a good distance off where there are no holidays none of those ill-judged coming home twice a year that unsettle children's minds so and where they may rough it a little you comprehend the payment's regular and no questions asked said squeers nodding his head that's it exactly rejoined the other moral strictly attended to though strictly said squeers not too much writing home aloud i suppose said the father-in-law hesitating none except a circular at christmas to say they never were so happy and hope they may never be sent for rejoined squeers nothing could be better said the father-in-law rubbing his hands then as we understand each other said squeers will you allow me to ask you whether you consider me a highly virtuous exemplary and well-conducted man in private life and whether as a person whose business it is to take charge of youth you place the strongest confidence in my unimpeachable integrity liberality religious principles and ability certainly i do replied the father-in-law reciprocating the schoolmaster's grin 
perhaps you won't object to say that if i make you a reference not the least in the world that's your sort said squeers taking up a pen this is doing business and that's what i like having entered mr snawley's address the schoolmaster had next to perform the still more agreeable office of entering the receipt of the first quarter's payment in advance which he had scarcely completed when another voice was heard inquiring for mr squeers here he is replied the schoolmaster what is it only a matter of business sir said ralph nickleby presenting himself closely followed by nicholas there was an advertisement of yours in the papers this morning there was sir this way if you please said squeers who had by this time got back to the box by the fireplace won't you be seated why i think i will replied ralph suiting the action to the word and placing his hat on the table before him this is my nephew sir mr nicholas nickleby how do you do sir said squeers nicholas bowed and said he was very well and seemed very much astonished at the outward appearance of the proprietor of dotheboys hall as indeed he was perhaps you recollect me said ralph looking narrowly at the schoolmaster you paid me a small account at each of my half yearly visits to town for some years i think sir replied squeers i did rejoined ralph for the parents of a boy named dorker who unfortunately unfortunately died at dotheboys hall said ralph finishing the sentence i remember very well sir rejoined squeers ah uh, mrs squeers sir was as partial to that lad as if he'd been her own the attention sir that was bestowed upon that boy in his illness dry toast and warm tea offered him every night and morning when he couldn't swallow anything a candle in his bedroom on the very night he died the best dictionary sent up for him to lay his head upon i don't regret it though it's a pleasant thing to reflect that one did one's duty by him ralph smiled as if he meant anything but smiling and looked around at the strangers present these are only some pupils of mine said wackford squeers pointing to the little boy on the trunk and the two little boys on the floor who had been staring at each other without uttering a word and writhing their bodies into most remarkable contortions according to the custom of little boys when they first become acquainted this gentleman sir is a parent who is kind enough to compliment me upon the course of education adopted at dotheboys hall which is situated sir at the delightful village of dotheboys near greta bridge in yorkshire where youth are boarded clothed booked washed furnished with pocket money yes we know all about that sir interrupted ralph testily it's in the advertisement you're very right sir it is in the advertisement replied squeers and in the matter of fact besides interrupted mr snawley i feel bound to assure you sir that i am proud to have this opportunity of assuring you that i consider mr squeers a gentleman highly virtuous exemplary well conducted and i make no doubt of it sir interrupted ralph checking the torrent of recommendation no doubt of it at all suppose we come to business with all my heart sir rejoined squeers never postpone business is the very first lesson we instil into our commercial pupils master belling my dear always remember that do you hear yes sir repeated master belling he recollects what it is does he said ralph tell the gentleman said squeers never repeated master belling very good said squeers go on never repeated master bellingham again very good indeed said squeers yes p suggested nicholas good-naturedly perform business said master belling never perform business very well sir said squeers darting a withering look at the culprit you and i will perform a little business on our private account by and by and just now said ralph we had better transact our own perhaps if you please said squeers well resumed ralph it's brief enough soon broached and i hope easily concluded you have advertised for an able assistant sir precisely so said squeers and you really want one certainly answered squeers here he is said ralph my nephew nicholas hot from school with everything he learnt there fermenting in his head and nothing fermenting in his pocket it's just the man you want i'm afraid said squeers perplexed with such an application from a youth of nicholas's figure i'm afraid the young man won't suit me yes he will said ralph i know better don't be cast down sir you will be teaching all the young noblemen in dotheboys hall in less than a week's time unless this gentleman is more obstinate than i take him to be 
i fear sir said nicholas addressing mr squeers that you object to my youth and to my not being a master of arts the absence of a college degree is an objection replied squeers looking as grave as he could and considerably puzzled no less by the contrast between the simplicity of the nephew and the worldly manner of the uncle than by the incomprehensible allusion to the young nobleman under his tuition look here sir said ralph i'll put this matter in its true light in two seconds if you'll have the goodness rejoined squeers this is a boy or a youth or a lad or a young man or a hobbledehoy or whatever you like to call him of eighteen or nineteen or thereabouts said ralph that i see observed the schoolmaster so do i said mr snawley thinking it as well to back his new friend occasionally his father is dead he is wholly ignorant of the world he has no resources whatever and wants something to do said ralph i recommend him to this splendid establishment of yours as an opening which will lead him to fortune if he turns it to proper account do you see that everybody must see that replied squeers half imitating the sneer with which the old gentleman was regarding his unconscious relative i do of course said nicholas eagerly he does of course you observe said ralph in the same dry hard manner if any caprice of temper should induce him to cast aside this golden opportunity before he has brought it to perfection i consider myself absolved from extending any assistance to his mother and sister look at him and think of the use he may be to you in half a dozen ways now the question is whether for some time to come at all events he won't serve your purpose better than twenty of the kind of people you would get under ordinary circumstances isn't that a question for consideration yes it is said squeers answering a nod of ralph's head with a nod of his own good rejoined ralph let me have two words with you the two words were had apart in a couple of minutes mr wackford squeers announced that mr nicholas nickleby was from that moment thoroughly nominated to and installed in the office of first assistant master at dotheboys hall your uncle's recommendation has done it mr nickleby said wackford squeers nicholas overjoyed at his success shook his uncle's hand warmly and could almost have worshipped squeers upon the spot he is an odd-looking man thought nicholas what of that porson was an odd-looking man and so was dr johnson all these bookworms are at eight o'clock to-morrow morning mr nickleby said squeers the coach starts you must be here a quarter before as we take these boys with us certainly sir said nicholas and your fare down i have paid growled ralph so you'll have nothing to do but keep yourself warm here was another instance of his uncle's generosity nicholas felt his unexpected kindness so much that he could scarcely find words to thank him indeed he had not found half enough when they took leave of the schoolmaster and emerged from the saracen's head gateway i shall be here in the morning to see you fairly off said ralph no skulking thank you sir replied nicholas i shall never forget this kindness take care you don't replied his uncle you had better go home now and pack up what you have got to pack do you think you could find your way to golden square first certainly said nicholas i could easily inquire leave these papers with my clerk then said ralph producing a small parcel and tell him to wait till i come home nicholas cheerfully undertook the errand and bidding his worthy uncle an affectionate farewell which that warm-hearted old gentleman acknowledged by a growl hastened away to execute his commission he found golden square in due course mr noggs who had stepped out for a minute or so to the public-house was opening the door with a latch-key as he reached the steps what's that inquired noggs pointing to the parcel papers from my uncle replied nicholas and you're to have the goodness to wait till he comes home if you please uncle cried noggs mr nickleby said nicholas in explanation come in said newman without another word he led nicholas into the passage and thence into the official pantry at the end of it where he thrust him into a chair and mounting upon his high stool sat with his arms hanging straight down by his sides gazing fixedly upon him as from a tower of observation there is no answer said nicholas laying the parcel on a table beside him newman said nothing but folding his arms and thrusting his head forward so as to obtain the nearer view of nicholas's face scanned his features closely no answer said nicholas speaking very loud under the impression that newman noggs was deaf newman placed his hands upon his knees and without uttering a syllable 
continued the same close scrutiny of his companion's face this was such a very singular proceeding on the part of an utter stranger and his appearance was so extremely peculiar that nicholas who had a sufficiently keen sense of the ridiculous could not refrain from breaking into a smile as he inquired whether mr noggs had any commands for him noggs shook his head and sighed upon which nicholas rose and remarking that he required no rest bade him good morning it was a great exertion for newman noggs and nobody knows to this day how he ever came to make it the other party being wholly unknown to him but he drew a long breath and actually said out loud without once stopping that if the young gentleman did not object to tell he should like to know what his uncle was going to do for him nicholas had not the least objection in the world but on the contrary was rather pleased to have an opportunity of talking on the subject which occupied his thoughts so he sat down again and his sanguine imagination warming as he spoke entered into a fervent and glowing description of all the honours and advantages to be derived from his appointment that seat of learning dotheboys hall what's the matter are you ill said nicholas suddenly breaking off as his companion after throwing himself into a variety of uncouth attitudes thrust his hand under the stool and cracked his finger joints as if he were snapping all the bones in his hands newman noggs made no reply but went on shrugging his shoulders and cracking his finger joints smiling horribly all the time and looking steadfastly at nothing out of the tops of his eyes in a most ghastly manner at first nicholas thought the mysterious man was in a fit but on further consideration decided that he was in liquor under which circumstances he deemed it prudent to make off at once he looked back when he had got the street door open newman noggs was still indulging in the same extraordinary gestures and the cracking of his fingers sounded louder than ever End of chapter four chapter five of the life and adventures of nicholas nickleby by charles dickens this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five nicholas starts for yorkshire of his leave-taking and his fellow-travellers and what befell them on the road if tears dropped into a trunk were charms to preserve its owner from sorrow and misfortune nicholas nickleby would have commenced his expedition under most happy auspices there was so much to be done and so little time to do it in so many kind words to be spoken and such bitter pain in the hearts in which they rose to impede their utterance that the little preparations for his journey were made mournfully indeed a hundred things which the anxious care of his mother and sister deemed indispensable for his comfort nicholas insisted on leaving behind as they might prove of some after use or might be convertible into money if occasion required a hundred affectionate contests on such points as these took place on the sad night which preceded his departure and as the termination of every angerless dispute brought them nearer and nearer to the close of their slight preparations kate grew busier and busier and wept more silently the box was packed at last and then there came supper with some little delicacy provided for the occasion and as a set-off against the expense of which kate and her mother had feigned to dine when nicholas was out the poor lad nearly choked himself by attempting to partake of it and almost suffocated himself in affecting a jest or two and forcing a melancholy laugh thus they lingered on till the hour of separating for the night was long past and then they found that they might as well have given vent to their real feelings before for they could not suppress them do what they would so they let them have their way and even that was a relief nicholas slept well till six next morning dreamed of home or what was home once no matter which for things that are changed or gone will come back as they used to be thank god in sleep and rose quite brisk and gay he wrote a few lines in pencil to say the good-bye which he was afraid to pronounce himself and laying there with his scanty stock of money at his sister's door shouldered his box and crept softly downstairs is that you hannah cried a voice from miss la creevy's sitting-room whence shone the light of a feeble candle it is i miss la creevy said nicholas putting down the box and looking in 
bless us exclaimed miss la creevy starting and putting her hand to her curl papers you are up very early mr nickleby so are you replied nicholas it's the fine arts that bring me out of bed mr nickleby returned the lady i am waiting for the light to carry out an idea miss la creevy had got up early to put a fancy nose into a miniature of an ugly little boy destined for his grandmother in the country who was expected to bequeath him property if he was like the family to carry out an idea repeated miss la creevy and that's the great convenience of living in a thoroughfare like the strand when i want a nose or an eye for any particular sitter i have only to look out of the window and wait till i get one does it take long to get a nose now inquired nicholas smiling why that depends in a great measure on the pattern replied miss la creevy snubs and romans are plentiful enough and there are flats of all sorts and sizes when there's a meeting at exeter hall but perfect aquilines i am sorry to say are scarce and we generally use them for uniforms or public characters indeed said nicholas if i should meet with any in my travels i'll endeavour to sketch them for you you don't mean to say that you're really going all the way down into yorkshire this cold winter's weather mr nickleby said miss la creevy i heard something of it last night i do indeed replied nicholas needs must you know when somebody drives necessity is my driver and that is only another name for the same gentleman well i'm very sorry for it that's all i can say said miss la creevy as much on your mother's and sister's account as on yours your sister is a very pretty young lady mr nickleby and that is an additional reason why she should have somebody to protect her i persuaded her to give me a sitting or two for the street door case ah oh, she'll make a sweet miniature as miss la creevy spoke she held up an ivory countenance intersected with very perceptible sky-blue veins and regarded it with so much complacency that nicholas quite envied her if you ever have an opportunity of showing kate some little kindness said nicholas presenting his hand i think you will depend upon that said the good-natured miniature painter and god bless you mr nickleby and i wish you well it was very little that nicholas knew of the world but he guessed enough about its ways to think that if he gave miss la creevy one little kiss perhaps she might not be the less kindly disposed towards those he was leaving behind so he gave her three or four with a kind of jocose gallantry and miss la creevy evinced no greater symptoms of displeasure than declaring that as she adjusted her yellow turban that she had never heard of such a thing and couldn't have believed it possible having terminated the unexpected interview in this satisfactory manner nicholas hastily withdrew himself from the house by the time he had found a man to carry his box it was only seven o'clock so he walked slowly on a little in advance of the porter and very probably with not half as light a heart in his breast as the man had although he had no waistcoat to cover it with and had evidently from the appearance of his other garments been spending the night in a stable and taking his breakfast at a pump regarding with no small curiosity and interest all the busy preparations for the coming day which every street and almost every house displayed and thinking now and then that it seemed rather hard that so many people of all ranks and stations could earn a livelihood in london that he should be compelled to journey so far in search of one nicholas speedily arrived at the saracen's head snow hill having dismissed his attendant and seen the box safely deposited in the coach office he looked into the coffee-room in search of mr squeers he found that learned gentleman sitting at breakfast with the three little boys before noticed and two others who had turned up by some lucky chance since the interview of the previous day ranged in a row on the opposite seat mr squeers had before him a small measure of coffee a plate of hot toast and a cold round of beef but he was that moment intent on preparing breakfast for the little boys this is two pennyworth of milk is it waiter said mr squeers looking down into a large blue mug and slanting it gently so as to get an accurate view of the quantity of liquid contained in it that's two pennyworth sir replied the waiter what a rare article milk is to be sure in london said mr squeers with a sigh just fill that mug up with lukewarm water william will you to the wherry top sir inquired the waiter why the milk will be drownded never you mind that replied mr squeers serve it right for being so dear you ordered that thick bread and butter for three did you coming directly sir you needn't hurry yourself said squeers there's plenty of time conquer your passions boys and don't be so eager after victuals 
As he uttered this moral precept, Mr. Squeers took a large bite out of the cold beef and recognised Nicholas. "'Sit down, Mr. Nickleby,' said Squeers. "'Here we are, a breakfasting, you see.' Nicholas did not see that anybody was breakfasting except Mr. Squeers, but he bowed with all becoming reverence and looked as cheerful as he could. "'Oh, that's the milk and water, is it, William?' said Squeers. "'Very good. Don't forget the bread and butter presently.' At this fresh mention of the bread and butter, the five little boys looked very eager and followed the waiter out with their eyes. Meanwhile, Mr. Squeers tasted the milk and water. "'Ah,' said that gentleman, smacking his lips, "'here's richness. Think of the many beggars and orphans in the street that would be glad of this, little boys. A shocking thing, hunger, isn't it, Mr. Nickleby?' "'Very shocking, sir,' said Nicholas. "'When I say number one,' pursued Mr. Squeers, putting the mug before the children, the boy on the left hand nearest the window may take a drink, and when I say number two, the boy next to him will go in, and so till we come to number five, which is the last boy. Are you ready? Yes, sir, cried all the little boys with great eagerness. That's right, said Squeers, calmly getting on with his breakfast. Keep ready till I tell you to begin. Subdue your appetites, my dears, and you've conquered human nature. This is the way we inculcate strength of mind, Mr. Nickleby said the schoolmaster, turning to Nicholas, and speaking with his mouth very full of beef and toast. Nicholas murmured something, he knew not what, in reply, and the little boys, dividing their gaze between the mug, the bread and butter, which had by this time arrived, and every morsel which Mr. Squeers took into his mouth, remained with strained eyes in torments of expectation. "'Thank God for a good breakfast,' said Squeers, when he had finished. "'Number one may take a drink.' Number one seized the mug ravenously, and had just drunk enough to make him wish for more, when Mr. Squeers gave the signal for number two, who gave up at the same interesting moment to number three, and the process was repeated until the milk and water terminated with number five. And now, said the schoolmaster, dividing the bread and butter for three into as many portions as there were children, you had better look sharp with your breakfast, for the horn will blow in a minute or two, and then every boy leaves off. Permission being thus given to fall to, the boys began to eat voraciously, and in desperate haste, while the schoolmaster, who was in high good humour after his meal, picked his teeth with a fork and looked smilingly on. In a very short time the horn was heard. "'I thought it wouldn't be long,' said Squeers, jumping up and producing a little basket from under the seat. "'Put what you haven't had time to eat in here, boys. You'll want it on the road.' Nicholas was considerably startled by these very economical arrangements, but he had no time to reflect upon them, for the little boys had to be got up to the top of the coach, and their boxes had to be brought out and put in, and Mr. Squeer's luggage was to be seen carefully deposited in the boot, and all these offices were in his department. He was in the full heat and bustle of concluding these operations when his uncle, Mr. Ralph Nickleby, accosted him. "'Oh, here you are, sir,' said Ralph. "'Here are your mother and sister, sir.' "'Where?' cried Nicholas, looking hastily round. "'Here,' replied his uncle. "'Having too much money and nothing at all to do with it, "'they were paying a hackney coach as I came up, sir. "'We were afraid of being too late to see him before he went away from us,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'embracing her son, heedless of the unconcerned lookers-on in the coachyard. "'Very good, ma'am,' returned Ralph. "'You're the best judge, of course. "'I merely said that you were paying a hackney coach. "'I never pay a hackney coach, ma'am. "'I never hire one. "'I haven't been in a hackney coach of my own hiring for thirty years, "'and I hope I shan't be for thirty more if I live as long. "'I should never have forgiven myself if I had not seen him,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'Poor dear boy, going away without his breakfast, too, "'because he feared to distress us.' "'Mighty fine, certainly,' said Ralph, with great testiness. "'When I first went into business, ma'am, I took a penny loaf and a halfpenny worth of milk for my breakfast as I walked to the city every morning. What do you say to that, man? Breakfast? Bah!' "'Now, Nickleby,' said Squeers, coming up at that moment, buttoning his greatcoat, "'I think you'd better get up behind. I'm afraid of one of them boys falling off, and then there's twenty pound a year gone.' "'Dear Nicholas,' whispered Kate, touching her brother's arm, who is that vulgar man? Eh? growled Ralph, whose quick ears had caught the inquiry. Do you wish to be introduced to Mr. Squeers, my dear? That the schoolmaster? No, uncle. Oh, no, replied Kate, shrinking back. 
i'm sure i heard you say as much my dear retorted ralph in his cold sarcastic manner mr squeers here is my niece nicholas's sister very glad to make your acquaintance miss said squeers raising his hat an inch or two i wish mrs squeers took gals and we had you for a teacher i don't know though whether she might not grow jealous if we had ha <laughs> ha if the proprietor of dotheboys hall could have known what was passing in his assistant's breast at that moment he would have discovered with some surprise that he was as near as being soundly pummelled as he had ever been in his life kate nickleby having a quicker perception of her brother's emotions led him gently aside and thus prevented mr squeers from being impressed with the fact in a peculiarly disagreeable manner my dear nicholas said the young lady who is this man what kind of place can it be that you are going to i hardly know kate replied nicholas pressing his sister's hand i suppose the yorkshire folks are rather rough and uncultivated that's all but this person urged kate is my employer or master or whatever the proper name may be replied nicholas quickly and i was an ass to take his course and ill they are looking this way and it is time i was in my place bless you love and good-bye mother look forward to our meeting again some day uncle farewell thank you heartily for all you have done and all you mean to do quite ready sir with his hasty adieu nicholas mounted nimbly into his seat and waved his hand gallantly as if his heart went with it at this moment when the coachman and guard were comparing notes for the last time before starting on the subject of the way bill when porters were screwing out the last reluctant sixpences itinerant newsmen making the last offer of a morning paper and the horses giving the last impatient rattle to their harnesses nicholas felt somebody pulling softly at his leg he looked down and there stood newman noggs who pushed up into his hand a dirty letter what's this inquired nicholas hush rejoined noggs pointing to mr ralph nickleby who was saying a few earnest words to squeers a short distance off take it read it nobody knows that's all stop cried nicholas no replied noggs nicholas cried stop again but newman noggs was gone a minute's bustle a banging of the coach doors a swaying of the vehicle to one side as the heavy coachman and still heavier guard climbed into their seats a cry of all right a few notes from the horn a hasty glance of two sorrowful faces below and the hard features of mr ralph nickleby and the coach was gone too and rattling over the stones of smithfield little boy's legs being too short to admit of their feet resting upon anything as they sat and the little boy's bodies being consequently in imminent hazard of being jerked off the coach nicholas had enough to do over the stones to hold them on between the manual exertion and the mental anxiety attendant upon this task he was not a little relieved when the coach stopped at the peacock at islington he was still more relieved when a hearty-looking gentleman with a very good-humoured face and a very fresh colour got up behind and proposed to take the other corner seat if we put some of these youngsters in the middle said the newcomer they'll be safer in case of their going to sleep eh if you'll have the goodness sir replied squeers that'll be the very thing mr nickleby take three of them boys between you and the gentleman belling and the youngest snawley can sit between me and the guard three children said squeers explaining to the stranger books as two i have not the least objection i am sure said the fresh-coloured gentleman i have a brother who wouldn't object to book his six children as two at any butchers or bakers in the kingdom i dare say far from it six children sir exclaimed squeers yes and all boys replied the stranger mr nickleby said squeers in great haste catch hold of that basket let me give you a card sir of an establishment where those six boys can be brought up in an enlightened liberal and moral manner with no mistake at all about it for twenty guineas a year twenty guineas sir i take all the boys together upon an average right through say a hundred pound a year for the lot oh said the gentleman glancing at the card you are the mr squeers mentioned here i presume yes i am sir replied the worthy pedagogue mr wackford squeers is my name and i'm very far from being ashamed of it these are some of my boys sir that's one of my assistants sir mr nickleby a gentleman's son and a good scholar mathematical classical and commercial we don't do things by halves at our shop all manner of learning my boys take down sir the expense is never thought of 
and they get paternal treatment and washing in upon my word said the gentleman glancing at nicholas with a half smile and a more than half expression of surprise these are advantages indeed you may say that sir rejoined squeers thrusting his hand into his greatcoat pockets the most unexceptionable references are given and required i wouldn't take a reference with any boy that wasn't responsible for the payment of five pound five a quarter no not if you went down on your knees and asked me with the tears running down your face to do it highly considerate said the passenger it's my great aim and end to be considerate sir rejoined squeers snawley junior if you don't leave off chattering your teeth and shaking with cold i'll warm you with a severe thrashing in about half a minute's time sit fast here gentlemen said the guard as he clambered up all right behind there dick cried the coachman all right was the reply off she goes and off she did go if coaches be feminine amidst a loud flourish from the guard's horn and the calm approval of all the judges of coaches and coach horses congregated at the peacock but more especially of the helpers who stood with the cloths over their arms watching the coach till it disappeared and then lounged admiringly stablewards bestowing various gruff encomiums on the beauty of the turnout when the guard who was a stout old yorkshireman had blown himself quite out of breath he put the horn into a little tunnel of a basket fastened to the coach side for the purpose and giving himself a plentiful shower of blows on the chest and shoulders observed that it was uncommon cold after which he demanded of every person separately whether he was going right through and if not where he was going satisfactory replies being made to these queries he surmised that the roads were pretty heavy after that fall last night and took the liberty of asking whether any of them gentlemen carried a snuff-box it happening that nobody did he remarked with a mysterious air that he had heard a medical gentleman as went down to grantham last week say how that snuff-taking was bad for the eyes but for his part he had never found it so and what he said was that everybody should speak as they found nobody attempting to controvert this position he took a small brown paper parcel out of his hat and putting on a pair of horn spectacles the writing being crabbed read the direction a half a dozen times over having done which he consigned the parcel to its old place put up his spectacles again and stared at everybody in turn after this he took another blow at the horn by the way of a refreshment and having now exhausted his usual topics of conversation folded his arms as well as he could in so many coats and falling into a solemn silence looked carelessly at the familiar objects which met his eye on every side as the coach rolled on the only things he seemed to care for being horses and droves of cattle which he scrutinized with a critical air as they were passed upon the road the weather was intensely and bitterly cold a great deal of snow fell from time to time and the wind was intolerably keen mr squeers got down at almost every stage to stretch his legs as he said and as he always came back from such excursions with a very red nose and composed himself to sleep directly there is reason to suppose that he derived a great benefit from the process the little pupils having been stimulated with the remains of their breakfast and further invigorated by sundry small cups of a curious cordial carried by mr squeers which tasted very like toast and water put into a brandy bottle by mistake went to sleep woke shivered and cried as their feelings prompted nicholas and the good-tempered man found so many things to talk about that between conversing together and cheering up the boys the time passed for them as rapidly as it could under such adverse circumstances so the day wore on at eton slocum there was a good coach dinner of which the box the four front outsides and the one inside nicholas the good-tempered man and mr squeers partook while the five little boys were put up to thaw by the fire and regaled with sandwiches a stage or two further on the lamps were lighted and a great to-do occasioned by the taking up at a roadside inn of a very fastidious lady with an infinite variety of cloaks and small parcels who loudly lamented for the behoof of the outsides the non arrival of her own carriage which was to have taken her on and made the guard solemnly promise to stop every green chariot he saw coming which as it was a dark night and he was sitting with his face the other way that officer undertook with many fervent asseverations to do lastly the fastidious lady 
finding there was a solitary gentleman inside, had a small lamp lighted which she carried in a reticule, and being after much trouble shut in, the horses were put into a brisk canter, and the coach was once more in rapid motion. The night and the snow came on together, and dismal enough they were. There was no sound to be heard, but the howling of the wind, for the noise of the wheels and the tread of the horses' feet were rendered inaudible by the thick coating of snow which covered the ground, and was fast increasing every moment. The streets of Stamford were deserted as they passed through the town, and its churches rose, frowning and dark, from the whitened ground. Twenty miles further on, two of the front outside passengers, wisely availing themselves of their arrival at one of the best inns in England, turned in for the night at the George at Grantham. The remainder wrapped themselves more closely in their coats and cloaks, and leaving the light and warmth of the town behind them, pillowed themselves against the luggage, and prepared, with many half-suppressed moans, again to encounter the piercing blast which swept across the open country. They were little more than a stage out of Grantham, or about halfway between it and Newark, when Nicholas, who had been asleep for a short time, was suddenly roused by a violent jerk which nearly threw him from his seat. Grasping the rail, he found that the coach had sunk greatly on one side, though it was still dragged forward by the horses, and while, confused by their plunging and the loud screams of the lady inside, he hesitated for an instant whether to jump off or not, the vehicle turned easily over and relieved him from all further uncertainty by flinging him into the road. End of chapter 5Chapter Six of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six, in which the occurrence of the accident mentioned in the last chapter affords an opportunity to a couple of gentlemen to tell stories against each other. Whoa! cried the guard on his legs in a minute and running to the leader's heads. Is there any gentleman there as can lend a hand, dear? Keep quiet, dang ye. Whoa! What's the matter? demanded Nicholas, looking sleepily up. Matter, man. Matter enough for one night, replied the guard. Dang the wall I'll bear. He's gone mad with glory, I think, cause the coach is over. Damn it, I'd have done it if all my bones weren't broken. Here, cried Nicholas, staggering to his feet. I'm ready. I'm only a little abroad, that's all. Hold em tight, cried the guard, while I cut traces. Hang on to them somehow. Well done, my lad. That's it. Let em go now. Dang em, they'll gang home fast enough. In truth, the animals were no sooner released than they trotted back, with much deliberation, to the stable they had just left, which was distant not a mile behind. Can you blow a horn? asked the guard, disengaging one of the coach lamps. I dare say I can, replied Nicholas. Then just blow away into that and that lies on ground, fit to waken the dead, will he? said the man, while well, I stop some of this here squealing inside. Come in, come in, don't make that noise, woman. As the man spoke, he proceeded to wrench open the uppermost door of the coach, while Nicholas, seizing the horn, awoke the echoes far and wide with one of the most extraordinary performances on that instrument ever heard by mortal ears. It had its effect, however, not only in rousing such of their fall, but in summoning assistance to their relief for lights gleamed in the distance, and people were already astir. In fact, a man on horseback galloped down before the passengers were well collected together, and a careful investigation being instituted, it appeared that the lady inside had broken her lamp, and the gentleman his head, that the two front outsides had escaped with black eyes, the box with a bloody nose, the coachman with a contusion on the temple, Mr. Squeers with a portmanteau bruise on his back, and the remaining passengers without any injury at all, thanks to the softness of the snowdrift in which they had been overturned. These facts were no sooner thoroughly ascertained than the lady gave several indications of fainting, but being forewarned that if she did she must be carried on some gentleman's shoulders to the nearest public house, she prudently thought better of it and walked back with the rest. They found on reaching it that it was a lonely place, with no very great accommodation in the way of apartments, that portion of its resources being all comprised in one public room, with a sanded floor and a chair or two, 
however a large faggot and plentiful supply of coals being heaped upon the fire the appearance of things was not long in mending and by the time they had washed off all effaceable marks of the late accident the room was warm and light which was a most agreeable exchange for the cold and darkness out of doors well mr nickleby said squeers insinuating himself into the warmest corner you did very right to catch hold of them horses i should have done it myself if i had come to in time but i'm very glad you did it you did it very well very well so well said the merry-faced gentleman who did not seem to approve very much of the patronizing tone adopted by squeers that if they had not been firmly checked when they were you would most probably have had no brains left to teach with this remark called up a discourse relative to the promptitude nicholas had displayed and he was overwhelmed with compliments and commendations i'm very glad to have escaped of course observed squeers every man is glad when he escapes from danger but if any one of my charges had been hurt if i had been prevented from restoring any one of these little boys to his parents whole and sound as i received him what would have been my feelings why the wheel at top of my head would have been far preferable to it are they all brothers sir inquired the lady who had carried the davy or safety lamp in one sense they are ma'am replied squeers diving into his greatcoat pocket for cards they are all under the same parental and affectionate treatment mrs squeers and myself are a mother and father to every one of them mr nickleby hand the lady them cards and offer these to the gentleman perhaps they might know of some parents that would be glad to avail themselves of the establishment expressing himself to this effect mr squeers who lost no opportunity of advertising gratuitously placed his hands upon his knees and looked to the pupils with as much benignity as he could possibly affect while nicholas blushing with shame handed round the cards as directed i hope you suffer no inconvenience for the overturn ma'am said the merry-faced gentleman addressing the fastidious lady as though he were charitably desirous to change the subject no bodily inconvenience replied the lady no mental inconvenience i hope the subject is a very painful one to my feelings sir replied the lady with strong emotion and i beg you as a gentleman not to refer to it dear me said the merry-faced gentleman looking merrier still i merely intended to inquire i hope no inquiries will be made said the lady or i shall be compelled to throw myself on the protection of the other gentleman landlord pray direct a boy to keep watch outside the door and if a green chariot passes in the direction of grantham to stop it instantly the people of the house were evidently overcome by this request and when the lady charged the boy to remember as a means of identifying the expected green chariot that it would have a coachman with a gold-laced hat on the box and a footman most probably in silk stockings behind the attentions of the good woman of the inn were redoubled even the box passenger caught the infection and growing wonderfully deferential immediately inquired whether there was not a very good society in that neighbourhood to which the lady replied yes there was in a manner which sufficiently implied that she moved at the very tip-top and summit of it all as the guard has gone on horseback to grantham to get another coach said the good-tempered gentleman when they had all been sitting round the fire for some time in silence and he must be gone a couple of hours at the very least i propose a bowl of hot punch what say you sir this question was addressed to the broken-headed inside who was a man of very genteel appearance dressed in mourning he was not past the middle age but his hair was grey it seemed to have been permanently turned by care or sorrow he readily acceded to the proposal and appeared to be prepossessed by the frank good nature of the individual from whom it emanated the latter personage took upon himself the office of tapster when the punch was ready and after dispensing it all round led the conversation to the antiquities of york with which both he and the grey-haired gentleman appeared to be well acquainted when this topic flagged he turned with a smile to the grey-haired gentleman and asked if he could sing i cannot indeed replied the gentleman smiling in his turn that's a pity said the owner of the good-humoured countenance is there nobody here who can sing a song to lighten the time the passengers one and all protested that they could not that they wished they could that they couldn't remember the words of anything without the book and so forth perhaps the lady would not object said the president with great respect and a merry twinkle in his eye some little italian thing out of the last opera brought out in town would be most acceptable i'm sure as the lady condescended to make no reply but tossed her head contemptuously 
and murmured some further expression of surprise regarding the absence of the green chariot one or two voices urged upon the president himself the propriety of making an attempt for the general benefit i would if i could said he of the good-tempered face for i hold that in this as in all other cases where people who are strangers to each other and are thrown unexpectedly together they should endeavour to render themselves as pleasant for the joint sake of the little community as possible i wish the maxim were more generally acted on in all cases said the grey-headed gentleman i am glad to hear it returned the other perhaps as you can't sing you'll tell us a story nay i should ask you after you i will with pleasure indeed said the grey-haired gentleman smiling well let it be so i fear the turn of my thoughts is not calculated to lighten the time you must pass here but you have brought this upon yourselves and shall judge we were speaking of york minster just now my story shall have some reference to it let us call it the five sisters of york after a murmur of approbation from the other passengers during which the fastidious lady drank a glass of punch unobserved the grey-haired gentleman thus went on a great many years ago for the fifteenth century was scarce two years old at the time and king henry the fourth sat upon the throne of england there dwelt in the ancient city of york five maiden sisters the subjects of my tale these five sisters were all of surpassing beauty the eldest was in her twenty-third year the second a year younger the third a year younger than the second and the fourth a year younger than the third they were tall stately figures with dark flashing eyes and hair of jet dignity and grace were in their every movement and the fame of their great beauty had spread throughout all the country round but if the four elder sisters were lovely how beautiful was the youngest a fair creature of sixteen the blushing tints in the soft bloom of the fruit or the delicate painting on the flower are not more exquisite than was the blending of the rose and lily in her gentle face or the deep blue of her eye the vine in all its elegant luxuriance is not more graceful than were the clusters of rich brown hair that sported round her brow if we all had hearts like those which beat so lightly in the bosoms of the young and beautiful what a heaven this earth would be if while our bodies grow old and withered our hearts could but retain their early youth and freshness of what avail would it be our sorrows and sufferings but the faint image of eden which is stamped upon them in childhood chafes and rubs in our rough struggles with the world and soon wears away too often to leave nothing but a mournful blank remaining the heart of this fair girl bounded with joy and gladness devoted attachment to her sisters and a fervent love of all beautiful things in nature were its pure affections her gleesome voice and merry laugh were the sweetest music of their home she was its very light and life the brightest flowers in the garden were reared by her the caged birds sang when they heard her voice and pined when they missed its sweetness alice dear alice what living thing within the sphere of her gentle witchery could fail to love her you may seek in vain now for the spot on which these sisters live for their very names have passed away and dusty antiquaries tell of them as of a fable but they dwelt in an old wooden house old even in those days with overhanging gables and balconies of rudely carved oak which stood within a pleasant orchard and was surrounded by a rough stone wall whence a stout archer might have winged an arrow to st mary's abbey the old abbey flourished then and the five sisters living on its fair domains paid yearly dues to the black monks of st benedict to which fraternity it belonged it was a bright and sunny morning in the pleasant time of summer when one of those black monks emerged from the abbey portal and bent his steps towards the house of the fair sisters heaven above was blue and the earth beneath was green the river glistened like a path of diamonds in the sun the birds poured forth their songs from the shady trees the lark soared high above the waving corn and the deep buzz of insects filled the air everything looked gay and smiling but the holy man walked gloomily on with his eyes bent upon the ground the beauty of the earth is but a breath and man is but a shadow what sympathy should a holy preacher have with either with eyes bent upon the ground then or only raised enough to prevent his stumbling over such obstacles as lay in his way 
the religious man moved forward slowly until he reached a small postern in the wall of the sister's orchard through which he passed closing it behind him the noise of soft voices in conversation and of merry laughter fell upon his ears ere he had advanced many paces and raising his eyes higher than was his humble wont he descried at no great distance the five sisters seated on the grass with alice in the centre all busily plying their customary task of embroidering save you fair daughters said the friar and in fair truth they were even a monk might have loved them as a choice masterpieces of his maker's hand the sisters saluted the holy man with becoming reverence and the eldest motioned him to a mossy seat beside them but the good friar shook his head and bumped himself down on a very hard stone at which no doubt approving angels were gratified ye were merry daughters said the monk you know how light of heart sweet alice is replied the eldest sister passing her fingers through the tresses of the smiling girl and what a joy and cheerfulness it wakes up within us to see all nature beaming in brightness and sunshine father added alice blushing beneath the stern look of the recluse the monk answered not save by a grave inclination of the head and the sisters pursued their task in silence still wasting the precious hours said the monk at length turning to the eldest sister as he spoke still wasting the precious hours on this vain trifling alas alas that the few bubbles on the surface of eternity all that heaven wills we should see of that dark deep stream should be so lightly scattered father urged the maiden pausing as did each of the others in her busy task we have prayed at matins our daily alms have been distributed at the gate the sick peasants have been tended all our morning tasks have been performed i hope our occupation is a blameless one see here said the friar taking the frame from her hand an intricate winding of gaudy colours without purpose or object unless it be that one day it is destined for some vain ornament to minister to the pride of your frail and giddy sex day after day has been employed upon this senseless task and yet it is not half accomplished the shade of each departed day falls upon our graves and the worm exults as he beholds it to know that we are hastening thither daughters is there no better way to pass the fleeting hours the four elder sisters cast down their eyes as if abashed by the holy man's reproof but alice raised hers and bent them mildly on the friar our dear mother said the maiden heaven rest her soul amen cried the friar in a deep voice our dear mother faltered the fair alice was living when these long tasks began and bade us when she should be no more ply them with all discretion and cheerfulness in our leisure hours she said that if in a harmless mirth and maidenly pursuits we passed those hours together they would prove the happiest and most peaceful of our lives and that if in later times we went forth into the world and mingled with its cares and trials if allured by its temptations and dazzled by its glitter we ever forgot that love and duty which should bind in holy ties the children of one loved parent a glance at the old work of our common girlhood would awaken good thoughts of bygone days and soften our hearts to affection and love alice speaks truly father said the eldest sister somewhat proudly and so saying she resumed her work as did the others it was a kind of sampler of a large size that each sister had before her the device was of a complex and intricate description and the pattern and colours of all five were the same the sisters bent gracefully over their work the monk resting his chin upon his hands looked from one to the other in silence how much better he said at length to shun all such thoughts and chances and in the peaceful shelter of the church devote your lives to heaven infancy childhood the prime of life and old age wither as rapidly as they crowd upon each other think how human dust rolls onward to the tomb and turning your faces steadily towards that goal avoid the cloud which takes its rise among the pleasures of the world and cheats the senses of their votaries the veil daughters the veil never sisters cried alice barter not the light and air of heaven and the freshness of earth and all the beautiful things which breathe upon it for the cold cloister and the cell nature's own blessings are the proper goods of life and we may share them sinlessly together 
to die is our heavy portion but oh let us die with life about us when our cold hearts cease to beat let warm hearts be beating near let our last look be upon the bounds which god has set to his own bright skies and not on stone walls and bars of iron dear sisters let us live and die if you list in this green garden's compass only shun the gloom and sadness of a cloister and we shall be happy the tears fell fast from the maiden's eyes as she closed her impassioned appeal and hid her face in the bosom of her sister take comfort alice said the eldest kissing her fair forehead the veil shall never cast its shadow on thy young brow how say you sisters for yourselves you speak and not for alice or for me the sisters as with one accord cried that their lot was cast together and that there were dwellings for peace and virtue beyond the convent's walls father said the eldest lady rising with dignity you hear our final resolve the same pious care which enriched the abbey of st mary and left us orphans to its holy guardianship directed that no constraint should be opposed upon our inclinations but that we should be free to live according to our choice let us hear no more of this we pray you sisters it is nearly noon let us take shelter until evening with a reverence to the friar the lady rose and walked towards the house hand in hand with alice the other sisters followed the holy man who had often urged the same point before but had never met with so direct a repulse walked some little distance behind with his eyes bent upon the earth and his lips moving as if in prayer as the sisters reached the porch he quickened his pace and called upon them to stop stay said the monk raising his right hand in the air and directing an angry glance by turns at alice and the eldest sister stay and hear from me what these recollections are which you would cherish above eternity and awaken if in mercy they slumbered by means of idle toys the memory of earthly things is charged in after life with bitter disappointment affliction death with dreary change and wasting sorrow the time will one day come when a glance at those unmeaning baubles will tear open deep wounds in the hearts of some among you and strike to your most inmost souls when that hour arrives and mark me come it will turn to the world to which you clung to the refuge which you spurned find me the cell which shall be colder than the fire of mortals grows when dimmed by calamity and trial and there weep for the dreams of youth these things are heaven's will not mine said the friar subduing his voice as he looked round upon the shrinking girls the virgin's blessing be upon you daughters with these words he disappeared through the postern and the sisters hastening into the house were seen no more that day but nature will smile though priests may frown and the next day the sun shone brightly and on the next and the next again and in the morning's glare and the evening's soft repose the five sisters still walked or worked or beguiled the time by cheerful conversation in their quiet orchard time passed away as a tale that is told faster indeed than many tales that are told of which number i fear this may be one the house of the five sisters stood where it did and the same trees cast their pleasant shade upon the orchard grass the sisters too were there and lovely as at first but a change had come over their dwelling sometimes there was a clash of armour and the gleaming of the moon on caps of steel and others jaded coursers were spurred up to the gate and a female form glided hurriedly forth as if eager to demand tidings of the weary messenger a goodly train of knights and ladies lodged one night within the abbey walls and the next day rode away with two of the fair sisters among them then horsemen began to come less frequently and seemed to bring bad tidings when they did and at length they ceased to come at all and footsore peasants slunk to the gate after sunset and did their errand there by stealth once a vassal was dispatched in haste to the abbey at dead of night and when morning came there were sounds of woe and wailing in the sister's house and after this a mournful silence fell upon it and a knight or lady horse or armour was seen about it no more there was a sullen darkness in the sky and the sun had gone angrily down tinting the dull clouds with the last traces of his wrath when the same black monk walked slowly on with folded arms within a stone's throw of the abbey a blight had fallen on the trees and shrubs 
and the wind at length beginning to break the unnatural stillness that had prevailed all day sighed heavily from time to time as though foretelling in grief the ravages of the coming storm the bat skimmed in fantastic flights through the heavy air and the ground was alive with crawling things whose instinct brought them forth to swell and fatten in the rain no longer were the friar's eyes directed to the earth they were cast abroad and roamed from point to point as if the gloom and desolation of the scene found a quick response in his own bosom again he paused near the sister's house and again he entered by the postern but not again did his ear encounter the sound of laughter or his eyes rest upon the beautiful figures of the five sisters all was silent and deserted the boughs of trees were bent and broken and the grass had grown long and rank no light feet had pressed it for many and many a day when the indifference or abstraction of one well accustomed to the change the monk glided into the house and entered a low dark room four sisters sat there their black garments made their pale faces whiter still and time and sorrow had worked deep ravages they were stately yet but the flush and pride of beauty were gone and alice where was she in heaven even the monk could bear with some grief here for it was long since these sisters had met and there were furrows in their blanched faces which years could never plough he took his seat in silence and motioned them to continue their speech they are here sisters said the elder lady in a trembling voice i have never borne to look upon them since and now i blame myself for my weakness what is there in her memory that we should dread to call up our old days shall be a solemn pleasure yet she glanced at the monk as she spoke and opening a cabinet brought forth the five frames of work completed long before her step was firm but her hand trembled as she produced the last one and when the feelings of the other sisters gushed forth at the sight of it her pent-up tears made way and she sobbed god bless her the monk rose and advanced towards them it was almost the last thing she touched in health he said in a low voice it was cried the elder lady weeping bitterly the monk turned to the second sister the gallant youth who looked into thine eyes and hung upon thy very breath when first he saw thee intent upon this pastime lies buried on a plain whereof the turf is red with blood rusty fragments of armour once brightly burnished lie rotting on the ground and are as little distinguishable for his are the bones that crumble in the mould the lady groaned and wrung her hands the policy of courts he continued turning to the other two sisters drew ye from your peaceful home the scenes of revelry and splendour the same policy and the restless ambition of proud and fiery men have sent ye back widowed maidens and humbled outcasts do i speak truly the sobs of the two sisters were their only reply there is little need said the monk with a meaning look to fritter away the time in gewgaws which shall raise up the pale ghosts of hopes of early years bury them heap penance and mortification on their heads keep them down and let the convent be their grave the sisters asked for three days to deliberate and felt that night as though the veil were indeed the fitting shroud for their dead joys but morning came again and though the boughs of the orchard trees drooped and ran wild upon the ground it was the same orchard still the grass was coarse and high but there was yet the spot on which they had so often sat together when change and sorrow were but names there was every walk and nook which alice had made glad and in the minster nave was one flat stone beneath which she slept in peace and could they remembering how her young heart had sickened at the thought of cloistered walls looking upon her grave in garbs which would chill the very ashes within it could they bow down in prayer and when all heaven turned to hear them bring back the dark shade of sadness on one angel's face no they sent abroad to artists of great celebrity in those times and having obtained the church's sanction to their work of piety caused to be executed in five large compartments of richly stained glass a faithful copy of their old embroidery work these were fitted into a large window until that time bare of ornament and when the sun shone brightly as she had so well loved to see it the familiar patterns were reflected in their original colours and throwing a stream of brilliant light upon the pavement fell warmly on the name of alice for many hours and every day the sisters paced slowly up and down the nave or knelt by the side of the flat broadstone 
only three were seen in the customary place after many years then but two and for a long time afterwards but one solitary female bent with age at length she came no more and the stone bore five plain christian names that stone has worn away and been replaced by others and many generations have come and gone since then time has softened down the colours but the same stream of light still falls upon the forgotten tomb of which no trace remains and to this day the stranger is shown in york cathedral an old window called the five sisters that's a melancholy tale said the merry-faced gentleman emptying his glass it's a tale of life and life is made up of such sorrows returned the other courteously but in a grave and sad tone of voice there are shades in all good pictures but there are lights too if we choose to contemplate them said the gentleman with a merry face the youngest sister in your tale was always light-hearted and died early said the other gently she would have died earlier perhaps had she been less happy said the first speaker with much feeling do you think the sisters who loved her so well would have grieved the less if her life had been one of gloom and sadness if anything could soothe the first sharp pain of a heavy loss it would be with me the reflection that those i mourned by being innocently happy here and loving all about them had prepared themselves for a purer and happier world the sun does not shine upon this fair earth to meet frowning eyes depend upon it i believe you're right said the gentleman who had told the story believe retorted the other can anybody doubt it take any subject of sorrowful regret and see with how much pleasure it is associated the recollection of past pleasure may become pain it does interpose the other well it does to remember happiness which cannot be restored is pain but of a softened kind our recollections are unfortunately mingled with much that we deplore and with many actions which we bitterly repent still in the most chequered life i firmly think there are so many little rays of sunshine to look back upon that i do not believe any mortal unless he had put himself without the pale of hope would deliberately drain a goblet of the waters of leith if he had it in his power possibly you are correct in that belief said the grey-haired gentleman after a short reflection i am inclined to think you are why then replied the other the good in this state of existence preponderates over the bad let miscalled philosophers tell us what they will if our affections be tried our affections are our consolation and comfort and memory however sad is the best and purest link between this world and a better but come i'll tell you a story of another kind after a very brief silence the merry-faced gentleman sent round the punch and glancing slyly at the fastidious lady who seemed desperately apprehensive that he was going to relate something improper began the baron of grogsvig the baron von kuldwerdout of grogsvig in germany was as likely a young baron as you would wish to see i needn't say that he lived in a castle because that's of course neither need i say that he lived in an old castle for what german baron ever lived in a new one there were many strange circumstances connected with this venerable building among which not the least startling and mysterious were that when the wind blew it rumbled in the chimneys or even howled among the trees in the neighbouring forest and that when the moon shone she found her way through certain small loopholes in the wall and actually made some parts of the wide halls and galleries quite light while she left others in gloomy shadow I believe that one of the baron's ancestors, being short of money, had inserted a dagger in a gentleman who called one night to ask his way, and it was supposed that these miraculous occurrences took place in consequence. And yet I hardly know how that could have been either, because the baron's ancestor, who was an amiable man, felt very sorry afterwards for having been so rash, and laying violent hands upon a quantity of stone and timber which belonged to a weaker baron built a chapel as an apology and so took a receipt from heaven in full of all demands talking of the baron's ancestor puts me in mind of one of the baron's great claims to respect on the score of his pedigree i am afraid to say i am sure how many ancestors the baron had but i know that he had a great many more than any other man of his time and i only wish that he had lived in these latter days that he might have had more it is a very hard thing upon the great men of past centuries that they should have come into the world so soon 
because a man who was born three or four hundred years ago cannot reasonably be expected to have as had as many relations before him as a man who is born now the last man whoever he is and he may be a cobbler or some low vulgar dog for aught we know will have a longer pedigree than the greatest nobleman now alive and i contend that this is not fair well but the baron von kolbelaut of groswig he was a fine swarthy fellow with dark hair and large moustachios who rode a hunting in clothes of lincoln green with russet boots on his feet and a bugle slung over his shoulder like the guard of a long stage when he blew this bugle four and twenty other gentlemen of inferior rank in lincoln green a little coarser and russet boots with a little thicker soles turned out directly and away galloped the whole train with spears in their hands like lacquered area railings to hunt down the boars or perhaps encounter a bear in which latter case the baron killed him first and greased his whiskers with him afterwards this was a merry life for the baron of groswig and a merrier still for the baron's retainers who drank rhine wine every night till they fell under the table and then had the bottles on the floor called for pipes never were such jolly roistering rollicking merry-making blades as the jovial crew of groswig but the pleasures of the table or the pleasures of under the table require a little variety especially when the same five-and-twenty people sit down daily to the same board to discuss the same subjects and tell the same stories the baron grew weary and wanted excitement he took to quarrelling with his gentlemen and tried kicking two or three of them every day after dinner this was a pleasant change at first but it became monotonous after a week or so and the baron felt quite out of sorts and cast about in despair for some new amusement one night after a day's sport in which he had outdone nimrod or gillingwater and slaughtered another fine bear and brought him home in triumph the baron von kuldwithout sat moodily at the head of his table eyeing the smoky roof of the hall with a discontented aspect he swallowed huge bumpers of wine but the more he swallowed the more he frowned the gentleman who had been honoured with the dangerous distinction of sitting on his right and left imitated him to a miracle in the drinking and frowned at each other i will cried the baron suddenly smiting the table with his right hand and twirling his moustache with his left fill to the lady of groswig the four-and-twenty lincoln greens turned pale with the exception of their four-and-twenty noses which were unchangeable i said to the lady of groswig repeated the baron looking round the board to the lady of groswig shouted the lincoln greens and down their four-and-twenty throats went four-and-twenty imperial points of such rare old hock that they smacked their eight-and-forty lips and winked again the fair daughter of the baron von swellenhausen said kuld without condescending to explain we will demand her in marriage of her father ere the sun goes down to-morrow if he refuse our suit we will cut off his nose a hoarse murmur rose from the company every man touched first the hilt of his sword and then the tip of his nose with appalling significance what a pleasant thing filial piety is to contemplate if the daughter of the baron von swillenhausen had pleaded a preoccupied heart or fallen at her father's feet and corned them in salt tears or only fainted away and complimented the old gentleman in frantic ejaculations the odds are a hundred to one but swillenhausen castle would have been turned out at window or rather the baron turned out at window and the castle demolished the damsel held her peace however when an early messenger bore the request of von kuld without next morning and modestly retired to her chamber from the casement of which she watched the coming of the suitor and his retinue she was no sooner assured that the horseman with the large moustachios was her proffered husband than she hastened to her father's presence and expressed her readiness to sacrifice herself to secure his peace the venerable baron caught his child to his arms and shed a wink of joy there was great feasting at the castle that day the four-and-twenty lincoln greens of von kuld without exchanged vows of eternal friendship with the twelve lincoln greens of von swillenhausen and promised the old baron that they would drink his wine till all was blue meaning probably until their whole countenances had acquired the same tint as their noses everybody slapped everybody else's back 
when the time for parting came and the baron von kurgadaut and his followers rode gaily home for six mortal weeks the bears and boars had a holiday the houses of curled without and swillenhausen were united the spears rusted and the baron's bugle grew hoarse through lack of blowing those were great times for the four-and-twenty but alas their high and palmy days had taken boots to themselves and were already walking off my dear said the baroness my love said the baron those coarse noisy men which ma'am said the baron starting the baroness pointed from the window at which they stood to the courtyard beneath where the unconscious lincoln greens were taking a copious stirrup cup preparatory to issuing forth after a boar or two my hunting train ma'am said the baron disband them love murmured the baroness disband them cried the baron in amazement to please me my love replied the baroness to please the devil ma'am answered the baron whereupon the baroness uttered a great cry and swooned away at the baron's feet what could the baron do he called for the lady's maid roared for the doctor then rushing into the yard kicked the two lincoln greens who were the most used to it and cursing the others all around bade them go but never mind where i don't know the german for it or i would have put it delicately that way it is not for me to say by what means or by what degrees some wives manage to keep down some husbands as they do although i may have my private opinion on the subject and may think that no member of parliament ought to be married inasmuch as three married members out of every four must vote according to their wives consciences if there be such things and not according to their own all i need say just now is that the baroness von kuldwedout somehow or other acquired great control of the baron von kuldwedout and that little by little and bit by bit day by day year by year the baron got the worst of some disputed question or was slyly unhorsed from some old hobby and that by the time he was a fat hearty fellow of forty-eight or thereabouts he had no feasting no revelry no hunting train and no hunting nothing in short that he liked or used to have and that although he was as fierce as a lion and as bold as brass he was decidedly snubbed and put down by his own lady in his own castle of grosvig nor was this the whole extent of the baron's misfortunes about a year after his nuptials there came into the world a lusty young baron in whose honour a great many fireworks were let off and a great many dozens of wine drunk but next year there came a young baroness and next year another young baron and so on every year either a baron or baroness and one year both together until the baron found himself the father of a small family of twelve upon every one of these anniversaries the venerable baroness von swillenhausen was nervously sensitive for the well-being of her child the baroness von kuldwedout and although it was not found that the good lady ever did anything material towards contributing to her child's recovery she still made it a point of duty to be as nervous as possible at the castle of grosvig and to divide her time between moral observations on the baron's housekeeping and bewailing the hard lot of her unhappy daughter and if the baron of grosvig a little hurt and irritated at this took heart and ventured to suggest that his wife was at least no worse off than the wives of other barons the baroness von swillenhausen begged all persons to take notice that nobody but she sympathised with her dear daughter's sufferings upon which her relations and friends remarked that to be sure she did cry a great deal more than her son-in-law and that if there were a hard-hearted brute alive it was that baron of grosvig the poor baron bore it all as long as he could and when he could bear it no longer lost his appetite and his spirits and sat himself gloomily and dejectedly down but there were worse troubles yet in store for him and as they came on his melancholy and sadness increased times changed he got into debt the grosvig coffers ran low though the swillenhausen family had looked upon them as inexhaustible and just when the baroness was on the point of making a thirteenth addition to the family pedigree von kuldwedat discovered that he had no means of replenishing them i don't see what's to be done said the baron i think i'll kill myself this was a bright idea the baron took an old hunting knife from a cupboard hard by and having sharpened it on his boot made what boys call an offer at his throat mm, said the baron stopping short perhaps it's not sharp enough the baron sharpened it again and made another offer 
when his hand was arrested by a loud screaming among the young barons and baronesses who had a nursery in an upstairs tower with iron bars outside the window to prevent their tumbling out into the moat if i had been a bachelor said the baron sighing i might have done it fifty times over without being interrupted hello put a flask of wine and the largest pipe in the little vaulted room behind the hall one of the domestics in a very kind manner executed the baron's order in the course of half an hour or so and von Kulverna, being apprised thereof strode into the vaulted room the walls of which being of dark shining wood gleamed in the light of the blazing logs which were piled upon the hearth the bottle and pipe were ready and upon the whole the place looked very comfortable leave the lamp said the baron anything else my lord inquired the domestic the room replied the baron the domestic obeyed and the baron locked the door i'll smoke a last pipe said the baron and then i'll be off so putting the knife upon the table till he wanted it and tossing off a goodly measure of wine the lord of Groswig threw himself back in his chair stretched his legs out before the fire and puffed away he thought about a great many things about his present troubles and past days of bachelorship and about the lincoln greens long since dispersed up and down the country no one knew whither with the exception of two who had been unfortunately beheaded and four who had killed themselves with drinking his mind was running upon bears and boars when in the process of draining his glass to the bottom he raised his eyes and saw for the first time and with unbounded astonishment that he was not alone no he was not for on the opposite side of the fire there sat with folded arms a wrinkled hideous figure with deeply sunken bloodshot eyes and an immensely long cadaverous face shadowed by jagged and matted locks of coarse black hair he wore a kind of tunic of dull bluish colour which the baron observed on regarding it attentively was clasped or ornamented down the front with coffin handles his legs too were encased in coffin plates as though in armour and over his left shoulder he wore a short dusky cloak which seemed to be made of a remnant of some pall he took no notice of the baron but was intently eyeing the fire hello said the baron stamping his foot to attract attention hello replied the stranger moving his eyes towards the baron but not his face or himself what now what now replied the baron nothing taunted by his hollowed voice and lustreless eyes i should ask that question how did you get here through the door replied the figure what are you says the baron a man replied the figure i don't believe it says the baron disbelieve it then says the figure i will rejoin the baron the figure looked at the bold baron of gruswig for some time and then said familiarly there's no coming over you i see i'm not a man what are you then asked the baron a genius replied the figure you don't look much like one returned the baron scornfully i am the genius of despair and suicide said the apparition now you know me with these words the apparition turned towards the baron as if composing himself for a talk and what was very remarkable was that he threw his cloak aside and displaying a stake which was run through the centre of his body pulled it out with a jerk and laid it on the table as composedly as if it had been a walking stick now said the figure glancing at the hunting knife are you ready for me not quite said the baron i must finish this pipe first look sharp then said the figure you seem in a hurry said the baron why well, yes i am answered the figure they're doing a pretty brisk business in my way over in england and france just now and my time is a good deal taken up do you drink said the baron touching the bottle with the bowl of his pipe nine times out of ten and then very hard rejoined the figure dryly never in moderation asked the baron never replied the figure with a shudder that breeds cheerfulness the baron took another look at his new friend whom he thought an uncommonly queer customer and at length inquired whether he took any active part in such little proceedings as that which he had in contemplation no replied the figure evasively but i am always present just to see fair i suppose said the baron just that replied the figure playing with his stake and examining the ferrule be as quick as you can will you for there is a young gentleman who is afflicted with too much money and leisure wanting me now i find going to kill himself because he has too much money exclaimed the baron quite tickled ha <laughs> that's a good one this was the first time the baron had laughed for many a long day 
i say expostulated the figure looking very much scared don't do that again why not demanded the baron because it gives me pain all over replied the figure sigh as much as you please that does me good the baron sighed mechanically at the mention of the word the figure brightening up again handed him the hunting knife with most winning politeness it's not a bad idea though said the baron feeling the edge of the weapon a man killing himself because he has too much money Phew, said the apparition petulantly no better than a man's killing himself because he has none or little whether the genius unintentionally committed himself in saying this or whether he thought the baron's mind was so thoroughly made up that it didn't matter what he said i have no means of knowing i only know that the baron stopped his hand all of a sudden opened his eyes wide and looked as if a quite a new light had come upon him for the first time why certainly said von Koldbevout, nothing is too bad to be retrieved except empty coffers cried the genius well but they may one day be filled again said the baron scolding wives snarled the genius oh they may be made quiet said the baron thirteen children shouted the genius can't all go wrong surely said the baron the genius was evidently growing very savage with the baron for holding these opinions all at once but he tried to laugh it off and said that if he would let him know when he had left off joking he should feel obliged to him but i am not joking i was never farther from it remonstrated the baron well i'm glad to hear that said the genius looking very grim because a joke without any figure of speech is the death of me come quit this dreary world at once i don't know said the baron playing with a knife it's a dreary one certainly but i don't think yours is much better for you have not the appearance of being particularly comfortable that puts me in mind what security i have that i should be any the better for going out of the world after all he cried starting up i never thought of that dispatch cried the figure gnashing his teeth keep off said the baron i'll brood over miseries no longer but put a good face on the matter and try the fresh air and the bears again and if that don't do i'll talk to the baroness soundly and cut the von swillenhausen's dead with this the baron fell into his chair and laughed so loud and boisterously that the room rang with it the figure fell back a pace or two regarding the baron meanwhile with a look of intense terror and when he had ceased caught up the stake plunged it violently into his body uttered a frightful howl and disappeared von Kuld without never saw it again having once made up his mind to action he soon brought the baroness and the von swillenhausers to reason and died many years afterwards not a rich man that i am aware of but certainly a happy one leaving behind him a numerous family who had been carefully educated in bear and boar hunting under his own personal eye and my advice to all men is that if ever they become hipped and melancholy from similar causes as very many men do they look at both sides of the question applying a magnifying glass to the best one and if they still feel tempted to retire without leave that they smoke a large pipe and drink a full bottle first and profit by the laudable example of the baron of grogsvig the fresh coach is ready ladies and gentlemen if you please said the new driver looking in this intelligence caused the punch to be finished in great hurry and prevented any discussion relative to the last story mr squeers was observed to draw the grey-headed gentleman to one side to ask a question with great apparent interest it bore reference to the five sisters of york and was in fact an inquiry whether he could inform him how much per annum the yorkshire convents got in those days with their boarders the journey was then resumed nicholas fell asleep towards morning and when he awoke found with great regret that during his nap both the baron of grogsvig and the grey-haired gentleman had got down and were gone the day dragged on uncomfortably enough at about six o'clock that night he and mr squeers and the little boys and their united luggage were all put down together at the george and new inn greta bridge end of chapter six chapter seven of the life and adventures of nicholas nickleby by charles dickens this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven mr and mrs squeers at home 
Mr. Squeers, being safely landed, left Nicholas and the boys standing with the luggage in the road to amuse themselves by looking at the coach as it changed horses, while he ran into the tavern and went through the leg-stretching process at the bar. After some minutes he returned with his legs thoroughly stretched, if the hue of his nose and a short hiccup afforded any criterion, and at the same time there came out of the yard a rusty pony chase and a cart driven by two labouring men. "'Put the boys and the boxes into the cart,' said Squeers, rubbing his hands, "'and this young man and me will go on in the chase. Get in, Nickleby.' Nicholas obeyed. Mr. Squeers, with some difficulty inducing the pony to obey also, they started off, leaving the cartload of infant misery to follow at leisure. "'Are you cold, Nickleby?' inquired Squeers, after they had travelled some distance in silence. "'Rather, sir, I must say.' "'Well, I don't find fault with that,' said Squeers. "'It's a long journey, this weather.' "'Is it much farther to Dotheboys Hall, sir?' asked Nicholas. Uh, "'About three miles from here,' replied Squeers. "'But you needn't call it a hall down here.' Nicholas coughed, as if he would like to know why. "'The fact is, it ain't a hall,' observed Squeers dryly. "'Oh, indeed,' said Nicholas, whom this piece of intelligence much astonished. "'No,' replied Squeers. We call it a hall up in London because it sounds better, but they don't know it by that name in these parts. A man may call his house an island if he likes. There's no act of Parliament against that, I believe. I believe not, sir, rejoined Nicholas. Squeers eyed his companion slyly at the conclusion of this little dialogue, and finding that he had grown thoughtful and appeared in no wise disposed to volunteer any observations, contented himself with lashing the pony until they reached their journey's end. "'Jump out,' said Squeers. "'Hello there. Come and put this horse up. Be quick, will you?' While the schoolmaster was uttering these and other impatient cries, Nicholas had time to observe that the school was a long, cold-looking house, one storey high, with a few straggling outbuildings behind, and a barn and a stable adjoining. After a lapse of a minute or two, the noise of somebody unlocking the yard gate was heard, and presently a tall, lean boy, with a lantern in his hand, issued forth. "'Is that you, Smike?' cried Squeers. "'Yes, sir,' replied the boy. "'And why the devil didn't you come before?' "'Please, sir, I fell asleep over the fire,' answered Smike, with humility. "'Fire? What fire? Where's there a fire?' demanded the schoolmaster sharply. "'Only in the kitchen, sir,' replied the boy. "'Missus said I was sitting up one might go in there for a warm.' "'Your missus is a fool,' retorted Squeers. You'd have been a deuced deal more wakeful in the cold, I'll engage. By this time, Mr. Squeers had dismounted, and after ordering the boy to see to the pony, and to take care that he hadn't any more corn that night, he told Nicholas to wait at the front door a minute while he went round and let him in. A host of unpleasant misgivings which had been crowding upon Nicholas during the whole journey thronged into his mind with redoubled force when he was left alone. His great distance from home and the impossibility of reaching it, except on foot, should he feel ever so anxious to return, presented itself to him in the most alarming colours. And as he looked up at the dreary house and dark windows, and upon the wild country round, covered with snow, he felt a depression of heart and spirit which he had never experienced before. "'Now then,' cried Squeers, poking his head out of the front door, "'where are you, Nickleby?' "'Here, sir,' replied Nicholas. "'Come in, then,' said Squeers. "'The wind blows in at this door, fit to knock a man off his legs.' Nicholas sighed and hurried in, Mr. Squeers having bolted the door to keep it shut, ushered him into a small parlour, scantily furnished with a few chairs, a yellow map hung against the wall, a couple of tables, one of which bore some preparations for supper, while, on the other tutor's assistant, and Murray's grammar, half a dozen cards of terms, and a worn letter directed to Wackford Squeers, Esquire, were arranged in picturesque confusion. They had not been in this apartment a couple of minutes when a female bounced into the room, and seizing Mr. Squeers by the throat gave him two loud kisses, one close after the other like a postman's knock. The lady, who was of a large, raw-boned figure, was about half a head taller than Mr. Squeers, and was dressed in a dimity night-jacket, with her hair in papers. 
She had also a dirty nightcap on, relieved by a yellow cotton handkerchief which tied it under the chin. "'How's my squeery? said this lady in a playful manner, and a very hoarse voice. "'Quite well, my love,' replied Squeers. "'How's the cows?' "'All right, every one of them,' answered the lady. "'And the pigs?' said Squeers. "'As well as they were when you went away.' "'Come, that's a blessing,' said Squeers, pulling off his great coat. "'The boys are all as they were, I suppose.' "'Oh, yes, they're well enough,' replied Mrs. Squeers, snappishly. "'That young pitcher's had a fever.' "'No,' exclaimed Squeers. "'Damn that boy! He's always at something of that sort.' "'Never was there such a boy, I do believe,' said Mrs. Squeers. "'Whatever he has is always catching, too. I say it's obstinacy, and nothing shall ever convince me of that it isn't. I'd beat it out of him, and I told you that six months ago.' "'So you did, my love,' rejoined Squeers. "'We'll try what can be done.' Pending these little endearments, Nicholas had stood awkwardly enough in the middle of the room, not very well knowing whether he was expected to retire into the passage or to remain where he was. He was now relieved from his perplexity by Mr. Squeers. "'This is the new young man, my dear,' said that gentleman. "'Oh,' replied Mrs. Squeers, nodding her head at Nicholas, and eyeing him coldly from top to toe. "'You'll take a meal with us tonight,' said Squeers. And go among the boys to-morrow morning. You can give him a shake down here to-night, can't you? We must manage it somehow, replied the lady. You don't much mind how you sleep, I suppose, sir? No, indeed, replied Nicholas. I am not particular. That's lucky, said Mrs. Squeers, and as the lady's humour was considered to lie chiefly in retort, Mr. Squeers laughed heartily, and seemed to expect that Nicholas should do the same. After some further conversation between the master and mistress relative to the success of Mr. Squeer's trip, and the people who had paid, and the people who had made default in payment, a young servant-girl brought in a Yorkshire pie and some cold beef, which being set upon the table, the boy Smike appeared with a jug of ale. Mr. Squeer's was emptying his greatcoat pockets of letters to different boys, and other small documents which he had brought down in them. The boy glanced with an anxious and timid expression at the papers, as if with a sickly hope that one among them might relate to him. The look was a very painful one, and it went to Nicholas's heart at once, for it told a long and very sad history. It induced him to consider the boy more attentively, and he was surprised to observe the extraordinary mixture of garments which formed his dress. Although he could not have been less than eighteen or nineteen years old, and was tall for that age, he wore a skeleton suit, such as usually put upon very little boys, and which, though most absurdly short in the arms and legs, was quite wide enough for his attenuated frame. In order that the lower part of his legs might be in perfect keeping with his singular dress, he had a very large pair of boots, originally made for tops, which might have been once worn by some stout farmer, but were now too patched and tattered for a beggar. Heaven knows how long he had been there but he still wore the same linen which he had first taken down, for, round his neck, was a tattered child's frill, only half concealed by a coarse man's neckerchief. He was lame, and as he feigned to be busy in arranging the table, glanced at the letters with a look so keen, and yet so dispirited and hopeless, that Nicholas could hardly bear to watch him. "'What are you bothering about there, Smike? cried Mrs. Squeers. "'Let the things alone, can't you?' eh said squeers looking up oh it's you is it yes sir replied the youth pressing his hands together as though to control by force the nervous wandering of his fingers is there well said squeers have you did anybody has nothing been heard about me devil a bit replied squeers testily the lad withdrew his eyes and putting his hand to his face moved towards the door not a word resumed squeers and never will be now this is a pretty sort of thing, isn't it, that you should have been left here all these years and no money paid after the first six, nor no notice taken, nor no clue to be got who you belong to? It's a pretty sort of thing that I should have to feed a great fellow like you and never hope to get one penny for it, isn't it? The boy put his hand to his head, as if he were making an effort to recollect something, and then looking vacantly at this questioner, gradually broke into a smile and limped away. "'I tell you what, Squeers,' remarked his wife as the door closed, "'I think that young chap's turning silly.' "'I hope not,' said the schoolmaster. 
for he's a handy fellow out of doors and worth his meat and drink anyway i should think he'd have wit enough for us though if he was but come let's have supper for i'm hungry and tired and i want to get to bed this reminder brought in an exclusive steak for mr squeers who speedily proceeded to do it ample justice nicholas drew up his chair but his appetite was effectually taken away how's the steak squeers said mrs s tender as a lamb replied squeers have a bit i couldn't eat a morsel replied his wife what will the young man take my dear whatever he likes that's present rejoined squeers in a most unusual burst of generosity what do you say mr knuckleboy inquired mrs squeers i'll take a little of the pie if you please replied nicholas a very little for i'm not hungry well it's a pity to cut the pie if you're not hungry isn't it said mrs squeers will you try a bit of the beef whatever you please replied nicholas abstractedly it's all the same to me mrs squeers looked vastly gracious on receiving this reply and nodding to squeers as much as to say that she was glad to find the young man knew his station assisted nicholas to a slice of meat with her own fair hands ale squeery inquired the lady winking and frowning to give him to understand that the question propounded was whether nicholas should have ale and not whether he squeers would take any certainly said squeers re-telegraphing in the same manner a glassful so nicholas had a glassful and being occupied with his own reflections drank it in happy innocence of all the foregone proceedings uncommon juicy steak that said squeers as he laid down his knife and fork after plying it in silence for some time it's prime meat rejoined his lady i bought a good large slice of it myself on purpose for for what exclaimed squeers hastily not for the no no not for them rejoined mrs squeers on purpose for you against you came home law you didn't think i would have made such a mistake as that upon my word my dear i didn't know what you were going to say said squeers who had turned pale you needn't make yourself uncomfortable remarked his wife laughing heartily to think that i should be such a noddy well this part of the conversation was rather unintelligible but popular rumour in the neighbourhood asserted that mrs squeers being amiably opposed to cruelty to animals not unfrequently purchased for boy consumption the bodies of horned cattle who had died a natural death possibly he was apprehensive of having unintentionally devoured some choice morsel intended for the young gentleman supper being over and removed by a small servant girl with a hungry eye mrs squeers retired to lock it up and also to take into safe custody the clothes of the five boys who had just arrived and were half way up the troublesome flight of steps which leads to death's door in consequence of exposure to the cold they were then regaled with a light supper of porridge and stowed away side by side in a small bedstead to warm each other and dream of a substantial meal with something hot after it if their fancy set that way which it is not at all improbable that they did mr squeers treated himself to a stiff tumbler of brandy and water made on the liberal half and half principle allowing for the dissolution of the sugar and his amiable helpmate mixed nicholas the ghost of a small glassful of the same compound this done mr and mrs squeers drew close up to the fire and sitting with their feet on the fender talked confidentially in whispers while nicholas taking up the tutor's assistant read the interesting legends in the miscellaneous questions and all the figures into the bargain with as much thought or consciousness of what he was doing as if he had been in a magnetic slumber at length mr squeers yawned fearfully and opined that it was high time to go to bed upon which signal mrs squeers and the girl dragged in a small straw mattress and a couple of blankets and arranged them into a couch for nicholas we'll put you into your regular bedroom to-morrow nickleby said squeers let me see who sleeps in brook's bed my dear in brooks said mrs squeers pondering there's jennings little bolder grimash and what's his name so there is rejoined squeers yes brooks is full full thought nicholas i should think he was there's a place somewhere i know said squeers but i can't at this moment call to mind where it is however we'll have that all settled to-morrow good night nickleby seven o'clock in the morning mind i shall be ready sir replied nicholas good night i'll come in myself and show you where the well is said squeers you'll always find a little bit of soap in the kitchen window that belongs to you 
Nicholas opened his eyes, but not his mouth, and Squeers was again going away when he once more turned back. I don't know, I'm sure, he said. Who's towel to put you on? But if you'll make shift with something tomorrow morning, Mrs. Squeers will arrange that in the course of the day. My dear, don't forget. I'll take care, replied Mrs. Squeers, and mind you take care, young man, and get first wash. The teacher ought always to have it, but they get the better of him if they can. Mr. Squeers then nudged Mrs. Squeers to bring away the brandy bottle, lest Nicholas should help himself in the night, and the lady, having seized it with great precipitation, they retired together. Nicholas, being left alone, took half a dozen turns up and down the room, in a condition of much agitation and excitement, but growing gradually calmer, sat himself down in a chair, and mentally resolved that, come what might, he would endeavour, for a time, to bear whatever wretchedness might be in store for him, and that, remembering the helplessness of his mother and sister, he would give his uncle no plea for deserting them in their need. Good resolutions seldom fail of producing some good effect in the mind from which they spring. He grew less desponding, and, so sanguine and buoyant his youth, even hoped that affairs at Dotheboys Hall might yet prove better than they promised. He was preparing for bed with something like renewed cheerfulness when a sealed letter fell from his coat pocket. In the hurry of leaving London it had escaped his attention, and had not occurred to him since, but it at once brought back to him the recollection of the mysterious behaviour of Newman Noggs. "'Dear me,' said Nicholas, "'what an extraordinary hand!' It was directed to himself, was written upon very dirty paper, and in such a cramped and crippled writing as to be almost illegible. After great difficulty and much puzzling, he contrived to read as follows. "'My dear young man, I know the world. Your father did not, or he would have not have done me a kindness when there was no hope of return. You do not, or you would not be bound on such a journey.' If ever you want a shelter in London, don't be angry at this. I once thought I never should. They know where I live, at the sign of the Crown in Silver Street, Golden Square. It is at the corner of Silver Street and James Street, with a bar door both ways. You can come at night. Once nobody was ashamed. Never mind, that's all over. Excuse errors. I should forget how to wear a whole coat now. I've forgotten all my old ways. My spelling may have gone with them. Newman Noggs. P.S. If you should go near Barnard Castle, there is good ale at the King's Head. Say you know me, and I am sure they will not charge you for it. You may say Mr. Noggs there, for I was a gentleman then. I was indeed. It may be a very undignified circumstance to record, but after he had folded this letter and placed it in his pocket-book, Nicholas Nickleby's eyes were dimmed with a moisture that might have been taken for tears. End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 of the Internal Economy of Dotheboys Hall. A ride of two hundred and odd miles in severe weather is one of the best softeners of a hard bed that ingenuity can devise. Perhaps it is even a sweetener of dreams for those which hovered over the rough couch of Nicholas and whispered their airy nothings in his ear were of an agreeable and happy kind. He was making his fortune very fast indeed when the faint glimmer of an expiring candle shone before his eyes and a voice he had no difficulty in recognising as part and parcel of Mr Squeers admonished him that it was time to rise. "'Bus seven, Nickleby,' said Mr. Squeers. "'Has morning come already?' asked Nicholas, sitting up in bed. "'Ah, that it has,' replied Squeers. "'And ready ice, too. Now, Nickleby, come, tumble up, will you?' Nicholas needed no further admonition, but tumbled up at once, and proceeded to dress himself by the light of the taper which Mr. Squeers carried in his hand. "'Here's a pretty go,' said that gentleman the pumps froze indeed said nicholas not much interested in the intelligence yes replied squeers you can't wash yourself this morning not wash myself exclaimed nicholas no not a bit of it rejoined squeers tartly so you must be content with giving yourself a dry polish till we break the ice in the well 
and can get a bucketful out for the boys. Don't stand staring at me, but do look sharp, will you? Offering no further observation, Nicholas huddled on his clothes. Squeers, meanwhile, opened the shutters and blew the candle out, when the voice of his amiable consort was heard in the passage demanding admittance. Come in, my love, said Squeers. Mrs. Squeers came in, still habited in the primitive night jacket which had displayed the symmetry of her figure on the previous night, and further ornamented with a beaver bonnet of some antiquity, which she wore with much ease and lightness on the top of the nightcap before mentioned. Drat the things, said the lady, opening the cupboard. I can't find the school spoon anywhere. Never mind it, my dear, observed Squeers in a soothing manner. It's of no consequence. No consequence? Why are you talk? retorted Mrs. Squeers sharply. Isn't it brimstone morning? I forgot, my dear, rejoined Squeers. Yes, it certainly is. We purify the boy's blood now and then, Nickleby. Purify fiddlesticks ends, said his lady. Don't think, young man, that we go to the expense of flour of brimstone and molasses just to purify them, because if you think we carry on the business in that way, you'll find yourself mistaken, and I'll tell you plainly. My dear, said Squeers, frowning. Oh, nonsense, rejoined Mrs. Squeers. If the young man comes to be a teacher here, let him understand at once that we don't want any foolery about the boys. They have the brimstone and treacle, partly because if they hadn't something or other in the way of medicine, they'd be always ailing and giving a world of trouble, and partly because it spoils their appetites and comes cheaper than breakfast and dinner. So it does them good and us good at the same time, and that's fair enough, I'm sure. Having given this explanation, Mrs. Squeers put her head into the closet, and instituted a stricter search after the spoon, in which Mr. Squeers assisted. A few words passed between them while they were thus engaged, but their voices were partially stifled by the cupboard. All that Nicholas could distinguish was that Mr. Squeers said what Mrs. Squeers had said was injudicious, and that Mrs. Squeers said what Mr. Squeers said was stuff. A vast deal of searching and rummaging ensued, and it proved fruitless. Smike was called in, and pushed by Mrs. Squeers, and boxed by Mr. Squeers, which course of treatment, brightening his intellects, enabled him to suggest that possibly Mrs. Squeers might have the spoon in her pocket, as indeed turned out to be the case. As Mrs. Squeers had previously protested, however, that she was quite certain she had not got it, Smike received another box on the ear for presuming to contradict his mistress, together with a promise of a sound thrashing if he were not more respectful in future, so that he took nothing very advantageous by his motion. "'A most invaluable woman, that, Nickleby,' said Squeers, when his consort had hurried away, pushing the drudge before her. "'Indeed, sir,' observed Nicholas. "'I don't know her equal,' said Squeers. "'I do not know her equal. "'That woman, Nickleby, is always the same, "'always the same, bustling, lively, active, saving creature that you see now.' Nicholas sighed involuntarily at the thought of the agreeable domestic prospect thus opened to him, but Squeers was, fortunately, too much occupied with his own reflections to perceive it. "'It's my way to say it when I'm up in London,' continued Squeers, "'that to them boys she is a mother. But she is more than a mother to them, ten times more. She does things to them boys, Nickleby, that I don't believe half the mothers going would do for their own sons.' "'I should think they would not, sir,' answered Nicholas. Now the fact was that both Mr. and Mrs. Squeers viewed the boys in the light of their proper and natural enemies, or, in other words, they held to consider that their business and profession was to get as much from every boy as could by possibility be screwed out of him. On this point they were both agreed, and behaved in unison accordingly. The only difference between them was that Mrs. Squeers waged war against the enemy openly and fearlessly, and that Squeers covered his rascality even at home with a spice of his habitual deceit, as if he really had a notion of some day or other being able to take himself in and persuade his own mind that he was a very good fellow. But come, said Squeers, interrupting the progress of some thoughts to this effect in the mind of his usher, let's go to the schoolroom and lend me a hand with my school coat, will you? Nicholas assisted his master to put on an old fustian shooting jacket, which he took down from a peg in the passage and Squeers, arming himself with his cane, led the way across a yard to a door in the rear of the house. There, said the schoolmaster as they stepped in together, this is our shop, Nickleby. It was such a crowded scene 
and there were so many objects to attract attention that at first Nicholas stared about him, really without seeing anything at all. By degrees, however, the place resolved itself into a bare and dirty room, with a couple of windows whereof a tenth part might be of glass, the remainder being stopped up with old copy-books and paper. There were a couple of long old rickety desks, cut, notched and inked and damaged, in every possible way. Two or three forms, a detached desk for Squeers, and another for his assistant. The ceiling was supported, like that of a barn, by cross-beams and rafters, and the walls were so stained and discoloured that it was impossible to tell whether they had ever been touched with paint or whitewash. But the pupils, the young nobleman, how the last faint traces of hope, the remotest glimmering of any good to be derived from his efforts in this den, faded from the mind of Nicholas as he looked in dismay around. Pale and haggard faces, lank and bony figures, children with the countenances of old men, deformities with irons upon their limbs, boys of stunted growth, and others whose long meagre legs would hardly bear their stooping bodies, all crowded on the view together. There were the bleared eye, the hair lip, the crooked foot, and every ugliness or distortion that told of unnatural aversion conceived by parents for their offspring, or of young lives which, from the earliest dawn of infancy, had been one horrible endurance of cruelty and neglect. There were little faces which should have been handsome, darkened with the scowl of sullen, dogged suffering. There was childhood with the light of its eye quenched, its beauty gone, and its helplessness alone remaining. They were vicious-faced boys, brooding with leaden eyes, like malefactors in a jail, and there were young creatures on whom the sins of their frail parents had descended, weeping even for the mercenary nurses they had known, and lonesome even in their loneliness. With every kind of sympathy and affection blasted in its birth, with every young and healthy feeling flogged and starved down, with every revengeful passion that can fester in swollen hearts, eating its evil way to their core in silence, what an incipient hell was breeding here. And yet this scene, painful as it was, had its grotesque features, which, in a less interested observer than Nicholas, might have provoked a smile. Mrs. Squeers stood at one end of the desks, presiding over an immense basin of brimstone and treacle, of which delicious compound she administered a large instalment to each boy in succession, using for the purpose a common wooden spoon which might have been originally manufactured for some gigantic top, and which widened every young gentleman's mouth considerably, they all being obliged under heavy corporal penalties to take in the whole of the bowl at a gasp. In another corner, huddled together for companionship, were the little boys who had arrived on the preceding night, three of them in very large leather breeches, and two in old trousers, a something tighter fit than drawers are usually worn. At no great distance from these were seated the juvenile son and hair of Mr. Squeers, a striking likeness to his father, kicking with great vigour under the hands of Smike, who was fitting upon him a pair of new boots that bore a most suspicious resemblance to those which the least of the little boys had worn on the journey down, as the little boy himself seemed to think, for he was regarding the appropriation with a look of most rueful amazement. Beside these there was a long row of boys waiting, with countenances of no pleasant anticipation to be treacled, and another file who had just escaped from the infliction, making a variety of wry mouths, indicative of anything but satisfaction. The whole were attired in such motley, ill-assorted, extraordinary garments as would have been irresistibly ridiculous, but for the foul appearance of dirt, disorder and disease with which they were associated. Now, said Squeers, giving the desk a great rap with his cane, which made half the little boys nearly jump out of their boots, is that physic in over? Just over, said Mrs. Squeers, choking the last boy in a hurry, and tapping the crown of his head with a wooden spoon to restore him. Here, you, Smike, take away now, look sharp. Smike shuffled out with a basin, and Mrs. Squeers, having called up a little boy with a curly head, and wiped her hands upon it, hurried out after him into a species of wash-house, where there was a small fire and a large kettle, together with a number of little wooden bowls which were arranged upon a board. Into these bowls Mrs. Squeers, assisted by the hungry servant, 
poured a brown composition which looked like diluted pincushions without the covers and was called porridge a minute wedge of brown bread was inserted in each bowl and when they had eaten their porridge by means of the bread the boys ate the bread itself and had finished their breakfast whereupon mr squeers said in a solemn voice for what we have received may the lord make us truly thankful and went away to his own nicholas distended his stomach with a bowl of porridge for much the same region which induces some savages to swallow earth lest they should be inconveniently hungry when there's nothing to eat having further disposed of a slice of bread and butter allotted to him in virtue of his office he sat himself down to wait for school time he could not but observe how silent and sad the boys all seemed to be there was none of the noise and clamour of a schoolroom none of its boisterous play or hearty mirth the children sat crouching and shivering together and seemed to lack the spirit to move about the only pupil who evinced the slightest tendency towards locomotion or playfulness was master squeers and as his chief amusement was to tread upon the other boy's toes in his new boots his flow of spirits was rather disagreeable than otherwise after some half hour's delay mr squeers reappeared and the boys took their places and their books of which latter commodity the average might be about one to eight learners a few minutes having elapsed during which mr squeers looked very profound as if he had a perfect apprehension of what was inside all the books and could say every word of their contents by heart if he only chose to take the trouble that gentleman called up the first class obedient to this summons they ranged themselves in front of the schoolmaster's desk half a dozen scarecrows out at knees and elbows one of whom placed a torn and filthy book beneath his learned eye this is the first class in english spelling and philosophy nickleby said squeers beckoning nicholas to stand beside him we'll get up a latin one and hand that over to you now then where's the first boy please sir he's cleaning the back parlour window said the temporary head of the philosophical class so he is to be sure rejoined squeers we go upon the practical mode of teaching nickleby the regular education system c l e a n clean verb active to make bright to scour w i n d e r winder winder a casement when the boy knows this out of a book he goes and does it it's just the same principle as the use of the globes where's the second boy please sir he's weeding the garden replied a small voice to be sure said squeers by no means disconcerted so he is b o t bot t i n tin botin n e y ne botany noun substantive a knowledge of plants when he has learned that botany means a knowledge of plants he goes and knows them that's our system nickleby what do you think of it it's a very useful one at any rate answered nicholas ah believe you rejoined squeers not remarking the emphasis of his usher third boy what's horse a beast sir replied the boy so it is said squeers ain't it nickleby i believe there is no doubt of that sir answered nicholas of course there isn't said squeers a horse is a quadruped and quadrupeds latin for beast as everybody that's gone through the grammar knows or else what is the use of having grammars at all where indeed said nicholas abstractedly as you're perfect in that resumed squeers turning to the boy go and look after my horse and rub him down well or i'll rub you down the rest of the class go and draw water up till somebody tells you to leave off for it's washing day to-morrow and they want the coppers filled so saying he dismissed the first class to their experiments in practical philosophy and eyed nicholas with a look half cunning and half doubtful as if he were not altogether certain what he might think of him by this time that's the way we do it nickleby he said after a pause nicholas shrugged his shoulders in a manner that was scarcely perceptible and said he saw it was and a very good way it is too said squeers now just take them fourteen little boys and hear them some reading because you know you must begin to be useful idling about here won't do mr squeers said this as if it had suddenly occurred to him either that he must not say too much to his assistant or that his assistant did not say enough to him in praise of the establishment the children were arranged in a semicircle round the new master 
and he was soon listening to their dull drawling hesitating recital of those stories of engrossing interest which are to be found in the more antiquated spelling books in this exciting occupation the morning lagged heavily on at one o'clock the boys having previously had their appetites thoroughly taken away by stir-about and potatoes sat down in the kitchen to some hard salt beef of which nicholas was graciously permitted to take his portion to his own solitary desk to eat it there in peace after this there was another hour of crouching in the schoolroom and shivering with cold and then school began again it was mr squeers custom to call the boys together and make a sort of report after every half yearly visit to the metropolis regarding the relations and friends he had seen the news he had heard the letters he had brought down the bills which had been paid the accounts which had been left unpaid and so forth this solemn proceeding always took place in the afternoon of the day succeeding his return perhaps because the boys acquired strength of mind from the suspense of the morning or possibly because mr squeers himself acquired greater sternness and inflexibility from certain warm potations in which he was wont to indulge after his early dinner be this as it may the boys were recalled from house window garden stable and cowyard and the school were assembled in full conclave when mr squeers with a small bundle of papers in his hand and mrs s following with a pair of canes entered the room and proclaimed silence let any boy speak a word without leave said mr squeers mildly and i'll take the skin off his back this special proclamation had the desired effect and a death-like silence immediately prevailed in the midst of which mr squeers went on to say boys i've been to london and have returned to my family and you as strong and well as ever according to half-yearly custom the boys gave three feeble cheers at this refreshing intelligence such cheers sights of extra strength with the chill on i've seen the parents of some boys continued squeers turning over his papers and they're glad to hear how their sons are getting on and that there's no prospect at all of their going away which of course is a very pleasant thing to reflect upon for all parties two or three hands went two or three eyes when squeers said this but the greater part of the young gentlemen having no particular parents to speak of were wholly uninterested in the thing one way or another i've had disappointments to contend against said squeers looking very grim boulder's father was two pound ten short where is boulder here he is please sir rejoined twenty officious voices boys are very like men to be sure come here boulder said squeers an unhealthy-looking boy with warts all over his hands stepped from his place to the master's desk and raised his eyes imploringly to squeers face his own quite white from the rapid beating of his heart boulder said squeers speaking very slowly for he was considering as the saying goes where to have him boulder if your father thinks that because why what's this sir as squeers spoke he caught up the boy's hand by the cuff of his jacket and surveyed it with an edifying aspect of horror and disgust what do you call this sir demanded the schoolmaster administering a cut with a cane to expedite the reply i can't help it sir indeed sir rejoined the boy crying they will come it's the dirty work i think sir at least i don't know what it is sir but it's not my fault boulder said squeers tucking up his wristbands and moistening the palm of his right hand to get a good grip of the cane you're an incorrigible young scoundrel and as the last thrashing did you no good we must see what another will do towards beating it out of you with this and wholly disregarding the piteous cry for mercy mr squeers fell upon the boy and caned him soundly not leaving off indeed until his arm was tired out there said squeers when he had quite done rub away as hard as you like you won't rub that off in a hurry oh you won't hold that noise won't you put him out smike the drudge knew better from long experience than to hesitate about obeying so he bundled the victim out by a side door and mr squeers perched himself again on his own stool supported by mrs squeers who occupied another at his side now let us see said squeers a letter for cobby stand up cobby another boy stood up and eyed the letter very hard while squeers made a mental abstract of the same oh said squeers cobby's grandmother is dead and his uncle john has took to drinking which is all the news his sister sends 
except eighteen pence which will just pay for that broken square of glass mrs squeers my dear will you take the money the worthy lady pocketed the eighteen pence with a most business-like air and squeers passed on to the next boy as coolly as possible grey marsh said squeers he's the next stand up grey marsh another boy stood up and the schoolmaster looked over the letter as before grey marsh's maternal aunt said squeers when he had possessed himself of its contents is very glad to hear he's so well and happy and sends her respectful compliments to mrs squeers and thinks she must be an angel she likewise thinks mr squeers is too good for this world but hopes he may long be spared to carry on the business would have sent the two pairs of stockings as desired but is short of money so forwards a tract instead and hopes Greymarsh will put his trust in providence hopes above all that he will study in everything to please mr and mrs squeers and look upon them as his only friends and that he will love master squeers and not object to sleeping five in a bed which no christian should ah said squeers folding it up a delightful letter very affecting indeed it was affecting in one sense for Greymarsh's maternal aunt was strongly supposed by her more intimate friends to be no other than his maternal parent squeers however without alluding to this part of the story which would have sounded immoral before boys proceeded with the business by calling out mobs whereupon another boy rose and Greymarsh resumed his seat mob's stepmother said squeers took to her bed on hearing that he wouldn't eat fat and has been very ill ever since she wishes to know by an early post where he expects to go if he quarrels with his victuals and with what feelings he could turn up his nose at the cow's liver broth after his good master had asked a blessing on it this was told her in the london newspapers not by mr squeers for he is too kind and too good to set anybody against anybody and it's vexed her so much mobs can't think she's sorry to find he is discontented which is sinful and horrid and hopes mr squeers will flog him into a happier state of mind with which view she has also stopped his eightpenny a week pocket money and given a double-bladed knife with a corkscrew in it to the missionaries which she had bought on purpose for him a sulky state of feeling said squeers after a terrible pause during which he had moistened the palm of his right hand again won't do cheerfulness and contentment must be kept up mobs come to me mobs moved slowly towards the desk rubbing his eyes in anticipation of a good cause for doing so and he soon afterwards retired by the side door with as good a cause as a boy need to have mr squeers then proceeded to open miscellaneous collection of letters some enclosing money which mrs squeers took care of and others referring to small articles of apparel as caps and so forth all of which the same lady stated to be too large or too small and calculated for nobody but young squeers who would appear indeed to have had most accommodating limbs since everything that came into the school fitted him to a nicety his head in particular must have been singularly elastic for hats and caps of all dimensions were alike to him this business dispatched a few slovenly lessons were performed and squeers retired to his fireside leaving nicholas to take care of the boys in the schoolroom which was very cold and where a meal of bread and cheese was served out shortly after dark there was a small stove at that corner of the room which was nearest to the master's desk and by it nicholas sat down so depressed and self-degraded by the consciousness of his position that if death could have come upon him at that time he would have been almost happy to meet it the cruelty of which he had been an unwilling witness the coarse and ruffinly behaviour of squeers even in his best moods the filthy place the sights and sounds about him all contributed to this state of feeling but when he recollected that being there as an assistant he actually seemed no matter what unhappy train of circumstances had brought him to that pass to be the aider and a better of a system which filled him with honest disgust and indignation he loathed himself and felt for the moment as though the mere consciousness of his present situation must through all time to come prevent his raising his head again but for the present his resolve was taken and the resolution he had formed on the preceding night remained undisturbed he had written to his mother and sister announcing the safe conclusion of his journey 
and saying as little about Dotheboys Hall, and saying that little as cheerfully as he possibly could. He hoped that by remaining where he was, he might do some good even there. At all events, others depended too much on his uncle's favour to admit of his awakening his wrath just then. One reflection disturbed him far more than any selfish considerations arising out of his own position. This was the probable destination of his sister Kate. His uncle had deceived him, and might he not consign her to some miserable place where her youth and beauty would prove a far greater curse than ugliness and decrepitude? To a caged man, bound hand and foot, this was a terrible idea. But no, he thought his mother was by. There was the portrait painter too, simple enough, but still living in the world and of it. He was willing to believe that Ralph Nickleby had conceived a personal dislike to himself. Having pretty good reason by this time to reciprocate it, he had no great difficulty in arriving at this conclusion, and tried to persuade himself that the feeling extended no further than between them. As he was absorbed in these meditations, he all at once encountered the upturned face of Smike, who was on his knees before the stove, picking a few stray cinders from the hearth and planting them on the fire. He had paused to steal a look at Nicholas, and when he saw that he was observed, shrunk back as if expecting a blow. "'You need not fear me,' said Nicholas kindly. "'Are you cold?' "'No.' "'You are shivering.' "'I am not cold,' replied Smike quickly. "'I am used to it.' There was such an obvious fear of giving offence in his manner, and he was such a timid, broken-spirited creature, that Nicholas could not help exclaiming, "'Poor fellow!' If he had struck the drudge, he would have slunk away without a word. But now he burst into tears. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear!' he cried, covering his face with his cracked and horny hands. "'My heart will break. It will, it will.' "'Hush!' said Nicholas, laying his hand upon his shoulder. "'Be a man. You are nearly one by years. God help you.' "'By years!' cried Smike. "'Oh, dear, dear, how many of them! How many of them since I was a little child!' younger than any that are here now. Where are they all? Whom do you speak of? inquired Nicholas, wishing to rouse the poor half-witted creature to reason. Tell me. My friends, he replied. Myself, my oh, what sufferings mine have been. There is always hope, said Nicholas. He knew not what to say. No, rejoined the other. No, none for me. Do you remember the boy that died here? I was not here, you know, said Nicholas gently. But what of him? why replied the youth drawing closer to his questioner's side i was with him at night and when it was all silent he cried no more for friends he wished to come and sit with him but began to see faces round his bed that came from home he said they smiled and talked to him and he died at last lifting his head to kiss them do you hear yes yes rejoined nicholas what faces will smile upon me when i die cried his companion shivering who will talk to me in those long nights? They cannot come from home. They would frighten me if they did, for I don't know what it is, and I shouldn't know them. Pain and fear, pain and fear for me, alive or dead. No hope, no hope. The bell rang to bed, and the boy, subsiding at the sound into his usual listless state, crept away as if anxious to avoid notice. It was with a heavy heart that Nicholas soon afterwards no not retired there was no retirement there followed to his dirty and crowded dormitory end of chapter eight chapter nine of the life and adventures of nicholas nickleby by charles dickens this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 of Miss Squeers, Mrs. Squeers, Master Squeers, and Mr. Squeers, and of various matters and persons connected no less with the Squeerses than Nicholas Nickleby. When Mr. Squeers left the schoolroom for the night, he betook himself, as had been before remarked, to his own fireside which was situated not in the room in which Nicholas had supped on the night of his arrival, but in a smaller apartment in the rear of the premises, where his lady wife, his amiable son, and accomplished daughter were in the full enjoyment of each other's society. 
Mrs. Squeers being engaged in the matronly pursuit of stocking darning, and the young lady and gentleman being occupied in the adjustment of some youthful differences, by means of a pugilistic contest across the table, which on the approach of their honoured parent subsided into a noiseless exchange of kicks beneath it. And in this place it may be as well to apprise the reader that Miss Fanny Squeers was in her three-and-twentieth year. If there be any one grace or loveliness inseparable from that particular period of life, Miss Squeers may be presumed to have been possessed of it, as there is no reason to suppose that she was a solitary exception to a universal rule. She was not tall like her mother, but short like her father. From the former she inherited a voice of harsh quality, from the latter, a remarkable expression of the right eye, something akin to having nothing at all. Miss Squeers had been spending a few days with a neighbouring friend, and had only just returned to the parental roof. To this circumstance may be referred her having heard nothing of Nicholas until Mr. Squeers himself now made him the subject of conversation. "'Well, my dear,' said Squeers, drawing up his chair, "'what do you think of him by this time?' "'Think of who?' inquired mrs squeers who as she often remarked was no grammarian thank heaven of the young man the new teacher who else could i mean oh that knuckle boy said mrs squeers impatiently i hate him why do you hate him for my dear asked squeers what's that to you retorted mrs squeers if i hate him that's enough ain't it quite enough for him my dear and a great deal too much i dare say if he knew it replied squeers in a pacific tone I only ask from curiosity, my dear. Well, then, if you want to know, rejoined Mrs. Squeers, I'll tell you, because he's a proud, haughty, consequential, turned-up-nosed peacock. Mrs. Squeers, when excited, was accustomed to use strong language, and, moreover, to make use of a plurality of epithets, some of which were of a figurative kind, as the word peacock, and furthermore the allusion to Nicholas's nose, which was not intended to be taken in its literal sense, but rather to bear a latitude of construction according to the fancy of the hearers. Neither were they meant to bear reference to each other, so much as to the object on whom they were bestowed, as will be seen in the present case, a peacock with a turned-up nose being a novelty in ornithology, and not a thing commonly seen. Hmm, said Squeers, as if in a mild depreciation of this outbreak. He is cheap, my dear. The young man is very cheap. Not a bit of it, retorted Mrs. Squeers. Five pound a year, said Squeers. What of that? It's dear if you don't want him, isn't it? replied his wife. But we do want him, urged Squeers. I don't see that you want him any more than the dead, said Mrs. Squeers. Don't tell me. You can put on the cards and in the advertisements education by Mr. Wackford Squeers and able assistance, without having any assistance, can't you? Isn't it done every day by all the masters about? I've no patience with you. "'Haven't you?' said Squeers sternly. "'Now I'll tell you what, Mrs. Squeers. "'In this matter of having a teacher, "'I'll take me own way, if you please. "'A slave driver in the West Indies "'is allowed a man under him "'to see that his blacks don't run away "'or get up a rebellion. "'And I'll have a man under me to do the same "'with our blacks, "'till such times as little Wackford "'is able to take charge of the school.' "'Am I to take care of the school "'when I grow up a man, father?' said wackford junior suspending in the excess of his delight a vicious kick which he was administering to his sister you are my son replied mr squeers in a sentimental voice oh my eye won't i give it to the boys exclaimed the interesting child grasping his father's cane oh father won't i make em squeak again it was a proud moment in mr squeers life when he witnessed that burst of enthusiasm in his young child's mind and saw in it a foreshadowing of his future eminence. He pressed a penny into his hand and gave vent to his feelings, as did his exemplary wife also, in a shout of approving laughter. The infantine appeal to their common sympathies at once restored cheerfulness to the conversation and harmony to the company. "'He's a nasty stuck-up monkey, that's what I consider him,' said Mrs. Squeers, reverting to Nicholas. "'Supposing he is,' said Squeers. He's as well stuck up in our schoolroom as anywhere else, isn't he? Especially if he don't like it. Well, observed Mrs. Squeers, there's something in that. I hope it'll bring his pride down, and it shall be no fault of mine if it don't. 
now a proud usher in a yorkshire school was such a very extraordinary and unaccountable thing to hear of any usher at all being a novelty but a proud one a being of whose existence the wildest imagination could never have dreamed that miss squeers who seldom troubled herself with scholastic matters inquired with much curiosity to who this knuckle-boy was that gave himself such airs nickleby said squeers spelling the name according to some eccentric system which prevailed in his own mind your mother always calls things and people by their wrong names no matter for that said mrs squeers i see them with right eyes and that's quite enough for me i watched him when you were laying into little boulder this afternoon he looked as black as thunder all the while and at one time started up as if he hadn't more than got it in his mind to make a rush at you i saw him though he thought i didn't never mind that parlour said miss squeers as the head of the family was about to reply who is the man why your father has got some nonsense in his head that he's the son of a poor gentleman that died the other day said mrs squeers the son of a gentleman yes but i don't believe a word of it if he's a gentleman's son at all he's a fondling that's my opinion mrs squeers intended to say foundling but as she frequently remarked when she made any such mistake it would be all the same a hundred years hence with which axiom of philosophy indeed she was in the constant habit of consoling the boys when they laboured under more than ordinary ill usage he's nothing of the kind said squeers in answer to the above remark for his father was married to his mother years before he was born and she is alive now if he was it would be no business of ours for we make a very good friend by having him here and if he likes to learn the boys anything besides minding them i have no objection i am sure i say again i hate him worse than poison said mrs squeers vehemently if you dislike him my dear returned squeers i don't know anybody who can show dislike better than you and of course there's no occasion with him to take the trouble to hide it i don't intend to i assure you interposed mrs s that's right said squeers and if he has a touch of pride about him as i think he has i don't believe there's a woman in all england who can bring anybody's spirit down as quick as you can my love mrs squeers chuckled vastly on the receipt of these flattering compliments and said she hoped she had attained a high spirit or two in her day it is but due to her character to say that in conjunction with her estimable husband she had broken many and many a one miss fanny squeers carefully treasured up this and much more conversation on the same subject until she retired for the night when she questioned the hungry servant minutely regarding the outward appearance and demeanour of nicholas to which queries the girl returned such enthusiastic replies coupled with so many laudatory remarks touching his beautiful dark eyes and his sweet smile and his straight legs upon which last named article she laid particular stress the general run of legs at dotheboys hall being crooked that miss squeers was not long in arriving at the conclusion that the new usher must be a very remarkable person or as she herself significantly phrased it something quite out of the common and so miss squeers made up her mind that she would take a personal observation of nicholas the very next day in pursuance of this design the young lady watched the opportunity of her mother being engaged and her father absent and went accidentally into the schoolroom to get a pen mended where seeing nobody but nicholas presiding over the boys she blushed very deeply and exhibited great confusion i beg your pardon faltered miss squeers i thought my father was or might be oh dear me how very awkward mr squeers is out said nicholas by no means overcome by the apparition unexpected though it was do you know how long it will be sir asked miss squeers with a bashful hesitation he said about an hour replied nicholas politely of course but without any indication of being stricken to the heart by miss squeers charms i never knew anything happen so cross exclaimed the young lady thank you i'm very sorry i intruded i'm sure if i hadn't thought my father was here i wouldn't upon any account have it is very provoking must look so very strange murmured miss squeers blushing once more and glancing from the pen in her hand to nicholas at his desk and back again if that is all you want said nicholas pointing to the pen and smiling in spite of himself at the affected embarrassment of the schoolmaster's daughter perhaps i can supply his place miss squeers glanced at the door as if dubious of the propriety of advancing any nearer to an utter stranger then round the schoolroom as though in some measure reassured by the presence of forty boys and finally sidled up to nicholas and delivered the pen into his hand 
with the most winning mixture of reserve and condescension shall it be a hard or a soft nib inquired nicholas smiling to prevent himself from laughing outright he has a beautiful smile thought miss squeers which did you say asked nicholas dear me i was thinking of something else for the moment i declare replied miss squeers oh as soft as possible if you please with which words miss squeers sighed it might be to give nicholas to understand that her heart was soft and that the pen was wanted to match upon these instructions nicholas made the pen when he gave it to miss squeers miss squeers dropped it and when he stooped to pick it up miss squeers stooped also and they knocked their heads together whereat five and twenty little boys laughed aloud being positively for the first and only time that half year very awkward of me said nicholas opening the door for the young lady's retreat not at all sir replied miss squeers it was my fault it was all my foolish uh, good morning good-bye said nicholas the next i make for you i hope will be made less clumsily take care you are biting the nib off now really said miss squeers so embarrassing i scarcely know what i very sorry to give you so much trouble not the least trouble in the world replied nicholas closing the schoolroom door oh i never saw such legs in the whole course of my life said miss squeers as she walked away in fact miss squeers was in love with nicholas nickleby to account for the rapidity with which this young lady had conceived a passion for nicholas it may be necessary to state that the friend from whom she had so recently returned was a miller's daughter of only eighteen who had contracted herself under the son of a small corn factor resident in the nearest market town miss squeers and the miller's daughter being fast friends had covenanted together some two years before according to a custom prevalent among young ladies that whoever was first engaged to be married should straightway confide the mighty secret to the bosom of the other before communicating it to any living soul and bespeak her as bridesmaid without loss of time in fulfilment of which pledge the miller's daughter when her engagement was formed came out express at eleven o'clock at night as the corn factor's son made an offer of his hand and heart at twenty-five minutes past ten by the dutch clock in the kitchen and rushed into miss squeer's bedroom with the gratifying intelligence now miss squeers being five years older and out of her teens which is also a great matter had since been more than commonly anxious to return the compliment and possess her friend with a similar secret but either in consequence of finding it hard to please herself or harder still to please anybody else had never had an opportunity so to do inasmuch as she had no such secret to disclose the little interview with nicholas had no sooner passed as above described however than miss squeers putting on her bonnet made her way with great precipitation to her friend's house and upon a solemn renewal of diverse old vows of secrecy revealed how that she was not exactly engaged but going to be to a gentleman's son none of your corn factors but a gentleman's son of high descent who had come down as a teacher to dotheboys hall under the most mysterious and remarkable circumstances indeed as miss squeers more than once hinted she had good reason to believe induced by the fame of her many charms to seek her out and woo and win her isn't it an extraordinary thing said miss squeers emphasizing the adjective strongly most extraordinary replied the friend but what has he said to you don't ask me what he said my dear rejoined miss squeers if you'd only seen his looks and smiles i never was so overcome in all my life did he look in this way inquired the miller's daughter counterfeiting as nearly as she could a favourite leer of the corn factor very like that only more genteel replied miss squeers ah said the friend then he means something depend upon it miss squeers having slight misgivings on the subject was by no means ill pleased to be confirmed by a competent authority and discovering on further conversation and comparison of notes a great many points of resemblance between the behaviour of nicholas and that of the corn factor grew so exceedingly confidential that she entrusted her friend with a vast number of things nicholas had not said which were all so very complimentary as to be quite conclusive then she dilated on the fearful hardship of having a father and mother strenuously opposed to her intended husband on which unhappy circumstance she dwelt at great length for the friend's father and mother were quite agreeable to her being married and the whole courtship was in consequence as flat and common a place affair as it was possible to imagine 
how i should like to see him exclaimed the friend so you shall tilda replied miss squeers i should consider myself one of the most ungrateful creatures alive if i denied you i think my mother's going away for two days to fetch some boys and when she does i'll ask you and john up to tea and have him to meet you this was a charming idea and having fully discussed it the friends parted it so fell out that mrs squeers journey to some distance to fetch three new boys and done the relations of two old ones for the balance of a small account was fixed that very afternoon for the next day but one and on the next day but one mrs squeers got up outside the coach as it stopped to change at greta bridge taking with her a small bundle containing something in a bottle and some sandwiches and carrying besides a large white topcoat to wear in the night-time with which baggage she went her way whenever such opportunities as these occurred it was squeers's custom to drive over to the market town every evening on pretence of urgent business and stop till ten or eleven o'clock at a tavern he much affected as the party was not in his way therefore but rather afforded a means of compromise with miss squeers he readily yielded his full assent thereunto and willingly communicated to nicholas that he was expected to take his tea in the parlour that evening at five o'clock to be sure miss squeers was in a desperate flutter as the time approached and to be sure she was dressed out to the best advantage with her hair it had more than a tinge of red and she wore it in a crop curled in five distinct rows up to the very top of her head and arranged dexterously over the doubtful eye to say nothing of the blue sash which floated down her back or the worked apron or the long gloves or the green gauze scarf worn over one shoulder and under the other or any of the numerous devices which were to be so many arrows to the heart of nicholas she had scarcely completed these arrangements to her entire satisfaction when the friend arrived with a whitey brown parcel flat and three-cornered containing sundry small adornments which were to be put on upstairs and which the friend put on talking incessantly when miss squeers had done the friend's hair the friend did miss squeers hair throwing in some striking improvements in the way of ringlets down the neck and then when they were both touched up to their entire satisfaction they went downstairs in full state with the long gloves on all ready for company where's john tilda said miss squeers when he gone home to clean himself replied the friend he will be here by the time the tea's drawn oh, i do so palpitate observed miss squeers oh, i know what it is replied the friend i have not been used to it you know tilda said miss squeers applying her hand to the left side of her sash you'll soon get the better of it dear rejoined the friend while they were talking thus the hungry servant brought in the tea things and soon afterwards somebody tapped at the room door there he is cried miss squeers oh tilda hush said tilda say come in come in cried miss squeers faintly and in walked nicholas good evening said that young gentleman all unconscious of his conquest i understood from mr squeers that oh yes it's all right interposed miss squeers father don't take tea with us but you won't mind that i dare say this was said archly nicholas opened his eyes at this but he turned the matter off very coolly not caring particularly about anything just then and went through the ceremony of introduction to the miller's daughter with so much grace that the young lady was lost in admiration we're only waiting for one more gentleman said miss squeers taking off the teapot lid and looking in to see how the tea was getting on it was a matter of equal moment to nicholas whether they were waiting for one gentleman or twenty so he received the intelligence with perfect unconcern and being out of spirits and not seeing any special reason why he should make himself agreeable looked out of the window and sighed involuntarily as luck would have it miss squeers friend was of a playful turn and hearing nicholas sigh she took it into her head to rally the lovers on the lowness of spirits but if it's caused by my being here said the young lady don't mind me a bit for i'm quite as bad you may go on just as you would if you were alone tilda said miss squeers colouring up to the top row of curls i am ashamed of you and here the two friends burst into a variety of giggles and glanced from time to time over the tops of their pocket handkerchiefs at nicholas who from a state of unmixed astonishment gradually fell into one of irrepressible laughter 
occasioned partly by the bare notion of his being in love with Miss Squeers, and partly by the preposterous appearance and behaviour of the two girls. These two causes of merriment taken together struck him as being so keenly ridiculous that despite his miserable condition he laughed till he was thoroughly exhausted. Well, thought Nicholas, as I am here, and seem expected for some reason or other to be amiable, it's of no use looking like a goose. I may as well accommodate myself to the company. We blush to tell it, but his youthful spirits and vivacity getting, for the time, the better of his sad thoughts, he no sooner formed this resolution than he saluted Miss Squeers and the friend with great gallantry, drawing a chair to the tea-table, began to make himself more at home than in all probability an usher has ever done in his employer's house since ushers were first invented. The ladies were in the full delight of this altered behaviour on the part of Mr. Nickleby, when the expected swain arrived, with his hair very damp from recent washing, and a clean shirt whereof the collar might have belonged to some giant ancestor, forming together with a white waistcoat of similar dimensions the chief ornament of his person. "'Well, John,' said Miss Matilda Price, which, by the by, was the name of the miller's daughter. "'Well,' said John, with a grin that even the collar could not conceal. "'I beg your pardon,' interposed Miss Squeers, hasting to do the honours. "'Mr. Nickleby, Mr. John Brodie. "'Servant, sir,' said John, who was something over six foot high, with a face and body rather above the due proportion than below it. "'Yours to command, sir,' replied Nicholas, making fearful ravages on the bread and butter. Mr. Browdie was not a gentleman of great conversational powers, so he grinned twice more, and having now bestowed his customary mark of recognition on every person in company, grinned at nothing in particular and helped himself to food. "'Old woman away, bain't she?' said Mr. Browdie, with his mouth full. Miss Squeers nodded assent. Mr. Browdie gave a grin of special wit, as if he thought that really was something to laugh at, and went to work at the bread and butter with increased vigour. It was quite a sight to behold how he and Nicholas emptied the plate between them. But "'You won't get bread and butter every night, I expect, man,' said Mr. Browdie, after he had sat staring at Nicholas a long time over the empty plate. Nicholas bit his lip and coloured, but affected not to hear the remark. "'Here, cod,' said Mr. Browdie, laughing boisterously. "'They don't put much into them. You'll be no but skin and bones if you stop here long enough. <laughs> "'You are facetious, sir,' said Nicholas scornfully. "'No, I don't know,' replied Mr. Browdie. "'But to the teacher, Cod, he were a lean, and he were.' The recollection of the last teacher's leanness seemed to afford Mr. Browdie the most exquisite delight, for he laughed until he found it necessary to apply his coat-cuffs to his eyes. "'I don't know whether your perceptions are quite keen enough, Mr. Browdie, to enable you to understand that your remarks are offensive,' said Nicholas, in a towering passion. "'But if they are, have the goodness to—' "'If you say another word, John,' shrieked Miss Pice, stopping her admirer's mouth as he was going to interrupt, "'only half a word. I'll never forgive you or speak to you again.' "'Well, my lass, I don't care about em,' said the corn factor, bestowing a hearty kiss on Miss Matilda. "'Let em gang on, let em gang on.' It now became Miss Squeer's turn to intercede with Nicholas, which she did with many symptoms of alarm and horror. The effect of the double intercession was that he and John Browdie shook hands across the table, with much gravity, and such was the imposing nature of the ceremonial that Miss Squeers was overcome and shed tears. "'What's the matter, Fanny?' said Miss Price. "'Nothing,' Tilda replied, Miss Squeers, sobbing. "'There never was any danger,' said Miss Price. "'Was there, Mr. Nickleby?' "'None at all,' replied Nicholas. "'Absurd.' "'That's right,' whispered Miss Price. "'Say something kind to her, and she'll soon come round. "'Here, shall John and I go into the kitchen and come back presently?' "'Not on any account,' rejoined Nicholas, quite alarmed at the proposition. "'What on earth should you do that for?' "'Well,' said Miss Price, beckoning him aside, and speaking with some degree of contempt, "'you are a one to keep company.' "'What do you mean?' said Nicholas. "'I am not a one to keep company at all. Here, at all events, I can't make this out.' "'No, nor I neither,' rejoined Miss Price. "'But men are always fickle, and always were, and always will be. That I can make out very easily.' fickle cried nicholas what do you suppose you don't mean to say you think oh no i think nothing at all retorted miss price pettishly look at her dress so beautiful and looking so well really almost handsome i'm ashamed of you my dear girl what have i got to do with her dressing beautifully or looking well inquired nicholas come don't call me dear girl said miss price smiling a little though for she was pretty and a coquette too in her small way 
and nicholas was good-looking and she supposed him the property of somebody else which were all reasons why she should be gratified to think she had made an impression on him or fanny will be saying it's my fault come we're going to have a game at cards pronouncing these last words aloud she tripped away and rejoined the big yorkshireman this was wholly unintelligible to nicholas who had no other distinct impression on his mind at the moment than that miss squeers was an ordinary-looking girl and her friend miss price a pretty one but he had not had time to enlighten himself by reflection for the hearth being by this time swept up and the candle snuff they sat down to play speculation there are only four of us tilda said miss squeers looking slyly at nicholas so we had better go partners two against two what do you say mr nickleby inquired miss price with all the pleasure in life replied nicholas and so saying quite unconscious of his heinous offence he amalgamated into one common heap those portions of dotheboys hall card of terms which represented his own counters and those allotted to miss price respectively mr Brodie said miss squeers hysterically shall we make a bank against them the auctionman assented apparently quite overwhelmed by the new usher's impudence and miss squeers darted a spiteful look at her friend and giggled convulsively the deal fell to nicholas and the hand prospered we intend to win everything said he tilda has won something she didn't expect i think haven't you dear said miss squeers maliciously only a dozen and eight love replied miss price affecting to take the question in a literal sense how dull you are to-night sneered miss squeers no indeed replied miss price i am in excellent spirits i was thinking you seemed out of sorts me cried miss squeers biting her lips and trembling with very jealousy oh no that's well remarked miss price your hair's coming out of curl dear never mind me tittered miss squeers you'd better attend to your partner thank you for reminding her said nicholas so she had the yorkshireman flattened his nose once or twice with his clenched fist as if to keep his hand in till he had an opportunity of exercising it upon the features of some other gentleman and miss squeers tossed her head with such indignation that the gust of wind raised by the multitudinous curls in motion nearly blew the candle out i never had such luck really exclaimed coquettish miss price after another hand or two it's all along of you mr nickleby i think i should like to have you for a partner always i wish you had you'll have a bad wife though if you always win at cards said miss price not if your wish is gratified replied nicholas i'm sure i shall have a good one in that case to see how miss squeers tossed her head and the corn factor flattened his nose while this conversation was carrying on it would have been worth a small annuity to have beheld that let alone miss price's evident joy at making them jealous and nicholas nickleby's happy unconsciousness of making anybody uncomfortable we have all the talking to ourselves it seems said nicholas looking good-humouredly round the table as he took the cards up for a fresh deal you do it so well tittered miss squeers that it would be a pity to interrupt wouldn't it mr browdie eh? nay said nicholas we do it in default of having anybody else to talk to we'll talk to you you know if you'll say anything said miss price thank you tilda dear retorted miss squeers majestically or you can talk to each other if you don't choose to talk to us said miss price rallying her dear friend john won't you say something say summat repeated the yorkshireman oh you not sit there so silent and glum well then said the yorkshireman striking the table heavily with his fist what i say is this dang my bones and body if i can't stand this any longer do you gang home with me and do young light and tight young whips to look sharp out for a broken head next time he comes under my hand mercy on us what's all this cried miss price in affected astonishment come on tully come on replied the yorkshireman sternly and as he delivered the reply miss squeers burst into a shower of tears arising in part from the desperate vexation and in part from an impotent desire to lacerate somebody's countenance with her fair fingernails this state of things had been brought about by diverse means and workings miss squeers had brought it about by aspiring to the high state and condition of being matrimonially engaged without good grounds for so doing miss price had brought it about by indulging in three motives of action first a desire to punish her friend for laying claim to a rivalship in dignity having no good title secondly the gratification of her own vanity in receiving the compliments of a smart young man and thirdly a wish to convince the corn factor of the great danger he ran in deferring the celebration of their expected nuptials 
while nicholas had brought it about by half an hour's gaiety and thoughtlessness and a very sincere desire to avoid the imputation of inclining at all to miss squeers so the means employed and the end produced were alike the most natural in the world for all young ladies will look forward to being married and will jostle each other in the race to the altar and will avail themselves of all opportunities of displaying their own attractions to the best advantage down to the very end of time as they have done from its beginning why and here's fanny in tears now exclaimed miss price as if in fresh amazement what can be the matter oh you don't know miss of course you don't know pray don't trouble yourself to inquire said miss squeers producing that change of countenance which children call making a face well i'm sure exclaimed miss price and who cares whether you're sure or not ma'am retorted miss squeers making another face you are monstrous polite ma'am said miss price i shall not come to you to take lessons in the art ma'am retorted miss squeers you needn't take the trouble to make yourself plainer than you are ma'am however rejoined miss price because that's quite unnecessary miss squeers in reply turned very red and thanked god that she hadn't got the bold faces of some people miss price in rejoinder congratulated herself upon not being possessed of the envious feelings of other people whereupon miss squeers made some general remark touching the danger of associating with low persons in which miss price entirely coincided observing that it was very true indeed and she had thought so a long time hilda exclaimed miss squeers with dignity i hate you ah oh, there's no love lost between us i assure you said miss price tying her bonnet strings with a jerk you will cry your eyes out when i'm gone you know you will i scorn your words minx said miss squeers you pay me a great compliment when you say so answered the miller's daughter curtsying very low wish you a very good night ma'am and pleasant dreams attend your sleep with this parting benediction miss price swept from the room followed by the huge yorkshireman who exchanged with nicholas at parting that particularly expressive scowl with which the cut and thrust counts in melodramatic performances inform each other that they will meet again they were no sooner gone than miss squeers fulfilled the prediction of her quondam friend by giving vent to a most copious burst of tears and uttering various dismal lamentations and incoherent words nicholas stood looking on for a few seconds rather doubtful what to do but feeling uncertain whether the fit would end in his being embraced or scratched and considering that either infliction would be equally agreeable he walked off quietly while miss squeers was moaning in her pocket handkerchief this is one consequence thought nicholas when he had groped his way to the dark sleeping room of my cursed readiness to adapt myself to any society in which chance carries me if i had sat mute and motionless as i might have done this would not have happened he listened for a few minutes but all was quiet i was glad he murmured to grasp any relief from the sight of this dreadful place or the presence of its vile master i have set these people by the ears and made two new enemies where heaven knows i needed none well it is a just punishment for having forgotten even for an hour what is around me now so saying he felt his way among the throng of weary-hearted sleepers and crept into his poor bed end of chapter nine chapter ten of the life and adventures of nicholas nickleby by charles dickens this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten how mr ralph nickleby provided for his niece and sister-in-law on the second morning after the departure of nicholas for yorkshire kate nickleby sat in a very faded chair raised upon a very dusty throne in miss la creevy's room giving that lady a sitting for the portrait upon which she was engaged and towards the full perfection of which miss la creevy had had the street door case brought upstairs in order that she might be the better able to infuse into the counterfeit countenance of miss nickleby a bright salmon flesh tint which she originally hit upon while executing the miniature of a young officer therein contained and which bright salmon flesh tint was considered by miss la creevy's chief friends and patrons to be quite a novelty in art as indeed it was 
i think i've caught it now said miss la creevy the very shade this will be the sweetest portrait i have ever done certainly it will be your genius that makes it so then i am sure replied kate smiling no no i won't allow that my dear rejoined miss la creevy it's a very nice subject very nice subject indeed though of course something depends upon the mode of treatment and not a little observed kate why my dear you are right there said miss la creevy in the main you are right there though i don't allow that it is of such very great importance in the present case ah the difficulties of art my dear are great they must be i have no doubt said kate humouring her good-natured little friend they are beyond anything you can form the faintest conception of replied miss la creevy what with bringing out eyes with all one's power and keeping down noses with all one's force and adding to heads and taking away teeth altogether you have no idea of the trouble one little miniature is the remuneration can scarcely repay you said kate why it does not and that's the truth answered miss la creevy and then people are so dissatisfied and unreasonable that nine times out of ten there's no pleasure in painting them sometimes i say oh how very serious you've made me look miss la creevy and to others la miss la creevy how very smirking I mean, the very essence of a good portrait is that it must be either serious or smirking or it's no portrait at all indeed said kate laughing certainly my dear because the sitters are always either one or the other replied miss la creevy look at the royal academy all those beautiful shiny portraits of gentlemen in black velvet waistcoats with their fists doubled up on round tables or marble slabs are serious you know and all the ladies who are playing with the little parasols or little dogs or little children it's the same rule in any art only varying the objects are smirking in fact said miss la creevy sinking her voice to a confidential whisper there are only two styles of portrait painting the serious and the smirk and we always use the serious for professional people except actors sometimes and the smirk for private ladies and gentlemen who don't care so much about looking clever kate seemed highly amused by this information and miss la creevy went on painting and talking with immovable complacency what a number of officers you seem to paint said kate availing herself of a pause in the discourse and glancing round the room number of what child inquired miss la creevy looking up from her work character portraits oh yes they're not real military men you know no bless your heart of course not only clerks and that who hire a uniform coat to be painted in and send it here in a carpet bag sometimes artists said miss la creevy keep a red coat and charge seven and sixpence extra for hire and carmine but i don't do that myself for i don't consider it legitimate drawing herself up as though she plumed herself greatly upon not resorting to these lures to catch sitters miss la creevy applied herself more intently to her task only raising her head occasionally to look with unspeakable satisfaction at some touch she had just put in and now and then giving miss nickleby to understand what particular feature she was at work upon at the moment not she expressly observed that you should make it up for painting my dear but because it's our custom sometimes to tell sitters what part we are upon in order that if there's any particular expression they want introduced they may throw it in at the time you know and when said miss la creevy after a long silence to wit an interval of a full minute and a half when do you expect to see your uncle again i scarcely know i had expected to have seen him before now replied kate soon i hope for this state of uncertainty is worse than anything i suppose he has money hasn't he inquired miss la creevy he is very rich i have heard rejoined kate i don't know that he is but i believe so ah uh, you may depend upon it he is or he wouldn't be so surly remarked miss la creevy who was an odd little mixture of shrewdness and simplicity when a man's a bear he is generally pretty independent his manner is rough said kate rough cried miss la creevy a porcupine's featherbed to him i never met with such a cross-grained old savage it is only his manner i believe observed kate timidly he was disappointed in early life i think i have heard or he has had his temper soured by some calamity i should be sorry to think ill of him until i knew he deserved it well that's very right and proper observed the miniature painter and heaven forbid that i should be the cause of your doing so but now mightn't he without feeling it himself make you and your mamma some nice little allowance that would keep you both comfortable until you were well married 
and be a little fortune to her afterwards what would a hundred a year for instance be to him i don't know what it would be to him said kate with energy but it would be that to me i would rather die than take heyday cried miss la creevy a dependence upon him said kate would embitter my whole life i should feel begging a far less degradation well exclaimed miss la creevy this of a relation whom you will not hear an indifferent person speak ill of my dear sounds oddly enough i confess i dare say it does replied kate speaking more gently indeed i am sure it must i i only mean that with the feelings and recollection of better times upon me i could not bear to live on anybody's bounty not his particularly but anybody's miss la creevy looked slyly at her companion as if she doubted whether ralph himself were not the subject of dislike but seeing that her young friend was distressed made no remark i only ask of him continued kate whose tears fell while she spoke that he will move so little out of his way in my behalf as to enable me by his recommendation only by his recommendation to earn literally my bread and remain with my mother whether we shall ever taste happiness again depends upon the fortunes of my dear brother but if he will do this and nicholas only tells us that he is well and cheerful i shall be contented as she ceased to speak there was a rustling behind the screen which stood between her and the door and some person knocked on the wainscot come in whoever it is cried miss la creevy the person complied and coming forward at once gave to view the form and features of no less an individual than mr ralph nickleby himself your servant ladies said ralph looking sharply at them by turns you were talking so loud that i was unable to make you hear when the man of business had a more than commonly vicious snarl lurking at his heart he had a trick of almost concealing his eyes under their thick protruding brows for an instant and then displaying them in their full keenness as he did so now and tried to keep down the smile which parted his thin compressed lips and puckered up the bad lines around his mouth they both felt certain that some part if not the whole of their recent conversation had been overheard i called in on my way upstairs more than half expecting to find you here said ralph addressing his niece and looking contemptuously at the portrait is that my niece's portrait ma'am yes it is mr nickleby said miss la creevy with a very sprightly air and between you and me and the post sir it will be a very nice portrait too though i say it who am the painter don't trouble yourself to show it to me ma'am cried ralph nickleby moving away i have no eye for likenesses is it nearly finished why yes replied miss la creevy considering with the pencil end of her brush in her mouth two more sittings will have them at once ma'am said ralph shall have no time to idle over fooleries after to-morrow work ma'am work we must all work have you let your lodgings ma'am i have not put a bill up yet sir put it up at once ma'am they won't want the rooms after this week or if they do can't pay for them now my dear if you're ready we'll lose no more time with an assumption of kindness which sat worse upon him than even his usual manner mr ralph nickleby motioned to the young lady to precede him and bowing gravely to miss la creevy closed the door and followed upstairs where mrs nickleby received him with many expressions of regard stopping them somewhat abruptly ralph waved his hand with an impatient gesture and proceeded to the object of his visit i have found a situation for your daughter ma'am said ralph well replied mrs nickleby now i will say that is only just what i have expected of you depend upon it i said to kate only yesterday morning at breakfast that after your uncle has provided in that most ready manner for nicholas he will not leave us until he has done at least the same for you these were my very words as near as i remember kate my dear why don't you thank your let me proceed ma'am pray said ralph interrupting his sister-in-law in the full torrent of her discourse kate my love let your uncle proceed said mrs nickleby i am most anxious that he should mamma rejoined kate well my dear if you are anxious that he should you had better allow your uncle to say what he has to say without interruption observed mrs nickleby with many small nods and frowns your uncle's time is very valuable my dear and whoever desirous you may be and naturally desirous as i am sure any affectionate relations who have seen so little of your uncle as we have must naturally be to protract the pleasure of having him among us 
still we are bound not to be selfish but to take into consideration the important nature of his occupations in the city i am very much obliged to you ma'am said ralph with a scarcely perceptible sneer an absence of business habits in this family leads apparently to a great waste of words before business when it does come under consideration is arrived at at all i fear it is so indeed replied mrs nickleby with a sigh your poor brother my poor brother ma'am interposed ralph tartly had no idea what business was was unacquainted i verily believe with the very meaning of the word i fear he was said mrs nickleby with her handkerchief to her eyes if it hadn't been for me i don't know what would have become of him what strange creatures we are the slight bait so skilfully thrown out by ralph on their first interview was dangling on the hook yet at every small deprivation or discomfort which presented itself in the course of the four-and-twenty hours to remind her of her straitened and altered circumstances peevish visions of her dower of one thousand pounds had arisen before mrs nickleby's mind until at last she had come to persuade herself that of all her late husband's creditors she was the worst used and the most to be pitied and yet she had loved him dearly for many years and had no greater share of selfishness than that is the usual of mortals such is the irritability of sudden poverty a decent annuity would have restored her thoughts to their old train at once repining is of no use ma'am said ralph of all fruitless errands sending a tear to look after a day that is gone is the most fruitless so it is sobbed mrs nickleby so it is as you feel so keenly in your own person person the consequences of inattention to business ma'am said ralph i am sure you will impress upon your children the necessity of attaching themselves to it early in life of course i must see that rejoined mrs nickleby sad experience you know brother-in-law kate my dear put that down in the next letter to nicholas or remind me to do it if i write ralph paused for a few moments and seeing that he had now made pretty sure of the mother in case the daughter objected to his proposition went on to say the situation that i have made interest to procure ma'am is with with a milliner and dressmaker in short a milliner cried mrs nickleby a milliner and dressmaker ma'am replied ralph dressmakers in london as i need not remind you ma'am who are so well acquainted with all matters in the ordinary routine of life make large fortunes keep equipages and become persons of great wealth and fortune now the first idea called up in mrs nickleby's mind by the words milliner and dressmaker were connected with certain wicker baskets lined with black oilskin which she remembered to have seen carried to and fro in the streets but as ralph proceeded these disappeared and were replaced by visions of large houses in the west end neat private carriages and a banker's book all of which images succeeded each other with such rapidity that he had no sooner finished speaking and she nodded her head and said very true with the great appearance of satisfaction what your uncle says is very true kate my dear said mrs nickleby i recollect when your poor papa and i came to town after we were married that a young lady brought me home a chip cottage bonnet with white and green trimming and green persian lining in her own carriage which drove up to the door full gallop at least i am not quite certain whether it was her own carriage or a hackney chariot but i remember very well that the horse dropped down dead as he was turning round and that your poor papa said that he hadn't had any corn for a fortnight this anecdote so strikingly illustrative of the opulence of milliners was not received with any great demonstration of feeling inasmuch as kate hung down her head while it was relating and ralph manifested very intelligible symptoms of extreme impatience the lady's name said ralph hastily striking in is mantalini madame mantalini i know her she lives near cavendish square if your daughter is disposed to try after the situation i'll take her there directly have you nothing to say to your uncle my love inquired mrs nickleby a great deal replied kate but not now i would rather speak to him when we are alone it will save his time if i thank him and say what i wish to say to him as we walk along with these words kate hurried away to hide the traces of emotion that were stealing down her face and to prepare herself for the walk while mrs nickleby amused her brother-in-law by giving him with many tears a detailed account of the dimensions of a rosewood cabinet piano they had possessed in their days of affluence together with a minute description of eight drawing-room chairs 
with turned legs and green chintz squabs to match the curtains, which had cost two pounds fifteen shillings apiece, and had gone at the sale for a mere nothing. These reminiscences were at length cut short by Kate's return in her walking dress, when Ralph, who had been fretting and fuming during the whole time of her absence, lost no time and used very little ceremony in descending into the street. Now, he said, taking her arm, walk as fast as you can, and you'll get to the step that you'll have to walk to business with every morning. So saying, he led Kate off at a good round pace towards Cavendish Square. I am very much obliged to you, uncle, said the young lady, after they had hurried on in silence for some time. Very. I'm glad to hear it, said Ralph. I hope you'll do your duty. I will try to please, uncle, replied Kate. Indeed, I don't begin to cry, growled Ralph. I hate crying. It's very foolish, I know, uncle, began poor Kate. It is, replied Ralph, stopping her short, and very affected besides. Let me see no more of it. Perhaps this was not the best way to dry the tears of a young and sensitive female, about to make her first entry on an entirely new scene of life, among cold and uninterested strangers. But it had its effect notwithstanding. Kate coloured deeply, breathed quickly for a few moments, and then walked on with a firmer and more determined step. It was a curious contrast to see how the timid country girl shrank through the crowd that hurried up and down the streets, giving way to the press of people and clinging closely to Ralph as though she feared to lose him in the throng, and how the stern and hard-featured man of business went doggedly on, elbowing the passengers aside, and now and then exchanging a gruff salutation with some passing acquaintance, who turned to look back upon his pretty charge, with looks expressive of surprise, and seemed to wonder at the ill-assorted companionship. But it would have been a stranger contrast still to have read the hearts that were beating side by side, to have laid bare the gentle innocence of the one and the rugged villainy of the other, to have hung upon the guileless thoughts of the affectionate girl, and have been amazed that among all the wily plots and calculations of the old man there should not be one word or figure denoting thought of death or the grave. But so it was, and stranger still, though this is the thing of every day, the warm young heart palpitated with a thousand anxieties and apprehensions, while that of the old worldly man lay rusting in its cell, beating only as a piece of cunning mechanism, and yielding no one throb of hope or fear or love or care for any living thing. Uncle, said Kate, when she judged they must be near their destination, I must ask one question of you. Am I to live at home? At home? replied Ralph. Where's that? I mean with my mother, the widow, said Kate emphatically. You will live, to all intents and purposes, here, rejoined Ralph, for here you will take your meals, and here you will be from morning till night, occasionally perhaps till morning again. But at night, I mean, said Kate. I cannot leave her, uncle. I must have some place that I can call a home. It will be wherever she is, you know, and it may be a very humble one. May be, said Ralph, walking faster in the impatience provoked by the remark. Must be, you mean. May be a humble one. Is the girl mad? The word slipped from my lips. I did not mean it indeed, urged Kate. I hope not, said Ralph. But my question, uncle, you have not answered it. Why, I anticipated something of the kind, said Ralph, and though I object very strongly, mind, have provided against it. I spoke of you as an out-of-door worker, so you will go to this home that may be humble every night. There was a comfort in this. Kate poured forth many thanks for her uncle's consideration, which Ralph received as if he had deserved them all, and they arrived without any further conversation at the dressmaker's door, which displayed a very large plate with Madame Mantellini's name and occupation, and was approached by a handsome flight of steps. There was a shop to the house, but it was let off to an importer of Otto of Roses. Madame Mantellini's showrooms were on the first floor, a fact which was notified to the nobility and gentry by the casual exhibition, near the handsomely curtained windows, of two or three elegant bonnets of the newest fashion, and some costly garments in the most approved taste. A liveried footman opened the door, and in reply to Ralph's inquiry whether Madame Mantellini was at home, ushered them through a handsome hall and up a spacious staircase into the show salon, which comprised two spacious drawing rooms, and exhibited an immense variety of superb dresses and materials for dresses, some arranged on stands, others laid carelessly on sofas, and others again scattered over the carpet 
hanging on the cheval glasses or mingling in some way with the rich furniture of various descriptions which was profusely displayed they waited here a much longer time than was agreeable to mr ralph nickleby who eyed the gaudy frippery about him with very little concern and was at length about to pull the bell when a gentleman suddenly popped his head into the room and seeing somebody there as suddenly popped it out again here hello cried ralph who's that at the sound of ralph's voice the head reappeared and the mouth displaying a very long row of very white teeth uttered in a mincing tone the words damn it what nickleby oh damn it having uttered which ejaculations the gentleman advanced and shook hands with ralph with great warmth he was dressed in a gorgeous morning gown with a waistcoat and turkish trousers of the same pattern pink silk neckerchief and bright green slippers and had a very copious watch chain wound round his body moreover he had whiskers and a moustache both dyed black and gracefully curled damn it you don't mean to say you want me do you damn it said this gentleman smiting ralph on the shoulder not yet said ralph sarcastically <laughs> damn it cried the gentleman when reeling round to laugh with greater elegance he encountered kate nickleby who was standing near my niece said ralph i remember said the gentleman striking his nose with the knuckle of his forefinger as a chastening for his forgetfulness damn it i remember what you came for step this way nickleby my dear will you follow me <laughs> they all follow me nickleby always did damn it always giving loose to the playfulness of his imagination after this fashion the gentleman led the way to a private sitting-room on the second floor scarcely less elegantly furnished than the apartment below where the presence of a silver coffee-pot an egg-shell and a sloppy china for one seemed to show that he had just breakfasted sit down my dear said the gentleman first staring at miss nickleby out of countenance and then grinning in delight at the achievement this cursed high room takes one's breath away these infernal sky parlours i'm afraid i must move nickleby i would by all means replied ralph looking bitterly around what a damned round fellow you are nickleby said the gentleman the damnedest longest-headed queerest-tempered old coiner of gold and silver ever was damn it have a complimented ralph to this effect the gentleman rang the bell and stared at miss nickleby until it was answered when he left off to bid the man desire his mistress to come directly after which he began again and left off no more until madame mantalini appeared the dressmaker was a buxom person handsomely dressed and rather good-looking but much older than the gentleman in the turkish trousers whom she had wedded some six months before his name was originally muntle but it had been converted by an easy transition into mantalini the lady rightly considered that an english appellation would be of serious injury to the business he had married on his whiskers upon which property he had previously subsisted in a genteel manner for some years and which he had recently improved after patient cultivation by the addition of a moustache which promised to secure him an easy independence his share in the labours of the business being at present confined to spending the money and occasionally when that ran short driving to mr ralph nickleby to procure discount at a percentage for the customers bills my life said mr mantalini what a damned devil of a time you have been i didn't even know mr nickleby was here my love said madame mantalini then what a doubly damned infernal rascal that footman must be my soul remonstrated mr mantalini my dear said madame this is entirely your fault my fault my heart's joy certainly returned the lady what can you expect dearest if you will not correct the man correct the man my soul's delight yes i'm sure he wants speaking too badly enough said madame pouting then do not vex itself said mr mantalini he should be horsewhipped till he cries out damnably with this promise mr mantalini kissed madame mantalini and after that performance madame mantalini pulled mr mantalini playfully by the ear which done they descended to business now ma'am said ralph who had looked on at all of this with such scorn as few men can express in looks this is my niece just so mr nickleby replied madame mantalini surveying cape from head to foot and back again can you speak french child yes ma'am replied kate not daring to look up for she felt that the eyes of the odious man in the dressing-gown were directed towards her like a damned native asked the husband miss nickleby offered no reply to this inquiry but turned her back upon the questioner as if addressing herself to make an answer to what his wife might demand we keep twenty young women constantly employed in the establishment said madame indeed ma'am replied kate timidly yes and some of them damned handsome too said the master 
Mantellini, exclaimed his wife in an awful voice. My sense is idle, said Mantellini. Do you wish to break my heart? Not for twenty thousand hemispheres populated with, with two little ballet dancers, replied Mantellini in a poetical strain. Then you will if you persevere in that mode of speaking, said his wife. What can Mr. Nickleby think when he hears you? Oh, nothing, ma'am, nothing, replied Ralph. I know his amiable nature and yours. Mere little remarks that give a zest to your daily intercourse. Lovers' quarrels that add sweetness to those domestic joys, which promise to last so long. That's all, that's all. If an iron door could be supposed to quarrel with its hinges, and to make a firm resolution to open with slow obstinacy, and grind them to powder in the process, it would emit a pleasanter sound in so doing than did these words in the rough and bitter voice in which they were uttered by Ralph. Even Mr. Mantellini felt their influence, and turning affrighted round, exclaimed, What a damned horrid croaking! You will pay no attention, if you please, to what Mr. Mantellini says, observed his wife, addressing Miss Nickleby. I do not, ma'am, said Kate, with quiet contempt. Mr. Mantellini knows nothing whatever about any of the young women, continued madame, looking at her husband and speaking to Kate. If he has seen any of them, he must have seen them in the street, going to or returning from their work, and not here. He was never even in the room. I do not allow it. What hours of work have you been accustomed to? I have never yet been accustomed to work at all, ma'am, replied Kate in a low voice. For which reason she'll work all the better now, said Ralph, putting in a word, lest this confession should injure the negotiation. I hope so, returned Madame Mantellini. Our hours are from nine to nine, with extra work when we're very full of business, for which I allow payment as overtime. Kate bowed her head to imitate that she had heard and was satisfied. Your meals, continued Madame Mantellini, that is, dinner and tea, you will take here. I should think your wages would average from five to seven shillings a week but I can't give you any certain information on that point until I see what you can do. Kate bowed her head again. If you're ready to come, said Madame Mantellini, we'd better begin on Monday morning at nine exactly, and then Miss Nag, the forewoman, shall have directions to try you with some easy work at first. Is there anything more, Mr. Nickleby? Nothing more, ma'am, replied Ralph, rising. Then I believe that's all, said the lady, having arrived at this natural conclusion. She looked at the door as if she wished to be gone but hesitated notwithstanding, as though unwilling to leave Mr. Mantellini the sole honour of showing them downstairs. Ralph relieved her from her perplexity by taking his departure without delay, Madame Mantellini making many gracious inquiries why he never came to see them, and Mr. Mantellini anathematising the stairs with great volubility as he followed them down, in the hope of inducing Kate to look round. A hope, however, which was destined to remain ungratified. There, said Ralph, when they got into the street, now you're provided for. Kate was about to thank him again, but he stopped her. I had some idea, he said, of providing for your mother in a pleasant part of the country. He had a presentation to some almshouses on the border of Cornwall, which had occurred to him more than once. But as you want to be together, I must do something else for her. She has a little money? A very little, replied Kate. A little would go a long way if it's used sparingly, said Ralph. She must see how long she can make it last, living rent-free. You leave your lodgings on Saturday. You told us to do so, Uncle. Yes, there is a house empty that belongs to me, which I can put you in until it's let. And then, if nothing else turns up, perhaps I shall have another. You must live there. Is it far from here, sir? inquired Kate. Pretty well, said Ralph, in another quarter of the town at the east end. But I'll send my clerk down to you at five o'clock on Saturday to take you there. Good-bye, you know your way, straight on. Coldly shaking his niece's hand, Ralph left her at the top of Regent Street, and turned down by a thoroughfare, intent on schemes of money-getting. Kate walked sadly back to their lodgings in the Strand. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven Newman Noggs inducts Mrs. and Miss Nickleby into their new dwelling in the city. 
Miss Nickleby's reflections, as she wended her way homewards, were of that desponding nature which the occurrences of the morning had been sufficiently calculated to awaken. Her uncle's was not a manner likely to dispel any doubts or apprehensions she might have formed in the outset. Neither was the glimpse she had had of Madame Mantalini's establishment by any means encouraging. It was with many gloomy forebodings and misgivings, therefore, that she looked forward with a heavy heart to the opening of her new career. If her mother's consolations could have restored her to a pleasanter and more enviable state of mind, there were abundance of them to produce the effect. By the time Kate had reached home, the good lady had called to mind two authentic cases of milliners who had been possessed of considerable property, though whether they had acquired it all in business, or had a capital to start with, or had been lucky and married to advantage, she could not exactly remember. However, as she very logically remarked, there must have been some young person in that way of business who had made a fortune without having anything to begin with, and that being taken for granted, why should Kate not do the same? Miss La Creevy, who was a member of the little council, ventured to insinuate some doubts relative to the probability of Miss Nickleby's arriving at this happy consummation in the compass of an ordinary lifetime. But the good lady set that question entirely at rest by informing them that she had a presentiment on the subject, a species of second sight with which she had been in the habit of clenching every argument with the deceased Mr. Nickleby, and in nine cases and three quarters out of every ten, determining it the wrong way. "'I'm afraid it's an unhealthy occupation,' said Miss La Creevy. "'I recollect getting three young milliners to sit to me when I first began to paint, and I remember that they were all very pale and sickly.' "'Oh, that's not a general rule by any means,' observed Mrs. Nickleby, "'for I remember as well as if it was only yesterday, "'employing one that I was particularly recommended to, "'to make me a scarlet cloak at the time when scarlet cloaks were fashionable, "'and she had a very red face, a very red face indeed.' "'Perhaps she drank,' suggested Miss La Creevy. Oh, "'I don't know how that may have been,' returned Mrs. Nickleby, "'but I know she had a very red face, so your argument goes for nothing.' In this manner, and with like powerful reasoning, did the worthy matron meet every little objection that presented itself to the new scheme of the morning. A happy Mrs. Nickleby, a project had but to be new, and it came home to her mind, brightly varnished and gilded as a glittering toy. This question disposed of, Kate communicated her uncle's desire about the empty house, to which Mrs. Nickleby assented with equal readiness characteristically remarking that on the fine evenings it would be a pleasant amusement for her to walk to the west and to fetch her daughter home, and no less characteristically forgetting that there were no such things as wet nights and bad weather to be encountered in almost every week of the year. "'I should be sorry, truly sorry, to leave you, my dear kind friend,' said Kate, on whom the good feeling of the poor miniature painter had made a deep impression." "'You shall not shake me off for all that,' replied Miss La Creevy, with as much sprightliness as she could assume. "'I shall see you very often, and come and hear how you get on, and if, in all London, or all the wide world besides, there is no other heart that takes an interest in your welfare, there will be one little lonely woman that prays for it night and day.' With this, the poor soul, who had a heart big enough for Gog, the guardian genius of London, and enough to spare for Magog to boot after making a great many extraordinary faces, which would have secured her an ample fortune, could she have transferred them to ivory or canvas, and sat down in a corner, and had what she termed a real good cry. But no crying, or talking, or hoping, or fearing, could keep off the dreaded Saturday afternoon, or Newman Noggs either, who, punctual to his time, limped up to the door, and breathed the whiff of cordial gin through the keyhole exactly as such of the church clocks in the neighbourhood, as agreed among themselves about the time, struck five. Newman waited for the last stroke, and then knocked. "'From Mr. Ralph Nickleby,' said Newman, announcing his errand when he got upstairs with all possible brevity. "'We should be ready directly,' said Kate. "'We have not much to carry, but I fear we must have a coach.' "'I'll get one,' replied Newman. "'Indeed, you shall not trouble yourself,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'I will,' said Newman. "'I can't suffer you to think of such a thing,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'You can't help it,' said Newman. 
not help it no i thought of it as i came along but i didn't get one thinking you might be ready i think of a great many things nobody can prevent that oh yes i understand you mr noggs said mrs nickleby our thoughts are free of course everybody's thoughts are their own clearly they wouldn't be if some people had their way muttered newman well no more they would mr noggs that's very true rejoined mrs nickleby some people to be sure are such how's your master newman darted a meaning glance at kate and replied with a strong emphasis on the last word of his answer that mr ralph nickleby was well and sent his love i am sure we are very much obliged to him observed mrs nickleby very said newman i'll tell him so it was no very easy matter to mistake newman noggs after having once seen him and as kate attracted by the singularity of his manner in which on this occasion however there was something respectful and even delicate notwithstanding the abruptness of his speech looked at him more closely she recollect having caught a passing glimpse of that strange figure before excuse my curiosity she said but did i not see you in the coachyard on the morning my brother went away to yorkshire newman cast a wistful glance on mrs nickleby and said no most unblushingly no exclaimed kate i should have said so anywhere you have said wrong rejoined newman it's the first time i've been out for three weeks i've had the gout newman was very very far from having the appearance of a gouty subject and so kate could not help thinking but the conference was cut short by mrs nickleby's insisting on having the door shut lest mr noggs should take cold and further persisting in sending the servant girl for a coach for fear he should bring on another attack of his disorder to both conditions newman was compelled to yield presently the coach came and after many sorrowful farewells and a great deal of running backwards and forwards across the pavement on the part of miss la creevy in the course of which the yellow turban came into violent contact with sundry foot passengers it that is to say the coach not the turban went away again with the two ladies and their luggage inside and newman despite all mrs nickleby's assurance that it would be his death on the box beside the driver they went into the city turning down by the riverside and after a long and very slow drive the streets being crowded at that hour with vehicles of every kind stopped in front of a large old dingy house in thames street the door and windows of which were so bespattered with mud that it would have appeared to have been uninhabited for years the door of this deserted mansion newman opened with a key which he took out of his hat in which by the by in consequence of the dilapidated state of his pockets he deposited everything and would have most likely carried his money if he had any and the coach being discharged he led the way to the interior of the mansion old and gloomy and black in truth it was and sullen and dark were the rooms once so bustling with life and enterprise there was a wharf behind opening on the thames an empty dog kennel some bones of animals fragments of iron hopes and staves of old casks lay strewn about but no life was stirring there it was a picture of cold silent decay this house depresses and chills one said kate and seems as if some blight had fallen on it if i were superstitious i should almost be inclined to believe that some dreadful crime had been perpetrated within these old walls and that the place has never prospered since how frowning and how dark it looks lord my dear replied mrs nickleby don't talk that way or you'll frighten me to death it's only my foolish fancy mamma said kate forcing a smile well then my love i wish you'd keep your foolish fancy to yourself and not wake up my foolish fancy to keep it company retorted mrs nickleby why didn't you think of all this before you are so careless we might have asked miss la creevy to keep us company or borrowed a dog or a thousand things but it is always the way and was just the same with your poor dear father unless i thought of everything this was mrs nickleby's usual commencement of a general lamentation running through a dozen or so of complicated sentences addressed to nobody in particular and into which she now launched until her breath was exhausted newman appeared not to hear these remarks but preceded them to a couple of rooms on the first floor which some kind of attempt had been made to render habitable in one there were a few chairs a table 
an old hearth rug and some faded baize, and a fire was ready laid in the grate. In the other stood an old tent bedstead and a few scanty articles of chamber furniture. "'Well, my dear,' said Mrs. Nickleby, trying to be pleased, "'now isn't this thoughtful and considerate of your uncle? Why, we should not have had anything but the bed we bought yesterday to lie down upon, if it hadn't been for his thoughtfulness.' "'Very kind indeed,' replied Kate, looking round. Newman Noggs did not say that he had hunted up the old furniture they saw, from attic and cellar, or that he had taken in the halfpenny worth of milk or for tea that stood upon a shelf, or filled the rusty kettle on the hob, or collected the wood chips from the wharf, or begged the coals, but the notion of Ralph Nickleby having directed it to be done tickled his fancy so much that he could not refrain from cracking all his ten fingers in succession, at which performance Mrs. Nickleby was rather startled at first, but supposing it to be some remote manner connected with the gout, did not remark upon. "'We need detain you no longer, I think,' said Kate. "'Is there nothing I can do?' asked Newman. "'Nothing, thank you,' rejoined Miss Nickleby. "'Perhaps, my dear, Mr. Noggs would like to drink our hells,' said Mrs. Nickleby, fumbling in her reticule for some small kind. "'I think, mamma," said Kate, hesitating, and remarking Newman's averted face, "'you would hurt his feelings if you offered it. Newman Noggs, bowing to the young lady more like a gentleman than the miserable wretch he seemed, placed his hand upon his breast, and pausing for a moment with the air of a man who struggles to speak, but is uncertain what to say, quitted the room. As the jarring echoes of the heavy house door closing on its latch reverberated dismally through the building, Kate felt half tempted to call him back and beg him to remain a little while, but she was ashamed to her own fears and Newman Noggs was on his road homewards. End of chapter 11《Chapter 12 of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 whereby the reader will be enabled to trace the further course of Miss Fanny Square's love, and to ascertain whether it ran smooth or otherwise. It was a fortunate circumstance for Miss Fanny Squeers that when her worthy papa returned home on the night of the small tea-party, he was what the initiated term too far gone to observe the numerous tokens of extreme vexation of spirit which were plainly visible in her countenance. Being, however, of a rather violent and quarrelsome mood in his cups, it is not impossible that he might have fallen out with her either on this or some other imaginary topic, if the young lady had not, with a foresight and prudence highly commendable, kept a boy up on purpose to bear the first brunt of the good gentleman's anger, which, having vented itself in a variety of kicks and cuffs, subsided sufficiently to admit of his being persuaded to go to bed, which he did with his boots on and an umbrella underneath his arm. The hungry servant attended Miss Squeers in her own room according to custom, to curl her hair, perform the other little offices of her toilet, and administer as much flattery as she could get up for the purpose. For Miss Squeers was quite lazy enough, and sufficiently vain and frivolous withal, to have been a fine lady, and it was only the arbitrary distinctions of rank and station which prevented her from being one. "'How lovely your hair do curl to-night, miss,' said the handmaiden. "'I declare, if it isn't a pity and a shame to brush it out.' "'Hold your tongue,' replied Miss Squeers wrathfully. Some considerable experience prevented the girl from being at all surprised at any outbreak of ill-temper on the part of Miss Squeers. Having a half-perception of what had occurred in the course of the evening, she changed her mode of making herself agreeable, and proceeded on the indirect tack. "'Well, I couldn't help saying, miss, if you was to kill me for it,' said the attendant, "'that I never see nobody look so vulgar as Miss Price this night.' Miss Squeers sighed and composed herself to listen. "'I know it's very wrong in me to say so, miss,' continued the girl, delighted to see the impression she was making. "'Miss Price being a friend of yourn and all, but she do dress herself out so, and go on in such a manner to get noticed, that, oh, well, if only people saw themselves.' "'What do you mean, Fib?' asked Miss Squeers, looking into her own little glass, where, like most of us, she saw, not herself, but the reflection of some pleasant image in her own brain, 
How you talk. Talk, miss, it's enough to make a tomcat talk French grammar. If only to see how she tosses her head, replied the handmaid. She does toss her head, observed Miss Squeers, with an air of abstraction. So vain and so very, very plain, said the girl. Poor Tilda, sighed Miss Squeers compassionately. And always laying herself out so to get admired, pursued the servant. Oh dear, it's positive indelicate. I can't allow you to talk in that way, Fib, said Miss Squeers. Tilda's friends are low people, and if she don't know any better, it's their fault and not hers. Well, but you know, Miss, said Phoebe, for which the name Fib was used as a patronising abbreviation, if she was only to take a copy by a friend, oh, if she only knew how wrong she was, and would but set herself right by you, what a nice young woman she might be in time. Fib, rejoined Miss Squeers with a stately air, it's not proper for me to hear these comparisons drawn. They make Tilda look a coarse, improper sort of person, and it seems unfriendly in me to listen to them. I would rather you drop the subject, Fib. At the same time, I must say that if Tilda Price would take pattern by somebody, not me particularly. Oh, yes, you, miss, you, miss, interposed Fib. Well, me, Fib, if you will have it so, said Miss Squeers. I must say that if she would, she would be all the better for it. So somebody else thinks, or I'm much mistaken, said the girl mysteriously. What do you mean? demanded Miss Squeers. Never mind, miss, replied the girl. I know what I know, that's all. Fib, said Miss Squeers dramatically, I insist upon your explaining yourself. What is this dark mystery? Why, if you will have it, miss, it's this, said the servant girl. Mr. John Browdie thinks as you think, and if he wasn't too far gone to do it creditable, he'd be very glad to be off with Miss Price and on with Miss Squeers. Gracious heavens, exclaimed Miss Squeers, clasping her hands with great dignity. What is this? Truth, ma'am, and nothing but the truth, replied the artful Fib. What a situation, cried Miss Squeers, on the brink of unconsciously destroying the peace and happiness of my own Tilda. What is the reason that men fall in love with me? whether I like it or not, and desert their chosen intendeds for my sake. Because I can't help it, miss, replied the girl. The reason's plain. If Miss Squeers were the reason, it was very plain. Never let me hear of it again, retorted Miss Squeers. Never, do you hear? Till the price has faults, many faults, but I wish her well. And above all, I wish her married, for I think it highly desirable, most desirable from the very nature of her failings, that she should be married as soon as possible, no, Fib, let her have Mr. Browdie. I may pity him, poor fellow, but I have a great regard for Tilda, and only hope she may make a better wife than I think she will. With this effusion of feeling, Miss Squeers went to bed. Spite is a little word, but it represents as strange a jumble of feelings and compound of discords as any polysyllable in the language. Miss Squeers knew as well in her heart of hearts that what the miserable serving girl said was sheer coarse lying flattery as did the girl herself yet the mere opportunity of venting a little ill-nature against the offending miss price and affecting to compassionate her weaknesses and foibles though only in the presence of a solitary dependent was almost as great a relief to her spleen as if the whole had been gospel truth nay more we have such extraordinary powers of persuasion when they are exerted over ourselves that Miss Squeers felt quite high-minded and great after a noble renunciation of John Browdie's hand, and looked down upon her rival with a kind of holy calmness and tranquillity, and had a mighty effect in soothing her ruffled feelings. This happy state of mind had some influence in bringing about a reconciliation, for when a knock came at the front door next day, and the miller's daughter was announced, Miss Squeers betook herself to the parlour in a Christian frame of spirit, perfectly beautiful to behold. "'Well, Fanny,' said the miller's daughter, "'you see I have come to see you, although we had some words last night.' "'I pity your bad passions, Tilda,' replied Miss Squeers, "'but I bear no malice. I am above it.' "'Don't be cross, Fanny,' said Miss Price. "'I have come to tell you something that I know will please you.' "'What might that be, Tilda?' demanded Miss Squeers, screwing up her lips and looking as nothing in earth, air, fire, or water could afford her the slightest gleam of satisfaction. "'This,' rejoined Miss Price, "'after we left here last night, John and I had a dreadful quarrel. "'That doesn't please me,' said Miss Squeers, relaxing into a smile, though. "'Law, I wouldn't think so bad of you as to suppose it did,' rejoined her companion. "'That's not it.' "'Oh,' said Miss Squeers, relapsing into melancholy. "'Go on.' 
after a great deal of wrangling and saying we would never see each other any more continued miss price we made it up and this morning john went and wrote our names down to be put up for the first time next sunday so we shall be married in three weeks and i give you notice to get your frock made there was mingled gall and honey in this intelligence the prospect of the friends being married so soon was the gall and the certainty of her not entertaining serious designs upon nicholas was the honey upon the whole the sweet greatly preponderated over the bitter so miss squeers said she would get the frock made and that she hoped tilda might be happy though at the same time she didn't know and would not have her build up too much upon it for men were strange creatures and a great many married women were very miserable and wished themselves single again with all their hearts to which condolences miss squeers added others equally calculated to raise her friend's spirits and promote her cheerfulness of mind but come now fanny said miss price i want to have a word or two with you about young mr nickleby he's nothing to me interrupted miss squeers with hysterical symptoms i despise him too much oh you don't mean that i'm sure replied her friend confess fanny don't you like him now without returning any direct reply miss squeers all at once fell into a paroxysm of spiteful tears and exclaimed that she was a wretched neglected miserable castaway i hate everybody said miss squeers and i wish that everybody was dead that i do dear dear said miss price quite moved by this avowal of misanthropical sentiments you are not serious i'm sure yes i am rejoined miss squeers tying tight knots in her pocket handkerchief and clenching her teeth and i wish i was dead too there oh you'll think differently in another five minutes said matilda how much better to take him into favour again than to hurt yourself by going on in that way wouldn't it be much nicer now to have him all to yourself on good terms in a company keeping love making pleasant sort of manner i don't know but what it would sobbed miss squeers oh tilda how could you have acted so mean and dishonourable i wouldn't have believed it of you if anybody had told me heyday exclaimed miss price giggling one would suppose i had been murdering somebody at least very nigh as bad said miss squeers passionately all this because i happen to have had enough good looks to make people civil to me cried miss price persons don't make their own faces and it's no more my fault if mine is a good one than it is the other people's fault if theirs is a bad one hold your tongue shrieked miss squeers in her shrillest tone or you'll make me slap you tilda and afterwards i shall be very sorry for it it is needless to say that by this time the temper of each young lady was in some slight degree affected by the tone of her conversation and that a dash of personality was infused into the altercation in consequence indeed the quarrel from slight beginnings rose to a considerable height and was assuming a very violent complexion when both parties falling into a great passion of tears exclaimed simultaneously that they had never thought of being spoken to in that way which exclamation leading to a remonstrance gradually brought on an explanation and the upshot was that they fell into each other's arms and vowed eternal friendship the occasion in question making the fifty-second time of repeating the same impressive ceremony within a twelve-month perfect amicability thus restored a dialogue naturally ensued upon the number and nature of the garments which would be indispensable for miss price's entrance into the holy state of matrimony when miss squeers clearly showed that a great many more than the miller could or would afford were absolutely necessary and could not decently be dispensed with the young lady then by an easy digression led the discourse to her own wardrobe and after recounting its principal beauties at some length took her friend upstairs to make an inspection thereof the treasures of two drawers and a closet having been displayed and all the smaller articles tried on it was time for miss price to return home and as she had been in raptures with all the frocks and had been stricken quite dumb with admiration of a new pink scarf miss squeers said in a high good humour that she would walk part of the way with her for the pleasure of her company and off they went together miss squeers dilating as they walked along upon her father's accomplishments and multiplying his income by ten to give her friend some faint notion of the vast importance and superiority of her family it happened that that particular time comprising the short daily interval which was suffered to elapse between what was pleasantly called the dinner of mr squeers pupils and their return to the pursuit of useful knowledge was precisely the hour when nicholas 
was accustomed to issue forth for a melancholy walk and to brood as he sauntered listlessly through the village upon his miserable lot miss squeers knew this perfectly well but perhaps had forgotten it for when she caught sight of that young gentleman advancing towards them she evinced many symptoms of surprise and consternation and assured her friend that she felt fit to drop into the earth shall we turn back or run into a cottage asked miss price he don't see us yet as miss squeers said this and in the tone of one who has made a high moral resolution and was besides taken with one or two chokes and catchings of breath indicative of feelings at a high pressure her friend made no further remark and they bore straight down upon nicholas who walking with his eyes bent upon the ground was not aware of their approach until they were close upon him otherwise he might have perhaps taken shelter himself good morning said nicholas bowing and passing by he is going murmured miss squeers i shall choke tilda come back mr nickleby do cried miss price affecting alarm at her friend's threat but really actuated by a malicious wish to hear what nicholas would say come back mr nickleby mr nickleby came back and looked as confused as might be as he inquired whether the ladies had any commands for him don't stop to talk urged miss price hastily but support her on the other side how do you feel now dear better sighed miss squeers laying a beaver bonnet of reddish brown with a green veil attached on mr nickleby's shoulder this foolish faintness don't call it foolish dear said miss price her bright eye dancing with merriment as she saw the perplexity of nicholas you have no reason to be ashamed of it it's those who are too proud to come round again without all this to do that ought to be ashamed you are resolved to fix it upon me i see said nicholas smiling although i told you last night it was not my fault there he says it was not his fault my dear remarked the wicked miss price perhaps you were too jealous or too hasty with him he says it was not his fault you hear i think that's apology enough you will not understand me said nicholas pray dispense with this jesting for i have no time and really no inclination to be the subject or promoter of mirth just now what do you mean asked miss price affecting amazement don't ask him tilda cried miss squeers i forgive him dear me said nicholas as the brown bonnet went down on his shoulder again this is more serious than i supposed allow me will you have the goodness to hear me speak here he raised up the brown bonnet and regarding with most unfeigned astonishment a look of tender reproach from miss squeers shrunk back a few paces to be out of the reach of the fair burden and went on to say i am very sorry truly and sincerely sorry for having been the cause of any difference among you last night i reproach myself most bitterly for having been so unfortunate as to cause the dissension that occurred although i did so i assure you most unwittingly and heedlessly well that's not all you've got to say surely exclaimed miss price as nicholas paused i fear there is something more stammered nicholas with a half smile and looking towards miss squeers it is a most awkward thing to say but the very mention of such a supposition makes one look like a puppy still may i ask if that lady supposes that i entertain any in short does she think that i am in love with her delightful embarrassment thought miss squeers i have brought him to it at last answer for me dear she whispered to her friend does she think so rejoined miss price of course she does she does exclaimed nicholas with such energy of utterance as might have been for the moment mistaken for rapture certainly replied miss price if mr nickleby has doubted that tilda said the blushing miss squeers in soft accents he may set his mind at rest his sentiments are reciprocal stop cried nicholas hurriedly pray hear me this is the grossest and wildest delusion the completest and most signal mistake that ever a human being laboured under or committed i have scarcely seen the young lady half a dozen times but if i had seen her sixty times or am destined to see her sixty thousand it would be and will be precisely the same i have not one thought wish or hope connected with her unless it be and i say this not to hurt her feelings but to impress her with a real state of my own unless it be on one subject dear to my heart as life itself of being one day able to turn my back upon this accursed place never to set foot in it again or think of it even think of it but with loathing and disgust with this particularly plain and straightforward declaration which he made with all the vehemence that his indignant and excited feelings could bring to bear upon it nicholas waiting to hear no more retreated but poor miss squeers her anger rage and vexation 
the rapid succession of bitter and passionate feelings that whirled through her mind are not to be described refused refused by a teacher picked up by an advertisement at an annual salary of five pounds payable at indefinite periods and found in food and lodging like the very boys themselves and this too in the presence of a little chit of a miller's daughter of eighteen who was going to be married in three weeks time to a man who had gone down upon his very knees to ask her she could have choked in right good earnest at the thought of being so humbled but there was one thing clear in the midst of her mortification and that was that she hated and detested nicholas with all the narrowness of mind and littleness of purpose worthy of a descendant of the house of squeers and there was one comfort too and that was that every hour and every day she could wound his pride and goad him with the infliction of some slight or insult or deprivation which could not but have the some effect upon the most insensible person and must be acutely felt by one so sensitive as nicholas with these two reflections uppermost in her mind miss squeers made the best of the matter to her friend by observing that mr nickleby was such an odd creature and of such a violent temper that she feared she should be obliged to give him up and parted from her and here it may be remarked that miss squeers having bestowed her affections or whatever it might be that in the absence of anything better represented them on nicholas nickleby had never once seriously contemplated the possibility of his being a, of a different opinion from herself in the business miss squeers reasoned that she was prepossessing and beautiful and that her father was master and nicholas man and that her father had saved money and nicholas had none all of which seemed to her conclusive arguments why the young man should feel only too much honoured by her preference she had not failed to recollect either how much more agreeable she could render his situation if she were his friend and how much more disagreeable if she was his enemy and doubtless many less scrupulous young gentlemen than nicholas would have encouraged her extravagance had it only been for this very obvious and intelligible reason however he had thought proper to do otherwise and miss squeers was outrageous let him see said the irritated young lady when she had regained her own room and eased her mind by committing an assault on fib if i don't set mother against him a little more when she comes back it was scarcely necessary to do this but miss squeers was as good as her word and poor nicholas in addition to bad food dirty lodging and being compelled to witness one dull unvarying round of squalid misery was treated with every special indignity that malice could suggest or the most grasping cupidity put upon him nor was this all there was another and deeper system of annoyance which made his heart sink and nearly drove him wild by its injustice and cruelty the wretched creature smike since the night nicholas had spoken kindly to him in the schoolroom had followed him to and fro with an ever restless desire to serve or help him anticipating such little wants as his humble ability could supply and content only to be near him he would sit beside him for hours looking patiently into his face and a word would brighten up his careworn visage and call into it a passing gleam even of happiness he was an altered being he had an object now and that object was to show his attachment to the only person that person a stranger who had treated him not to say with kindness but like a human creature upon this poor being all the spleen and ill-humour that could not be vented on nicholas were unceasingly bestowed drudgery would have been nothing smike was well used to that buffetings inflicted without cause would have been equally a matter of course for them also he had served a long and weary apprenticeship but it was no sooner observed that he had become attached to nicholas than stripes and blows stripes and blows morning noon and night were his only portion squeers was jealous of the influence which his man had soon acquired and his family hated him and smike paid for both nicholas saw it and ground his teeth at every repetition of the savage and cowardly attack he had arranged a few regular lessons for the boys and one night as he paced up and down the dismal schoolroom his swollen heart almost bursting to think that his protection and countenance should have increased the misery of the wretched being whose peculiar destitution had awakened his pity he paused mechanically in a dark corner where sat the object of his thoughts the poor soul was poring hard over a tattered book with the traces of recent tears still upon his face vainly endeavouring to master some task 
which a child of nine years old possessed of ordinary powers could have conquered with ease but which to the adult brain of the crushed boy of nineteen was a sealed and hopeless mystery yet there he sat patiently conning the page again and again stimulated by no boyish ambition for he was the common jest and scoff even of the uncouth objects that congregated about him but inspired by the one eager desire to please his solitary friend nicholas laid a hand upon his shoulder i can't do it said the dejected creature looking up with bitter disappointment in every feature no no do not try replied nicholas the boy shook his head and closing the book with a sigh looked vacantly round and laid his head upon his arm he was weeping do not for god's sake said nicholas in an agitated voice i cannot bear to see you they are more hard with me than ever sobbed the boy i know it rejoined nicholas they are but for you said the outcast i should die they would kill me they would i know they would you will do better poor fellow replied nicholas shaking his head mournfully when i am gone gone cried the other looking intently in his face softly rejoined nicholas yes are you going demanded the boy in an earnest whisper i cannot say replied nicholas i was speaking more to my own thoughts than to you tell me said the boy imploringly oh do tell me will you go will you i should be driven to that at last said nicholas the world is before me after all tell me urged smike is the world as bad and dismal as this place heaven forbid replied nicholas pursuing the train of his own thoughts its hardest and coarsest toil were happiness to this should i ever meet you there demanded the boy speaking with unusual wildness and volubility yes replied nicholas willing to soothe him no no said the other clasping him by the hand should i should i tell me that again say i should be sure to find you you would replied nicholas with the same humane intention and i would help and aid you and not bring fresh sorrow on you as i have done here the boy caught both the young man's hands passionately in his and hugging them to his breast uttered a few broken sounds which were unintelligible squeers entered at the moment and he shrunk back into his old corner End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the life and adventures of nicholas nickleby by charles dickens this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen nicholas varies the monotony of dotheboys hall by a most vigorous and remarkable proceeding which leads to consequences of some importance the cold feeble dawn of a january morning was stealing in at the windows of the common sleeping-room when nicholas raising himself on his arm looked among the prostrate forms which on every side surrounded him as though in search of some particular object it needed a quick eye to detect from among the huddled mass of sleepers the form of any given individual as they lay closely packed together covered for warmth's sake with their patched and ragged clothes little could be distinguished but the sharp outlines of pale faces over which the sombre light shed the same dull heavy colour with here and there a gaunt arm thrust forth its thinness hidden by no covering but fully exposed to view in all its shrunken ugliness there were some who lying on their backs with upturned faces and clenched hands just visible in the leaden light bore more the aspect of dead bodies than of living creatures and there were others coiled up in strange and fantastic postures as might have been taken for the uneasy efforts of pain to gain some temporary relief rather than the freaks of slumber a few and these were among the youngest of the children slept peacefully on with smiles upon their faces dreaming perhaps of home but ever and again a deep and heavy sigh breaking the stillness of the room announced that some new sleeper had awakened to the misery of another day and as morning took the place of night the smiles gradually faded away with the friendly darkness which had given them birth dreams are the bright creatures of poem and legend who sport on earth in the night season and melt away in the first beam of the sun which lights grim care and stern reality on their daily pilgrimage through the world nicholas looked upon the sleepers at first with the air of one who gazes upon a scene which though familiar to him has lost none of its sorrowful effect in consequence and afterwards with a more intense and searching scrutiny 
as a man who missed something his eye was accustomed to meet, and had expected to rest upon. He was still occupied in this search, and had half risen from his bed in the eagerness of his quest, when the voice of Squeers was heard calling from the bottom of the stairs. "'Now then,' cried that gentleman, "'I ain't going to sleep all day up there. You lazy hounds!' added Mrs. Squeers, finishing the sentence, and producing at the same time a sharp sound, like that which is occasioned by the lacing of stays. "'We should be down directly, sir,' replied Nicholas. "'Down directly,' said Squeers. "'Ah, you'd better be down directly, or I'll be down upon some of you in less. Where's that smike?' Nicholas looked hurriedly around again, but made no answer. "'Smike!' shouted Squeers. "'Do you want your head broke in a fresh place, Smike?' demanded his amiable lady in the same way. Still there was no reply, and Nicholas stared about him, as did the greater part of the boys who were by this time roused. "'Confound his impudence!' muttered Squeers, rapping the stair-rail impatiently with his cane. "'Nickleby!' "'Well, sir, send that obstinate scoundrel down. Don't you hear me calling?' "'He's not here, sir,' replied Nicholas. "'Don't tell me a lie,' retorted the schoolmaster. "'He is.' "'He is not,' retorted Nicholas angrily. "'Don't tell me one.' "'We shall soon see that,' said Mr. Squeers, rushing upstairs. "'I'll find him, I'll warrant you.' With which assurance Mr. Squeers bounced into the dormitory, and, swinging his cane in the air, ready for a blow, darted into the corner where the lean body of the drudge was usually stretched at night. The cane descended harmlessly upon the ground. There was nobody there. "'What does this mean?' said Squeers, turning round with a very pale face. "'Where have you hid him?' "'I've said nothing of him since last night,' replied Nicholas. "'Come,' said Squeers, evidently frightened, though he endeavoured to look otherwise. "'You won't save him this way. Where is he?' "'At the bottom of the nearest pond, for aught I know,' rejoined Nicholas in a low voice, and fixing his eyes full on the master's face. "'Damn you! What do you mean by that?' retorted Squeers in great perturbation. Without waiting for a reply, he inquired of the boys whether any one among them knew anything of their missing schoolmate. There was a general hum of anxious denial, in the midst of which one shrill voice was heard to say, as indeed everybody thought, "'Please, sir, I think Smike's run away, sir.' "'Ah!' cried Squeers, turning sharp round. "'Who said that?' "'Tompkins, please, sir,' rejoined a chorus of voices. Mr. Squeers made a plunge into the crowd, and at one dive caught a very little boy, habited still in his night-gear, and the perplexed expression of whose countenance, as he was brought forward, seemed to intimate that he was as yet uncertain whether he was about to be punished or rewarded for the suggestion. He was not long in doubt. "'You think he's run away, do you, sir?' demanded Squeers. "'Yes, please, sir,' replied the little boy. "'And what, sir?' said Squeers, catching the little boy suddenly by the arms and whisking up his drapery in a most dexterous manner. "'What reason have you to suppose that any boy would want to run away from this establishment, eh, sir?' The child raised a dismal cry by way of answer, and Mr. Squeers, throwing himself into the most favourable attitude for exercising his strength, beat him until the little urchin in his writhings actually rolled out of his hands when he mercifully allowed him to roll away as best he could. There, said Squeers. Now, if any other boy thinks Smike has run away, I should be glad to have a talk with him. There was, of course, a profound silence during which Nicholas showed his disgust as plainly as looks could show it. Well, Nickleby, said Squeers, eyeing him maliciously, you think he's run away, I suppose? I think it extremely likely, replied Nicholas in a quiet manner. Ah, oh, you do, do you? sneered Squeers. Maybe you know that he has. I know nothing of the kind. He didn't tell you he was going, I suppose, did he? sneered Squeers. He did not, replied Nicholas. I am very glad he did not, for it would have then been my duty to have warned you in time. Which, no doubt, you would have been devilish sorry to do, said Squeers, in a taunting fashion. I should indeed, replied Nicholas. You interpret my feelings with great accuracy. Mrs. Squeers had listened to this conversation from the bottom of the stairs, but now losing all patience, she hastily assumed her night-jacket, and made her way to the scene of action. "'What's all this here to do?' said the lady, as the boys fell off right and left, to save her the trouble of clearing a passage with her brawny arms. "'What on earth are you talking to him for, Squeery?' "'Why, my dear,' said Squeers, "'the fact is that Smike is not to be found.' 
"'Well, I know that,' said the lady. "'And where's the wonder? "'If you get a parcel of proud stomach teachers here "'that set the young dogs a-rebelling, "'what else can you look for? "'Now, young man, you have just the kindness "'to take yourself off to the schoolroom "'and take the boys off with you, "'and don't you stir out of there "'until you have leave given you. "'Or you and I may fall out in a way "'that will spoil your beauty, "'handsome as you think yourself, "'and so I tell you.' "'Indeed,' said Nicholas. "'Yes, indeed, and indeed again, Mr. Jackanapes,' said the excited lady. "'And I wouldn't keep such as you in the house another hour if I had my way.' "'Nor would you if I had mine,' replied Nicholas. "'Now, boys.' "'Ah, now, boys,' said Mrs. Squeers, mimicking as nearly as she could the voice and manner of the usher. "'Follow your leader, boys, and take Patter by Smike if you dare. "'See what he'll get for himself when he's brought back. "'And mind, I'll tell you, you shall have as bad and twice as bad "'if you as much open your mouths about him.' "'I'll catch him,' said Squeers. "'I'll only stop short of flaying him alive. "'I give you notice, boys.' "'If you catch him,' retorted Mrs. Squeers contemptuously, "'you're sure to. "'You can't help it if you go the right way to work. "'Come, away with you.' With these words, Mrs. Squeers dismissed the boys, and after a little light skirmishing with those in the rear who were pressing forward to get out of the way, but were detained for a few moments by the throng in front, succeeded in clearing the room when she confronted her spouse alone he is off said mrs squeers the cow-house and stable are locked up so he can't be there and he's not downstairs anywhere for the girl has looked he must have gone york way and by a public road too why must he inquired squeers stupid said mrs squeers angrily he hadn't any money had he never had a penny of his own in his whole life that i know of replied squeers to be sure rejoined mrs squeers and he didn't take anything to eat with him, that I'll answer for. Ha, ha, ha! Ha, ha, ha! laughed Squeers. Then, of course, said Mrs. S., he must beg his way, and he could do that nowhere but on the public road. That's true, exclaimed Squeers, clapping his hands. True, yes, but you would have never thought of it for all that, if I hadn't said so, replied his wife. Now, if you take the chase and go one road, and I borrow Swallow's chase and go the other, what with keeping our eyes open and asking questions one or other of us is pretty certain to lay hold of him the worthy lady's plan was adopted and put into execution without a moment's delay after a very hasty breakfast and the prosecution of some inquiries in the village the result of which seemed to show that he was on the right track squeers started forth in the pony chase intent upon discovery and vengeance Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Squeers, arrayed in the white top-coat and tied up in various shawls and handkerchiefs, issued forth in another chase and another direction, taking with her a good-sized bludgeon, several odd pieces of strong cord, and a stout labouring man, all provided and carried upon the expedition, with the sole object of assisting in the capture and, once caught, ensuring the safe custody of the unfortunate Smike. Nicholas remained behind, in a tumult of feeling, sensible that whatever might be the upshot of the boy's flight, nothing but painful and deplorable consequences were likely to ensue from it. Death, from want and exposure to the weather, was the best that could be expected from the protracted wandering of so poor and helpless a creature, alone and unfriended, through a country of which he was wholly ignorant. There was little, perhaps, to choose between this fate and a return to the tender mercies of the Yorkshire school. But the unhappy being had established a hold upon his sympathy and compassion, which made his heart ache at the prospect of the suffering he was destined to undergo. He lingered on in restless anxiety, picturing a thousand possibilities until the evening of the next day, when Squeers returned alone and unsuccessful. "'No news of the scamp,' said the schoolmaster, who had evidently been stretching his legs on the old principle not a few times during the journey. "'I'll have consolation for this out of somebody, Nickleby, if Mrs. Squeers don't hunt him down, so I'll give you a warning.' "'It's not in my power to console you, sir,' said Nicholas. "'It's nothing to me.' "'Isn't it?' said Squeers in a threatening manner. "'We shall see.' "'We shall,' rejoined Nicholas. "'Here's the pony run right off his legs, "'and me obliged to come home with a hack-cob. "'That'll cost fifteen shillings, besides other expenses,' said Squeers. "'Who's to pay for that, do you hear?' "'Nicholas shrugged his shoulders and remained silent. "'I'll have it out of somebody, I tell you,' said Squeers. "'His usual harsh, crafty manner changed to open bullying. "'None of your whining vaporings here, Mr. Puppy, "'but be off to your kennel, for it's past your bedtime. "'Come, get out.' 
Nicholas bit his lip and knit his hands involuntarily, for his finger-ends tingled to avenge the insult. But remembering that the man was drunk, and that it could come to little but a noisy brawl, he contented himself with darting a contemptuous look at the tyrant, and walked as majestically as he could upstairs. Not a little nettled, however, to observe that Miss Squeers, and Master Squeers, and the servant girl, were enjoying the scene from a snug corner, the two former indulging in many edifying remarks about the presumption of poor upstarts, which occasioned a vast deal of laughter, in which even the most miserable of all miserable servant girls joined, while Nicholas, stung to the quick, drew over his head such bedclothes as he had, and sternly resolved that the outstanding account between himself and Mr. Squeers should be settled rather more speedily than the latter anticipated. Another day came, and Nicholas was scarcely awake when he heard the wheels of a chaise approaching the house. It stopped. The voice of Mrs. Squeers was heard, and in exultation, ordering a glass of spirits for somebody, which was in itself a sufficient sign that something extraordinary had happened. Nicholas hardly dared to look out of the window, but he did so, and the very first object that met his eyes was the wretched smite. So bedabbled in mud and rain, so haggard and worn and wild, that but for his garments being such as no scarecrow was ever seen to wear, he might have been doubtful even then of his identity. "'Let him out,' said Squeers, after he had literally feasted his eyes in silence upon the culprit. "'Bring him in, bring him in!' "'Take care,' cried Mrs. Squeers, as her husband proffered his assistance. "'We tied his legs under the apron and made him fast to the chairs to prevent his giving us the slip again. With hands trembling with delight, Squeers unloosened the cord, and Smike, to all appearance, more dead than alive, was brought into the house and securely locked up in a cellar, until such times as Mr. Squeers should deem it expedient to operate upon him, in the presence of the assembled school.' Upon a hasty consideration of the circumstances, it may be a matter of surprise to some persons that Mr. and Mrs. Squeers should have taken so much trouble to repossess themselves of an encumbrance of which it was their wont to complain so loudly. But their surprise will cease when they are informed that the manifold services of the drudge, if performed by anybody else, would have cost the establishment some ten or twelve shillings per week in the shape of wages, and furthermore that all runaways were as a matter of policy, made severe examples of at Dotheboys Hall, inasmuch as, in consequence of the limited extent of its attractions, there was little but inducement beyond the powerful impulse of fear for any pupil, provided with the usual number of legs and the power of using them, to remain. The news that Smike had been caught and brought back in triumph ran like wildfire through the hungry community and expectation was on tiptoe all morning. On tiptoe it was destined to remain, however, until afternoon when Squeers, having refreshed himself with his dinner, and further strengthened himself by an extra libation or so, made his appearance, accompanied by his amiable partner, with a countenance of portentous import, and a fearful instrument of flagellation, strong, supple, wax-ended and new, in short, purchased that morning expressly for the occasion. "'Is every boy here?' asked Squeers in a tremendous voice. Every boy was there, but every boy was afraid to speak. So Squeers glared along the lines to assure himself, and every eye drooped, and every head cowered down as he did so. "'Each boy keep his place,' said Squeers, administering his favourite blow to the desk and regarding it with gloomy satisfaction, the universal start which it never failed to occasion. Nickleby, to your desk, sir. It was remarked by more than one small observer that there was a very curious and unusual expression in the usher's face, but he took his seat without opening his lips in reply. Squeers, casting a triumphant glance at his assistant, and a look of most comprehensive despotism on the boys, left the room, and shortly afterwards returned dragging Smike by the collar, or rather by that fragment of his jacket which was nearest the place where his collar would have been, had he boasted such a decoration. In any other place the appearance of the wretched, jaded, spiritless object would have occasioned a murmur of compassion and remonstrance. It had some effect even there, for the lookers-on moved uneasily in their seats, 
and a few of the boldest ventured to steal looks at each other expressive of indignation and pity they were not lost on squeers however whose gaze was fastened on the luckless smike as he inquired according to custom in such cases whether he had anything to say for himself nothing i suppose said squeers with a diabolical grin smike glanced round and his eye rested for an instant on nicholas as if he had expected him to intercede but his look was riveted on his desk have you anything to say demanded squeers again giving his right arm two or three flourishes to try its power and suppleness stand a little out of the way mrs squeers my dear i've hardly got room enough spare me sir cried smike oh that's all is it said squeers yes i'll flog you to within an inch of your life and i'll spare you that <laughs> laughed mrs squeers that's a good un i was driven to do it said smike faintly and casting another imploring look about him driven to it were you said squeers oh it wasn't your fault it was mine i suppose eh a nasty ungrateful pig-headed brutish obstinate sneaking dog exclaimed mrs squeers taking smike's head under her arm and administering a cuff at every epithet what does he mean by that stand aside my dear replied squeers we'll try and find out mrs squeers being out of breath with her exertions complied squeers caught the boy firmly in his grip one desperate cut had fallen on his body he was wincing from the lash and uttering a scream of pain it was raised again and again about to fall when nicholas nickleby suddenly starting up cried stop in a voice that made the rafters ring who cried stop said squeers turning savagely round i said nicholas stepping forward this must not go on must not go on cried squeers almost in a shriek no thundered nicholas aghast and stupefied by the boldness of the interference squeers released his hold of smike and falling back a pace or two gazed upon nicholas with looks that were positively frightful i say must not repeated nicholas nothing daunted shall not i will prevent it squeers continued to gaze upon him with his eyes starting out of his head but astonishment had actually for the moment bereft him of speech you have disregarded all my quiet interference in the miserable lad's behalf said nicholas you have returned no answer to the letter in which i beg forgiveness for him and offer to be responsible that he would remain quietly here don't blame me for this public inference you have brought it upon yourself not i sit down beggar screamed squeers almost beside himself with rage and seizing smike as he spoke wretch rejoined nicholas fiercely touch him at your peril i will not stand by and see it done my blood is up and i have the strength of ten such men as you look at yourself for by heaven i will not spare you if you drive me on stand back cried squeers brandishing his weapon i have a long series of insults to avenge said nicholas flushed with passion and my indignation is aggravated by the dastardly cruelties practised on helpless infancy in this foul den have a care for if you do raise the devil within me the consequences shall fall heavily upon your own head he had scarcely spoken when squeers in a violent outbreak of wrath and with a cry like the howl of a wild beast spat upon him and struck him a blow across the face with his instrument of torture which raised up a bar of livid flesh as it was inflicted smarting with the agony of the blow and concentrating into that one moment all his feelings of rage scorn and indignation nicholas sprang upon him wrested the weapon from his hand and pinning him by the throat beat the ruffian until he roared for mercy the boys with the exception of master squeers who coming to his father's assistance harassed the enemy in the rear moved not hand or foot but mrs squeers with many shrieks for aid hung on to the tail of her partner's coat and endeavoured to drag him from his infuriated adversary while miss squeers who had been peeping through the keyhole in expectation of a very different scene darted in at the very beginning of the attack and after launching a shower of inkstands at the usher's head beat nicholas to her heart's content animating herself at every blow with the recollection of his having refused her proffered love and thus imparting additional strength to an arm which as she took after her mother in this respect was at no time one of the weakest nicholas in the full torrent of his violence felt the blows no more than if they had been dealt with feathers 
but becoming tired of the noise and uproar and feeling that his arm grew weak besides he threw all his remaining strength into half a dozen finishing cuts and flung squeers from him with all the force he could muster the violence of his fall precipitated mrs squeers completely over an adjacent form and squeers striking his head against it in his descent lay at his full length on the ground stunned and motionless having brought affairs to this happy termination and ascertained to his thorough satisfaction that squeers was only stunned and not dead upon which point he had some unpleasant doubts at first nicholas left his family to restore him and retired to consider what course he had better adopt he looked anxiously round for smike as he left the room but he was nowhere to be seen after a brief consideration he packed up a few clothes in a small leathern valise and finding that nobody offered to oppose his progress he marched boldly out by the front door and shortly afterwards struck into the road which led to greta bridge when he had cooled sufficiently to be enabled to give his present circumstances some little reflection they did not appear in a very encouraging light he only had four shillings and a few pence in his pocket and was something more than two hundred and fifty miles from london whither he resolved to direct his steps that he might ascertain among other things what account of the morning's proceedings mr squeers transmitted to his most affectionate uncle lifting up his eyes as he arrived at the conclusion that there was no remedy for this unfortunate state of things he beheld a horseman coming towards him whom on nearer approach he discovered to his infinite chagrin to be no other than mr john browdie who clad in cords and leather leggings was urging his animal forward by means of a thick ash stick which seemed to have been recently cut from some stout sapling i'm in no mood for more noise and riot thought nicholas and yet do what i will i shall have an altercation with this honest blockhead and perhaps a blow or two from yonder staff in truth there appeared to be some reason to expect that such a result would follow from the encounter for john browdie no sooner saw nicholas advancing than he reined in his horse by the footpath and waited until such times as he should come up looking meanwhile very sternly between the horse's ears at nicholas as he came on at his leisure servant young gentleman said john yours said nicholas well we're met at last observed john making the stirrup ring under a smart touch of the ash stick yes replied nicholas hesitating come he said frankly after a moment's pause we parted on no very good terms the last time we met it was my fault i believe but i had no intention of offending you and no idea that i was doing so i was very sorry for it afterwards will you shake hands shake hands cried the good-humoured yorkshireman ah that i will at the same time he bent down from the saddle and gave nicholas's fist a huge wrench but what be the matter with thy face man be all broken like it's a cut said nicholas turning scarlet as he spoke a blow but i returned it to the giver and with good interest too now nah, did thee though exclaimed john browdie well done i like en for that the fact is said nicholas not very well knowing how to make the avowal the fact is that i have been ill-treated no interposed john browdie in a turn of compassion for he was a giant in strength and stature and nicholas very likely in his eyes seemed a mere dwarf don't say that yes i have replied nicholas by that man squeers and i have beaten him soundly and am leaving this place in consequence what cried john browdie with such an ecstatic shout that the horse quite shied at it beaten the schoolmaster <laughs> beaten the schoolmaster who ever heard of the like o that now give us thy hand again youngster beaten the schoolmaster dang it oh, i love thee for that with these expressions of delight john browdie laughed and laughed again so loud that the echoes far and wide sent back nothing but jovial peals of merriment and shook nicholas by the hand meanwhile no less heartily when his mirth had subsided he inquired what nicholas meant to do on his informing him to go straight to london he shook his head doubtfully and inquired if he knew how much the coaches charged to carry passengers so far no i do not said nicholas but it is of no great consequence to me for i intend walking going away to london on foot cried john in amazement every step of the way replied nicholas i should be many steps further on by this time and so good-bye 
nay no replied the honest countryman reining in his impatient horse stand still telly how much cash has he gotten not much said nicholas colouring but i can make it enough where there's a will there's a way you know john browdie made no avowal to answer this remark but putting his hand in his pocket pulled out an old purse of solid leather and insisted that nicholas should borrow for him whatever he required for his present necessities don't be afraid man he said take enough to carry the home you'll pay me one day i warrant nicholas could by no means be prevailed upon to borrow more than a sovereign with which loan mr browdie after many entreaties that he would accept of more observing with a touch of yorkshire caution that if he didn't spend it all he could put the surplus by till he had an opportunity of remitting it carriage free which was fain to content himself take that bit of timber to help me on with man he added pressing his stick on nicholas and giving his hand another squeeze keep a good heart and bless thee beaten the schoolmaster god it's the best thing i've heard this twenty year so saying and indulging with more delicacy than might have been expected from him in another series of loud laughs for the purpose of avoiding the thanks which nicholas poured forth john browdie set spurs to his horse and went off at a smart canter looking back from time to time as nicholas stood gazing after him and waving his hand cheerily as if to encourage him on his way nicholas watched the horse and rider until they disappeared over the brow of a distant hill and then set forward on his journey he did not travel far that afternoon for by this time it was nearly dark and there had been a heavy fall of snow which not only rendered the way toilsome but the track uncertain and difficult to find after daylight save by experienced wayfarers he lay that night at a cottage where beds were let at a cheap rate to the more humble class of travellers and rising betimes next morning made his way before night to boroughbridge passing through that town in search of some cheap resting place he stumbled upon an empty barn within a couple of hundred yards of the roadside in a warm corner of which he stretched his weary limbs and soon fell asleep when he awoke next morning and tried to recollect his dreams which had been all connected with his recent sojourn at dotheboys hall he sat up rubbed his eyes and stared not with the most composed countenance possible at some motionless object which seemed to be stationed within a few yards in front of him strange cried nicholas can this be some lingering creation of the visions that have hardly left me cannot be real and yet i am awake smike the form moved rose advanced and dropped upon its knees at his feet it was smike indeed why do you kneel to me said nicholas hastily raising him to go with you anywhere everywhere to the world's end to the churchyard grave replied smike clinging to his hand let me oh do let me you are my home my kind friend take me with you pray i'm a friend who can do little for you said nicholas kindly how come you here he had followed him it seemed had never lost sight of him all the way had watched while he slept and when he halted for refreshment and had feared to appear before lest he should be sent back he had not intended to appear now but nicholas had awakened more suddenly than he looked for and he had no time to conceal himself poor fellow said nicholas your hard fate denies you any friend but one and he is nearly as poor and helpless as yourself may i may i go with you asked smike timidly i will be your faithful hard-working servant i will indeed i want no clothes added the poor creature drawing his rags together these will do very well i only want to be near you and you shall cried nicholas and the world shall deal by you as it does by me till one or both of us shall quit it for a better come with these words he strapped his burden on his shoulders and taking his stick in one hand extended the other to his delighted charge and so they passed out of the old barn together end of chapter 13「Having the misfortune to treat of none but common people, it is necessarily of a mean and vulgar character.' 
in that quarter of london in which golden square is situated there is a bygone faded tumble-down street with two irregular rows of tall meagre houses which seem to have stared each other out of countenance years ago the very chimneys appear to have grown dismal and melancholy from having had nothing better to look at than the chimneys over the way their tops are battered and broken and blackened with smoke and here and there some taller stack than the rest inclining heavily to one side and toppling over the roof seems to meditate taking revenge for half a century's neglect by crushing the inhabitants of the garrets beneath the fowls who peck about the kennels jerking their bodies hither and thither with a gait which none but town fowls are ever seen to adopt and which any country cock or hen would be puzzled to understand are perfectly in keeping with the crazy habitations of their owners dingy ill-plumed drowsy flutterers sent like many of the neighbouring children to get a livelihood in the streets they hop from stone to stone in forlorn search of some hidden eatable in the mud and can scarcely raise a crow among them the only one with anything approaching to a voice is an aged bantam at the baker's and even he is hoarse in consequence of bad living in his last place to judge from the size of the houses they have been at one time tenanted by persons of better condition than their present occupants but they are now let off by the week in floors or rooms and every door has almost as many plates or bell handles as there are apartments within the windows are for the same reason sufficiently diversified in appearance being ornamented with every variety of common blind and curtain that can easily be imagined while every doorway is blocked up and rendered nearly impassable by a motley collection of children and porter pots of all sizes from the baby in arms and the half-pint pot to the full-grown girl and half-gallon can in the parlour of one of these houses which was perhaps a thought dirtier than any of its neighbours which exhibited more bell-handles children and porter pots and caught in all its freshness the first gust of the thick black smoke that poured forth night and day from a large brewery hard by hung a bill announcing that there was yet one room to let within its walls though on what story the vacant room could be regard being had to the outward tokens of many lodgers which the whole front displayed from the mangle in the kitchen window to the flower pots on the parapet it would have been beyond the power of a calculating boy to discover the common stairs of this mansion were bare and carpetless but a curious visitor who had to climb his way to the top might have observed that there were not wanting indications of the progressive poverty of the inmates although their rooms were shut thus the first-floor lodgers being flush of furniture kept an old mahogany table real mahogany on the landing-place outside which was only taken in when occasion required on the second story the spare furniture dwindled down to a couple of old deal chairs of which one belonging to the back room was shorn of a leg and bottomless the story above boasted no greater excess than a worm-eaten wash-tub and the garret landing-place displayed no costlier articles than two crippled pitchers and some broken blacking bottles it was on this garret landing-place that a hard-featured square-faced man elderly and shabby stopped to unlock the door of the front attic into which having surmounted the task of turning the rusty key and its still more rusty wards he walked in with the air of a legal owner this person wore a wig of short coarse red hair which he took off with his hat and hung upon a nail having adopted in its place a dirty cotton nightcap and groped about in the dark till he found a remnant of candle he knocked at the partition which divided the two garrets and inquired in a loud voice whether mr noggs had a light the sound that came back was stifled by the lath and plaster and it seemed moreover as though the speaker had uttered them from the interior of a mug or other drinking vessel but they were in the voice of newman and they conveyed a reply in the affirmative a nasty night mr noggs said the man in the nightcap stepping in to light his candle does it rain asked newman does it replied the other pettishly i am wet through it doesn't take much to wet you and me through mr crowl said newman laying his hand upon the lapel of his threadbare coat 
"'Well, and that makes it the more vexatious,' observed Mr. Crowl in the same pettish tone. Uttering a low, querulous growl, the speaker, whose harsh countenance was the very epitome of selfishness, raked the scanty fire nearly out of the grate, and, emptying the glass which Noggs had pushed toward him, inquired where he kept his coals. Newman Noggs pointed to the bottom of a cupboard, and Mr. Crowl, seizing the shovel, threw on half the stock, which Noggs very deliberately took off again without saying a word. "'You have not turned saving at this time of day, I hope,' said Crowl. Newman pointed to the empty glass as though it were a sufficient refutation of the charge, and briefly said that he was going downstairs to supper. "'The Kenwigses?' asked Crowl. Newman nodded assent. "'Think of that now,' said Crowl. "'If I didn't, thinking that you were certain not to go, because you said you wouldn't, tell Kenwigs I couldn't come, and make up my mind to spend the evening with you.' "'I was obliged to go,' said Newman. "'They would have me.' "'Well, but what's to become of me?' urged the selfish man, who never thought of anybody else. "'It's all your fault. I'll tell you what, I'll sit by your fire till you come back again.' Newman cast a despairing glance at his small store of fuel. But not having the courage to say no, a word in which all his life he never had said at the right time, either to himself or anyone else, gave way to the proposed arrangement. Mr. Crowell immediately went about making himself as comfortable with Newman Noggs's means as circumstances would admit of his being made. The lodgers to whom Crawl had made allusion under the designation of the Kenwigses were the wife and olive branches of one of Mr. Kenwigs, a turner in ivory, who was looked upon as a person of some consideration on the premises, inasmuch as he occupied the whole of the first floor, comprising of a suite of two rooms. Mrs. Kenwigs, too, was quite a lady in her manners, and of a very genteel family, having an uncle who collected a water rate, besides which distinction the two eldest of her little girls went twice a week to dancing school in the neighbourhood, and had flaxen hair tied with blue ribbons hanging in luxuriant pigtails down their backs, and wore little white trousers with frills around the ankles, for all of which reasons, and many more equally valid but too numerous to mention, Mrs. Kenwigs was considered a very desirable person to know, and was the constant theme of all the gossips in the street, and even three or four doors round the corner at both ends. It was the anniversary of the happy day on which the Church of England, as by law established, had bestowed Mrs. Kenwigs upon Mr. Kenwigs, and in grateful commemoration of the same, Mrs. Kenwigs had invited a few select friends to cards, and a supper on the first floor, and had put on a new gown to receive them, which gown, being of a flaming colour, and made upon a juvenile principle, was so successful that Mr. Kenwigs said the eight years of matrimony and the five children seemed all a dream, and Mrs. Kenwigs, younger and more blooming than on the very first Sunday, he had kept company with her. Beautiful as Mrs. Kenwigs looked when she was dressed, though, and so stately that you would have supposed she had a cook and a housemaid at least, and nothing to do but order them about, she had a world of trouble with the preparations more indeed than she being of a delicate and genteel constitution could have sustained had not the pride of housewifery upheld her at last however all the things that had to be got together were got together and all the things that had to be got out of the way were got out of the way and everything was ready and the collector himself having promised to come fortune smiled upon the occasion the party was admirably selected there were, first of all, Mr. Kenwigs and Mrs. Kenwigs, and four olive Kenwigses who sat up to supper, firstly because it was but right that they should have such a treat on such a day, and secondly because their going to bed, in presence of the company, would have been inconvenient, not to say improper. Then there was a young lady who had made Mrs. Kenwigs dress, and who, it was the most convenient thing in the world, living in the two-pair back, gave up her bed to the baby, and got a little girl to watch it. Then, to match this young lady, there was a young man, who had known Mr. Kenwigs when he was a bachelor, and was much esteemed by the ladies as bearing the reputation of a rake. To these were added a newly married couple, who had visited Mr. and Mrs. Kenwigs in their courtship, and a sister of Mrs. Kenwigs, who was quite a beauty, besides whom there was another young man, supposed to entertain honourable designs upon the lady last mentioned, and Mr. Noggs, who was a genteel person to ask, 
because he had been a gentleman once. There were also an elderly lady from the back parlour, and one more young lady who, next to the collector, perhaps was the great lion of the party, being the daughter of a theatrical fireman who went on in the pantomime and had the greatest fun for the stage that was ever known, being able to sing and recite in a manner that brought the tears to Mrs. Kenwig's eyes. There was only one drawback upon the pleasure of seeing such friends, and that was that the lady in the back parlour, who was very fat and turned of sixty, came in a low book muslin dress and short kid gloves, which so exasperated Mrs. Kenwigs that the lady assured her visitors in private that if it hadn't happened that the supper was cooking in the back parlour grate at that moment, she certainly would have requested its representative to withdraw. My dear, said Mr. Kenwigs, wouldn't it be better to begin a round game? Kenwigs, my dear, returned his wife, I'm surprised at you. Would you begin without my uncle? I forgot the collector, said Kenwigs. Oh, no, that would never do. He is so particular, said Mrs. Kenwigs, turning to the other married lady, that if we began without him, I should be out of his will for ever. Dear, cried the married lady, you have no idea what he is, replied Mrs. Kenwigs, and yet as good a creature as ever breathed. The kindest-hearted man that ever was, said Kenwigs. It goes to his heart, I believe, to be forced to cut the water off when the people don't pay, observed the bachelor friend, intending a joke. George, said Mr. Kenwigs solemnly, none of that, if you please. It was only my joke, said the friend, abashed. George, rejoined Mr. Kenwigs, a joke is a very good thing, a very good thing. But when that joke is made at the expense of Mrs. Kenwigs' feelings, I set my face against it. A man in public life expects to be sneered at. It is the fault of his elevated position, and not of himself. Mrs. Kenwigs' relation is a public man, and that he knows, George, and that he can bear. But putting Mrs. Kenwigs out of the question, if I could put Mrs. Kenwigs out of the question, on such an occasion as this, I have the honour to be connected with the collector by marriage, and I cannot allow these remarks in my... Mr. Kenwigs was going to say house, but he rounded the sentence with apartments. At the conclusion of these observations, which drew forth evidences of acute feeling from Mrs. Kenwigs, and had the intended effect of impressing the company with a deep sense of the collector's dignity, a ring was heard at the bell. "'That's him,' whispered Mr. Kenwigs, greatly excited. "'Morlina, my dear, run down and let your uncle in, and kiss him directly you get the door. Hum, let's be talking.' Adopting Mr. Kenwigs' suggestion, the company spoke very loudly, to look easy and unembarrassed, and almost as soon as they had begun to do so, a short old gentleman in drabs and gaiters, with a face that might have been carved out of lignum vitae, for anything that appeared to the contrary, was led playfully in by Miss Morlina Kenwigs, regarding whose uncommon Christian name it may be here remarked that it had been invented and composed by Mrs. Kenwigs previous to her first lying in for the special distinction of her eldest child, in case it should prove a daughter. "'Oh, Uncle, I'm so glad to see you,' said Mrs. Kenwigs, kissing the collector affectionately on both cheeks. "'So glad!' "'Many happy returns of the day, my dear,' replied the collector, returning the compliment. Now this was an interesting thing. Here was a collector of water rates without his book, without his pen and ink, without his double knock, without his intimidation, kissing, actually kissing an agreeable female, and leaving taxes, summonses, notices that he had called, or announcements that he would never call again, for two quarters due wholly out of the question. It was pleasant to see how the company looked on, quite absorbed in the sight, and to behold the nods and winks which they expressed their gratification at finding so much humanity in a tax-gatherer. "'Where will you sit, Uncle?' said Mrs. Kenwigs, in the full glow of family pride, which the appearance of her distinguished relation occasioned. "'Anywhere is my dear,' said the collector. "'I'm not particular.' "'Not particular! What a meek collector! If he had been an author who knew his place, he couldn't have been more humble.' "'Mr. Lillivick,' said Kenwigs, addressing the collector, "'some friends here, sir, are very anxious for the honour of—' "'Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Cutler, Mr. Lillivick.' "'Proud to know you, sir,' said Mr. Cutler. "'I've heard of you very often.' These were not mere words of ceremony, for Mr. Cutler, having kept house in Mr. Lillivick's parish, have heard of him very often indeed. His attention in calling had been quite extraordinary. 
George, you know, I think, Mr. Lillyvick, said Kenwigs. Lady from downstairs, Mr. Lillyvick. Mr. Snooks, Mr. Lillyvick. Miss Green, Mr. Lillyvick. Mr. Lillyvick, Miss Patoka of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. Very glad to make two public characters acquainted. Mrs. Kenwigs, my dear, will you sort the counters? Mrs. Kenwigs, with the assistance of Newman Noggs, who, as he performed sundry little acts of kindness for the children, at all times and seasons was humoured in his request to be taken no notice of, and was merely spoken about in a whisper as the decayed gentleman, did as he was desired, and the greater part of the guests sat down to speculation, while Newman himself, Mrs. Kenwigs, and Miss Patoka of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, looked after the supper-table. While the ladies were thus busying themselves, Mr. Lillyvick was intent upon the game in progress and as all should be fish that comes to a water-collector's net, the dear old gentleman was by no means scrupulous in appropriating himself the property of his neighbours, which, on the contrary, he abstracted whenever an opportunity presented itself, smiling good-humouredly all the while, and making so many condescending speeches to the owners that they were delighted with his amiability, and thought in their hearts that he deserved to be Chancellor of the Exchequer at least. After a great deal of trouble, and the administration of many slaps on the head to the infant Kenwigses, whereof two of the most rebellious were summarily banished, the cloth was laid with much elegance, and a pair of boiled fowls, a large piece of pork, apple pie, potatoes and greens were served, at sight of which the worthy Mr. Lillyvick vented a great many witticisms, and plucked up amazingly, to the immense delight and satisfaction of the whole body of admirers. Very well and very fast the supper went off, no more serious difficulties occurring than those which arose from the incessant demand for clean knives and forks, which made poor Mrs. Kenwigs wish more than once that private society adopted the principle of schools, and required that every guest should bring his own knife, fork and spoon, which doubtless would be a great accommodation in many cases and to no one more so than to the lady and gentleman of the house, especially if the school principal were carried out to the full extent, and the articles were expected, as a matter of delicacy, not to be taken away again. Everybody having eaten everything, the table was cleared in a most alarming hurry, and with great noise, and the spirits whereat the eyes of Newman Noggs glistened, being arranged in order, with water both hot and cold, the party composed themselves for conviviality. Mr. Lillyvick being stationed in a large armchair by the fireside, and the four little Kenwigses disposed on a small form in front of the company, with their flaxen tails towards them, and their faces to the fire, an arrangement which was no sooner perfected than Mrs. Kenwigs was overpowered by the feelings of a mother, and fell upon the left shoulder of Mr. Kenwigs, dissolved in tears. "'They are so beautiful,' said Mrs. Kenwig, sobbing. "'Oh, dear,' said all the ladies, "'so they are. "'It's very natural you should feel proud of that. "'But don't give way, don't. "'I can not help it, and it don't signify,' sobbed Mrs. Kenwigs. "'Oh, they're too beautiful to live, much too beautiful.' On hearing this alarming presentiment of their being doomed to an early death in the flower of their infancy, all four little girls raised a hideous cry and burying their heads in their mother's lap, simultaneously screamed until the eight flaxen tails vibrated again, Mrs. Kenwigs, meanwhile, clasping them alternatively to her bosom, with attitudes expressive of distraction, which Miss Patoka herself might have copied. At length the anxious mother permitted herself to be soothed into a more tranquil state, and the little Kenwigses, being also composed, were distributed among the company, to prevent the possibility of Mrs. Kenwigs again being overcome by the blaze of their combined beauty. This done, the ladies and gentlemen united in prophesying that they would live for many, many years, and there was no occasion at all for Mrs. Kenwigs to distress herself, which in good truth there did not appear to be, the loveliness of the children by no means justifying her apprehensions. This day eight years, said Mr. Kenwigs after a pause. Dear me! Ah! This reflection was echoed by all present, who said, Ah, first, and then, dear me, afterwards. I was younger then, tittered Mrs. Kenwigs. No, said the collector. Certainly not, added everybody. I remember my niece, said Mr. Lillyvick, surveying his audience with a grave air. 
I remember on that very afternoon when she first acknowledged to her mother a partiality for Kenwigs. Mother, she says, I love him. Adore him, I said, Uncle, interposed Mrs. Kenwigs. Love him, I think, my dear, said the collector firmly. Perhaps you are right, Uncle, replied Mrs. Kenwigs submissively. I thought it was a door. Love, my dear, retorted Mr. Lillyvick. Mother, she says, I love him. What do I hear, cries her mother, and instantly falls into strong convulsions. A general exclamation of astonishment burst from the company. Into strong convulsions, repeated Mr. Lillyvick, regarding them with a rigid look. Kenwigs will excuse my saying, in the presence of friends, that there was a very great objection to him, on the ground he was beneath the family and would disgrace it. You remember, Kenwigs? Certainly, replied that gentleman, in no way displeased at the reminiscence, inasmuch as it proved beyond all doubt what a high family Mrs. Kenwigs came of. I shared in that feeling, said Mr. Lillyvick. Perhaps it was natural, perhaps it wasn't. A gentle murmur seemed to say that, in one of Mr. Lillyvick's station, the objection was not only natural, but highly praiseworthy. I came round to him in time, said Mr. Lillyvick, after they were married, and there was no help for it. I was one of the first to say that Kenwigs must be taken notice of. The family did take notice of him, in consequence, and on my representation, and I am bound to say, and proud to say, that I have always found him a very honest, well-behaved, upright, respectable sort of man. Kenwigs, shake hands. I am proud to do it, sir, said Mr. Kenwigs. So am I, Kenwigs, rejoined Mr. Lillyvick. A very happy life I have led with your niece, sir, said Kenwigs. It would have been your own fault if you had not, sir, remarked Mr. Lillyvick. Morlina Kenwigs, cried her mother at this crisis, much affected. Kiss your dear uncle. The young lady did as she was requested, and the three other little girls were successively hoisted up to the collector's countenance, and subjected to the same process, which was afterwards repeated on them by the majority of those present. Oh dear, Mrs. Kenwig, said Miss Petowker, while Mr. Noggs is making that punch to drink, happy returns in, do let Morlina go through that figure dance before Mr. Lillyvick. No, no, my dear, replied Mrs. Kenwigs, it will only worry my uncle. It can't worry him, I am sure, said Miss Petoka. You will be very much pleased, won't you, sir? That I am sure I shall, replied the collector, glancing at the punch mixer. Well, then, I'll tell you what, said Mrs. Kenwigs. Morlina shall do the steps, if Uncle can persuade Miss Petoka to recite us the blood drinker's burial afterwards. There was a great clapping of hands and stamping of feet at this proposition, the subject whereof gently inclined her head several times in acknowledgment of the reception. You know, said Miss Petoka reproachfully, that I dislike doing anything professional in private parties. Oh, but not here, said Mrs. Kenwigs. We are all so very friendly and pleasant that you might as well be going through it in your own room. Besides the occasion. I can't resist that, interrupted Miss Petoka. Anything in my humble power I shall be delighted to do. Mrs. Kenwigs and Miss Petoka had arranged a small programme of the entertainments between them of which there was a prescribed order, but they had settled to have a little pressing on both sides because it looked more natural. The company being all ready, Miss Petoka hummed a tune and Morlina danced a dance, having previously had the soles of her shoes chalk, with as much care as if she were going on the tightrope. It was a very beautiful figure, comprising a great deal of work for the arms, and was received with unabounded applause. If I was blessed with a, a child, said Miss Petoka, blushing, of such genius as that, I would have her out at the opera instantly. Mrs. Kenwigs sighed and looked at Mr. Kenwigs, who shook his head and observed that he was doubtful about it. Kenwigs is afraid, said Mrs. K. What of, inquired Miss Petoka, not of her falling. Oh, no, replied Mrs. Kenwigs, but if she grew up what she is now, only think of the young dukes and marquises. Very right, said the collector. Still, submitted Miss Petoka, if she took a proper pride in herself, you know. There's a good deal in that, observed Mrs. Kenwigs, looking at her husband. I only know, faltered Miss Petoka, it may be no rule to be sure, but I have never found any inconvenience or unpleasantness of that sort. Mr. Kenwigs, with becoming gallantry, said that that settled the question at once, and that he would take the subject into his serious consideration. This being resolved upon, Miss Petoka was entreated to begin the blood-drinker's burial. 
to which end that young lady let down her back hair and taking up her position at the other end of the room with the bachelor friend posted in a corner to rush out at the queue in death expire and catch her in his arms when she died raving mad and went through the performance with extraordinary spirit and to the great terror of the little kenwigses who were all but frightened into fits the ecstasies consequent upon the effort had not yet subsided and newman who had not been thoroughly sober at so late an hour for a long time had not yet been able to put in a word of announcement that the punch was ready when a hasty knock was heard at the room door which elicited a shriek from mrs kenwigs who immediately divined that the baby had fallen out of bed who is that demanded mr kenwigs sharply don't be alarmed it's only me said crowl looking in in his nightcap the baby is very comfortable for i peeked into the room as i came down and it's fast asleep and so is the girl and i don't think the candle will set fire to the bed curtain unless a draught was to get in the room it's mr noggs that i wanted me cried newman much astonished why it is a queer hour isn't it replied crowl who was not best pleased at the prospect of losing his fire and they are queer-looking people too all covered with rain and mud shall i tell them to go away no said newman rising people how many two rejoined crowl want me by name asked newman by name replied crowl mr newman noggs as pat as need be newman reflected for a few seconds and then hurried away muttering that he would be back directly he was as good as his word for in an exceedingly short time he burst into the room and seizing without a word of apology or explanation a lighted candle and a tumbler of hot punch from the table darted away like a madman what the deuce is the matter with him exclaimed crowl throwing the door open hark is there any noise above the guests rose in great confusion and looking in each other's faces with much perplexity and some fear stretched their necks forwards and listened attentively End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the life and adventures of nicholas nickleby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen of nicholas nickleby by charles dickens acquaints the reader with the cause and origin of the interruption described in the last chapter and with some other matters necessary to be known newman noggs scrambled in violent haste upstairs with the steaming beverage which he had so unceremoniously snatched from the table of mr kenwigs and indeed from the very grasp of the water-rate collector who was eyeing the contents of the tumbler at the moment of its unexpected abstraction with lively marks of pleasure visible in his countenance he bore his prize straight to his own back garret where footsore and nearly shoeless wet dirty jaded and disfigured with every mark of fatiguing travel sat nicholas and smike at once the cause and partner of his toil both perfectly worn out by their unwanted and protracted exertion newman's first act was to compel nicholas with gentle force to swallow half the punch at a breath nearly boiling as it was and his next to pour the remainder down the throat of smike who never having tasted anything stronger than an aperient medicine in his whole life exhibited various odd manifestations of surprise and delight during the passage of the liquor down his throat and turned up his eyes most emphatically when it was all gone you're wet through said newman passing his hand hastily over the coat which nicholas had thrown off and i i haven't even a change he added with a wistful glance at the shabby clothes he wore himself i have dry clothes or at least such as will serve my turn well in my bundle replied nicholas if you look so distressed to see me you will add to the pain i feel already at being compelled for one night to cast myself upon your slender means for aid and shelter newman did not look the less distressed to hear nicholas talking in this strain but upon his young friend grasping him heartily by the hand and assuring him that nothing but implicit confidence in the sincerity of his professions and kindness of feeling towards himself would have induced him on any consideration even to have made him acquainted with his arrival in london 
Mr. Noggs brightened up again, and went about making such arrangements as it were in his power for the comfort of his visitors with extreme alacrity. These were simple enough, poor Newman's means halting at a very considerable distance short of his inclinations. But slight as they were, they were not made without much bustling and running about. As Nicholas had husbanded his scanty stock of money so well that it was not yet quite expended, a supper of bread and cheese, with some cold beef from the cook-shop, was soon placed upon the table, and these viands being flanked by a bottle of spirits and a pot of porter, there was no ground for apprehension on the score of hunger or thirst at all events. Such preparations as Newman had it in his power to make, for the accommodation of his guests during the night, occupied no very great time in completing, and as he had insisted as an express preliminary that Nicholas should change his clothes and that Smike should invest himself in his solitary coat, which no entreaties would dissuade him from stripping off for the purpose, the travellers partook of their frugal fare, with more satisfaction than one of them at least had derived from many a better meal. They then drew near the fire, which Newman Noggs had made up as well as he could after the inroads of Kroll upon the fuel, and Nicholas, who had hitherto been restrained by the extreme anxiety of his friend that he should refresh himself after his journey, now pressed him with earnest questions concerning his mother and sister. Well, replied Newman with his accustomed taciturnity, both well. They are living in the city still, inquired Nicholas. They are, said Newman. And my sister, added Nicholas, is she still engaged in the business which she wrote to tell me she thought she should like so much? Newman opened his eyes rather wider than usual, but merely replied by a gasp which, according to the action of the head that accompanied it, was interpreted by his friends as meaning yes or no. In the present instance the pantomime consisted of a nod and not a shake, so Nicholas took the answer as a favourable one. Now listen to me, said Nicholas, laying his hand upon Newman's shoulder. Before I would make an effort to see them, I deemed it expedient to come to you, lest, by gratifying my own selfish desire, I should inflict an injury upon them which I can never repair. What has my uncle heard from Yorkshire? Newman opened and shut his mouth several times, as though he were trying his utmost to speak, but could make nothing of it, and finally fixed his eyes on Nicholas with a grim and ghastly stare. What has he heard? urged Nicholas, colouring. You see that I am prepared to hear the very worst that malice can have suggested. Why should you conceal it from me? I must know it sooner or later, and what purpose can be gained by trifling with the matter for a few minutes? when half the time would put me in possession of all that has occurred. Tell me at once, pray. Tomorrow morning, said Newman. Hear it tomorrow. What purpose would that answer, urged Nicholas? You would sleep the better, replied Newman. I should sleep the worst, answered Nicholas impatiently. Sleep, exhausted as I am, and standing in no common need of rest, I cannot hope to close my eyes all night unless you tell me everything. "'And if I should tell you everything,' said Newman, hesitating, "'why, then you may rouse my indignation or wound my pride,' rejoined Nicholas, "'but you will not break my rest, for if the scene were acted over again, "'I could take no other part than I have taken, "'and whatever the consequence may accrue to myself from it, "'I shall never regret doing as I have done, never, if I starve or beg in consequence. "'What is a little poverty or suffering to the disgrace of the basest, and most inhuman cowardice. I tell you, if I had stood by tamely and passively, I should have hated myself, and merited the contempt of every man in existence, the black-hearted scoundrel. With this gentle allusion to the absent Mr. Squeers, Nicholas repressed his rising wrath, and relating to Newman exactly what had passed at Dotheboys Hall, entreated him to speak out without more pressing. Thus adjured, Mr. Noggs took from an old trunk a sheet of paper which appeared to have been scrawled over in great haste after sundry and extraordinary demonstrations of reluctance delivered himself in the following terms my dear young man you mustn't give way to this sort of thing will never do you know as to getting on in the world if you take everybody's part that's ill-treated damn it i'm proud to hear of it and i would have done it myself Newman accompanied this very unusual outbreak with a violent blow upon the table, as if, in the heat of the moment, he had mistaken it for the chest or ribs of Mr. Watford Squeers. 
having by this open declaration of his feelings quite precluded himself from offering nicholas any cautious worldly advice which had been his first intention mr noggs went straight to the point the day before yesterday said newman your uncle received this letter i took a hasty copy of it while he was out shall i read it if you please replied nicholas as newman noggs accordingly read as follows dotheboys hall thursday morning sir my pa requests me to write to you the doctors considering it doubtful whether he will ever recover the use of his legs which prevents his holding a pen we are in a state of mind beyond everything and my pa is one mask of bruises both blue and green likewise two forms are steepled in his gore we were compelled to have him carried down into the kitchen where he now lies you will judge from this that he has been brought very low when your nephew that you recommended for a teacher had done this to my pa and jumped upon his body with his feet and also language which will not pollute my pen with describing he assaulted my ma with dreadful violence dashed her to the earth and drove her back comb several inches into her head a very little more and it must have entered her skull we have a medical certificate that if it had the tortoise shell would have affected the brain me and my brother were then the victims of his fury since which we have suffered very much which leads us to the arrowing belief that we have received some injury in our insides especially as no marks of violence are visible externally i am screaming out loud all the time i write and so is my brother which takes off my attention rather and i hope you will excuse the mistakes the monster having satiated his thirst for blood ran away taking with him a boy of desperate character that he had excited to rebellion and a garnet ring belonging to my ma and not having been apprehended by the constables is supposed to have been took up by some stage-coach my pa begs that if he comes to you the ring may be returned and you will let the thief and assassin go as if we prosecuted him he would only be transported and if he is let go he is sure to be hung before long which will save us the trouble and be much more satisfactory hoping to hear from you when convenient i remain yours etc fanny squeers p s i pity his ignorance and despise him a profound silence succeeded to the reading of this choice gentle epistle during which newman noggs as he folded it up gazed with a kind of grotesque pity at the boy of desperate character therein referred to who having no more distinct perception of the matter in hand than that he had been the unfortunate cause of heaping trouble and falsehood upon nicholas sat mute and dispirited with a most woe-begone and heart-stricken look mr noggs said nicholas after a few moments reflection i must go out at once go out cried newman yes said nicholas to golden square nobody who knows me would believe this story of the ring but it may suit the purpose or gratify the hatred of mr ralph nickleby to feign to attach credence to it it is due not to him but to myself that i should state the truth and moreover i have a word or two to exchange with him which will not keep cool they must said newman they must not indeed rejoined nicholas firmly as he prepared to leave the house hear me speak said newman planting himself before his impetuous young friend he is not there he is away from town he will not be back for three days and i know that letter will not be answered before he returns are you sure of this asked nicholas chafing violently and pacing the narrow room with rapid strides quite rejoined newman he had hardly read it when he was called away its contents are known to nobody but himself and us are you certain demanded nicholas precipitately not even to my mother or sister if i thought that they i will go there i must see them which is the way where is it now be advised by me said newman speaking for the moment in his earnestness like any other man make no effort to see even them till he comes home i know the man do not seem to have been tampering with anybody when he returns go straight to him and speak as boldly as you like guessing at the real truth he knows it as well as you or i trust him for that you mean well to me and should know him better than i can replied nicholas after some consideration well let it be so newman who had stood during the foregoing conversation with his back planted against the door 
ready to oppose any egress from the apartment by force if necessary, resumed his seat with much satisfaction, and as the water in the kettle was by this time boiling, made a glass full of spirits and water for Nicholas, and a cracked mug full for the joint accommodation of himself and Smike, of which the two partook in great harmony, while Nicholas, leaning his head upon his hand, remained buried in melancholy meditation. Meanwhile, the company below stairs, after listening attentively and not hearing any noise which would justify them and interfering for the gratification of their curiosity, returned to the chamber of the Kenwigses, and employed themselves in hazarding a great variety of conjectures relative to the cause of Mr. Nogg's sudden disappearance and detention. Law, I tell you what,' said Mrs. Kenwigs, "'suppose it should be an express sent up "'to say that his property has all come back again.' "'Dear me,' said Mr. Kenwigs, "'it's not impossible. "'Perhaps in that case we'd better send up and ask "'if he won't take a little more punch.' "'Kenwigs,' said Mr. Lillyvick in a loud voice, "'I'm surprised at you.' "'What's the matter, sir?' asked Mr. Kenwigs, "'with becoming submission to the collector of water rates.' "'Making such a remark as that, sir,' replied Mr. Lillyvick angrily, he has had punch already, has he not, sir? I consider the way in which that punch was cut off, if I may use the expression, a highly disrespectful to this company. Scandalous, perfectly scandalous. It may be the custom to allow such things in this house, but it's not the kind of behaviour that I've been used to see displayed. And so I don't mind telling you, Kenwigs. A gentleman has a glass of punch before him, to which he is just about to set his lips, when another gentleman comes and collars that glass of punch without a with your leave or by your leave, and carries that glass of punch away. This may be good manners, I dare say it is, but I don't understand it, that's all. And what's more, I don't care if I never do. It's my way to speak my mind, Kenwigs, and that is my mind. And if you don't like it, it's past my regular time for going to bed, and I can find my way home without making it later. Here was an untoward event. The collector had sat swelling and fuming in offended dignity for some minutes, and had now fairly burst out. The great man, the rich relation, the unmarried uncle, who had it in his power to make Morlina an heiress, and the very baby a legatee, was offended. Gracious powers, where was this going to end? "'I am very sorry, sir,' said Mr. Kenwigs, humbly. "'Don't tell me you're sorry,' retorted Mr. Lillyvick, with much sharpness. "'You should have prevented it, then.' The company were quite paralysed by this domestic crash. The back parlour sat with her mouth wide open, staring vacantly at the collector, in a stupor of dismay. The other guests were scarcely less overpowered by the great man's irritation. Mr. Kenwigs, not being skilful in such matters, only fanned the flame in attempting to extinguish it. "'I didn't think of it, I'm sure, sir,' said that gentleman. "'I didn't suppose that such a little thing as a glass of punch "'would have put you out of temper.' "'Out of temper? "'What the devil do you mean by that piece of impertinence, Mr. Kenwigs?' "'said the collector. "'Morlina, child, give me my hat.' "'Oh, you're not going, Mr. Lillyvick, sir,' interposed Miss Patoka, "'with her most bewitching smile. "'But still Mr. Lillyvick, regardless of the siren, "'cried obdurately, "'Morlina, my hat!' Upon the fourth repetition of which demand, Mrs. Kenwig sunk back in her chair with a cry that might have softened a water-butt, not to say a water-collector, while the four little girls, privately instructed to that effect, clasped their uncle's drab shorts in their arms, and prayed him in imperfect English to remain. "'Why should I stop here, my dears?' said Mr. Lillyvick. "'I'm not wanted here.' "'Oh, do not speak so cruelly, uncle,' sobbed Mrs. Kenwigs, "'unless you wish to kill me.' "'I shouldn't wonder if some people were to say I did,' replied Mr. Lillyvick, glancing angrily at Kenwigs. "'Out of temper!' "'Oh, I cannot bear to see him look so at my husband,' cried Mrs. Kenwigs. "'It's so dreadful in families. Oh!' "'Mr. Lillyvick,' said Kenwigs, "'I hope for the sake of your niece that you won't object to being reconciled.' The collector's features relaxed as the company added their entreaties to those of his nephew-in-law. He gave up his hat and held out his hand. "'There, Kenwigs,' said Mr. Lillyvick, "'and let me tell you at the same time "'to show you how much out of temper I was, "'that if I had gone away without another word, "'it would have made no difference "'respecting that pound or two "'which I shall leave among your children when I die.' "'Morlina Kenwigs,' cried her mother in a torrent of affection, "'go down upon your knees to your dear uncle, 
and beg him to love you all his life through, for he's more an angel than a man, and I've always said so. Miss Morlina, approaching to do homage in compliance with this injunction, was summarily caught up and kissed by Mr. Lillybick, and thereupon Mrs. Kenwigs darted forward and kissed the collector, and an irrepressible murmur of applause broke from the company who had witnessed his magnanimity. The worthy gentleman then became once more the life and soul of the society, being again reinstated in his old post of lion, from which high station the temporary distraction of their thoughts for a moment had dispossessed him. Quadruped lions are said to be savage only when they are hungry. Biped lions are rarely sulky longer than when their appetite for distinction remains unappeased. Mr. Lillyvick stood higher than ever, for he had shown his power hinted at his property and testamentary intentions, gained great credit for disinterestedness and virtue, and in addition to all was finally accommodated with a much larger tumbler of punch than that which Newman Noggs had so feloniously made off with. "'I say, beg everybody's pardon for intruding again,' said Crowl, looking in at this happy juncture. "'But what a queer business this is, isn't it? Noggs has lived in this house, now going on for five years.' and nobody has ever been to see him before, within the memory of the oldest inhabitant. It's a strange time of night to be called away, sir, certainly, said the collector, and the behaviour of Mr. Noggs himself is, to say the least of it, mysterious. Well, so it is, rejoined Crowl, and I'll tell you what's more, I think these two geniuses, whoever they are, have run away from somewhere. What makes you think that, sir? demanded the collector, who seemed, by tacit understanding, to have been chosen and elected mouthpiece to the company. You have no reason to suppose they have run away from anywhere without paying the rates and taxes due, I hope. Mr. Crull, with a look of some contempt, was about to enter a general protest against the payment of rates or taxes under any circumstances, when he was checked by a timely whisper from Kenwigs and several frowns and winks from Mrs. Kay, which providentially stopped him. Why, the fact is, said Crowl, who had been listening at Newman's door with all his might and main, the fact is that they have been talking so loud that they quite disturbed me in my room, so I couldn't help catching a word here and a word there, and all I heard certainly seemed to refer to their having bolted from some place or other. I don't wish to alarm Mrs. Kenwigs, but I hope they haven't come from any jail or hospital, and brought away a fever or some unpleasantness of that sort which might be catching for the children. Mrs. Kenwigs was so overpowered by this supposition that it needed all the tender attentions of Miss Patoka of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane to restore her to anything like a state of calmness, not to mention the assiduity of Mr. Kenwigs, who held a fat smelling bottle to his lady's nose until it became a matter of some doubt whether the tears which coursed down her face were the result of feelings or sal volatile. The ladies, having expressed their sympathy singly and separately, fell according to custom into a little chorus of soothing expressions among which such condolences as poor dear i should feel just the same if i was her to be sure it's a very trying thing and nobody but a mother knows what a mother's feelings is were among the most prominent and most frequently repeated in short the opinion of the company was so clearly manifested that mr kenwig was on the point of repairing to mr nogg's room to demand an explanation and had indeed swallowed a preparatory glass of punch with great inflexibility and steadiness of purpose when the attention of all present was diverted by a new and terrible surprise this was nothing less than the sudden pouring forth of a rapid succession of the shrillest and most piercing screams from an upper story and to all appearance from the very two pair back in which the infant kenwigs was at that moment enshrined they were no sooner audible than Mrs. Kenwigs, opining that a strange cat had come in and sucked the baby's breath while the girl was asleep, made for the door, wringing her hands and shrieking dismally, to the great consternation and confusion of the company. Mr. Kenwigs, see what it is, make haste, cried the sister, laying violent hands upon Mrs. Kenwigs and holding her back by force. Oh, don't twist about so, dear, I can never hold you. "'My baby, my blessed, 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 blessed baby!' screamed Mrs. Kenwigs, making every blessed sound louder than the last. "'My own darling, sweet, innocent Lillyvick! Oh, let me go to him! Let me go!' Pending the utterance of these frantic cries and the wails and lamentations of the four little girls, 
Mr. Kenwigs rushed upstairs to the room whence the sounds proceeded, at the door of which he encountered Nicholas, with the child in his arms, who darted out with such a violence that the anxious father was thrown down six stairs and alighted on the nearest landing-place before he had found time to open his mouth to ask what was the matter. "'Don't be alarmed,' cried Nicholas, running down. "'Here it is. It's all out. It's all over. Pray compose yourselves. There's no harm done.' And with these and a thousand other assurances, he delivered the baby, whom in his hurry he had carried upside down, to Mrs. Kenwigs, and ran back to assist Mr. Kenwigs, who was rubbing his head very hard, and looking much bewildered by his tumble. Reassured by this cheering intelligence, the company in some degree recovered from their fears, which had been productive of some most singular instances of a total want of presence of mind. Thus the bachelor friend had for a long time supported in his arms Mrs. Kenwig's sister, instead of Mrs. Kenwig's, and the worthy Mr. Lillyvick had been actually seen, in the perturbation of his spirits, to kiss Miss Patoka several times behind the room door, as calmly as nothing distressing were going forward. "'It's a mere nothing,' said Nicholas, returning to Mrs. Kenwigs. The girl who was watching the child, being tired, I suppose, fell asleep and then set her hair on fire. "'Oh, you malicious little wretch!' cried Mrs. Kenwigs, impressively shaking her forefinger at the small unfortunate, who might be thirteen years old and was looking on with a singed head and a frightened face. "'I heard her cries,' continued Nicholas, and ran down in time to prevent her setting fire to anything else. "'You may depend upon it that the child is not hurt, for I took it off the bed myself, and brought it here to convince you. This brief explanation over, the infant, who, as he was christened after the collector, rejoiced in the names of Lillyvick Kenwigs, was partially suffocated under the caresses of the audience, and squeezed to his mother's bosom until he roared again. The attention of the company was then directed by a natural transition to the little girl who had had the audacity to burn her hair off, and who, after receiving sundry small slaps and pushes, from the more energetic of the ladies, was mercifully sent home, the ninepence with which she was to have been rewarded, being as cheated to the Kenwigs family. Oh, "'Whatever are we to say to you, sir?' exclaimed Mrs. Kenwigs, addressing young Lillyvick's deliverer. "'I'm sure I don't know.' "'You need say nothing at all,' replied Nicholas. "'I have done nothing to found any very strong claim upon your eloquence, I am sure.' "'He might have been burnt to death if it hadn't been for you, sir,' simpered Miss Patoka. Not very likely, I think, replied Nicholas, for there was an abundance of assistance here which must have reached him before he'd been in any danger. You will let us drink your health anyway, sir, said Mr. Kenbiggs, motioning towards the table. In my absence, by all means, rejoined Nicholas, with a smile. I've had a very fatiguing journey, and should be most indifferent company, a far greater check upon your merriment than a promoter of it, even if I kept awake, which I think very doubtful. If you will allow me, I'll return to my friend Mr. Noggs, who went upstairs again when he found nothing serious had occurred. Good night. Excusing himself in these terms from joining in the festivities, Nicholas took a most winning farewell of Mrs. Kenwigs and the other ladies, and retired after making a very extraordinary impression upon the company. What a delightful young man, cried Mrs. Kenwigs. Uncommon gentlemanly, really, said Mr. Kenwigs. Don't you think so, Mr. Lillyvick? Yes, said the collector, with a dubious shrug of his shoulders. He is gentlemanly, very gentlemanly in appearance. I hope you don't see anything against him, uncle, inquired Mrs. Kenwigs. No, my dear, replied the collector. No, I trust he may not turn out well. No matter, my love to you, my dear, and a long life to the baby. Your namesake, said Mrs. Kenwigs, with a sweet smile. And I hope a worthy namesake, observed Mr. Kenwigs, willing to propitiate the collector. I hope a baby as will never disgrace his godfather, and as may be considered, in after years, of a peace with the Lillyvicks whose name he bears. I do say, and Mrs. Kenwigs is of the same sentiment, and feels as strong as I do, that I consider his being called Lillyvick one of the greatest blessings and honours of my existence. The greatest blessing, Kenwigs murmured his lady. The greatest blessing, said Mr. Kenwigs, correcting himself. A blessing that I hope one of these days I may be able to deserve. This was a politic stroke of the Kenwigses, because it made Mr. Lillyvick the great head and fountain of the baby's importance. The good gentleman felt the delicacy and dexterity of the touch, 
and at once proposed the health of the gentleman, name unknown, who had signalised himself that night by his coolness and alacrity. "'Who, I don't mind saying,' observed Mr. Lillyvick, as a great concession, "'is a good-looking young man enough, with manners that I hope his character may be equal to. "'He has a very nice face and style, really,' said Mrs. Kenwigs. "'He certainly has,' added Miss Petoker. "'There's something in his appearance quite... "'Dear, dear, what's that word again?' "'What word?' inquired Mr. Lillyvick. "'Why, dear me, how stupid I am,' replied Miss Petoker, hesitating. "'What do you call it when lords break off door-knockers and beat policemen "'and play at coaches with other people's money and all that sort of thing?' aristocratic suggested the collector ah aristocratic replied miss petoker something very aristocratic about him isn't there the gentlemen held their peace and smiled at each other as who should say well there's no accounting for tastes that the ladies resolved unanimously that nicholas had an aristocratic air and nobody caring to dispute the position it was established triumphantly the punch being by this time drunk out and the little kenwigses who had for some time previously held their little eyes open with their little forefingers becoming fractious and requesting rather urgently to be put to bed the collector made a move by pulling out his watch and acquainting the company that it was nigh two o'clock whereat some of the guests were surprised and others shocked and hats and bonnets were groped for under the tables and in course of time found their owners went away after a vast deal of shaking of hands and many remarks how they had never spent such a delightful evening and how they marvelled to find it so late expecting to have heard that it was half-past ten at the very latest and how they wished that mr and mrs kenwigs had a wedding day once a week and how they wondered by what hidden agency mrs kenwigs could possibly have managed so well and a great deal more of the same kind to all of which flattering expressions Mr. and Mrs. Kenwigs replied by thanking every lady and gentleman, seriatim, for the favour of their company, and hoping they might have enjoyed themselves only half as well as they said they had. As to Nicholas, quite unconscious of the impression he had produced, he had long since fallen asleep, leaving Mr. Newman, Noggs, and Smike to empty the spirit bottle between them and this office they performed with such extreme good will that newman was equally at a loss to determine whether he himself was quite sober and whether he had ever seen any gentleman so heavily drowsily and completely intoxicated as his new acquaintance end of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter Sixteen. Nicholas seeks to employ himself in a new capacity, and being unsuccessful, accepts an engagement as a tutor in a private family. The first care of Nicholas next morning was to look after some room in which, until better times dawned upon him, he could contrive to exist, without trenching upon the hospitality of Newman Noggs, who would have slept upon the stairs with pleasure so that his young friend was accommodated. The vacant apartment to which the bill in the parlour window bore reference appeared, on inquiry, to be a small back room on the second floor, reclaimed from the leads and overlooking a soot-bespeckled prospect of tiles and chimney-pots for the letting of this portion of the house from week to week on reasonable terms the parlour lodger was empowered to treat he being deputed by the landlord to dispose of the rooms as they became vacant and to keep a sharp lookout that the lodgers didn't run away as a means of securing the punctual discharge of which last service he was permitted to live rent free lest he should at any time be tempted to run away himself. Of this chamber Nicholas became the tenant, and having hired a few common articles of furniture from a neighbouring broker, and paid the first week's hire in advance, out of a small fund raised by the conversion of some spare clothes into ready money, he sat himself down to ruminate upon his prospects, which, like the prospect outside his window, were sufficiently confined and dingy as they by no means improved on better acquaintance, 
and as familiarity breeds contempt, he resolved to banish them from his thoughts by dint of hard walking. So, taking up his hat, and leaving poor Smike to arrange and rearrange the room with as much delight as if it had been the costliest palace, he betook himself to the streets and mingled with the crowd which thronged them. Although a man may lose a sense of his own importance when he is a mere unit among a busy throng, all utterly regardless of him, it by no means follows that he can dispossess himself, with equal facility, of a very strong sense of the importance and magnitude of his cares. The unhappy state of his own affairs was the one idea which occupied the brain of Nicholas. Walk as fast as he would, and when he tried to dislodge it by speculating on the situation and prospects of the people who surrounded him, he caught himself in a few seconds, contrasting their condition with his own, and gliding almost imperceptibly back to his old train of thought again. Occupied in these reflections, as he was making his way along one of the great public thoroughfares of London, he chanced to raise his eyes to a blue board, whereupon was inscribed, in characters of gold, General Agency Office, for places and situations of all kinds inquire within. It was a shop front, fitted up with a gauze blind and an inner door, and in the window hung a long and tempting array of written placards, announcing vacant places of every grade, from a secretary's to a footboy's. Nicholas halted instinctively before this temple of promise, and ran his eye over the capital text openings in life which were so profusely displayed. When he had completed his survey, he walked on a little way, and then back, and then on again, at length, after pausing irresolutely several times before the door of the general agency office, he made his mind up and stepped in. He found himself in a little floor-clothed room, with a high desk railed off in one corner, behind which sat a lean youth with cunning eyes and a protruding chin, whose performances in capital text darkened the window. He had a thick ledger lying open before him, and with the fingers of his right hand inserted between the leaves, and his eyes fixed on a very fat old lady in a mob cap, evidently the proprietoress of the establishment, who was airing herself at the fire, seemed to be only waiting her directions to refer some entries contained within its rusty clasps. As there was a board outside which acquainted the public that servants of all work were perpetually in waiting, to be hired from ten till four, Nicholas knew at once that some half a dozen strong young women, each with pattens and an umbrella, who were sitting upon a form in one corner, were in attendance for that purpose. Especially as the poor things looked anxious and weary, he was not quite so certain of the callings and stations of two smart young ladies who were in a conversation with the fat lady before the fire, until, having sat himself down in a corner, and remarked that he would wait until the other customers had been served, the fat lady resumed the dialogue which his entrance had interrupted. "'Cook, Tom,' said the fat lady, still airing herself, as aforesaid. "'Cook,' said Tom, turning over some leaves of the ledger. "'Well, read out an easy place or two, said the fat lady. "'Pick out very light ones, if you please, young man,' interposed a genteel female in shepherd's plaid boots, who appeared to be the client. Mrs. Marker, said Tom, reading, Russell Place, Russell Square, offers eighteen guineas, tea and sugar found, two in family, and see very little company. Five servants kept, no man, no followers. Oh, Lord, tittered the client, that won't do. Read another young man, will you? Mrs. Rymug, said Tom, Pleasant Place, Finsbury, wages twelve guineas, no tea, no sugar, serious family. "'Ah, you needn't mind reading that,' interrupted the client. Three serious footmen,' said Tom impressively. Three, did you say?' asked the client in an altered tone. Three serious footmen,' replied Tom. "'Cook, housemaid, and nursemaid. "'Each female servant required to join the little Bethel congregation three times every Sunday with a serious footman. "'If the cook is more serious than the footman, she will be expected to improve the footman. "'If the footman is more serious than the cook,' He will be expected to improve the cook. I'll take the address of that place, said the client. I don't know but what it mightn't suit me pretty well. Here's another, remarked Tom, turning over the leaves. Family of Mr. Gallenbile, M.P. Fifteen guineas, tea and sugar, and servants allowed to see male cousins, if godly. Note, 
cold dinner in the kitchen on the sabbath mr gallanbile being devoted to the observance question no victuals whatever cooked on the lord's day with the exception of dinner for mr and mrs gallanbile which being a work of piety and necessity is exempted mr gallanbile dines late on the day of rest in order to prevent the sinfulness of the cook's dressing herself i don't think that'll answer as well as the other said the client after a little whispering with her friend i'll take the other direction if you please young man i can but come back again if it don't do tom made out the addresses requested and the genteel client having satisfied the fat lady with a small fee meanwhile went away accompanied by her friend as nicholas opened his mouth to request the young man to turn to the letter s and let him know what secretary ships remained undisposed of there came into the office an applicant in whose favour he immediately retired and whose appearance both surprised and interested him this was a young lady who could be scarcely eighteen of very slight and delicate figure but exquisitely shaped who walking timidly up to the desk made an inquiry in a very low tone of voice relative to some situation as governess or companion to a lady she raised her veil for an instant while she preferred the inquiry and disclosed a countenance of most uncommon beauty though shaded by a cloud of sadness which in one so young was doubly remarkable having received a card of reference to some person on the books she made the usual acknowledgment and glided away she was neatly but very quietly attired so much so indeed that it seemed as though her dress if it had been worn by one who imparted fewer graces of her own to it might have looked poor and shabby her attendant for she had one was a red-faced round-eyed slovenly girl who from a certain roughness about the bare arms that peeped from under her bedraggled shawl and the half-washed-out traces of smut and black lead which tattooed her countenance was clearly of a kin with the servants of all work on the form between whom and herself there had passed various grins and glances indicative of the freemasonry of the craft this girl followed her mistress and before nicholas had recovered from the first effects of his surprise and admiration the young lady was gone it is not a matter of such complete and utter improbability as some sober people may think that he would have followed them out had he not been restrained by what passed between the fat lady and her bookkeeper when is she coming again tom asked the fat lady to-morrow morning replied tom mending his pen where have you sent her to asked the fat lady mrs clark's replied tom she'll have a nice life of it if she goes there observed the fat lady taking a pinch of snuff from a tin box tom made no other reply than thrusting his tongue into his cheek and pointing the feather of his pen towards nicholas reminders which elicited from the fat lady an inquiry of now sir what can we do for you nicholas briefly replied that he wanted to know was there any such post to be had as secretary or amanuensis to a gentleman any such rejoined the missness a dozen such ain't there tom i should think so answered that young gentleman and as he said it he winked towards nicholas with a degree of familiarity which he no doubt intended for a rather flattering compliment but with which nicholas was most ungratefully disgusted upon reference to the book it appeared that the dozen secretaryships had dwindled down to one mr gregsbury the greater member of parliament of manchester buildings westminster wanted a young man to keep his papers and correspondence in order and nicholas was exactly the sort of young man that mr gregsbury wanted i don't know what the terms are as he said he settled them himself with the party observed the fat lady but they must be pretty good ones because he's a member of parliament inexperienced as he was nicholas did not feel quite assured of the force of this reasoning or the justice of this conclusion but without troubling himself to question it he took down the address and resolved to wait upon mr gregsbury without delay i don't know what the number is said tom but manchester buildings isn't a large place and if the worst comes to the worst it won't take you very long to knock at all the doors on both sides of the way till you find him out i say what a good-looking girl that was wasn't she what girl demanded nicholas sternly oh yeah i know what girl eh whispered tom shutting one eye and cocking his chin in the air you didn't see her you didn't i say don't you wish you was me when she comes to-morrow morning nicholas looked at the ugly clerk as if he had a mind to reward his admiration of the young lady by beating the ledger about his ears 
but he refrained and strode haughtily out of the office setting at defiance in his indignation those ancient laws of chivalry which not only made it proper and lawful for all good knights to hear the praise of the ladies to whom they were devoted but rendered it incumbent upon them to roam about the world and knock at head all such matter-of-fact and unpoetical characters as declined to exalt above all the earth damsels whom they had never chanced to look upon or hear of as if that were any excuse thinking no longer of his own misfortunes but wondering what could be those of the beautiful girl he had seen nicholas with many wrong turns and many inquiries and almost as many misdirections bent his steps towards the place whither he had been directed within the precincts of the ancient city of westminster and within half a quarter of a mile of its ancient sanctuary is a narrow and dirty region the sanctuary of the smaller members of parliament in modern days it is all comprised in one street of gloomy lodging-houses from whose windows in vacation time there is a frown long melancholy row of bills which say as plainly as did the countenance of their occupiers ranged on ministerial and opposition benches in the session which slumbers with its fathers to let to let in busier periods of the year these bills disappear and the houses swarm with legislators there are legislators in the parlours in the first floor in the second in the third in the garrets the small apartments reek with the breath of deputations and delegates in damp weather the place is rendered close by the steams of moist acts of parliament and frowsy petitions general postmen grow faint as they enter its infected limits and shabby figures in quest of franks flit restlessly to and fro like the troubled ghosts of complete letter writers departed this is manchester buildings and here at all hours of the night may be heard the rattling of latch-keys in their respective keyholes with now and then when a gust of wind sweeping across the water which washes the building's feet impels the sound towards its entrance the weak shrill voice of some young member practising to-morrow's speech all the livelong day there is a grinding of organs and a clashing and clanging of little boxes of music for manchester buildings is an eel pot which has no outlet but its awkward mouth a case bottle which is no thoroughfare and a short and narrow neck and in this respect it may be typical of the fate of some few among its more adventurous residents who after wriggling themselves into parliament by violent efforts and contortions find that it too is no thoroughfare for them that like manchester buildings it leads to nothing beyond itself and that they are fain at last to back out no wiser no richer not one whit more famous than when they went in into manchester buildings nicholas turned with the address of the great mr gregsbury in his hand as there was a stream of people pouring into a shabby house not far from the entrance he waited until they had made their way in and then making up to the servant ventured to inquire if he knew where mr gregsbury lived the servant was a very pale shabby boy who looked as if he had slept underground from his infancy as very likely he had mr gregsbury said he mr gregsbury he lodges here it's all right come in nicholas thought he might as well get in while he could so in he walked and he had no sooner done so than the boy shut the door and made off this was odd enough but what was more embarrassing was that all along the passage and all along the narrow stairs blocking up the window and making the dark entry darker still was a confused crowd of persons with great importance depicted in their looks who were to all appearance waiting in silent expectation of some coming event from time to time one man would whisper his neighbour or a little group would whisper together and then the whisperers would nod fiercely to each other or give their heads a relentless shake as if they were bent upon doing something very desperate and were determined not to be put off whatever happened as a few minutes elapsed without anything occurring to explain this phenomenon and as he felt his own position a peculiarly uncomfortable one nicholas was on the point of seeking some information from the man next to him when a sudden move was visible on the stairs and a voice was heard to cry now gentlemen have the goodness to walk up so far from walking up the gentleman on the stairs began to walk down with great alacrity and to entreat with extraordinary politeness that the gentleman nearest the street would go first 
the gentleman nearest the street retorted with equal courtesy that they couldn't think of such a thing on any account but they did it without thinking of it inasmuch as the other gentleman pressing some half dozen among whom was nicholas forward and closing up behind pushed them not merely up the stairs but into the very sitting-room of mr gregsbury which they were thus compelled to enter with most unseemly precipitation and without the means of retreat the press behind them more than filling the apartment gentlemen said mr gregsbury you are welcome i am rejoiced to see you for a gentleman who was rejoiced to see a body of visitors mr gregsbury looked as uncomfortable as might be but perhaps this was occasioned by senatorial gravity and a statesmanlike habit of keeping his feelings under control he was a tough burly thick-headed gentleman with a loud voice a pompous manner a tolerable command of sentences with no meaning in them and in short every requisite for a very good member indeed now gentlemen said mr gregsbury tossing a great bundle of papers into a wicker basket at his feet and throwing himself back in his chair with his arms over his elbows you are dissatisfied with my conduct i see by the newspapers yes mr gregsbury we are said a plump old gentleman in a violent heat bursting out of the throng and planting himself in the front do my eyes deceive me said mr gregsbury looking towards the speaker or is that my old friend pugstyles i am that man and no other sir replied the plump old gentleman give me your hand my worthy friend said mr gregsbury pugstyles my dear friend i am very sorry to see you here i am very sorry to be here sir said mr pugstyles but your conduct mr gregsbury has rendered this deputation from your constituents imperatively necessary my conduct pugstyles said mr gregsbury looking round upon the deputation with gracious magnanimity my conduct has been and ever will be regulated by a sincere regard for the true and real interests of this great and happy country whether i look at home or abroad whether i behold the peaceful industrious communities of our island home her rivers covered with steamboats her roads with locomotives her streets with cabs her skies with balloons of a power and magnitude hitherto unknown in the history of aeronautics in this or any other nation i say whether i look merely at home or stretching my eyes further contemplate the boundless prospect of conquest and possession achieved by british perseverance and british valour which is outspread before me i clasp my hands and turning my eyes to the broad expanse above my head exclaim thank heaven i am a briton the time had been when this burst of enthusiasm would have been cheered to the very echo but now the deputation received it with chilling coldness the general impression seemed to be that as an explanation of mr gregsbury's political conduct it did not enter quite enough into detail and one gentleman in the rear did not scruple to remark aloud that for his purpose it savoured rather too much of a gammon tendency the meaning of that term gammon said mr gregsbury is unknown to me if it means that i grow a little too fervid or perhaps even hyperbolical in extolling my native land i admit the full justice of the remark i am proud of this free and happy country my form dilates my eyes glisten my breast heaves my heart swells my bosom burns when i call to mind her greatness and her glory we wish sir remarked mr pugstyles calmly to ask you a few questions if you please gentlemen my time is yours and my country's and my country said mr gregsbury this permission being conceded mr pugstyles put on his spectacles and referred to a written paper which he drew from his pocket whereupon nearly every other member of the deputation pulled a written paper from his pocket to check mr pugstyles off as he read the questions this done mr pugstyles proceeded to business question number one whether sir you did not give a voluntary pledge previous to your election that in the event of your being returned you would immediately put down the practice of coughing and groaning in the house of commons and whether you did not submit to be coughed and groaned down in the very first debate of the session and have since made no effort to effect a reform in this respect whether you did not also pledge yourself to astonish the government and make them shrink in their shoes and whether you have astonished them and made them shrink in their shoes or not go on to the next one my dear pugstyle said mr gregsbury have you any explanation to offer with reference to that question sir asked mr pugstyles certainly not said mr gregsbury 
the members of the deputation looked fiercely at each other and afterwards at the member dear pugstyles having taken a very long stare at mr gregsby over the tops of his spectacles resumed his list of inquiries question number two whether sir you did not likewise give a voluntary pledge that you would support your colleague on every occasion and whether you did not the night before last desert him and vote upon the other side because the wife of a leader on the other side had invited mrs gregsby to an evening party go on said mr gregsby nothing to say on that either sir asked the spokesman nothing whatever replied mr gregsby the deputation who had only seen him at canvassing or election time was struck dumb by his coolness he didn't appear to be the same man then he was all milk and honey now he was all starch and vinegar but men are so different at different times question number three and last said mr pugstyles emphatically whether sir you did not state upon the hustings that it was your firm and determined intention to oppose everything proposed to divide the house upon every question to move for returns on every subject to place a motion on the books every day and in short in your own memorable words to play the very devil with everything and everybody with this comprehensive inquiry mr pugstyles folded up his list of questions as did all his backers mr gregsby reflected blew his nose threw himself further back in his chair came forward again leaning his elbows on the table made a triangle with his two thumbs and his two forefingers and tapping his nose with the apex thereof replied smiling as he said it i deny everything at this unexpected answer a hoarse murmur arose from the deputation and the same gentleman who had expressed an opinion relative to the gammoning nature of the introductory speech again made a monosyllabic demonstration by growling out resign which growl being taken up by his fellows swelled into a very earnest and general remonstrance i am requested sir to express a hope said mr pugstyles with a distant bow that on receiving a requisition to that effect from a great majority of your constituents you will not object at once to resign your seat in favour of some candidate whom they think they can better trust to this mr gregsbury read the following reply which anticipating the request he had composed in the form of a letter whereof copies had been made to send round to the newspapers my dear mr pugstyles next to the welfare of our beloved island this great and free and happy country whose powers and resources are i sincerely believe illimitable i value that noble independence which is an englishman's proudest boast and which i fondly hope to bequeath to my children untarnished and unsullied actuated by no personal motives but moved only by high and great constitutional considerations which i will not attempt to explain for they are really beneath the comprehension of those who have not made themselves masters as i have of the intricate and arduous study of politics i would rather keep my seat and intend doing so will you do me the favour to present my compliments to the constituent body and acquaint them with this circumstance with great esteem my dear pug styles and etc and etc then you will not resign under any circumstances asked the spokesman mr gregsbury smiled and shook his head then good morning sir said pug styles angrily heaven bless you said mr gregsbury and the deputation with many growls and scowls filed off as quickly as the narrowness of the staircase would allow of their getting down the last man being gone mr gregsbury rubbed his hands and chuckled as many fellows will when they think they have said or done a more than commonly good thing he was so engrossed in this self-congratulation that he did not observe that nicholas had been left behind in the shadow of the window curtains until that young gentleman fearing he might otherwise overhear some soliloquy intended to have no listeners coughed twice or thrice to attract the members notice what's that said mr gregsby in sharp accents Nicholas stepped forward and bowed. "'What do you do here, sir?' asked Mr. Gregsbury. "'A spy upon my privacy? A concealed voter? You have heard my answer, sir. Pray follow the deputation.' "'I should have done so if I belonged to it, but I do not,' said Nicholas. "'Then how come you here, sir?' was the natural inquiry of Mr. Gregsbury, M.P. "'And where the devil have you come from, sir?' was the question which followed it. 
i brought this card from the general agency office sir said nicholas wishing to offer myself as your secretary and understanding that you stood in need of one that's all you have come for is it said mr gregsby eyeing him in some doubt nicholas replied in the affirmative you have no connection with any of those rascally papers have you said mr gregsby you didn't get in the room to hear what was going forward and put it in print eh i have no connection i'm sorry to say with anything at present rejoined nicholas politely enough but quite at his ease oh said mr gregsby how did you find your way up here then nicholas related how he had been forced up by the deputation that was the way was it said mr gregsby sit down nicholas took a chair and mr gregsby stared at him for a long time as if to make certain before he asked any further questions that there were no objections to his outward appearance you want to be my secretary do you he said at length i wish to be employed in that capacity sir replied nicholas well said mr gregsby now what can you do i suppose replied nicholas smiling that i can do what usually falls to the lot of other secretaries what's that inquired mr gregsby what is it replied nicholas ah what is it retorted the member looking shrewdly at him with his head on one side uh, secretary's duties are rather difficult to define perhaps said nicholas considering they include i presume correspondence good interposed mr gregsby the arrangement of papers and documents very good occasionally perhaps the writing from your dictation and possibly sir said nicholas with a half smile the copying of your speech for some public journal when you have made one of more than usual importance certainly rejoined mr gregsby what else really said nicholas after a moment's reflection i am not able at this instant to recapitulate any other duty of a secretary beyond the general one of making himself as agreeable and useful to his employer as he can consistently with his own respectability and without overstepping that line of duties which he undertakes to perform and which the designation of his office is usually understood to imply mr gregsbury looked fixedly at nicholas for a short time and then glancing warily round the room said in a suppressed voice that is all very well mr what is your name nickleby that is all very well mr nickleby and very proper so far as it goes so far as it goes but it doesn't go far enough there are other duties mr nickleby which a secretary to a parliamentary gentleman must never lose sight of i should require to be crammed sir beg your pardon interposed nicholas doubtful whether he had heard aright to be crammed sir repeated mr gregsby may i beg your pardon again if i inquire what you mean said nicholas my meaning sir is perfectly plain replied mr gregsby with a solemn aspect my secretary would have to make himself master of the foreign policy of the world as it is mirrored in the newspapers to run his eye over all accounts of public meetings all leading articles and accounts of the proceedings of public bodies and to make notes of anything which appeared to him might be made a point of in any little speech upon the question of some petition lying on the table or anything of that kind do you understand i think i do sir replied nicholas then said mr gregsby it would be necessary for him to make himself acquainted from day to day with newspaper paragraphs on passing events such as mysterious disappearance and supposed suicide of a pot-boy or anything of that sort upon which i might found a question to the secretary of state for the home department then he would have to copy the question and as much as i remembered of the answer including a little compliment about the independence and good sense and to send the manuscript in a frank to the local paper with perhaps half a dozen lines of leader to the effect that i was always to be found in my place in parliament and never shrunk from the responsible and arduous duties and so forth do you see nicholas bowed besides which continued mr gregsby i should expect him now and then to go through a few figures of the printed tables and to pick out a few results so that i might come out pretty well on timber duty questions and finance questions and so on and i should like him to get up a few little arguments about the disastrous effects of a return to cash payments and a metallic currency with a touch now and then about the exportation of bullion and the emperor of russia and banknotes and all that kind of thing which it's only necessary to talk fluently about because nobody understands it do you take me i think i understand said nicholas with regard to such questions as are not political continued mr gregsby warming 
and which one can't be expected to care a curse about beyond the natural care of not allowing inferior people to be as well off as ourselves else where are our privileges i should wish my secretary to get together a few little flourishing speeches of a patriotic cast for instance if any preposterous bill were brought forward for giving poor grubbing devils of authors a right to their own property i should like to say that i for one would never consent to opposing an insurmountable bar to the diffusion of literature among the people you understand that the creations of the pocket being man's might belong to one man or one family but that the creations of the brain being god's ought as a matter of course belong to the people at large and if i was pleasantly disposed i should like to make a joke about posterity and say that those who wrote for posterity should be content to be rewarded by the approbation of posterity it might take with the house and could never do me any harm because posterity can't be expected to know anything about me or my jokes either do you see i see that sir replied nicholas you must always bear in mind in such cases as this where our interests are not affected said mr gregsbury to put it very strong about the people because it comes out very well at election time and you could be as funny as you liked about the authors because i believe the greater part of them live in lodgings and are not voters this is a hasty outline of the chief things you have to do except waiting in the lobby every night in case i forgot anything and should want fresh cramming and now and then during great debates sitting in the front row of the gallery and saying to the people about you see that gentleman with his hand to his face and his arm twisted round the pillar that's mr gregsbury the celebrated mr gregsbury with any other little eulogium that might strike you at the moment and for salary said mr gregsbury winding up with great rapidity for he was out of breath and for salary i don't mind saying at once in round numbers to prevent any dissatisfaction though it's more than i've been accustomed to give fifteen shillings a week and find yourself there with his handsome offer mr gregsbury once more threw himself back in his chair and looked like a man who had been most profligately liberal but is determined not to repent of it notwithstanding fifteen shillings a week is not much said nicholas mildly not much fifteen shillings a week not much young man cried mr gregsbury fifteen shillings a pray do not suppose that i quarrel with the sum sir replied nicholas for i am not ashamed to confess that whatever it may be in itself to me it is a great deal but the duties and responsibilities make the recompense small and they are so very heavy that i fear to undertake them do you decline to undertake them sir inquired mr gregsby with his hand on the bell rope i fear they are too great for my powers however good my will may be sir replied nicholas that is as much to say that you had rather not accept the place and that you consider fifteen shillings a week too little said mr gregsby ringing do you decline it sir i have no alternative but to do so replied nicholas door matthews said mr gregsby as the boy appeared i am sorry to have troubled you unnecessarily sir said nicholas i am sorry you have rejoined mr gregsby turning his back upon him door matthews good morning sir said nicholas door matthews cried mr gregsby the boy beckoned nicholas and tumbling lazily downstairs before him opened the door and ushered him into the street with a sad and pensive air he retraced his steps homewards smike had scraped a meal together from the remnants of last night's supper and was anxiously awaiting his return the occurrences of the morning had not improved nicholas's appetite and by him the dinner remained untasted he was sitting in a thoughtful attitude with the plate which the poor fellow had assiduously filled with the choicest morsels untouched by his side when newman noggs looked into the room come back asked newman yes replied nicholas tired to death and what is worse might have remained at home for all the good i have done couldn't expect to do much in one morning said newman may be so but i am sanguine and did expect said nicholas and am proportionately disappointed saying which he gave newman an account of his proceedings if i could do anything said nicholas anything however slight until ralph nickleby returns and i have eased my mind by confronting him i should feel happier i should think it no disgrace to work heaven knows lying indolently here like a half-tamed sullen beast distracts me i don't know said newman small things offer they would pay the rent 
and more but you wouldn't like them no you could hardly be expected to undergo it no no what could i hardly be expected to undergo asked nicholas raising his eyes show me in this wide waste of london any honest means by which i could even defray the weekly hire of this poor room and see if i shrink from resorting to them undergo i have undergone too much my friend to feel pride or squeamishness now except added nicholas hastily after a short silence except such squeamishness as is common honesty and so much pride as constitutes self-respect i see little to choose between assistant to a brutal pedagogue and toady to a mean and ignorant upstart be he a member or no member i hardly know whether i should tell you what i heard this morning or not said newman has it reference to what you said just now asked nicholas it has then in heaven's name my good friend tell it me said nicholas for god's sake consider my deplorable condition and while i am promised to take no step without taking counsel with you give me at least a vote in my own behalf moved by this entreaty newman stammered forth a variety of most unaccountable and entangled sentences the upshot of which was that mrs kenwigs had examined him at great length that morning touching the origin of his acquaintance with and the whole life adventures and pedigree of nicholas that newman had parried these questions as long as he could but being at length hard pressed and driven into a corner had gone so far as to admit that nicholas was a tutor of great accomplishments involved in some misfortunes which he was not at liberty to explain and bearing the name of johnson that mrs kenwigs impelled by gratitude or ambition or maternal pride or maternal love all four powerful motives conjointly had taken a secret conference with mr kenwigs and had finally returned to propose that mr johnson should instruct the four miss kenwigses in the french language as spoken by natives at the weekly stipend of five shillings current coin of the realm being at the rate of one shilling per week per each miss kenwigs and one shilling over until such times as the baby might be able to take it out in grammar which unless i am very much mistaken observed mrs kenwigs in making the proposition will not be very long for such clever children mr noggs never were born into this world i do believe there said newman that's all it's beneath you i know but i thought that perhaps you might might cried nicholas with great alacrity of course i shall i accept the offer at once tell the worthy mother so without delay my dear fellow and that i am ready to begin whenever she pleases newman hastened with joyful steps to inform mrs kenwigs of his friend's acquiescence and soon returning brought back word that they would be happy to see him in the first floor as soon as convenient that mrs kenwigs had upon the instant sent out to secure a second-hand french grammar and dialogues which had long been fluttering in the sixpenny box at the bookstall round the corner and that the family highly excited at the prospect of this addition to their gentility wished the initiatory session to come off immediately and here it may be observed that nicholas was not in the ordinary sense of the word a young man of high spirit he would resent an affront to himself or interpose to redress a wrong offered to another as boldly and freely as any knight that ever set a lance in rest but he lacked that peculiar excess of coolness and great-minded selfishness which invariably distinguish gentlemen of high spirit in truth for our own part we are disposed to look upon such gentlemen as being rather encumbrances than otherwise in rising families happening to be acquainted with several whose spirit prevents their settling down to any grovelling occupation and only displays itself in a tendency to cultivate mustachios and look fierce and although mustachios and ferocity are both very pretty things in their way and very much to be commended we confess to a desire to see them bred at the owner's proper cost rather than at the expense of low-spirited people nicholas therefore not being a high-spirited young man according to common parlance and deeming it a greater degradation to borrow for the supply of his necessities from newman noggs than to teach french to the little kenwigses for five shillings a week accepted the offer with the alacrity already described and betook himself to the first floor with all convenient speed here he was received by mrs kenwigs with a genteel air 
kindly intended to assure him of her protection and support and here too he found mr lillyvick and miss Patoka, the four miss kenrigses on their form of audience and the baby in a dwarf porter's chair with a deal tray before it amusing himself with a toy horse without a head the said horse being composed of a small wooden cylinder not unlike an italian iron supported on four crooked pegs and painted in ingenious resemblance of red wafers set in blacking how do you do mr johnson said mrs kenwigs uncle mr johnson how do you do sir said mr lillyvick rather sharply for he had not known what nicholas was on the previous night and it was rather an aggravating circumstance if a tax collector had been too polite to a teacher mr johnson is engaged as a private master to the children uncle said mrs kenwigs so you said just now my dear replied mr lillyvick but i hope said mrs kenwigs drawing herself up that it will not make them proud but that they will bless their own good fortune which has borne them superior to common people's children do you hear morlina yes ma replied miss kenwigs and when you go out in the streets or elsewhere i desire that you don't boast of it to the other children said mrs kenwigs and that if you must say anything about it you don't say no more than we've got a private master comes to teach us at home but we ain't proud because ma says it's sinful do you hear morlina yes ma replied miss kenwigs again then mind you recollect it and do as i tell you said mrs kenwigs shall mr johnson begin uncle i am ready to hear if mr johnson is ready to commence my dear said the collector assuming the air of a profound critic what sort of language do you consider french sir how do you mean asked nicholas do you consider it a good language sir said the collector a pretty language a sensible language a pretty language certainly replied nicholas and as it has a name for everything and admits of elegant conversation about everything i presume it is a sensible one i don't know said mr lillyvick doubtfully do you call it a cheerful language now yes replied nicholas i should say it was certainly it's very much changed since my time then said the collector very much was it a dismal one in your time asked nicholas scarcely able to repress a smile very replied mr lillyvick with some vehemence of manner it's the war time that i speak of the last war it may be a cheerful language i should be sorry to contradict anybody but i can only say that i've heard the french prisoners who were natives and ought to know how to speak it talking in such a dismal manner that it made one miserable to hear them ay that i have fifty times sir fifty times mr lillyvick was waxing so cross that mrs kenwigs thought it expedient to motion to nicholas not to say anything and it was not until miss Patoka had practised several blandishments to soften the excellent old gentleman that he deigned to break silence by asking what's water in french sir la replied nicholas ah said mr lillyvick shaking his head mournfully i thought as much lua i don't think anything of that language nothing at all i suppose the children may begin uncle said mrs kenwigs oh yes they may begin my dear replied the collector discontentedly i have no wish to prevent them the permission being conceded the four miss kenwigses sat in a row with their tails all one way and what leaner at the top while nicholas taking the book began his preliminary explanations miss Patoka and mrs kenwigs looked on in silent admiration broken only by the whispered assurances of the latter that morlina would have it all by heart in no time and mr lillyvick regarded the group with frowning and attentive eyes lying in wait for something upon which he could open a fresh discussion on the language End of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter Seventeen follows the fortunes of Miss Nickleby. It was with a heavy heart and many sad forebodings which no effort could banish that kate nickleby on the morning appointed for the commencement of her engagement with madame mantalini left the city when its clocks yet wanted a quarter of an hour of eight and threaded her way alone amid the noise and bustle of the streets towards the west end of london at this early hour many sickly girls whose business like that of the poor worm is to produce with patient toil 
the finery that bedecks the thoughtless and luxurious traverse our streets making towards the scene of their daily labour and catching as if by stealth in their hurried walk the only gasp of wholesome air and glimpse of sunlight which cheer their monotonous existence during the long train of hours that make a working day as she drew nigh to the more fashionable quarter of the town kate marked many of this class as they passed by hurrying like herself to their painful occupation and saw in their unhealthy looks and feeble gait but too clear an evidence that her misgivings were not wholly groundless she arrived at madame mantalini's some minutes before the appointed hour and after walking a few times up and down in the hope that some other female might arrive and spare her the embarrassment of stating her business to the servant knocked timidly at the door which after some delay was opened by the footman who had been putting on his striped jacket as he came upstairs and was now intent on fastening his apron is madame mantalini in faltered kate not often out at this time miss replied the man in a tone which rendered miss something more offensive than my dear can i see her asked kate eh replied the man holding the door in his hand and honouring the inquirer with a stare and a broad grin lord no i came by her own appointment said kate i am i am to be employed here oh you should have rung the workers bell said the footman touching the handle of one in the door-post let me see though i forgot miss nickleby is it yes replied kate you're to walk upstairs then please said the man madame mantalini wants to see you this way take care of these things on the floor cautioning her in these terms not to trip over a heterogeneous litter of pastry cooks trays lamps waiters full of glasses and piles of rout seats which were strewn about the hall plainly bespeaking a late party on the previous night the man led the way to the second story and ushered kate into a back room communicating by folding doors with the apartment in which she had first seen the mistress of the establishment if you'll wait here a minute said the man i'll tell her presently having made this promise with much affability he retired and left kate alone there was not much to amuse in the room of which the most attractive feature was a half-length portrait in oil of mr mantalini whom the artist had depicted scratching his head in an easy manner and thus displaying to advantage a diamond ring the gift of madame mantalini before her marriage there was however the sound of voices in conversation in the next room and as the conversation was loud and the partition thin kate could not help discovering that they belonged to mr and mrs mantalini you will be odiously demnably outrageously jealous my soul said mr mantalini you will be very miserable horrid miserable demnition miserable and then there was a sound as though mr mantalini was sipping his coffee i am miserable returned madame mantalini evidently pouting then you're an ungrateful unworthy demmed unthankful little fairy said mr mantalini i am not returned madame with a sob do not put itself out of humour said mr mantalini breaking an egg it is a pretty bewitching little demmed countenance and it should not be out of humour for it spoils its loveliness and makes it cross and gloomy like a frightful naughty demmed hobgoblin i am not to be brought round in that way always rejoined madame sulkily it shall be brought round in any way it likes best and not brought round at all if it likes that better retorted mr mantalini with his egg-spoon in his mouth it's very easy to talk said mrs mantalini not so easy when one is eating a damnation egg replied mr mantalini for the yolk runs down the waistcoat and yolk of egg does not match any waistcoat but a yellow waistcoat damn it you were flirting with her during the whole night said madame mantalini apparently desirous to lead the conversation back to the point from which it had strayed no no my life you were said madame i had my eye upon you all the time bless the little winking twinkling eye it was on me all the time cried mantalini in a sort of lazy rapture oh damn it and i say once more resumed madame that you ought not to waltz with anybody but your own wife and i will not bear it mantalini if i take poison first she will not take poison and have horrid pains will she said mantalini who by the altered sound of his voice seemed to have moved his chair and taken up his position nearer to his wife she will not take poison because she had a damn fine husband who might have married two countesses and a dowager 
Two countesses interposed madame. You told me one before. Two, cried Mantalini. Two demfane women, real countesses, and splendid fortunes, Demet. And why didn't you ask madame playfully? I didn't I, replied her husband. Had I not seen at a morning concert the demdest little fascinator in the world? And while that little fascinator is my wife, may not all the countesses and dowagers in England be? Mr. Mantalini did not finish the sentence, but he gave Madame Mantalini a very loud kiss, which Madame Mantalini returned, after which there seemed to be some more kissing mixed up with the progress of the breakfast. And what about the cash, my existence jewel, said Mantalini, when these endearments cease? How much have we in hand? Very little indeed, replied Madame. We must have some more, said Mantalini. We must have some discount out of old Nickleby to carry on the war with, Demit. You can't want any more just now, said Madame coaxingly. My life and soul, returned her husband. There is a horse for sale at Scrubs, which would be a sin and a crime to lose, going my senses joy for nothing. For nothing, cried Madame, I'm glad of that. For actually nothing, replied Mantalini. A hundred guineas down will buy him mane and crest and legs and tail, all of the demdest beauty. I will ride him in the park before the very chariots of the rejected countesses. The damned old dowager will faint with grief and rage. The other two will say he is married, he has made away with himself. It's a damned thing, it's all up. They will hate each other demnably and wish you dead and buried. Ha <laughs> ha, damn it. Madame Mantalini's prudence, if she had any, was not proof against these triumphal pictures. After a little jingling of keys, she observed that she would see what her desk contained, and rising for that purpose, opened the folding door and walked into the room where Kate was seated. "'Dear me, child!' exclaimed Madame Mantalini, recalling in surprise. "'How came you here?' "'Child!' cried Mantalini, hurrying in. "'How came—' "'Oh, oh, oh damn it! How do you do?' "'I've been waiting here some time, ma'am,' said Kate, addressing Madame Mantalini. "'The servant must have forgotten to let you know that I was here, I think.' "'You really must see to that man,' said Madame, turning to her husband. "'He forgets everything. "'I will twist his damned nose off his countenance for leaving such a very pretty creature all alone by herself,' said her husband. "'Mantalini,' cried Madame, "'you forget yourself.' "'I don't forget you, my soul, and never shall, and never can,' said Mantalini, kissing his wife's hand and grimacing aside to Miss Nickleby, who turned away. Appeased by this compliment, the lady of the business took some papers from her desk, which she handed over to Mr. Mantalini, who received them with great delight. She then requested Kate to follow her, and after several feints on the part of Mr. Mantalini to attract the young lady's attention, they went away, leaving that gentleman extended full length on the sofa, with his heels in the air and a newspaper in his hand. Madame Mantalini led the way down a flight of stairs and through a passage to a large room at the back of the premises, where were a number of young women employed in sewing, cutting out, making up, altering, and various other processes known only to those who are cunning in the arts of millinery and dressmaking. It was a close room with a skylight, and as dull and as quiet as a room need be. On Madame Mantalini calling aloud for Miss Nag, a short, bustling, overdressed female, full of importance, presented herself, and all the young ladies, suspending their operations for the moment, whispered to each other sundry criticisms upon the make and texture of Miss Nickleby's dress, her complexion, her cast of features, and personal appearance, with as much good breeding as could have been displayed by the very best society in a crowded ballroom. "'Oh, Miss Nag," said Madame Mantalini, "'this is the young person I spoke to you about.' Miss Nag bestowed a reverential smile upon Madame Mantalini, which she dexterously transformed into a gracious one for Kate, and said that certainly, although it was a great deal of trouble to have young people who were wholly unused to the business, still she was sure the young person would try to do her best, impressed with which conviction she, Miss Nag, felt an interest in her already. I think that for the present, at all events, it would be better for Miss Nickleby to come into the showroom with you and try things on for people, said Madame Mantalini. She will not be able for the present to be of much use in any other way, and her appearance will suit very well with mine, Madame Mantalini, interrupted Miss Nag. So it will, and to be sure, I might have known that you would not be long in finding that out, for you have so much taste in all these matters. 
really as often as i say to the young ladies i do not know how when or where you possibly could have acquired all you know uh, miss nickleby and i are quite a pair madame mantalini only i am a little darker than miss nickleby and uh, i think my foot may be a little smaller miss nickleby i am sure will not be offended at my saying that when she hears that our family always have been celebrated for small feet ever since uh, ever since our family had any feet at all indeed i think i had an uncle once madame mantalini who lived in cheltenham and had the most excellent business as a tobacconist uh, who had such small feet that they were no bigger than those which are usually joined to wooden legs the most symmetrical feet madame mantalini that even you can imagine they must have had something of the appearance of club feet miss nag said madame well now that is so like you returned miss nag <laughs> of club feet oh very good as i often remark to the young ladies well i must say and i do not care who knows it of all the ready humour uh, i ever heard anywhere and i have heard a good deal for when my dear brother was alive i kept house for him miss nickleby we had to supper once a week or two three young men highly celebrated in those days for their humour madame mantalini of all the ready humour i say to the young ladies i ever heard madame mantalini's is the most remarkable uh, it's so gentle so sarcastic and yet so good-natured as i was observing to miss simmons only this morning that how or when or by what means she acquired it is to me a mystery indeed here miss nag paused to take a breath and while she pauses it may be observed not that she was marvellously loquacious and marvellously deferential to madame mantalini since these are facts which require no comment but that every now and then she was accustomed in the torrent of her discourse to introduce a loud shrill clear uh, the import and meaning of which was variously interpreted by her acquaintance some holding that miss nag dealt in exaggeration and introduced this monosyllable when any fresh invention was in course of coinage in her brain others that when she wanted a word she threw it in to gain time and prevent any one else from striking into the conversation it may be further remarked that miss nag still aimed at youth although she had shot beyond it years ago and that she was weak and vain and one of those people who are best described by the axiom that you may trust them as far as you can see them and no further you'll take care that miss nickleby understands her hours and so forth said madame mantalini and so i leave her with you you'll not forget my directions miss nag miss nag of course replied that to forget anything madame mantalini had directed was a moral impossibility and that lady dispensing a general good morning among her assistants sailed away charming creature isn't she miss nickleby said miss nag rubbing her hands together i have seen very little of her said kate i hardly know yet have you seen mr mantalini inquired miss nag yes i have seen him twice isn't he a charming creature indeed he does not strike me as being so by any means replied kate no my dear cried miss nag elevating her hands why goodness gracious mercy where's your taste such a fine tall full whiskered dashing gentlemanly man with such teeth and hair and uh, well now you do astonish me i dare say i am very foolish replied kate laying aside her bonnet but as my opinion is of very little importance to him or any one else i do not regret having formed it and should be slow to change it i think he is a very fine man don't you think so asked one of the young ladies indeed he may be for anything i could say to the contrary replied kate and drives very beautiful horses doesn't he inquired another i dare say he may but i never saw them answered kate never saw them interposed miss nag oh well there is at once you know how can you possibly pronounce an opinion about a gentleman um if you don't see him as he turns out altogether there was so much of the world even of the little world of the country girl in this idea of the old milliner that kate who was anxious for every reason to change the subject made no further remark and left miss nag in possession of the field after a short silence during which most of the young people made a closer inspection of kate's appearance and compared notes respecting it one of them offered to help her off with her shawl and the offer being accepted inquired whether she did not find black very uncomfortable to wear 
i do indeed replied kate with a bitter sigh so dusty and hot observed the same speaker adjusting her dress for her kate might have said that morning is sometimes the coldest wear which mortals can assume that it not only chills the breasts of those it clothes but extending its influence to summer friends freezes up their sources of goodwill and kindness and withering all the buds of promise they once so liberally put forth leaves nothing but bared and rotten hearts exposed there are a few who have lost a friend or relative constituting in life their sole dependence who have not keenly felt this chilling influence of their sable garb she had felt it acutely and feeling it at the moment could not quite restrain her tears i am very sorry to have wounded you by my thoughtless speech said her companion i did not think of it you are in mourning for some near relation for my father answered kate for what relation miss simmons asked miss nagg in an audible voice her father replied the other softly her father eh said miss nagg without the slightest depression of her voice ah a long illness miss simmons hush replied the girl i don't know our misfortune was very sudden said kate turning away or i might perhaps at a time like this be enabled to support it better there had existed not a little desire in the room according to invariable custom when any new young person came to know who kate was and what she was and all about her but although it might have been very naturally increased by her appearance and emotion the knowledge that it pained her to be questioned was sufficient to repress even this curiosity and miss nag finding it hopeless to attempt extracting any further particulars just then reluctantly commanded silence and bade the work proceed in silence then the tasks were plied until half past one when a baked leg of mutton with potatoes to correspond was served in the kitchen the meal over and the young ladies having enjoyed the additional relaxation of washing their hands the work began again and was again performed in silence until the noise of carriages rattling through the streets and of loud double knocks at doors gave token that the day's work of the more fortunate members of society was proceeding in its turn one of these double knocks at madame mantalini's door announced the equipage of some great lady or rather rich one for there is occasionally a distinction between riches and greatness who had come with her daughter to approve of some court dresses which had been a long time preparing and upon whom kate was deputed to wait accompanied by miss nag and officered of course by madame mantalini kate's part in the pageant was humble enough her duties being limited to holding articles of costume until miss nag was ready to try them on and now and then tying a string or fastening a hook and eye she might not unreasonably have supposed herself beneath the reach of any arrogance or bad humour but it happened that the lady and daughter were both out of temper that day and the poor girl came in for her share of their revilings she was awkward her hands were cold dirty coarse she could do nothing right they wondered how madame mantalini could have such people about her requested that they might see some other young woman the next time they came and so forth so common an occurrence would hardly be deserving of mention but for its effect kate shed many bitter tears when these people were gone and felt for the first time humbled by her occupation she had it's true quailed at the prospect of drudgery and hard service but she had felt no degradation in working for her bread until she found herself exposed to insolence and pride philosophy would have taught her that the degradation was on the side of those who had sunk so low as to display such passions habitually and without cause but she was too young for such consolation and her honest feeling was hurt may not the complaint that common people are above their station often take its rise in the fact of uncommon people being below theirs in such scenes and occupations the time wore on until nine o'clock when kate jaded and dispirited with the occurrences of the day hastened from the confinement of the workroom to join her mother at the street corner and walk home the more sadly from having to disguise her real feelings and feign to participate in all the sanguine visions of her companion bless my soul kate said mrs nickleby i've been thinking all day what a delightful thing it would be for madame mantalini to take you into partnership such a likely thing too you know why your poor dear papa's cousin sister-in-law a miss browndock was taken into partnership by a lady that kept a school at hammersmith 
and made her fortune in no time at all i forget by the by whether that miss brown dock was the same lady that got ten thousand pound prize in the lottery but i think she was indeed now i come to think of it i'm sure she was mantalini and nickleby how well it would sound and if nicholas has any good fortune you might have dr nickleby the headmaster of westminster school living in the same street dearest nicholas cried kate taking from her reticule her brother's letter from dotheboys hall in all our misfortunes how happy it makes me mamma to hear he is doing well and to find him writing in such good spirits it consoles me for all we may undergo to think that he is comfortable and happy poor kate she little thought how weak her consolation was and how soon she would be undeceived End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the life and adventures of nicholas nickleby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain nicholas nickleby by charles dickens chapter eighteen miss nag after doting on kate nickleby for three whole days makes up her mind to hate her for evermore the causes which led miss nag to form this resolution there are many lives of much pain hardship and suffering which having no stirring interest for any but those who lead them are disregarded by persons who do not want thought or feeling but who pamper their compassion and need high stimulants to rouse it there are not a few among the disciples of charity who require in their vocation scarcely less excitement than the votaries of pleasure in theirs and hence it is that disease sympathy and compassion are every day expended on out-of-the-way objects when only too many demands upon the legitimate exercise of the same virtues in a healthy state are constantly within the sight and hearing of the most unobservant person alive in short charity must have its romance as the novelist or playwright must have his a thief in fustian is a vulgar character scarcely to be thought of by persons of refinement but dress him in green velvet with a high-crowned hat and change the scene of his operations from a thickly peopled city to a mountain road and you shall find in him the very soul of poetry and adventure so it is with the one great cardinal virtue which properly nourished and exercised leads to if it does not necessarily include all the others it must have its romance and the less of real hard struggling workaday life there is in that romance the better the life to which poor kate nickleby was devoted in consequence of the unforeseen train of circumstances already developed in this narrative was a hard one but less the very dullness unhealthy confinement and bodily fatigue which made up its sum and substance should deprive it of any interest with the mass of the charitable and sympathetic i would rather keep miss nickleby herself in view just now than chill them in the outset by a minute and lengthened description of the establishment presided over by madame mantalini well now indeed madame mantalini said miss knag as kate was taking her weary way homewards on the first night of a novitiate that miss nickleby is a very creditable young person a very creditable young person indeed um, upon my word madame mantalini it does very extraordinary credit even to your discrimination that you should have found such a very excellent very well behaved very um, unassuming young woman to assist in the fitting on i have seen some young women when they had the opportunity of displaying before their betters behave in such a uh, oh dear well but you're always right madame mantalini always and as i very often tell the young ladies how do you contrive to be always right when so many people are so often wrong it is to me a mystery indeed beyond putting a very excellent client out of humour miss nickleby has not done anything very remarkable to-day that i am aware of at least said madame mantalini in reply oh dear said miss knag but you must allow a great deal for inexperience you know and youth required madame oh i say nothing about that madame mantalini replied miss knag reddening because if youth were any excuse you wouldn't have quite so good a forewoman as i have i suppose suggested madame 
well i never did know anybody like you madame mantalini rejoined miss nag most complacently and that's the fact for you know what one's going to say before it has time to rise to one's lips oh very good ha 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 for myself observed madame mantalini glancing with affected carelessness at her assistant and laughing heartily in her sleeve i consider miss nickleby the most awkward girl i ever saw in my life poor dear thing said miss nag it's not her fault if it was we might hope to cure it but as it's her misfortune madame mantalini why really you know as the man said about the blind horse we ought to respect it her uncle told me she had been considered pretty remarked madame mantalini i think her one of the most ordinary girls i ever met with ordinary cried miss nag with a countenance beaming delight and awkward well all i can say is madame mantalini that i quite love the poor girl and yet if she was twice as indifferent looking and twice as awkward as she is i should be only so much the more her friend and that's the truth of it in fact miss nag had conceived an incipient affection for kate nickleby after witnessing her failure that morning and this short conversation with her superior increased the favourable prepossession to a most surprising extent which was the more remarkable as when she first scanned that young lady's face and figure she had entertained certain inward misgivings that they would never agree but now said miss nag glancing at the reflection of herself in a mirror at no great distance i love her i quite love her i declare i do of such a highly disinterested quality was this devoted friendship and so superior was it to the little weakness of flattery or ill-nature that the kind-hearted miss nag candidly informed kate nickleby the next day that she saw she would never do for the business but that she need not give herself the slightest uneasiness on this account for that she miss nag by increased exertions on her own part would keep her as much as possible in the background and that all she would have to do would be to remain perfectly quiet before company and to shrink from attracting notice by every means in her power the last suggestion was so much in accordance with the timid girl's own feelings and wishes that she readily promised implicit reliance on the excellent spinster's advice without questioning or indeed bestowing a moment's reflection upon the motives that dictated it i take quite a lively interest in you my dear soul upon my word said miss nag a sister's interest actually it's the most singular circumstance i ever knew undoubtedly it was singular that if miss nag did feel a strong interest in kate nickleby it should not rather have been the interest of a maiden aunt or a grandmother that being the conclusion to which the difference in their respective ages would naturally have tended but miss nag wore clothes of a very youthful pattern and perhaps her feelings took the same shape bless you said miss nag bestowing a kiss upon kate at the conclusion of the second day's work how very awkward you have been all day i fear your kind and open communication which has rendered me more painfully conscious of my own defects has not improved me sighed kate no no i dare say not rejoined miss nag in a most uncommon flow of good humour but how much better that you should know it at first and so be able to go on straight and comfortable which way are you walking my love towards the city replied kate the city cried miss nag regarding herself with great favour in the glass as she tied her bonnet goodness gracious me now do you really live in the city is it so very unusual for anybody to live there asked kate half smiling i couldn't have believed it possible that any young woman could have lived there under any circumstances whatever for three days together replied miss nag reduced i should say poor people answered kate correcting herself hastily for she was afraid of appearing proud must live where they can ah very true so they must very proper indeed rejoined miss nag with that sort of half sigh which accompanied by two or three slight nods of the head is pity small change in a general society and that's what i very often tell my brother when our servants go away ill and he thinks the back kitchen's rather too damp for em to sleep in these sort of people i tell him are glad to sleep anywhere heaven suits the back to the burden what a nice thing it is to think that it should be so isn't it very replied kate i'll walk you part of the way my dear said miss nag for you must go very near our house and as it's quite dark and our last servant went to the hospital a week ago with st anthony's fire in her face i shall be glad of your company 
Kate would have willingly excused herself from this flattering companionship, but Miss Nag, having adjusted her bonnet to her entire satisfaction, took her arm with an air which plainly showed how much she felt the compliment she was conferring, and they were in the street before she could say another word. "'I fear,' said Kate, hesitating, "'that Mamma, my mother, I mean, is waiting for me.' "'You needn't make the least apology, my dear,' said Miss Nag, smiling sweetly as she spoke. "'I dare say she is a very respectable old person, and I should be quite, um, quite pleased to know her.' As poor Mrs. Nickleby was cooling, not her heels alone, but her limbs generally, at the street corner, Kate had no alternative but to make her known to Miss Nag, who, during the last new carriage customer at second hand, acknowledged the introduction with condescending politeness. The three then walked away, arm in arm, with Miss Snag in the middle, in a special state of amiability. "'I have taken such a fancy to your daughter, Mrs. Nickleby, you can't think,' said Miss Snag, after she had proceeded a little distance in dignified silence. "'I'm delighted to hear it,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'though it is nothing new to me that even strangers should like Kate.' Um, cried Miss Nag. "'You will like her better when you know how good she is,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'It is a great blessing to me in my misfortunes to have a child who knows neither pride nor vanity, and whose bringing up might very well have excused a little of both at first. You don't know what it is to lose a husband, Miss Nag.' As Miss Nag had never yet known what it was to gain one, it followed very nearly as a matter of course that she didn't know what it was like to lose one. So she said in some haste, No, indeed I don't. And she said it with an air, intending to signify that she should like to catch herself marrying anybody. No, no, she knew better than that. Kate has improved, even in this little time, I have no doubt, said Mrs. Nickleby, glancing proudly at her daughter. Oh, of course, said Miss Nag. And will improve still more, added Mrs. Nickleby. That she will, I'll be bound, replied Miss Nag, squeezing Kate's arm in her own to point the joke. She always was clever, said poor Mrs. Nickleby, brightening up, always from a baby. I recollect when she was only two years and a half old that a gentleman who used to visit very much at our house, Mr. Watkins, you know, Kate, my dear, that your poor papa went bail for, who afterwards ran away to the United States and sent us a pair of snowshoes with such an affectionate letter that it made your poor dear father cry for a week. You remember the letter, in which he said that he was very sorry he couldn't repay the fifty pounds just then because his capital was all out at interest, and he was very busy making his fortune, but that he didn't forget you were his goddaughter, and he should take it very unkind if we didn't buy you a silver coral and put it down to his old account. Dear me, yes, my dear, how stupid you are, and spoke so affectionately of the old port wine that he used to drink a bottle and a half of every time he came. You must remember, Kate. Yes, yes, mamma, what of him? "'Why, that, Mr. Watkins, my dear,' said Mrs. Nickleby slowly, as if she were making a tremendous effort to recollect something of paramount importance. "'That, Mr. Watkins, he wasn't any relation, Miss Nag will understand, to the Watkins who kept the old boar in the village. By the by, I don't remember whether it was the old boar or the George the Third, but it was one of the two I know, and it's much the same that Mr. Watkins said, when you were only two years and a half old, that you were one of the most astonishing children he ever saw. He did indeed, Miss Nag, and he wasn't at all fond of children, and couldn't have had the slightest motive for doing it. I know it was he who said so, because I recollect it as well as if it were only yesterday, in his borrowing twenty pounds off her poor dear papa the very moment afterwards. Having quoted this extraordinary and most disinterested testimony to her daughter's excellence, Mrs. Nickleby stopped to breathe, and Miss Nag, finding that the discourse was turning upon family greatness, lost no time in striking in with a small reminiscence on her own account. "'Don't talk of lending money, Mrs. Nickleby,' said Miss Nag, "'or you'll drive me crazy, perfectly crazy. My mamma, uh, um, uh, was the most lovely and beautiful creature, with the most striking and exquisite, um, uh, the most exquisite nose that ever was put upon a human face.' I do believe, Mrs. Nickleby, here Miss Nag rubbed her own nose sympathetically, the most delightful and accomplished woman, perhaps, that ever was seen. But she had that one failing of lending money, and carried it to such an extent that she lent uh, thousands of pounds, all our little fortunes, and what's more, Mrs. Nickleby, 
i don't think that if we were to live till till uh, till the very end of time that we should ever get them back again i don't indeed after concluding this effort of invention without being interrupted miss nag fell into many more recollections no less interesting than true the full tide of which mrs nickleby in vain attempting to stem at length sailed smoothly down by adding an undercurrent of her own recollections and so both ladies went on talking together in perfect contentment the only difference between them being that whereas miss nag addressed herself to kate and talked very loud mrs nickleby kept on in one unbroken monotonous flow perfectly satisfied to be talking and caring very little whether anybody listened or not in this manner they walked on very amicably until they arrived at miss nag's brother's who was an ornamental stationer and small circulating library keeper in a by-street off tottenham court road and who let out by the day week month or year the newest old novels whereof the titles were displayed in pen and ink characters on a sheet of pasteboard swinging at his doorpost as miss nag happened at the moment to be in the middle of an account of her twenty-second offer from a gentleman of large property she insisted upon their all going in to supper together and in they went don't go away mortimer said miss nag as they entered the shop it's only one of our young ladies and her mother mrs and miss nickleby oh indeed said mr mortimer nag ah having given utterance to these ejaculations with a very profound and thoughtful air Mr. Nag slowly snuffed the two kitchen candles on the counter, and two more in the window, then snuffed himself from a box in his waistcoat pocket. There was something very impressive in the ghostly air with which all this was done, and as Mr. Nag was a tall, lank gentleman, of solemn features, wearing spectacles and garnished with much less hair than a gentleman bordering on forty or thereabouts usually boasts, mrs nickleby whispered to her daughter that she thought he must be literary past ten said mr nag consulting his watch thomas close the warehouse thomas was a boy nearly half as tall as a shutter and the warehouse was a shop about the size of three hackney coaches ah said mr nag once more heaving a deep sigh as he restored to its parent shelf the book he had been reading well yes i believe supper is ready sister with another sigh mr nag took up the kitchen candles from the counter and preceded the ladies with mournful steps to a back parlour where a charwoman employed in the absence of the sick servant and remunerated with certain eighteen pences to be deducted from her wages was putting the supper out mrs bloxon said miss nag reproachfully how very often i have begged you not to come into the room with your bonnet on i can't help it miss nag said the charwoman bridling up at the shortest notice there's been a deal of cleaning to do in this house and if you don't like it i must trouble you to look out for somebody else for it don't hardly pay me and that's the truth if i was to be hung this minute i don't want any remarks if you please said miss nag with a strong emphasis on the personal pronoun is there any fire downstairs for some hot water presently no there is not indeed miss nag replied the substitute so i won't tell you no stories about it then why isn't there said miss nag because there aren't no coals left out and if i could make coals i would but as i can't i won't and so i make bold to tell you ma'am replied mrs bloxham will you hold your tongue female said mr mortimer nag plunging violently into this dialogue by your leave mr nag retorted the charwoman turning sharp round i'm only too glad not to speak in this house except in where and when i'm spoke to sir and with regard to being a female sir i should wish to know what you considered yourself a miserable wretch exclaimed mr nag striking his forehead a miserable wretch i'm very glad to find you don't call yourself out of your name sir said mrs bloxham and as i've had two twin children the day before yesterday it was only seven weeks and my little charlie fell down an airy and put his elbow out last monday i shall take it as a favour if you'll send nine shillings for one week's work to my house the four o'clock strikes ten tomorrow. with these parting words the good woman quitted the room with a great ease of manner leaving the door wide open mr nag at the same moment flung himself into the warehouse and groaned aloud what is the matter with that gentleman pray inquired mrs nickleby greatly disturbed by the sound is he ill inquired kate really alarmed hush replied miss nag a most melancholy history he was once most devotedly attached to 
Madame Mantalini. Bless me, exclaimed Mrs. Nickleby. Yes, continued Miss Nag, and received great encouragement too, and confidently hoped to marry her. He has a most romantic heart, Mrs. Nickleby, as indeed, um, as indeed all our family have, and the disappointment was a dreadful blow. He is a wonderfully accomplished man, most extraordinarily accomplished. Reads, um, every novel that comes out. I mean, every novel that uh, has any fashion in it, of course. The fact is that he did find so much in the books he read, applicable to his own misfortunes, and did find himself in every respect so much like the heroes, because, of course, he is conscious of his own superiority, as we all are, and very naturally, that he took to scorning everything and became a genius, and I am quite sure that he is, at this very present moment, writing another book another book repeated kate finding that a pause was left for somebody to say something yes said miss nag nodding in great triumph another book in three volumes post octavo of course it's a great advantage to him in all his little fashionable descriptions to have the benefit of my um, of my experience because of course few authors who write about such things can have such opportunities of knowing them as i have He's so wrapped up in high life that the least allusion to business or worldly matters, like that woman just now, for instance, quite distracts him. But, as I often say, I think his disappointment is a great thing for him, because if he hadn't been disappointed, he couldn't have written about blighted hopes and all that. And the fact is, if it hadn't happened as it has, I don't believe his genius would have ever come out at all. How much more communicative Miss Nag might have become under more favourable circumstances, it is impossible to divine. But as the gloomy one was within earshot, and the fire wanted making up, her disclosures stopped here. To judge from all appearances, and the difficulty of making the water warm, the last servant could not have been much accustomed to any other fire than St. Anthony's, but a little brandy and water was made at last, and the guests, having been previously regaled with cold leg of mutton and bread and cheese, soon afterwards took leave. Kate, amusing herself all the way home with the recollection of her last glimpse of Mr. Mortimer Nag, deeply abstracted in the shop, and Mrs. Nickleby, by debating within herself whether the dressmaking firm would ultimately become Mantellini, Nag and Nickleby, or Mantellini, Nickleby and Nag, at this high point, Miss Nag's friendship remained for three whole days, much to the wonderment of Madame Mantalini's young ladies, who had never beheld such constancy in that quarter before. But on the fourth it received a check, no less violent than sudden, which thus occurred. It happened that an old lord of a great family, who was going to marry a young lady of no family in particular, came with the young lady and the young lady's sister, to witness the ceremony of trying on two nuptial bonnets which had been ordered the day before and madame mantalini announcing the fact in a shrill treble through the speaking pipe which communicated with the workroom miss nag darted hastily upstairs with a bonnet in each hand and presented herself in the showroom in a charming state of palpitation intended to demonstrate her enthusiasm in the cause the bonnets were no sooner fairly on than Miss Nag and Madame Mantellini fell into convulsions of admiration. A most elegant appearance, said Madame Mantellini. I never saw anything so exquisite in all my life, said Miss Nag. Now the old lord, who was a very old lord, said nothing, but mumbled and chuckled in a state of great delight. No less with the nuptial bonnets and their wearers than with his own address in getting such a fine woman for his wife and the young lady, who was a very lively young lady, seeing the old lord in this rapturous condition, chased the old lord behind a cheval glass, and there kissed him, while Madame Mantellini and the other young lady looked discreetly another way. But pending the salutation, Miss Nag, who was tinged with curiosity, stepped accidentally behind the glass, and encountered the lively young lady's eye just at the very moment when she kissed the old lord upon which the young lady in a pouting manner murmured something about an old thing and great impertinence and finished by darting a look of displeasure at miss nag and smiling contemptuously madame mantalini said the young lady ma'am said madame mantalini pray have up that pretty young creature we saw yesterday oh yes do said the sister 
of all things in the world madame mantalini said the lord's intended throwing herself languidly on a sofa i hate being waited upon by frights or elderly persons let me always see that young creature i beg whenever i come by all means said the old lord the lovely young creature by all means every one is talking about her said the young lady in the same careless manner and my lord being a great admirer of beauty must positively see her she is universally admired replied madame mantalini miss nag send up miss nickleby you needn't return i beg your pardon madame mantalini what did you say last asked miss nag trembling you needn't return repeated the superior sharply miss nag vanished without another word and in all reasonable time was replaced by kate who took off the new bonnets and put on the old ones blushing very much to find that the old lord and the two young ladies were staring her out of countenance all the time why how you colour child said the lord's chosen bride she is not quite so accustomed to her business as she will be in a week or two interposed madame mantalini with a gracious smile i am afraid you have been giving her some of your wicked looks my lord said the intended no 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 replied the old lord no no i am going to be married and lead a new life <laughs> a new life a new life <laughs> Ah, it was a satisfactory thing to hear that the old gentleman was going to lead a new life for it was pretty evident that his old one would not last him much longer the mere exertion of protracted chuckling reduced him to a fearful ebb of coughing and gasping it was some minutes before he could find breath to remark that the girl was too pretty for a milliner i hope you don't think good looks a disqualification for the business my lord said madame mantalini simpering not by any means replied the old lord or you would have left it long ago you naughty creature said the lively lady poking the peer with her parasol i won't have you talk so how dare you this playful inquiry was accompanied with another poke and another and then the old lord caught the parasol and wouldn't give it up again which induced the other lady to come to the rescue and some very pretty sportiveness ensued you will see that those little alterations are made madame mantalini said the lady nay you bad man you positively shall go first i wouldn't leave you behind with that pretty girl not for half a second i know you too well jane my dear let him go first and we shall be quite sure of him the old lord evidently much flattered by this suspicion bestowed a grotesque leer upon kate as he passed and receiving another tap with a parasol for his wickedness tottered downstairs to the door where his sprightly body was hoisted into the carriage by two stout footmen Phew, said madame mantalini how he ever gets into a carriage without thinking of a hearse i can't think there take the things away my dear take them away kate who had remained during the whole scene with her eyes modestly fixed upon the ground was only too happy to avail herself of the permission to retire and hastened joyfully downstairs to miss nag's dominion the circumstances of the little kingdom had greatly changed however during the short period of her absence in place of miss nag being stationed in her accustomed seat preserving all the dignity and greatness of madame mantalini's representative that worthy soul was reposing on a large box bathed in tears while three or four of the young ladies in close attendance upon her together with the presence of hartshorn vinegar and other restoratives would have borne ample testimony even without the derangement of the headdress and front row of curls to her having fainted desperately bless me said kate stepping hastily forward what's the matter this inquiry produced in miss nag violent symptoms of a relapse and several young ladies darting angry looks at kate applied more vinegar and hartshorn and said it was a shame what is a shame demanded kate what is the matter what has happened tell me matter cried miss nag coming all at once bolt upright to the great consternation of the assembled maidens matter fie upon you you nasty creature gracious cried kate almost paralysed by the violence with which the adjective had been jerked out from between miss nag's closed teeth have i offended you you offended me retorted miss nag you a chit a child an upstart nobody oh indeed ha <laughs> ha now it was evident as miss nag laughed that something struck her as being exceedingly funny and as the young ladies took their tone from miss nag she being the chief they all got up a laugh without a moment's delay and nodded their heads a little and smiled sarcastically to each other 
as much as to say how very good that was. Here she is, continued Miss Nag, getting off the box and introducing Kate with much ceremony and many low curtsies to the delighted throng. Here she is. Everybody's talking about her. The bell ladies, the beauty. Oh, you bold-faced thing. At this crisis, Miss Nag was unable to repress a virtuous shudder, which immediately communicated itself to all the young ladies, after which Miss Nag laughed, and after that cried. For fifteen years, exclaimed Miss Nag, sobbing in a most affecting manner, for fifteen years I have been the credit and ornament of this room and the one upstairs. Thank God, said Miss Nag, stamping first her right foot and then her left with remarkable energy, I have never in all that time till now been exposed to the arts, the vile arts of a creature who disgraces us with all her proceedings and makes proper people blush for themselves. But I feel it, I do feel it, although I am disgusted. Miss Nag relapsed into softness, and the young ladies, renewing their attentions, murmured that she ought to be superior to such things, and that for their part they despised them, and considered them beneath their notice, in witness whereof they called out more emphatically than before that it was a shame, and that they felt so angry they did they hardly knew what to do with themselves. I have lived to this day to be called a fright, cried Miss Nag, suddenly becoming convulsive and making an effort to tear her front off. Oh, no, no, replied the chorus. Pray don't say so. Don't now. Have I deserved to be called an elderly person? screamed Miss Nag, wrestling with the supernumeraries. Don't think of such things, dear, answered the chorus. I hate her, cried Miss Nag. I detest and hate her. Never let her speak to me again. Never let anybody who is a friend of mine speak to her. A slut, a huzzy, an impudent, artful huzzy. Having denounced the object of her wrath in these terms, Miss Nag screamed once, hiccuped thrice, gurgled in her throat several times, slumbered, shivered, woke, came to, composed her headdress, and declared herself quite well again. Poor Kate had regarded these proceedings at first in perfect bewilderment. She had then turned red and pale by turns, and once or twice essayed to speak, but as the true motives of this altered behaviour developed themselves, she retired a few paces and looked calmly on without deigning a reply. Nevertheless, although she walked proudly to her seat and turned her back upon the group of little satellites who clustered round their ruling planet in the remotest corner of the room, she gave way in secret to some such bitter tears as would have gladdened Miss Nag's inmost soul if she could have seen them fall. End of chapter 18「19 of the Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens Chapter 19 Descriptive of a dinner at Mr. Ralph Nickleby's and of the manner in which the company entertain themselves before dinner, at dinner, and after dinner. The bile and rancour of the worthy Miss Nag, undergoing no diminution during the remainder of the week, but rather augmenting with every successive hour, and the honest ire of all the young ladies rising, or seeming to rise, in exact proportion to the good spinster's indignation, and both waxing very hot every time Miss Nickleby was called upstairs, it will be ready imagined that that young lady's daily life was none of the most cheerful or enviable kind. She hailed the arrival of Saturday night as a prisoner would a few delicious hours of respite from slow and wearing torture, and felt that the poor pittance for her first week's labour would have been dearly and hardly earned had its amount been trebled. When she joined her mother as usual at the street corner, she was not a little surprised to find her in conversation with Mr. Ralph Nickleby but her surprise was soon redoubled, no less by the matter of their conversation than by the smooth and altered manner of Mr. Nickleby himself. "'Ah, my dear,' said Ralph, "'we are at that moment talking about you.' "'Indeed,' replied Kate, shrinking, though she scarce knew why, from her uncle's cold, glistening eye. 
that instant said ralph i was coming to call for you making sure to catch you before you left but your mother and i have been talking over family matters and the time has slipped away so rapidly well now hasn't it interposed mrs nickleby quite insensible to the sarcastic tone of ralph's last remark upon my word i couldn't have believed it possible that such a kate my dear you're to dine with your uncle at half-past six o'clock to-morrow triumphing in having been the first to communicate this extraordinary intelligence mrs nickleby nodded and smiled a great many times to impress its full magnificence on kate's wondering mind and then flew off at an acute angle to a committee of ways and means let me see said the good lady your black silk frock will be quite dress enough my dear with that pretty little scarf and a plain band in your hair and a pair of black silk stock oh dear dear cried mrs nickleby flying off at another angle if i had but those unfortunate amethysts of mine you recollect them kate my love how they used to sparkle you know but your papa your poor dear papa ah there never was anything so cruelly sacrificed as those jewels were never overpowered by this agonizing thought mrs nickleby shook her head in a melancholy manner and applied her handkerchief to her eyes i don't want them mamma indeed said kate forget that you ever had them lord kate my dear rejoined mrs nickleby pettishly how like a child you talk four and twenty silver teaspoons brother-in-law two gravies four salts all the amethysts necklace brooch and earrings all made away with at the same time and i saying almost on my bended knees to that poor good soul why don't you do something nicholas why don't you make some arrangement i am sure that anybody who is about us at that time will do me justice to own that if i said that once i said it fifty times a day didn't i kate my dear did i ever lose an opportunity of impressing it on your poor papa no no mamma never replied kate and to do mrs nickleby justice she never had lost and to do married ladies as a body justice they seldom do lose any occasion of inculcating similar golden percepts whose only blemish is the slight degree of vagueness and uncertainty in which they are usually enveloped ah said mrs nickleby with great fervour if my advice had been taken at the beginning well i have always done my duty and that's some comfort when she had arrived at this reflection mrs nickleby sighed rubbed her hands cast up her eyes and finally assumed a look of meek composure thus importing that she was a persecuted saint but that she wouldn't trouble her hearers by mentioning a circumstance which must be so obvious to everybody now said ralph with a smile which in common with all other tokens of emotion seemed to skulk under his face rather than play boldly over it to return to the point from which we have strayed i have a little party of, of gentlemen whom i am connected in business just now at my house to-morrow and your mother has promised that you shall keep house for me i'm not much used to parties but this is one of business and such fooleries are an important part of it sometimes you don't mind obliging me mind cried mrs nickleby my dear kate why pray interrupted ralph motioning her to be silent i spoke to my niece i shall be very glad of course uncle replied kate but i am afraid you will find me awkward and embarrassed oh no said ralph come when you like in a hackney coach i'll pay for it good night uh, uh, god bless you the blessing seemed to stick in mr ralph nickleby's throat as if it were not used to the thoroughfare and didn't know the way out but it got out somehow though awkwardly enough and having disposed of it he shook hands with his two relatives and abruptly left them what a very strongly marked countenance your uncle has said mrs nickleby quite struck with his parting look i don't see the slightest resemblance to his poor brother mamma said kate reprovingly to think of such a thing no said mrs nickleby musing there certainly is none but it's a very honest face the worthy matron made this remark with great emphasis and elocution as if it comprised no small quantity of ingenuity in research and in truth it was not unworthy of being classed among the extraordinary discoveries of the age kate looked up hastily and as hastily looked down again 
"'What has come over you, my dear, in the name of goodness?' asked Mrs. Nickleby, when they had walked on for some time in silence. "'I was only thinking, Mamma," answered Kate. "'Thinking,' replied Mrs. Nickleby. "'Aye, and indeed plenty to think about, too. Your uncle has taken a strong fancy to you, that's quite clear, and if some extraordinary good fortune doesn't come to you after this, I shall be a little surprised, that's all.' With this she launched out into sundry anecdotes of young ladies who had had thousand-pound notes given them in reticules by eccentric uncles, and of young ladies who had accidentally met amiable gentlemen of enormous wealth at their uncles' houses, and married them after a short but ardent courtships. Kate, listening first in apathy and afterwards in amusement, felt as they walked home something of her mother's sanguine complexion gradually awakening in her own bosom and began to think that her prospects might be brightening, and that better days might be dawning upon them. Such is hope, heaven's own gift to struggling mortals, pervading like some subtle essence from the skies, all things, both good and bad, as universal as death, and more infectious than a disease. The feeble winter sun, and winter suns in the city, are very feeble indeed might have brightened up as he shone through the dim windows of the large old house on witnessing the unusual sight which one half-furnished room displayed in a gloomy corner where for years had stood a silent dusty pile of merchandise sheltering its colony of mice and frowning a dull lifeless mass upon the panelled room save when responding to the roll of heavy wagons in the street without it quaked with sturdy tremblings and caused the bright eyes of its tiny citizens to grow brighter still with fear and struck them motionless with an attentive ear and palpitating heart until the alarm had passed away in this dark corner was arranged with scrupulous care all kate's little finery for the day each article of dress partaking of that indescribable air of jauntiness and individuality which empty garments, whether by association, or that they become moulded, as it were, to the owner's form, will take, in eyes accustomed to, or picturing, the wearer's smartness. In place of a bale of musty goods, there lay the black silk dress, the neatest possible figure in itself. The small shoes, with toes delicately turned out, stood upon the very pressure of some old iron weight, and a pile of harsh discoloured leather had unconsciously given place to the very same little pair of black silk stockings which had been the objects of mrs nickleby's peculiar care rats and mice and such small gear had long ago been starved or had emigrated to better quarters and in their stead appeared gloves bands scarfs hairpins and many other little devices almost as ingenious in their way as rats and mice themselves for the tantalization of mankind about and among them all moved kate herself not the least beautiful or unwanted relief to the stern old gloomy building in good time or in bad time as the reader likes to take it for mrs nickleby's impatience went a great deal faster than the clocks of that at the end of town and kate was dressed to the very last hairpin and a full hour and a half before it was at all necessary to begin to think about it in good time or in bad time the toilet was completed, and it being at length the hour agreed upon for starting, the milkman fetched a coach from the nearest stand, and Kate, with many adieu to her mother, and many kind messages to Miss La Creevy, who was to come to tea, seated herself in it, and went away in state, if anybody ever went away in state in a hackney coach yet. And the coach and the coachman and the horses rattled and jangled and whipped and cursed and swore and tumbled on together, until they came to golden square the coachman gave a tremendous double knock at the door which was opened long before he had done as quickly as if there had been a man behind it with his hand tied to the latch kate who had expected no more uncommon appearance than newman noggs in a clean shirt was not a little astonished to see that the opener was a man in handsome livery and there were two or three others in the hall there was no doubt about its being the right house however for there was the name upon the door so she accepted the lace coat sleeve which was tendered her and entering the house was ushered upstairs into a back drawing-room where she was left alone if she had been surprised at the apparition of the footman she was perfectly absorbed in amazement at the richness and splendour of the furniture 
the softest and most elegant carpets the most exquisite pictures the costliest mirrors articles of richest ornament quite dazzling from their beauty and perplexing from the prodigality from which they were scattered around encountered her on every side the very staircase nearly down to the hall door was crammed with beautiful and luxurious things as though the house were brimful of riches which with a very trifling addition would fairly run over into the street presently she heard a series of loud double knocks at the street door and after every knock some new voice in the next room the tones of mr ralph nickleby were easily distinguishable at first but by degrees they merged into the general buzz of conversation and all she could ascertain was that there were several gentlemen with no very musical voices who talked very loud laughed very heartily and swore more than she would have thought quite necessary but this was a question of taste at length the door opened and ralph himself divested of his boots and ceremoniously embellished with black silks and shoes presented his crafty face i couldn't see you before my dear he said in a low tone and pointing as he spoke to the next room i was engaged in receiving them now shall i take you in pray uncle said kate a little flurried as people much more conversant with society often are when they are about to enter a room full of strangers and have had time to think of it previously are there any ladies here no said ralph shortly i don't know any must i go in immediately asked kate drawing back a little as you please said ralph shrugging his shoulders they are all come and dinner will be announced directly afterwards that's all kate would have entreated a few minutes respite but reflecting that her uncle might consider the payment of the hackney coach fare a sort of bargain for her punctuality she suffered him to draw her arm through his and lead her away seven or eight gentlemen were standing round the fire when they went in and as they were talking very loud were not aware of their entrance until mr ralph nickleby touching one on the coat sleeve said in a harsh emphatic voice as if to attract general attention lord frederick verisopht my niece miss nickleby the group dispersed as if in great surprise and the gentleman addressed turning round exhibited a suit of clothes of the most superlative cut a pair of whiskers of similar quality a moustache a head of hair and a young face eh said the gentleman what the devil with which broken ejaculations he fixed his glass in his eye and stared at miss nickleby in great surprise my niece my lord said ralph then my ears did not deceive me and it's not a waxwork said his lordship how do you do i'm very happy and then his lordship turned to another superlative gentleman something older something stouter something redder in the face and something longer upon town and said in a loud whisper that the girl was devilish pity introduce me nickleby said this second gentleman who was lounging with his back to the fire and both elbows on the chimney-piece sir mulberry hawk said ralph otherwise a most knowing card in the pack miss nickleby said lord frederick very soft don't leave me out nickleby cried a sharp-faced gentleman who was sitting on a low chair with a high back reading the paper mr pike said ralph nor me nickleby cried a gentleman with a flushed face and a flash air from the elbow of sir mulberry hawk mr pluck said ralph then wheeling about again towards a gentleman with the neck of a stork and the legs of no animal in particular ralph introduced him as the honourable mr snob and a white-headed person at the table as colonel chowser the colonel was in conversation with somebody who appeared to be a make-weight and was not introduced at all there were two circumstances which in this early stage of the party struck home to kate's bosom and brought the blood tingling to her face one was the flippant contempt with which the guests evidently regarded her uncle and the other the easy insolence of their manner towards herself that the first symptom was very likely to lead to the aggravation of the second it needed no great penetration to foresee and here mr ralph nickleby had reckoned without his host for however fresh from the country a young lady by nature may be and however unacquainted with conventional behaviour the chances are that she will have quite as strong an innate sense of the decencies and proprieties of life as if she had run the gauntlet of a dozen london seasons possibly a stronger one for such senses have been known to blunt in this improving process when ralph had completed the ceremonial of introduction 
he led his blushing niece to a seat as he did so he glanced warily round as though to assure himself of the impression which her unlooked-for appearance had created an unexpected pleasure nickleby said lord frederick verisopht taking his glass out of his right eye where it had until now done duty on kate and fixing it in his left to bring it to bear on ralph designed to surprise you lord frederick said mr pluck not a bad idea said his lordship and one that would most certainly warrant the addition of an extra two and a half per cent nickleby said sir mulberry hawk in a thick coarse voice take the hint and tack it on the other five and twenty or whatever it is and give me half for the advice sir mulberry garnished this speech with a hoarse laugh and terminated it with a pleasant oath regarding mr nickleby's limbs whereat messrs pyke and pluck laughed consumedly these gentlemen had not yet quite recovered the jest when dinner was announced and they were then thrown into fresh ecstasies by a similar cause for sir mulberry hawk in an excess of humour shot dexterously past lord frederick verisopht who was about to lead kate downstairs and drew her arm through his up to the elbow no damn it verisopht said sir mulberry fair play's a jewel and miss nickleby and i settled the matter with our eyes ten minutes ago <laughs> laughed the honourable mr snob very good very good rendered additionally witty by this applause sir mulberry hawk leered upon his friends most facetiously and led kate downstairs with an air of familiarity which roused in her gentle breast such burning indignation as she felt it almost impossible to repress nor was the intensity of these feelings at all diminished when she found herself placed at the top of the table with sir mulberry hawk and lord frederick verisopht on either side oh you found your way into our neighbourhood have you said sir mulberry as his lordship sat down of course replied lord frederick fixing his eyes on miss nickleby how can you ask me will you attend to your dinner said sir mulberry and don't mind miss nickleby and me for we shall prove very indifferent company i dare say i wish you'd interfere here nickleby said lord frederick what's the matter my lord demanded ralph from the bottom of the table where he is supported by messrs pike and pluck this fellow hawk is monopolizing your niece said lord frederick he has a tolerable share of everything that you lay claim to my lord said ralph with a sneer gad so he has replied the young man devil take me if i know which is master in my house he or i i know muttered ralph i think i shall cut him off with a shilling said the young nobleman jocosely no no curse it said sir mulberry when you come to the shilling the last shilling i'll cut you fast enough but till then i'll never leave you you may take your oath of it this sally which was strictly founded on fact was received with a general roar above which was plainly distinguishable the laughter of mr pike and mr pluck who were evidently sir mulberry's toads in ordinary and indeed it was not difficult to see the majority of the company preyed upon the unfortunate young lord who weak and silly as he was appeared by far the least vicious of the party sir mulberry hawk was remarkable for his tact in ruining by himself and his creatures young gentlemen of fortune a genteel and elegant profession of which he had undoubtedly gained the head with all the boldness of an original genius he had struck out an entirely new course of treatment quite opposed to the usual method his custom being when he had gained the ascendancy over those he took in hand rather to keep them down than to give them their own way and to exercise his vivacity upon them openly and without reserve thus he made them butts in a double sense and while he emptied them with great address caused them to ring with sundry well-administered taps for the diversion of society the dinner was as remarkable for the splendour and completeness of its appointments as the mansion itself and the company were remarkable for doing it ample justice in which respect messrs pike and pluck particularly signalized themselves these two gentlemen eating of every dish and drinking of every bottle with a capacity and perseverance truly astonishing they were remarkably fresh too notwithstanding their great exertion for on the appearance of the dessert they broke out again as if nothing serious had taken place since breakfast well said lord frederick sipping his first glass of port if this is a discounting dinner all i have to say is devil take me it wouldn't be a good plan to get discount every day 
you'll have plenty of it in your time returned sir mulberry hawk nickleby will tell you that what do you say nickleby inquired the young man am i to be a good customer it depends entirely on circumstances my lord replied ralph on your lordship's circumstances interposed colonel chowser of the militia and the race courses the gallant colonel glanced at messrs pike and pluck as if he thought they ought to laugh at his joke but those gentlemen being only engaged to laugh for sir mulberry hawk were to his signal discomfiture as grave as a pair of undertakers to add to his defeat sir mulberry considering any such efforts an invasion of his peculiar privilege eyed the offender steadily through his glass as if astonished at his presumption and audibly stated that his impression was that it was an infernal liberty which being a hint to lord frederick he put up his glass and surveyed the object of censure as if he were some extraordinary wild animal then exhibiting for the first time as a matter of course messrs pike and pluck stared at the individual whom sir mulberry hawk stared at so the poor colonel to hide his confusion was reduced to the necessity of holding his port before his right eye and affecting to scrutinize its colour with the most lively interest all this while kate had sat as silently as she could scarcely daring to raise her eyes lest they should encounter the admiring gaze of lord frederick verisopht or what was still more embarrassing the bold looks of his friend sir mulberry the latter gentleman was obliging enough to direct general attention towards her here is miss nickleby observed sir mulberry wondering why the deuce somebody doesn't make love to her no indeed said kate looking hastily up i then she stopped feeling it would have been better to have said nothing at all i'll hold any man fifty pounds said sir mulberry that miss nickleby can't look in my face and tell me she wasn't thinking so done cried the noble gull within ten minutes done responded sir mulberry the money was produced on both sides and the honourable mr snob was elected to the double office of stakeholder and timekeeper pray said kate in great confusion while these preliminaries were in course of completion pray do not make me the subject of any bets uncle i cannot really why not my dear replied ralph in whose grating voice however there was an unusual huskiness as though he spoke unwillingly and would rather that the proposition had not been broached it is done in a moment there is nothing in it if the gentlemen insist on it i don't insist on it said sir mulberry with a loud laugh that is by no means insist upon nickleby's making the denial for if she does i lose but i shall be glad to see her bright eyes especially as she favours the mahogany so much so she does and it's too bad of you miss nickleby said the noble youth quite cruel said mr pike horrid cruel said mr pluck i don't care if i do lose said sir mulberry for one tolerable look at miss nickleby's eyes is worth double the money more said mr pike far more said mr pluck how goes the enemy snob asked sir mulberry hawk four minutes gone bravo won't you make one effort for me miss nickleby asked lord frederick after a short interval you needn't trouble yourself to acquire my buck said sir mulberry miss nickleby and i understand each other she declares on my side and shows her taste you haven't a chance old fellow time snob eight minutes gone get the money ready said sir mulberry you'll soon hand over ha <laughs> ha laughed mr pike mr pluck who always came second and topped his companion if he could screamed outright the poor girl who was so overwhelmed with confusion that she scarcely knew what she did had determined to remain perfectly quiet but fearing that by doing so she might seem to countenance sir mulberry's boast which had been uttered with great coarseness and vulgarity of manner raised her eyes and looked him in the face there was something so odious so insolent so repulsive in the look which met her that without the power to stammer forth a syllable she rose and hurried from the room she restrained her tears by a great effort until she was alone upstairs and then gave them vent capital said sir mulberry hawk putting the stakes in his pocket that's a girl of spirit will drink her health it is needless to say that pike and co responded with a great warmth of manner to this proposal or that the toast was drunk with many little insinuations from the firm relative to the completeness of sir mulberry's conquest ralph who while the attention of the other guests was attracted to the principals in the preceding scene had eyed them like a wolf and appeared to breathe more freely now that his niece was gone the decanters passing quickly round 
he leaned back in his chair and turned his eyes from speaker to speaker as they warmed with wine with looks that seemed to search their hearts and lay bare for his distempered sport every idle thought within them meanwhile kate left wholly to herself had in some degree recovered her composure she had learnt from a female attendant that her uncle wished to see her before she left and had also gleaned the satisfactory intelligence that the gentlemen would take coffee at table the prospect of seeing them no more contributed greatly to calm her agitation and taking up a book she composed herself to read she started sometimes when the sudden opening of the dining-room door let loose a wild shout of noisy revelry and more than once rose in great alarm as a fancied footstep on the staircase impressed her with fear that some stray member of the party was returning alone nothing occurring however to realize her apprehensions she endeavoured to fix her attention more closely on her book in which by degrees she became so much interested that she had read on through several chapters without heed of time or place when she was terrified by suddenly hearing her name pronounced by a man's voice close at her ear the book fell from her hand lounging on an ottoman close beside her was sir mulberry hawk evidently the worse if a man be a ruffian at heart he is never the better for wine what a delightful studiousness said this accomplished gentleman was it real now or only to display the eyelashes kate looking anxiously towards the door made no reply i have looked at them for five minutes said sir mulberry upon my soul they're perfect why did i speak and destroy such a pretty little picture do me the favour to be silent now sir replied kate no don't said sir mulberry folding his crushed hat to lay his elbow on and bringing himself still closer to the young lady upon my life you oughtn't to such a devoted slave of yours miss nickleby it's an infernal thing to treat him so harshly upon my soul it is i wish you to understand sir said kate trembling in spite of herself but speaking with great indignation that your behaviour offends and disgusts me if you have a spark of gentlemanly feeling remaining you will leave me now why said sir mulberry why will you keep up this appearance of excessive rigour my sweet creature now be more natural my dear miss nickleby be more natural do kate hastily rose but as she rose sir mulberry caught her dress and forcibly detained her let me go sir she cried her heart swelling with anger do you hear instantly this moment sit down sit down said sir mulberry i want to talk to you unhand me sir this instant cried kate not for the world rejoined sir mulberry thus speaking he leaned over as if to replace her in her chair but the young lady making a violent effort to disengage herself he lost his balance and measured his length upon the ground as kate sprung forward to leave the room mr ralph nickleby appeared in the doorway and confronted her what's this said ralph it is this sir replied kate violently agitated that beneath the roof where i a helpless girl your dead brother's child should most have found protection i have been exposed to insult which should make you shrink to look upon me let me pass you ralph did shrink as the indignant girl fixed her kindling eye upon him but he did not comply with her injunction nevertheless for he led her to a distant seat and returning and approaching sir mulberry hawk who had by this time risen motioned towards the door your way lies there sir said ralph in a suppressed voice that some devil might have owned with pride what do you mean by that demanded his friend fiercely the swollen veins stood out like sinews on ralph's wrinkled forehead and the nerves about his mouth worked as though some unendurable emotion wrung them but he smiled disdainfully and again pointed to the door do you know me you old madman asked sir mulberry well said ralph the fashionable vagabond for the moment quite quailed under the steady look of the older sinner and walked towards the door muttering as he went you wanted the lord did you he said stopping short when he reached the door as if a new light had broken in upon him and confronting ralph again damn i was in the way was i ralph smiled again but made no answer who brought him to you first pursued sir mulberry and how without me could you ever have wound him in your net as you have 
the net is a large one and rather full said ralph take care that it chokes nobody in the meshes you would sell your flesh and blood for money yourself if you had not already made a bargain with the devil retorted the other do you mean to tell me that your pretty niece was not brought here as a decoy for the drunken boy downstairs although this hurried dialogue was carried on in a suppressed tone on both sides ralph looked involuntarily round to ascertain that kate had not moved her position so as to be within hearing his adversary saw the advantage he had gained and followed it up do you mean to tell me he asked again that it is not so do you mean to say that if he had found his way up here instead of me you wouldn't have been a little more blind and a little more deaf and a little less flourishing than you have been come nickleby answer me that i tell you this replied ralph that if i brought her here as a matter of business ah that's the word interposed sir mulberry with a laugh you're coming to yourself again now as a matter of business pursued ralph speaking slowly and firmly as a man who has made up his mind to say no more because i thought she might make some impression on the silly youth you have taken in hand and are lending good help to ruin i knew knowing him that it would be long before he outraged her girl's feelings and that unless he offended her by mere puppyism and emptiness he would with a little management respect the sex and conduct even of his ursula's niece but if i thought to draw him on more gently by this device i did not think of subjecting the girl to the licentiousness and brutality of so old a hand as you and now we understand each other yeah, especially as there was nothing to be got by it eh sneered sir mulberry exactly so said ralph he had turned away and looked over his shoulder to make this last reply the eyes of the two worthies met with an expression as if each rascal felt that there was no disguising himself from the other and sir mulberry hawk shrugged his shoulders and walked slowly out his friend closed the door and looked restlessly towards the spot where his niece still remained in the attitude in which he had left her she had flung herself heavily upon the couch and with her head drooping over the cushion and her face hidden in her hands seemed to be still weeping in an agony of shame and grief ralph would have walked into any poverty-stricken debtor's house and pointed him out to a bailiff though in attendance upon a young child's deathbed without the smallest concern because it would have been a matter quite in the ordinary course of business and the man would have been an offender against his only code of morality but here was a young girl who had done no wrong save that of coming into the world alive who had patiently yielded to all his wishes who had tried hard to please him above all who did know him money and he felt awkward and nervous ralph took a chair at some distance then another chair a little nearer then moved a little nearer still then nearer again and finally sat himself on the same sofa and laid his hand on kate's arm hush my dear he said as she drew back and her sobs burst out afresh hush hush don't mind it now don't think of it oh for pity's sake let me go home cried kate let me leave this house and go home yes yes said ralph you shall but you must dry your eyes first and compose yourself let me raise your head there there oh uncle exclaimed kate clasping her hands what have i done what have i done that you should subject me to this if i had wronged you in thought or word or deed it would have been most cruel to me and the memory of one you must have loved in some old time but only listen to me for a moment interrupted ralph seriously alarmed by the violence of her emotions i didn't know it would be so it was impossible for me to foresee it i did all i could come let us walk about you are faint with the closeness of the room and the heat of these lamps you will be better now if you make the slightest effort i will do anything replied kate if you will only send me home well well i will said ralph but you must get back your looks for those you have will frighten them and nobody must know of this but you and i now let us walk the other way there you look better even now with such encouragements as these ralph nickleby walked to and fro with his niece leaning on his arm actually trembling beneath her touch in the same manner when he judged it prudent to allow her to depart he supported her downstairs after adjusting her shawl and performing such little offices most probably for the first time in his life across the hall and down the steps ralph led her too nor did he withdraw his hand until she was seated in the coach 
as the door of the vehicle was roughly closed a comb fell from kate's hair close at her uncle's feet and as he picked it up and returned it to her hand the light from a neighbouring lamp shone upon her face the lock of hair that had escaped and curled loosely over her brow the traces of tears scarcely dry the flushed cheek the look of sorrow all fired some dormant train of recollection in the old man's breast and the face of his dead brother seemed present before him with the very look it bore on some occasion of boyish grief of which every minutest circumstance flashed upon his mind with the distinctness of a scene of yesterday ralph nickleby who was proof against all appeals of blood and kindred who was steeled against every tale of sorrow and distress staggered while he looked and went back to his house as a man who had seen a spirit from some world beyond the grave End of chapter 19chapter twenty of the life and adventures of nicholas nickleby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain nicholas nickleby by charles dickens wherein nicholas at length encounters his uncle to whom he expresses his sentiments with much candour his resolution little miss la creevy trotted briskly through diverse streets at the west end of the town early on monday morning the day after the dinner, charged with the important commission of acquainting Madame Mantalini that Miss Nickleby was too unwell to attend that day, but hoped to be enabled to resume her duties on the morrow, and as Miss La Creevy walked along, revolving in her mind various genteel forms and elegant turns of expression, with a view to the selection of the very best in which to couch her communication, she cogitated a good deal upon the probable causes of her young friend's indisposition i don't know what to make of it said miss la creevy her eyes were decidedly red last night she said she had a headache headaches don't occasion red eyes she must have been crying arriving at this conclusion which indeed she had established to her perfect satisfaction on the previous evening miss la creevy went on to consider as she had done nearly all night what new causes of unhappiness her young friend could possibly have had i can't think of anything said the little portrait painter nothing at all unless it was the behaviour of that old bear cross to her i suppose unpleasant brute relieved by this expression of opinion albeit it was vented upon empty air miss la creevy trotted on to madame mantalini's and being informed that the governing power was not yet out of bed requested an interview with the second in command whereupon miss knag appeared so far as i am concerned said miss knag when the message had been delivered with many ornaments of speech i could spare miss nickleby for evermore oh indeed ma'am rejoined miss la creevy highly offended but you see you are not mistress of the business and therefore it's of no great consequence very good ma'am said miss knag have you any further commands for me no i have not ma'am rejoined miss la creevy then good morning ma'am said miss knag good morning to you ma'am and many obligations for your extreme politeness and good breeding rejoined miss la creevy thus terminating the interview during which both ladies had trembled very much and had been marvellously polite certain indications that they were within an inch of a very desperate quarrel miss la creevy bounced out of the room and into the street i wonder who that is said the queer little soul a nice person to know I should think i wish i had a painting of her i do her justice so feeling quite satisfied that she had said a very cutting thing at miss knag's expense miss la creevy had a hearty laugh and went home to breakfast in good humour here was one of the advantages of having lived alone so long the little bustling active cheerful creature existed entirely within herself talked to herself made a confidant of herself was as sarcastic as she could be on people who offended her by herself pleased herself and did no harm if she indulged in scandal nobody's reputation suffered and if she enjoyed a little bit of revenge no living soul was one atom the worse one of the many to whom from straitened circumstances a consequent inability to form the associations they would wish and a disinclination to mix with the society they could obtain 
London is as complete a solitude as the plains of Syria. The humble artist had pursued her lonely, but if contented way for many years, and, until the peculiar misfortunes of the Nickleby family attracted her attention, had made no friends, though brimful of the friendliest feelings to all mankind. There are many warm hearts in the same solitary guise as poor little Miss La Creevy's. However, that's neither here nor there just now. She went home to breakfast and had scarcely caught the full flavour of her first sip of tea when the servant announced a gentleman, whereat Miss La Creevy, at once imagining a new sitter, transfixed by admiration at the street-door case, was in unspeakable consternation at the presence of the tea-things. "'Here, take him away. Run with him into the bedroom. Anywhere,' said Miss La Creevy. "'Dear, dear, to think that I should be late on this particular morning of all others, after being ready for three weeks by half-past eight o'clock, and not a soul coming near the place.' "'Don't let me put you out of the way,' said a voice Miss La Creevy knew. "'I told the servant not to mention my name, because I wished to surprise you.' "'Mr. Nicholas!' cried Miss La Creevy, starting in great astonishment. "'You have not forgotten me, I see,' replied Nicholas, extending his hand. "'Why, I think I should have even known you if I had met you in the street,' said Miss La Creevy, with a smile. "'Hannah, another cup and saucer. Now I'll tell you what, young man, I'll trouble you not to repeat the impertinence you were guilty of on the morning you went away.' "'You would not be very angry, would you?' asked Nicholas. "'Wouldn't I?' said Miss La Creevy. "'You had better try, that's all.' Nicholas, with becoming gallantry, immediately took Miss La Creevy at her word, who uttered a faint scream and slapped his face. But it was not a very hard slap, and that's the truth. "'I never saw such a rude creature,' exclaimed Miss La Creevy. "'Well, you told me to try,' said Nicholas. "'Well, but I was speaking ironically,' rejoined Miss La Creevy. "'Oh, that's another thing,' said Nicholas. "'You should have told me that, too.' "'I dare say you didn't know indeed,' retorted Miss La Creevy. "'But now I look at you again, you seem thinner than when I saw you last, "'and your face is haggard and pale. "'How come you have left Yorkshire?' "'She stopped here, for there was so much heart in her altered tone and manner "'that Nicholas was quite moved.' "'I need look somewhat changed,' he said after a short silence, "'for I have undergone some suffering both of mind and body since I left London. "'I have been very poor, too, and have even suffered from want.' "'Good heavens!' Mr. Nicholas exclaimed Miss La Creevy. "'What are you telling me?' "'Nothing which needs distress you quite so much,' answered Nicholas, with a more sprightly air. "'Neither did I come here to bewail my lot, but on a matter more to the purpose.' I wish to meet my uncle face to face. I should tell you that first. Then all I have to say about that is, interposed Miss La Creevy, that I don't envy you your taste, and that sitting in the same room with his very boots would put me out of humour for a fortnight. In the main, said Nicholas, there may be no great difference of opinion between you and me so far, but you will understand that I desire to confront him, to justify myself, and to cast his duplicity and malice in his throat. That's quite another matter, rejoined Miss La Creevy. Heaven forgive me, but I shouldn't cry my eyes quite out of my head if they choked him. Well, to this end I called upon him this morning, said Nicholas. He only returned to town on Saturday, and I knew nothing of his arrival until late last night. And did you see him? asked Miss La Creevy. No, replied Nicholas. He'd gone out. Ha! said Miss La Creevy. "'on some kind, charitable business, I dare say. "'I have reason to believe,' pursued Nicholas, "'from what has been told me by a friend of mine "'who is acquainted with his movements, "'that he intends seeing my mother and sister today "'and giving them his version of the occurrences "'that have befallen me. "'I will meet him there.' "'That's right,' said Miss La Creevy, rubbing her hands. "'And yet I don't know,' she added, "'that there is much to be thought of, others to be considered.' "'I have considered others,' rejoined Nicholas. But as honesty and honour are both at issue, nothing shall deter me. You should know best, said Miss La Creevy. In this case, I hope so, answered Nicholas. And all I want you to do for me is to prepare them for my coming. They think me a long way off, and if I went wholly unexpected, I should frighten them. If you can spare time to tell them that you have seen me, and that I shall be with them in quarter of an hour afterwards, you will do me a great service. 
i wish i could do you or any of you a greater said miss la creevy but the power to serve is as seldom joined with the will as the will is with the power i think talking on very fast and very much miss la creevy finished her breakfast with great expedition and put away the tea caddy and hid the key under the fender resumed her bonnet and taking nicholas's arm sallied forth at once to the city nicholas left her near the door of his mother's house and promised to return within a quarter of an hour it so chanced that ralph nickleby at length seeing fit for his own purposes to communicate the atrocities of which nicholas had been guilty had instead of first proceeding to another quarter of the town on business as newman noggs supposed he would gone straight to his sister-in-law hence when miss la creevy admitted by a girl who was cleaning the house made her way into the sitting-room she found mrs nickleby and kate in tears and ralph just concluding his statement of his nephew's misdemeanours kate beckoned her not to retire and miss la creevy took a seat in silence you're here already are you my gentleman thought the little woman then he shall announce himself and see what effect that has on you this is pretty said ralph folding up miss squeer's note very pretty i recommend him against all my previous conviction for i knew he would never do any good to a man with whom behaving himself properly he might have remained in comfort for years what is the result conduct for which he might hold up his hand at the old bailey i will never believe it said kate indignantly never it is some base conspiracy which carries its own falsehood with it my dear said ralph you wrong the worthy man these are not inventions the man is assaulted your brother is not to be found this boy of whom they speak goes with him remember remember it's impossible said kate nicholas and a thief too mamma how can you sit and hear such statements poor mrs nickleby who had at no time been remarkable for the possession of a very clear understanding and who had been reduced by the late changes in her affairs to a most complicated state of perplexity made no other reply to this earnest remonstrance than exclaiming from behind a mass of pocket handkerchief that she could never have believed it thereby most ingeniously leaving her hearers to suppose that she did believe it it would be my duty if he came in my way to deliver him up to justice said ralph my bounden duty i should have no other course as a man of the world and a man of business to pursue and yet said ralph speaking in a very marked manner and looking furtively but fixedly at kate and yet i would not i would spare the feelings of his of his sister and his mother of course added ralph as though by an afterthought and with far less emphasis kate very well understood that this was held out as an additional inducement to her to preserve the strictest silence regarding the events of the preceding night she looked involuntarily towards ralph as he ceased to speak but he had turned his eyes another way and seemed for the moment quite unconscious of her presence everything said ralph after a long silence broken only by mrs nickleby's sobs everything combines to prove the truth of this letter if indeed there were any possibility of disputing it do innocent men steal away from the sight of honest folks and skulk in hiding places like outlaws do innocent men inveigle nameless vagabonds and prowl with them about the country as idle robbers do assault riot theft what do you call these a lie cried a voice as the door was dashed open and nicholas came into the room in the first moment of surprise and possibly of alarm ralph rose from his seat and fell back a few paces quite taken off his guard by this unexpected apparition in another moment he stood fixed and immovable with folded arms regarding his nephew with a scowl while kate and miss la creevy threw themselves between the two to prevent the personal violence which the fierce excitement of nicholas appeared to threaten dear nicholas cried his sister clinging to him be calm consider consider kate cried nicholas clasping her hand so tight in the tumult of his anger that she could scarcely bear the pain when i consider all and think of what has passed i need be made of iron to stand before him there is not hardihood enough in flesh and blood to face it out 
oh dear dear cried mrs nickleby that things should have come to such a pass as this who speaks in a tone as if i had done wrong and brought disgrace on them said nicholas looking round your mother sir replied ralph motioning towards her whose ears have been poisoned by you said nicholas by you who under pretence of deserving the thanks she poured upon you heaped every insult wrong and indignity upon my head you who sent me to a den where sordid cruelty worthy of yourself runs wanton and youthful misery stalks precocious where the lightness of childhood shrinks into the heaviness of age and its every promise blights and withers as it grows i call heaven to witness said nicholas looking eagerly round that i have seen all this and that he knows it refute these calumnies said kate and be more patient so that you may give them no advantage tell us what you really did and show that they are untrue of what do they or of what does he accuse me said nicholas first of attacking your master and being within an ace of qualifying yourself to be tried for murder interposed ralph i speak plainly young man bluster as you will i interfered said nicholas to save a miserable creature from the vilest cruelty and in so doing i inflicted such punishment upon a wretch as he will not readily forget though far less than he deserved from me if the same scene were renewed before me now i would take the same part but i would strike harder and heavier and brand him with such marks as he should carry to his grave go to it when he would you hear said ralph turning to mrs nickleby penitence this oh dear me cried mrs nickleby i don't know what to think i really don't don't speak just now mamma i entreat you said kate dear nicholas i only tell you that you may know what wickedness can prompt but they accuse you of a, a ring is missing and they dare to say that the woman said nicholas haughtily the wife of the fellow from whom these charges come dropped as i suppose a worthless ring among some clothes of mine early in the morning on which i left the house at least i know that she was in the bedroom where they lay struggling with an unhappy child and that i found it when i opened my bundle on the road i returned it at once by coach and they have it now i knew i knew said kate looking towards her uncle about this boy love in whose company they say you left the boy a silly helpless creature from brutality and hard usage is with me now rejoined nicholas you hear said ralph appealing to the mother again everything proved even upon his own confession do you choose to restore that boy sir no i do not replied nicholas you do not sneered ralph no repeated nicholas not to the man with whom i found him i would that i knew of whom he has the claim of birth i might wring something from his sense of shame if he were dead to every tie of nature indeed said ralph now sir will you hear a word or two from me you can speak when and what you please replied nicholas embracing his sister i take little heed of what you say or threaten mighty well sir retorted ralph but perhaps it may concern others who may think it worth their while to listen and consider what i tell them i will address your mother sir who knows the world ah and i only too dearly wish i didn't sobbed mrs nickleby there really was no necessity for the good lady to be much distressed upon this particular head the extent of her worldly knowledge being to say the least very questionable and so ralph seemed to think for he smiled as she spoke he then glanced steadily at her and nicholas by turns as he delivered himself in these words of what i have done or what i meant to do for you ma'am and my niece i say not one syllable i held out no promise and i leave you to judge for yourself i held out no threat now but i say that this boy headstrong wilful and disorderly as he is should not have one penny of my money nor one crust of my bread nor one grasp of my hand to save him from the loftiest gallows in all europe i will not meet him come where he comes or hear his name i will not help him or those who help him with a full knowledge of what he brought upon you by so doing he has come back in his selfish sloth to be an aggravation of your wants and a burden upon his sister's scanty wages i regret to leave you and more to leave her but now i will not encourage this compound of meanness and cruelty and as i will not ask you to renounce him i see you no more 
if ralph had not known and felt his power in wounding those he hated his glances at nicholas would have shown it him in all its force as he pronounced in the above address innocent as the young man was of all wrong every artful insinuation stung every well-considered sarcasm cut him to the quick and when ralph noticed his pale face and quivering lip he hugged himself to mark how well he had chosen the taunts best calculated to strike deep into a young and ardent spirit i can't help it cried mrs nickleby i know you've been very good to us and meant to do a good deal more for my dear daughter i'm quite sure of that i know you did and it was very kind of you having her at your house and all and of course it would have been a great thing for her and for me too but i can't you know brother-in-law i can't renounce my own son even if he has done all you say he has it's not possible i couldn't do it so we must go to rack and ruin kate my dear i can bear it i dare say pouring forth these and a perfectly wonderful train of other disjointed expressions of regret which no mortal power but mrs nickleby's could have ever strung together that lady wrung her hands and her tears fell faster why do you say if nicholas has done what they say he has mamma asked kate with honest anger you know he has not i don't know what to think one way or another my dear said mrs nickleby nicholas is so violent and your uncle has so much composure that i can only hear what he says and not what nicholas does never mind don't let us talk more about it we can go to the workhouse or the refuge for the destitute or the magdalen hospital i dare say and the sooner we go the better with this extraordinary jumble of charitable institutions mrs nickleby again gave way to her tears stay said nicholas as ralph turned to go you need not leave this place sir for it will be relieved of my presence in one minute and it will be long very long before i darken these doors again nicholas cried kate throwing herself on her brother's shoulder do not say so my dear brother you will break my heart mamma speak to him do not mind her nicholas she does not mean it you should know her better uncle somebody for heaven's sake speak to him i never meant kate said nicholas tenderly i never meant to stay among you think better of me than to suppose it possible i may turn my back on this town a few hours sooner than i intended but what of that we shall not forget each other apart and better days will come when we shall part no more be a woman kate he whispered proudly and do not make me one while he looks on no no i will not said kate eagerly but you will not leave us oh think of all the happy days we have had together before these terrible misfortunes came upon us of all the comfort and happiness of home and the trials we have to bear now of our having no protector under all the slights and wrongs that poverty so much favours and you cannot leave us to bear them alone without one hand to help us you will be helped when i am away replied nicholas hurriedly i am no help to you no protector i should bring you nothing but sorrow and want and suffering my own mother sees it and her fondness and fears for you point to the course that i should take and so all good angels bless you kate till i can carry you to some home of mine where we may revive the happiness denied to us now and talk of these trials as of things gone by do not keep me here but let me go at once there dear girl dear girl the grasp which had detained him relaxed and kate swooned in his arms nicholas stooped over her for a few seconds and placing her gently in a chair confided to their honest friend i need not entreat your sympathy he said wringing a hand for i know your nature you will never forget them he stepped up to ralph who remained in the same attitude which he had preserved throughout the interview and moved not a finger whatever step you take sir he said in a voice inaudible beyond themselves i shall keep a strict account of i leave them to you at your desire there will be a day of reckoning sooner or later and it will be a heavy one for you if they are wronged ralph did not allow a muscle of his face to indicate that he had heard one word of this parting address he hardly knew that it was concluded and mrs nickleby had scarcely made up her mind to detain her son by force if necessary when nicholas was gone as he hurried through the streets to his obscure lodging seeking to keep pace as it were with the rapidity of the thoughts which crowded upon him many doubts and hesitations arose in his mind and almost tempted him to return but what would they gain by this supposing he were to put ralph nickleby at defiance and were even fortunate enough to obtain some small employment 
his being with them could only render their present condition worse and might greatly impair their future prospects for his mother had spoken of some new kindness towards kate which she had not denied no thought nicholas i have acted for the best but before he had gone five hundred yards some other and different feeling would come upon him and then he would lag again pulling his hat over his eyes give way to the melancholy reflections which pressed thickly upon him to have committed no fault and yet to be so entirely alone in the world to be separated from the only persons he loved and to be prescribed like a criminal when six months ago he had been surrounded by every comfort and looked up to as the chief hope of his family this was hard to bear he had not deserved it either well there was comfort in that and poor nicholas would brighten up again to be again depressed as his quickly shifting thoughts presented every variety of light and shade before him undergoing these alternations of hope and misgiving which no one placed in a situation of ordinary trial can fail to have experienced nicholas at length reached his poor room where no longer borne up by the excitement which had hitherto sustained him but depressed by the revulsion of feeling it left behind he threw himself on the bed and turning his face to the wall gave free vent to the emotions he had so long stifled he had not heard anybody enter and was unconscious of the presence of smike until happening to raise his head he saw him standing at the upper end of the room looking wistfully towards him he withdrew his eyes when he saw that he was observed and affected to be busied with some scanty preparations for dinner well smike said nicholas as cheerfully as he could speak let me hear what new acquaintances you have made this morning or what new wonder you have found out in the compass of this street and the next one no said smike shaking his head mournfully i must talk of something else to-day of what you like replied nicholas good-humouredly of this said smike i know you are unhappy and have got into great trouble by bringing me away i ought to have known that and stopped behind i would indeed if i had thought it then you you are not rich you have not enough for yourself and i should not be here you grow said the lad laying his hand timidly on that of nicholas you grow thinner every day your cheek is paler and your eye more sunk indeed i cannot bear to see you so and think how i am burdening you i tried to go away to-day but the thought of your kind face drew me back i could not leave you without a word the poor fellow could say no more for his eyes filled with tears and his voice was gone the word which separates us said nicholas grasping heartily by the shoulder shall never be said by me for you are my only comfort and stay i would not lose you now smike for all the world could give the thought of you has upheld me through all i have endured to-day and shall through fifty times such trouble give me a hand my heart is linked to yours we will journey from this place together before the week is out what if i am steeped in poverty you lighten it and we will be poor together End of chapter twenty